This book contains up to four sides per cassette. Side 1. RC 65705. Off Armageddon Reef. By David Weber. Copyright 2007. By David Weber. Read by Martha Harmon Pardee. This book contains 605 pages on 20 sides. If you would like to skip over any remaining announcements or introductory material, place your cassette player in fast forward until a beep is heard. Stop at that point to hear the beginning of the book. Library of Congress Annotation To save humanity from advancing hostile aliens, Earth launches Operation Ark. Refugees colonize a distant planet they call Safehold, where leaders impose an oppressive religion forbidding technology and innovation. Centuries later, Lieutenant Commander Nimue Alban awakens with an android body, pre-programmed to oppose the Church and restore freedoms. 2007 From the Book Jacket Dying was the easy part. The Terran Federation Navy fought desperately for over 40 years, but the ruthless species known as the Gababa slaughtered the human race's extrasolar colonies one by one. Now the end had finally come. Earth herself lay under siege by an enemy humankind could not defeat. And so mankind undertook one last throw of the dice. Operation Ark. Earth's final colonizing expedition was meant to build a new civilization on a planet so distant even the Gababa might never find it, and without the high-tech infrastructure whose emissions might betray its location. To protect and conceal that expedition, the Navy's final fleet was prepared to die to the last ship. Lieutenant Commander Nimue Alban volunteered to serve on the flagship of that fleet, knowing that she and everyone else aboard it would die, which was exactly what happened. So she was a little surprised to wake up in a cave on a planet called Safehold. She was even more surprised to discover that she'd been dead for eight centuries, and that the fanatic administrators of Operation Ark had used mind-control techniques to create a false, brutally suppressive religion in which every single Safeholdian believed, one whose entire purpose was to forbid invention and innovation forever. Everyone on Safehold knew the Church was the consecrated custodian of God's will. Everyone knew forbidden technology was the work of the devil. And everyone knew that anyone who dabbled in the forbidden must be destroyed, lest everyone's soul be lost forever to damnation. But a tiny faction within Operation Ark's leadership remembered the truth and believed in human dignity and freedom. They've left Nimue Alban to oppose that monstrous creation, and they've given her a carefully hidden cache of technology and the capabilities of the android body in which her memories, loves, hopes, and dreams live on. Now it's her job to somehow provoke the technological progress and freedom of thought and belief. The Church of God awaiting has worked centuries to crush. Nimue Alban spent her entire life fighting against the inevitable destruction of her species. Now she's about to discover that dying in humanity's defense was the easy part. About the author David Weber is the author of the New York Times best-selling Honor Harrington series, the most recent of which is At All Costs. His many other novels include Mutineer's Moon, The Armageddon Inheritance, Heirs of Empire, Path of the Fury, and Wind Rider's Oath. He lives in South Carolina. Off Armageddon Reef Reader's Note Characters, glossary, and a note on Safeholdian timekeeping found at the end of the print edition have been moved in this recording to follow the dedication. Maps found in the print edition are not included in this recording. End of reader's note. For Fred Saberhagen, whose work has brought me, and so many others, so much pleasure, it's always nice when someone whose work you like so much turns out to be even more likable as a person. And... For Sharon, who loves me, puts up with my insane schedule, helps me remember which day of the month it is, knows just about everything there is about swimming, and has been known to suggest a three-hanky scene or two to me along the way. Not that I'm saying she did it this time. Oh, my, no. I love you. Characters Bishop Executor Gerald Adamson 
Archbishop Eric Dennis, Chief Administrator for the Archbishopric of Cheris. Lieutenant Jerome Albert, Royal Teresian Navy, First Lieutenant, HMS Typhoon. Admiral General Fidel Alvarez, Dolora Navy, Duke of Malachi. King Ronald IV of Dolar's Senior Admiral. Crown Prince Caleb Armok, Crown Prince of Cheris, older son of King Harald VII, King Harald Armok VII, King of Cheris, Calvin Armok, Duke of Tyrian, Constable of Hyratha, King Harald VII's first cousin, Calvin Caleb Armok, Calvin Armok's younger son, Regis Armok, Calvin Armok's elder son and heir. Prince Jean Armok, Crown Prince Caleb's younger brother, youngest child of King Harald VII. Princess Jeannette Armok, Crown Prince Caleb's younger sister, second eldest child of King Harald VII. Jennifer Armok, Duchess of Tyrian, wife of Calvin Armok. Philip Osgood, Earl of Chorus, Prince Hector's spymaster. Lieutenant Commander Nimwe Alban, TFN. Admiral Pei Kao Jurs, Tactical Officer. Vicar Alain. See also Alain Maguire. Midshipman Hector Applin. Royal Teresian Navy. Junior Midshipman, HMS Royal Cheris. Lieutenant Merlin Athrawis. Teresian Royal Guard. Nimwe Alban's male persona. Midshipman Bartolf Ames, Royal Teresian Navy, a midshipman, HMS Typhoon. Archbishop Boris Barman, Archbishopric of Coruscant. Jeevis Bolton, Baron White Ford's valet. King Ronald Barnes IV, King of Dolar. Archbishop Boris, see Archbishop Boris Barman. Thomas Barman. Baron White Castle, Prince Hector's ambassador to Prince Narmon. Princess Falaise Bates, Prince Narmon of Emerald's youngest child and second daughter. Princess Maria Bates, Prince Narmon of Emerald's oldest child. Prince Narmon Bates II, ruler of the princedom of Emerald. Prince Narmon Garrett Bates, second child of Prince Narmon of Emerald. Princess Olivia Bates, wife of Prince Narmon of Emerald. Prince Travis Bates, Prince Narmon of Emerald's third child and second son. Dr. Adore Bedar, Ph.D., Chief Psychiatrist, Operation ARC. Bishop Executor Gerald, see Bishop Executor Gerald Adamson. Bishop Executor Willis, see Bishop Executor Willis Grierson. Bishop Michael, see Bishop Michael Stainer, Lieutenant Roger Blyden, Dolaran Navy, Second Lieutenant, Galley, Royal Bedar. Duke Blackwater, see Ernest Lincoln. Captain Conair Bausham, Royal Teresian Marines, CO HMS Gale. Lieutenant Robert Bradley, Coruscantia Navy, true name of Captain Stephen White. Father Matteo Brown, Archbishop Eric Dennis, Senior Secretary and Aide, Archbishop Eric's Confidant and Protégé, Captain Ellis Browning, CO, Temple Galleon, Blessed Langhorn, Frederick Brygart, 14th Earl of Hanth, Howard Brygart's great-grandfather, Sir Howard Brygart, the rightful heir to the Earldom of Hanth. Major Brecken Burke, Royal Teresian Marines, CO, Marine Detachment, HMS Royal Cheris, Archbishop Jason Connor, Archbishop of Glacier Heart, Lieutenant Melvin Chalmer, Royal Teresian Navy, First Lieutenant, HMS Telesburg. Father Carlos Chalmers, Archbishop Boris Barman's aide and secretary, Captain Marique Charles, CO, Teresian Merchant Ship Wave Daughter. Major Kent Cleric, Royal Teresian Marines, a Marine expert in infantry tactics. 
Vicar Jasper Clinton, Grand Inquisitor of the Church of God Awaiting, one of the so-called Group of Four. Admiral Sir Luke Coleman, Chisomian Navy, Earl Sharpfield, Queen Charleian Senior Fleet Commander. Earl Chorus, C. Philip Osgood, Samuel Cochrane, Duke of Fern, King Ronald IV of Dolar's First Counselor. Galvin Dyken, Crown Prince Caleb's personal valet. Prince Hector Dakin, Prince of Coruscant, leader of the League of Coruscant. Corporal Jacques Dragoner, Royal Tiresian Marines, a member of Crown Prince Caleb's bodyguard. Vicar Robert Ducherne, Ministry of Treasury, Council of Vicars, one of the so-called Group of Four. Franz Dimitri, Royal Tiresian Marines, a member of Crown Prince Caleb's bodyguard. Adorai Dennis, Archbishop Eric Dennis' wife. Archbishop Eric Dennis, Archbishop of Cheris. Captain Harris Eckerd, Dolora Navy, CO, Galley King Ronald. Archbishop Eric, C. Eric Dennis. Private Louis Farman. Royal Tiresian Marines, a member of Crown Prince Caleb's bodyguard. Sergeant Peter Faircaster, Royal Tiresian Marines, Senior Noncom, Crown Prince Caleb's bodyguard. Father Michael, Parish Priest of Lakeview. Duke of Fern, C. Samuel Cochrane. Lieutenant Arnold Falcon, Royal Tiresian Marines, Commanding Officer, Crown Prince Caleb's personal bodyguard. Captain Matthias Fofau, TFN, CO TFNS, Swiftsure. Father Raymond Fuller, Chaplain, HMS Dreadnought. Raphael Ferkel, Second Baseman and Leadoff Hitter, Telesburg Crockens. Sergeant Charles Gardener, Cheresian Royal Guard, one of King Harold VII's bodyguards. Admiral Louis Gardener, Dolara Navy. Earl of Thirsk, Senior Professional Admiral of the Doloran Navy, Second in Command to Duke Malachi, Grand Vicar Eric the Seventeenth, Secular and Temporal Head of the Church of God Awaiting, Earl Grey Harbor, C. Regis Yawens, Timon Greenhill, King Harald the Seventh's Senior Huntsman, Baron Green Mountain, C. Marek Sanders, Father Barnai Gaishane, Victor Zomsen Trinairs, Senior Aide. Lieutenant Andre Girard, Royal Cheresian Navy, First Officer HMS Dreadnought. Bishop Executor Willis Grayson, Archbishop of Liam Turns, Chief Administrator for the Archbishopric of Emerald. Sergeant Gorge Harper, Cheresian Royal Guard, one of King Harald VII's bodyguards. Captain Sir Owen Hotchkiss, Royal Cheresian Navy, CO, HMS, Tellisburg. Powell Hallman, King Harald VII's Senior Chamberlain. Archbishop Halman, C. Halman Zomsen. Midshipman Yancey Haskin, Dolara Navy, a midshipman aboard Gorath Bay. Earl Hanth, C. Tadeo Montale. Matthew Paul Harrison. Timothy and Sarah Harrison's great-grandson. Robert Harrison, Timothy and Sarah Harrison's grandson. Matthew Paul Harrison's father. Sarah Harrison, wife of Timothy Harrison, Hand and an Eve. Timothy Harrison, mayor of Lakeview and an Adam. Father Albert Harris. Vicar Zomsen Trinairs, special representative to Dolar. George Howard. Earl Grey Harbor's Personal Guardsman, Lieutenant Gabriella Gabby Henderson, TFN, Tactical Officer, TFNS Swiftsure. Edward Hausman, a wealthy foundry owner and shipbuilder in Tellisburg. Lieutenant Clement Hunter, Cheresian Royal Guard, an officer of the Cheresian Royal Guard in Tellisburg. Captain Sir Alfred Hendrick, Royal Cheresian Navy, Baron Seamount, the Royal Tiresian Navy's senior gunnery expert. Admiral Joseph Hurst, 
Chizomia Navy, Earl Sharpfield's second in command. Captain Gilbert Kiley, Carotesia Navy, CO Galley, King Gorja II. Captain Pate Cotter, Emerald Navy, CO Galley, Black Prince. King Gorja III, See Gorja Yai Rail. King Harald VII, See Harald Armok. King Ronald IV, See Ronald Barnes. Midshipman Linnale Corby, Royal Cherisia Navy, Senior Midshipman, HMS Dreadnought. Brady Lang, Prince Narman of Emerald's Chief Agent in Cheris. Eric Langhorn, Chief Administrator, Operation Ark. Lieutenant Jim Lane, Royal Cherisian Marines, Major Kent Cleric's Aide. High Admiral Brian Lock Island, Earl of Lock Island, CO Royal Cherisian Navy, a cousin of King Harald VII. Lord Protector Gregor, C. Gregor Stonar. Archbishop Liam, C. Archbishop Liam Turn. Admiral Ernest Lincoln, Coruscandian Navy. Duke of Blackwater, CO, Coruscandian Navy. Midshipman Marek Magenti, Royal Cherisia Navy, Senior Midshipman HMS Typhoon. Dr. Roger Mucklin, Head of the Royal Cherisian College. Lieutenant Roland Mulry, Emerald Navy, a Lieutenant aboard Galley Black Prince. Earl Mondier, C. Garth Ralston. Tadeo Montail, Usurper Earl of Hant. Lieutenant Ronald Marek, Royal Cherisia Navy, First Lieutenant, HMS Royal Cheris. Admiral Gavin Martin, Tarotesia Navy, Baron White Ford, Senior Admiral of the Navy of Taro. Vicar Alain McGuire, Captain General, Council of Vicars, one of the so-called Group of Four. Captain Quentin Michael, Dolara Navy, CO Galley Goreth Bay. Lieutenant Liam Michelson, Tarotesia Navy, First Lieutenant King Gorja II. Lieutenant Neville Meredith, Dolaran Navy, First Lieutenant Galley Royal Vedar. James McPherson, one of Prince Hector's agents in Cheris. Father Joshua McGregor, Vicar Zomsin Trinair's Special Representative to Taro. Duke Malachi, C. Fidel Alvarez, Captain Willem Manther, Royal Cherisia Navy, CO HMS Dreadnought, Midshipman Adam Marshall, Royal Cherisia Navy, Senior Midshipman HMS Royal Cheris, Master Domnek, King Harald VII's Court Arms Master, Lieutenant Jacob Matheson, Dolara Navy, First Lieutenant Galley Gorath Bay, Captain Duncan Mailer, Royal Cherisia Navy, CO, HMS Halberd. Jaspar Mason, Prince Hector's senior agent in Cheris. Lieutenant Fraser Mathis, Coruscandian Navy, true name of Captain Walter Seatown. Oscar Mulvane, one of Prince Hector's agents in Cheris. Ryan McHale, a major textile producer and sailmaker in Telesburg. Archbishop Irvin Miller, Archbishop of Sodar. Sir Kevin Mergen, Coruscandian Navy, CO. Galley Coruscand. Commodore Cody Niles, Royal Cherisian Navy, CO of one of High Admiral Lock Island's galley squadrons. King Gorja Niao III, King of Taro. Sigmon Ormaster, Royal Cherisian Marines, a member of Crown Prince Caleb's bodyguard. Travis Olson, Earl of Pine Hollow, Prince Narmons of Emerald's first counselor and cousin. Anyat Oliver, Sir Dustin Oliver's wife. Sir Dustin Oliver, a leading Telesburg ship designer, chief constructor, Royal Cherisia Navy. OWL, Nimue Albans AI, based on the manufacturer's acronym. Ordonius Westinghouse Lytton Rapier, tactical computer. Mark 17A. Admiral Kao Jir Pei, TFN, CO, Operation Breakaway, older brother of Commodore Pei Kao Young. Commodore Kao Young Pei, TFN, CO, 
Operation Arc Final Escort. Dr. Shan Wei Pei, Ph.D., Commodore Pei Cao Young's wife, Senior Terraforming Expert for Operation Arc. Madame Angelique Fonda, Proprietor of one of the City of Zion's most discreet brothels. Earl Pine Hollow, C. Travis Olson. Prince Caleb, C. Caleb Armock. Prince Hector, C. Hector Dakin. Prince Narmon, C. Narmon Bates. Dr. Elias Proctor, Ph.D., a member of Pei Sean Wei's staff and a noted cyberneticist. Queen Charlayan, C. Charlayan Tate. Commodore Donnert Quentin, Coruscantian Navy. Baron Tandler Keep, one of Duke of Blackwater's squadron commanders. Admiral Garth Ralston, Emerald Navy. Earl of Mondier, CO, Emerald Navy. Commodore Eric Ralston, Dolaran Navy, one of Duke Malachi's squadron commanders. Benjamin Rice, Baron Wave Thunder, King Harald VII, spymaster and a member of his Privy Council. Archbishop Willem Reno, Archbishop of Changwu, Adjutant of the Order of Schuler, Vicar Robert, see also Robert Ducherne. Colonel Autumn Ropewalk, Cherisian Royal Guard, CO, Cherisian Royal Guard. Captain Horace Rowan, CO, Sir Dustin Oliver's yacht, Anyet. Edmund Rustman, Baron Stonekeep, King Gorgia III of Taro's First Counselor and Spymaster. Lieutenant Benjamin Sadler, Royal Cherisian Navy, Second Lieutenant, HMS Dreadnought. Mark Sanders, Baron Green Mountain, Queen Charlayan of Chisholm's First Minister. Sir Richard C. Farmer, Baron Wave Thunder's Senior Investigator. Baron Seamount, C. Sir Alfred Hendrick. Captain Walter Seatown, CO of Merchant Ship, Francine, acting as a courier for Prince Hector's spies in Cheris. See also Lieutenant Fraser Mathis. Hall Shander. Baron of Shander, Prince Narmon of Emerald's spymaster, Earl Sharpfield, C. Sir Luke Coleman, Father Simon Shoemaker, Archbishop Eric Dennis Secretary for his 891 pastoral visit, an agent of the Grand Inquisitor, Jan Smolf, star pitcher for the Telesburg Krakens, Captain Martin Luther Somerset TFN, CO TFNS Excalibur, Bishop Michael Stainer, Bishop of Telesburg, King Harald VII's confessor and advisor. Commodore Sir Dominic Stainer, Royal Cherisian Navy, specialist in naval tactics. CO Experimental Squadron, Crown Prince Caleb's second-in-command. Younger brother of Bishop Michael Stainer, later Admiral. Lord Protector Gregor Stonar. Elected ruler of the Sidermark Republic. Baron Stonekeep, C. Edmund Rustman. Captain Darrell Stewart, Royal Cherisia Navy, CO HMS Typhoon. Thomas Simmons, Grand Duke of Zebediah. Senior member and head of Council of Zebediah. Captain Gervais Talman, Emerald Navy, second in command of the Royal Dockyard in Trangier. Baron Tandler Keep, C. Donnert Quentin, Queen Charlayan Tate, Queen of Chisholm, Captain Joseph Thiessen, TFN, Admiral Pei Cao Jers, Chief of Staff, Earl Thirsk, C. Louis Gardner, Franklin Thomas, Crown Prince Caleb's Tutor, Lieutenant Henry Tillier, Royal Theresia Navy, High Admiral Lock Island's personal aide, Duke Tyrion, C. Calvin Armock, Vicar Zomson Trinair, Chancellor of the Council of Vicars of the Church of God Awaiting, one of the so-called Group of Four, Captain Sir Denzel Trevithan, Royal Cherisian Navy, CO HMS Royal Cheris, Archbishop Liam Turn, Archbishop of Emerald, Archbishop Irvin, C. Irvin Miller, Baron Wave Thunder, C. Benjamin Rice, Captain Stephen White, CO, Merchant ship Sea Cloud, a courier for Prince Hector's spies in Cheris. C. 
See also Robert Bradley. Baron White Castle. See Thomas Barman. Baron White Ford. See Gavin Martin. Archbishop Willem. See Willem Reno. Maurice Willems. The Duke of Tyrion's Majordomo. Father Peter Wilson. A priest of the Order of Schuler, the Church of God awaitings intendant for Cheris. Lieutenant Kenneth Winston. Corisandian Navy. First Lieutenant Galley. Corisand. Ernest Yawance. Regis Yawance's deceased elder brother. Regis Yawance. Earl of Grey Harbor. King Harald's first minister and head of the Privy Council. Grand Duke Zebediah. See Thomas Simmons. Archbishop Halman Zomson. Archbishop of Gorath. Senior prelate of the Kingdom of Dolar. Vicar Zomson. See Zomson Trinair. Franck Jansen. The Duke of Tyrion Senior Guardsman. Vicar Jasper. See Zomson Clinton. Archbishop Jason. See Jason Connor. Captain Nicholas Jepson. Emerald Navy. CO Galley Triton. Lachlan Jessup. King Harald VII's valet. Lieutenant Philip Jolson. Terotesian Navy. Second Lieutenant. King Gorgia II. Glossary. Anshin Ritsume. Literally enlightenment from the Japanese. Rendered in the safe hold Bible, however, as the little fire, the lesser touch of God's spirit, the maximum enlightenment of which mortals are capable. Borer, a form of safe holdian shellfish which attaches itself to the hulls of ships or the timbers of wharves by boring into them. There are several types of borer, the most destructive of which actually eat their way steadily deeper into a wooden structure. Borers and rot are the two most serious threats, aside, of course, from fire to wooden hulls. Catamount, a smaller version of the safe holdian slash lizard. The catamount is very fast and smarter than its larger cousin, which means that it tends to avoid humans. It is, however, a lethal and dangerous hunter in its own right. The commentaries, the authorized interpretations and doctrinal expansions upon the Holy Writ. They represent the officially approved and sanctioned interpretation of the original scripture. Choke tree, a low-growing species of tree native to safehold. It comes in many varieties and is found in most of the planet's climate zones. It is dense-growing, tough, and difficult to eradicate, but it requires quite a lot of sunlight to flourish, which means it is seldom found in mature, old-growth forests. Cotton silk, a plant native to safehold which shares many of the properties of silk and cotton. It is very lightweight and strong, but the raw fiber comes from a plant pod which is even more filled with seeds than old earth cotton. Because of the amount of hand labor required to harvest and process the pods and to remove the seeds from it, cotton silk is very expensive. Council of Vicars, the Church of God awaitings equivalent of the College of Cardinals. Doom Whale, the most dangerous predator of safehold, although fortunately it seldom bothers with anything as small as humans. Doom whales have been known to run to as much as 100 feet in length, and they are pure carnivores. Each doom whale requires a huge range, and encounters with them are rare, for which human beings are just as glad, thank you. Doom whales will eat anything, including the largest crocans. They have been known on extremely rare occasions to attack merchant ships and war galleys. Dragon, the largest native Safeholdian land life forms. Dragons come in two varieties, the common dragon and the great dragon. The common dragon is about twice the size of a Terran elephant and is herbivorous. The great dragon is smaller, about half to two-thirds the size of the common dragon, but carnivorous, filling the highest feeding niche of Safehold's land-based ecology. They look very much alike, aside from their size and the fact that the common dragon has herbivore teeth and jaws, whereas the great dragon has elongated jaws with sharp, serrated teeth. They have six limbs and, unlike the slash lizard, are covered in thick, well-insulated hide rather than fur. Five day, a Safeholdian week, consisting of only five days, Monday through Friday. Fleming moss, usually lower case. An absorbent moss, native to Safehold, which was genetically engineered by Shanway's terraforming crews, to possess natural antibiotic properties. It is a staple of Safeholdian medical practice. 
grasshopper, a Safeholian insect analog which grows to a length of as much as nine inches and is carnivorous. Fortunately, they do not occur in the same numbers as terrestrial grasshoppers. Group of four, the four vicars who dominate and effectively control the council of vicars of the Church of God awaiting. Hiratha Dragons, the Hiratha professional baseball team, the traditional rivals of the Telesburg Krakens for the Kingdom Championship. The Insights, the recorded pronouncements and observations of the Church of God awaiting's grand vicars and canonized saints. They represent deeply significant spiritual and inspirational teachings, but, as the work of fallible mortals, do not have the same standing as the Holy Writ itself. Intendant, the cleric assigned to a bishopric or archbishopric as the direct representative of the Office of Inquisition. The intendant is specifically charged with assuring that the prescriptions of Zhuo Zheng are not violated. Kerchief a traditional headdress worn in the Kingdom of Taro which consists of a specially designed bandana tied across the hair. Knights of the Temple Lands, the corporate title of the prelates who govern the Temple Lands. Technically, the Knights of the Temple Lands are secular rulers who simply happen to also hold high church office. Under the letter of the church's law, what they may do as the Knights of the Temple Lands is completely separate from any official action of the church. This legal fiction has been of considerable value to the Church on more than one occasion. Kraken, generic term for an entire family of maritime predators. Krakens are rather like sharks crossed with octopi. They have powerful, fish-like bodies, strong jaws with inward, inclined, fang-like teeth, and a cluster of tentacles just behind the head which can be used to hold prey while they devour it. The smallest coastal krakens can be as short as three or four feet. Deep water krakens up to 50 feet in length have been reported, and there are legends of those still larger. Kyao se he, literally great fire or magnificent fire, the term used to describe the brilliant nimbus of light the Operation Arc Command crew generated around their air cars and skimmers to help prove their divinity to the original Safeholdians. Langhorn's Watch, the 31-minute period immediately before midnight in order to compensate for the extra length of Safehold's 26.5-hour day. Master Trainer, a character out of the Safeholdian entertainment tradition. Master Trainer is a stock character in Safeholdian puppet theater, by turns a bumbling conspirator whose plans always miscarry, and the puppeteer who controls all of the marionette actors in the play. Narwhale, a species of Safeholdian sea life named for the old earth species of the same name. Safeholdian narwhales are about 40 feet in length and equipped with twin horn-like tusks up to 8 feet long. Prong lizard, a roughly elk-sized lizard with a single horn which branches into four sharp points in the last third or so of its length. They are herbivores and not particularly ferocious. Prescriptions of Zhuo Zheng The definition of allowable technology under the doctrine of the Church of God awaiting. Essentially, the prescriptions limit allowable technology to that which is powered by wind, water, or muscle. The prescriptions are subject to interpretation, generally by the order of Schuller, which generally errs on the side of conservatism. Rakurai Literally, lightning bolt the Holy Writ's term for the kinetic weapons used to destroy the Alexandria Enclave. Sand Maggot, a loathsome carnivore looking much like a six-legged slug, which haunts beaches just above the surf line. Sand Maggots do not normally take living prey, although they have no objection to devouring the occasional small creature which strays into their reach. Their natural coloration blends with their sandy habitat well, and they normally conceal themselves by digging their bodies into the sand until they are completely covered, or only a small portion of their backs show. Sea cow, a walrus-like safe Holdian sea mammal which grows to a body length of approximately ten feet when fully mature. Seijin, sage holy man, directly from the Japanese by way of Maruyama Chihiro, the Langhorn staffer who wrote the Church of God Awaiting's Bible. 
slash lizard, a six-limbed, saurian-looking, furry, oviparous mammal, one of the three top predators of safe hold. Mouth contains twin rows of fangs capable of punching through chainmail. Feet have four long toes each, tipped with claws up to five or six inches long. Snark, self-navigating, autonomous reconnaissance and communication platform. Spider crab, a native species of sea life considerably larger than any terrestrial crab. The spider crab is not a crustacean, but rather more of a segmented, tough-hided, many-legged, seagoing slug. Despite that, its legs are considered a great delicacy and are actually very tasty. Spider rat, a native species of vermin which fills roughly the ecological niche of a terrestrial rat. Like all safehold mammals, it is six-limbed, but it looks like a cross between a hairy Gila monster and an insect with long, multi-jointed legs, which actually arch higher than its spine. It is nasty-tempered, but basically cowardly, and fully adult male specimens of the larger varieties of spider rat run to about two feet in body length, with another two feet of tail. The more common varieties average between 33% and 50% of that body tail length. Steel thistle, a native Saifoldian plant which looks very much like branching bamboo. The plant bears seed pods filled with small spiny seeds embedded in fine straight fibers. The seeds are extremely difficult to remove by hand, but the fiber can be woven into a fabric which is even stronger than cotton silk. It can also be twisted into extremely strong, stretch-resistant rope. Moreover, the plant grows almost as rapidly as actual bamboo, and the yield of raw fiber per acre is 70% higher than for terrestrial cotton. Surgoi Kasai literally dreadful great conflagration. The true spirit of God, the touch of his divine fire, which only an angel or archangel can endure. Telesburg Krakens, the Telesburg Professional Baseball Club. The Testimonies, by far the most numerous of the Church of God awaitings writings. These consist of the first-hand observations of the first few generations of humans on safehold, they do not have the same status as the Christian Gospels because they do not reveal the central teachings and inspiration of God. Instead, collectively, they form an important substantiation of the writ's historical accuracy and conclusively attest to the fact that the events they collectively describe did, in fact, transpire. Wire vine, a kudzu-like vine native to Safehold. Wire vine isn't as fast-growing as kudzu, but it's equally tenacious and unlike kudzu, several of its varieties have long, sharp thorns. Unlike many native Safeholdians species of plants, it does quite well intermingled with terrestrial imports. It is often used as a sort of combination of hedgerows and barbed wire by Safehold farmers. Wyvern, the Safeholdian ecological analog of terrestrial birds. There are as many varieties of wyverns as there are of birds, including, but not limited to, the homing wyvern, hunting wyvern suitable for the equivalent of hawking for small prey, the crag wyvern, a small wingspan 10 feet flying predator, various species of sea wyverns, and the king wyvern, a very large flying predator with a wingspan of up to 25 feet. All wyverns have two pairs of wings and one pair of powerful clawed legs. The king wyvern has been known to take children as prey when desperate or when the opportunity presents, but they are quite intelligent. They know that man is a prey best left alone and generally avoid areas of human habitation. Wyvernry, a nesting place and or breeding hatchery for domesticated wyverns. A note on Safeholdian timekeeping. The Safeholdian day is 26 hours and 31 minutes long. Safehold's year is 301.32 local days in length, which works out to 0.91 Earth standard years. It has one major moon, named Langhorn, which orbits Safehold in 27.6 local days, so the lunar month is approximately 28 days long. The Safeholdian day is divided into 26 60-minute hours and one 31-minute period known as Langhorn's Watch which is used to adjust the local day into something which can be evenly divided into standard minutes and hours. The Safeholdian calendar year is divided into 10 months, February, April, March, May, June, July, August, September, October, and November. Each month is divided into 10 five-day weeks, 
each of which is referred to as a five-day. The days of the week are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The extra day in each year is inserted into the middle of the month of July, but is not numbered. It is referred to as God's Day, and is the High Holy Day of the Church of God awaiting. What this means, among other things, is that the first day of every month will always be a Monday, and the last day of every month will always be a Friday. Every third year is a leap year, with the additional day, known as Langhorn's Memorial, being inserted again, without numbering, into the middle of the month of February. It also means that each safe Holdian month is 795 standard hours long, as opposed to 720 hours for a 30-day birth month. The Safeholdian equinoxes occur on April 23rd and September 22nd. The solstices fall on July 7th and February 8th. July 2nd, 2378, Trestwell's Star, HD 63077A, Terran Federation. Captain to the bridge, Captain to the bridge. Captain Mateus Fofau rolled out of bed as the urgent voice of the officer of the watch blared over the intercom counterpointed by the high-pitched wail of the emergency general quarters signal. The captain's bare feet were on the deck sole, and he was already reaching for the bedside comm before his eyes were fully open, and he jabbed the red priority key purely by feel. Bridge. The response came almost instantly, in a voice flat with the panic-resisting armor of training. It's the Captain Chief Kuznetsov, Fofal said crisply. Give me Lieutenant Henderson. Aye, sir. There was a brief instant of silence, then another voice. Officer of the deck, it said. Talk to me, Gabby, Fofau said crisply. Skipper, Lieutenant Gabriella Henderson, the heavy cruiser's tactical officer, had the watch, and her normally calm contralto was strained and harsh. We've got bogies, lots of bogies. They just dropped out of hyper twelve light minutes out, and they're headed in system at over four hundred gravities. Fofau's jaw clenched. Four hundred gravities was twenty percent higher than the best Federation compensators could manage, which pretty conclusively demonstrated that whoever these people were, they weren't Federation units. Strength estimate? he asked. Still coming in, sir, Henderson replied flatly. So far we've confirmed over seventy. Fofau winced. All right. He was astounded by how calm his own voice sounded. Implement first contact protocols and also spy glass and watchmen. Then take us to condition four. Make sure the governor's fully informed and tell her I'm declaring a code alpha. Aye, aye, sir. I'll be on the bridge in five minutes. Fofau continued as his sleeping cabin's door opened and his steward loped through it with his uniform. Let's get some additional recon drones launched and headed for these people. Aye, aye, sir. I'll see you in five, Fofau said. He keyed the comm off and turned to accept his uniform from the white-faced steward. In actual fact, Mateus Fofau reached the command deck of TFNS Swiftshore in just under five minutes. He managed to restrain himself to a quick, brisk stride as he stepped out of the bridge elevator, but his eyes were already on the master plot, and his mouth tightened. The unknown vessels were a scatter of ominous ruby chips bearing down on the binary system's geo-primary component and the blue and white marble of its fourth planet. Captain on the bridge, Chief Kuznetsov announced, but Fofau waved everyone back into his or her bridge chair. As you were, he said, and almost everyone settled back into place. Lieutenant Henderson did not. She rose from the captain's chair at the center of the bridge. Her relief as Fofau's arrival relieved her of command, obvious. He nodded to her, stepped past her, and settled himself in the same chair. The captain has the ship, he announced formally, then looked back up at Henderson, still standing beside him. Any incoming transmissions from them? No, sir. If they'd begun transmitting the instant they dropped out of hyper, we'd have heard something from them about... The lieutenant glanced at the digital time display. Two minutes ago, we haven't. Fofau nodded, somehow looking at the spreading cloud of red icons on the display he wasn't surprised. Strength update? he asked. Tracking estimates a minimum of 85 starships, Henderson said. We don't have any indications of fighter launches yet. Fofau nodded again, and a strange singing sort of tension 
that was almost its own form of calm, seemed to fill him. The calm of a man face to face with a disaster for which he has planned and trained for years, but never really expected to confront. Watchman, he asked. Implemented, sir, Henderson replied. Antelope got underway for the hyperlimit two minutes ago. Spyglass, activated, sir. That's something, a detached corner of Fofau's brain said. TFNS Antelope was a tiny, completely unarmed, and very fast courier vessel. Crestwell's world was the Federation's most advanced colonial outpost, fifty light years from Saul, too new, too sparsely settled to have its own hypercon yet. That left only courier ships, and at this moment Antelope's sole function was to flee Saulward at her maximum possible velocity with the word that Code Alpha had come to pass. Spyglass was the net of surveillance satellites stretched around the periphery of the star system's hyperlimit. They were completely passive, hopefully all but impossible to detect, and they weren't there for Swift Shore's benefit. Their take, all of it, was being beamed after Antelope to make certain she had full and complete tactical records as of the moment she hypered out. And that same information was being transmitted to Antelope's sister ship, TFNS Gazelle, as she lay totally covert in orbit around the system's outermost gas giant. Her task was to remain hidden until the end, if she could, and then to report back to old Earth. And it's a good thing she's out there, Fofal thought grimly, because we certainly aren't going to be making any reports. Ship status? he asked. All combat systems are closed up at Condition 4, sir. Engineering reports all stations manned and ready, and both normal space and hyperdrives are online prepared to answer maneuvering commands. Very good. Pofau pointed at her normally assigned command station and watched her head for it. Then he inhaled deeply and pressed a stud on the arm of his command chair. This is the captain, he said without the usual formalities of an all-hands announcement. By now, you all know what's going on. At the moment, you know just as much about these people as I do. I don't know if they're the Gababa or not. If they are, it doesn't look very good. But I want all of you to know that I'm proud of you. Whatever happens, no captain could have a better ship or a better crew. He released the comm stud and swiveled his chair to face the heavy cruiser's helmsman. Bring us to 015-119er at 50 gravities, he said quietly. And TFNS Swift Shore moved to position herself between the planet whose human colonists had named it Crestwell's world, and the mammoth armada bearing down upon it. Matthias Pofau had always been proud of his ship, proud of her crew, of her speed, of the massive firepower packed into her three-quarters of a million ton hull. At the moment, what he was most aware of was her frailty. Until ten years earlier, there'd been no Terran Federation Navy, not really. There'd been something the Federation called a navy, but it had actually been little more than a fleet of survey vessels, backed up by a handful of light-armed units whose main concerns had been search and rescue operations and the suppression of occasional purely human predators. But then, ten years ago, a Federation survey ship had found evidence of the first confirmed advanced non-human civilization. No one knew what that civilization's citizens had called themselves because none of them were still alive to tell anyone. Humanity had been shocked by the discovery that an entire species had been deliberately destroyed, that a race capable of fully developing and exploiting the resources of its home star system had been ruthlessly wiped out. The first assumption had been that the species in question had done it to itself in some sort of mad spasm of suicidal fury. Indeed, some of the scientists who'd studied the evidence continued to maintain that that was the most likely explanation. Those holdouts, however, were a distinct minority. Most of the human race had finally accepted the second and far more horrifying hypothesis. They hadn't done it to themselves. Someone else had done it to them. Fofau didn't know who'd labeled the hypothetical killers the Gababa, and he didn't much care. But the realization that they might exist was the reason there was a genuine and steadily growing Federation Navy these days and the reason contingency plans like Spyglass and Watchmen had been put into place, and the reason TFNS Swiftsure found herself between Cresswell's world and the incoming 
still totally silent fleet of red icons. There was no way in the universe a single heavy cruiser could hope to stop or slow down or even inconvenience a fleet the size of the one headed for Fofau's ship, nor was it likely he could have stayed away from hostile warships capable of the acceleration rate the unknowns had already demonstrated. But even if he could have, that wasn't Swiftsure's job. Even at their massive acceleration rate, it would take the bogies almost four hours to reach Crestwell's world, assuming they wanted to rendezvous with it. If all they wanted to do was overfly the planet, they could do it in less than three. But whatever their intention, it was Swiftsure's job to stand her ground, to do her damnedest, up to the very last instant, to open some sort of peaceful communication with the unknowns, to serve as a fragile shield and tripwire which might just possibly, however remote the possibility might be, deter an attack on the newly settled planet behind her. And almost certainly to become the first casualty in the war the Federation had dreaded for almost a decade. Sir, we're picking up additional drive signatures, Lieutenant Henderson announced. They look like fighters. Her voice was crisp, professionally clipped. Tracking makes it roughly four hundred. Acknowledged. Still no response to our transmissions, communications? None, sir, the comm officer replied tautly. Tactical. Begin deploying missiles. Aye, aye, sir, Henderson said. Deploying missiles now. Big, long-ranged missiles detached from the external ordnance rings, while others went gliding out of the cruiser's midships missile hatches. They spread out in a cloud about Swiftsure on their secondary station-keeping drives, far enough out to put the ship and their fellow missiles safely outside the threat perimeter of their preposterously powerful primary drives. Looks like they want to englobe the planet, he thought, watching the bogey's formation continue to spread while his ship's unceasing communication attempts beamed towards them. That doesn't look especially peaceful-minded of them. He glanced at the master plot's range numbers. The intruders had been inbound for almost 116 minutes now. Their velocity relative to Crestwell's world was up to just over 31,000 kilometers per second. And unless they reversed acceleration in the next few seconds, they were going to overfly the planet after all. I wonder... Missile launch, Gabriella Henderson announced suddenly. Repeat missile launch. Many missiles inbound. Matthias Volfau's heart seemed to stop. They can't possibly expect to actually hit an evading starship at that range. That was his first thought, as the thousands of incoming missile icons suddenly speckled his plot. But they can sure as hell hit a planet, can't they? His brain told him an instant later. He stared at that hurricane of missiles and knew what was going to happen. Swiftsure's defenses could never have stopped more than a tithe of that torrent of destruction and the frozen corner of his mind wondered what they were armed with. Fusion warheads? Antimatter? Chemical or biological agents? Or perhaps they were simply kinetic weapons? With the prodigious acceleration they were showing, they'd have more than enough velocity to do the job with no warheads at all. Communications, he heard his voice say flatly as he watched the executioners of Cresswell's worlds half-million inhabitants, accelerating towards him. Secure communication attempts. Maneuvering. Bring us to maximum power. Heading 000, 005. Tactical. He turned his head and met Lieutenant Henderson's eyes levelly. Prepare to engage the enemy. February 14th, 2421. TFNS Excalibur. TFNS Gulliver. Task Force 1. The scout ship was too small to be a threat to anyone. The tiny starship was less than 3% the size of TFNS Excalibur, the task force's dreadnought flagship. True, it was faster than Excalibur, and its weapons systems and electronics were somewhat more advanced, but it could not have come within a light minute of the task force and lived. Unfortunately, it didn't have to. It's confirmed, sir. Captain Somerset's mahogany-skinned face was grim on Admiral Pei Kaljur's flag bridge comm screen. Excalibur's commander had aged since the task force set out, Admiral Pei thought. Of course, he was hardly alone in that. 
How far out, Martin? the Admiral asked flatly. Just over 2.6 light minutes, Somerset replied, his expression grimmer than ever. It's too close, Admiral. Maybe not, Hay said, then smiled thinly at his flag captain. And whatever the range, we're stuck with it, aren't we? Sir, I could send this screen out, try and push him further back. I could even detach a destroyer squadron to sit on him, drive him completely out of sensor range of the fleet. We don't know how close behind him something heavier may be, Pay shook his head. Besides, we need them to see us sooner or later, don't we? Admiral, Somerset began, I don't think we can afford to take the chance that we can't afford not to take the chance, Pay said firmly. Go ahead and push the screen out in his direction. See if you can get him to move at least a little further out. But either way, we execute breakaway in the next half hour. Somerset looked at him out of the calm screen for another moment, then nodded heavily. Very well, sir. I'll pass the orders. Thank you, Martin, Pay said in a much softer voice, and cut the circuit. The captain may have a point, sir, a quiet contralto said from behind him, and he turned his bridge chair to face the speaker. Lieutenant Commander Nimue Alban was a very junior officer indeed, especially for an anti jerome society, to be suggesting to a four-star admiral, however respectfully, that his judgment might be less than infallible. Pei Kao Zhe felt absolutely no temptation to point that out to her, however, first because despite her youth she was one of the more brilliant tactical officers the Terran Federation Navy had ever produced, second because if anyone had earned the right to second-guess Admiral Pei, it was Lieutenant Commander Alban. He does have a point, Pei conceded. A very good one, in fact. But I've got a feeling the bad news isn't very far behind this particular raven. A uh, feeling, sir? Alban's combination of dark hair and blue eyes were the gift of her Welsh father, but her height and fair complexion had come from her Swedish mother, Admiral Pei, on the other hand, was a small, wiry man, over three times her age, and she seemed to tower over him as she raised one eyebrow. Still, he was pleased to note in a bittersweet sort of way it wasn't an incredulous expression. After all, he told himself, my penchant for playing a hunch has a lot to do with the fact that I'm the last full admiral the Terran Federation will ever have. It's not some arcane form of ESP in this case, Nimue, he said. But where's the other scout? You know Gababa's scout ships always operate in pairs, and Captain Somerset's reported only one of them. The other fellow has to be somewhere. Like calling up the rest of the pack, Alban said, her blue eyes dark, and he nodded. That's exactly what he's doing. They must have gotten at least a sniff of us before we picked them up, and one of them turned and headed back for help immediately. This one's going to hang on our heels, keep track of us, and home the rest in. But the one thing he isn't going to do is come in close enough to risk letting us get a good shot at him. He can't afford to let us pick him off and then drop out of hyper. They might never find us again. I see where you're going, sir. Alban looked thoughtful for a moment, her blue eyes intent on something only she could see, then returned her attention to the Admiral. Sir, she asked quietly, would I be out of line if I used one of the priority comm circuits to contact Gulliver? I'd like to tell the Commodore goodbye. Of course you wouldn't be, Pei replied equally quietly. And when you do, tell him I'll be thinking about him. Sir, you could tell him yourself. No. Pei shook his head. Kao Yang and I have already said our goodbyes, Nimue. Yes, sir. The word spread quickly from Excalibur as the 10th Destroyer Squadron headed for the Gababa Scout, and a cold, ugly wave of fear came with the news. Not panic, perhaps, because every single member of the murdered Federation's final fleet had known in his heart of hearts that this moment would come. Indeed, they'd planned for it. But that made no one immune from fear when it actually came. More than one of the officers and ratings watching the destroyer's icons sweep across the tactical displays towards the scout ship prayed silently that they would overtake the fleet little ship, destroy it. They knew how unlikely that was to happen, and even if it did, it would probably buy them no more than a few more weeks, possibly a few months. But that didn't keep them from praying. 
Aboard the heavy cruiser TFNS Gulliver, a small wiry Commodore said a prayer of his own, not for the destruction of the scout ship, not even for his older brother, who was about to die, but for a young lieutenant commander who had become almost a daughter to him, and who had volunteered to transfer to Excalibur, knowing the ship could not survive. Commodore Pei, you have a comm request from the flag, his communications officer said quietly. It's Nimue, sir. Thank you, Oscar. Pei Kao Young said. Put her through to my display here. Yes, sir. Nimue, Pei said as the familiar oval face with the sapphire blue eyes appeared on his display. Commodore, she replied. I'm sure you've heard by now. Indeed, we're preparing to execute Breakaway even now. I knew you would be. Your brother, the Admiral, asked me to tell you he'll be thinking about you. So will I. And I know you'll be thinking about us, too, sir. That's why I wanted to take this chance to tell you. She looked directly into his eyes. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve under you, sir. I regret nothing which has ever happened since you selected me for your staff. That means a great deal to me, Nimue, Pei said very softly. Like his brother, he was a traditionalist, and it was not the way of his culture to be emotionally demonstrative but he knew she saw the pain in his eyes. And may I also say, he added, that I am deeply grateful for all the many services you have performed. It sounded horribly stilted to his own ear, but it was the closest either of them dared come over a public comm circuit, especially since all message traffic was automatically recorded, and stilted or no, she understood what he meant, just as completely as he'd understood her. I'm glad, sir, she said, and please tell Shan Wei goodbye for me. Give her my love. Of course, and you already know you have hers, Pei said. And then, whatever his culture might have demanded, he cleared his throat hard, harshly. And mine, he said huskily. That means a lot, sir. Alban smiled almost gently at him. Goodbye, Commodore. God bless. The destroyers did succeed in pushing the scout ship back, not as far as they would have liked, but far enough to give Admiral Pei a distinct feeling of relief. General signal to all units, he said, never looking away from the master tactical display. Pass the order to execute breakaway. Aye, aye, sir, the senior flag bridge com reading replied, and a moment later the light codes on Pei's display flickered suddenly. Only for an instant, and only because his sensors were watching them so closely, or, he thought wryly, that's the theory anyway. Forty-six huge starships killed their hyperdrives and disappeared as they dropped instantly sublight. But in the very same instant that they did, forty-six other starships, which had been carefully hidden away in stealth, appeared just as quickly. It was a precisely coordinated maneuver which Pei's command had practiced over and over again in the simulators and more than a dozen times in actual space and they performed it this one last time flawlessly. The forty-six newcomers slid quickly and smoothly into the holes which had abruptly appeared in the formation, and their drives emissions signatures were almost perfect matches for those of the ships which had disappeared. That's going to be a nasty surprise for the Gababa, Pei told himself coldly, and one of these days is going to lead to an even bigger and nastier surprise for them. You know he said, turning away from the display to face Lieutenant Commander Alban and Captain Joseph Thiessen, his chief of staff. We came so close to kicking these people's asses. Another fifty years, seventy-five at the outside, and we could have taken them, star-spanning empire or no. I think that's probably a little over-optimistic, sir, Thiessen replied after a moment. We never did find out how big their empire actually is, you know. It wouldn't have mattered. Pei shook his head sharply. We're in a virtual dead heat with them technologically right now, Joe. Right now. And how old are their ships? Some of them are brand new, sir, Nimue Alban replied for the chief of staff. But I take your point, she continued, and even Tisa nodded almost unwillingly. Pei didn't press the argument. There was no reason to, not now. Although in some ways 
It would have been an enormous relief to tell someone besides Nimue what was really about to happen, but he couldn't do that to Tyson. The chief of staff was a good man, one who believed absolutely in the underlying premises of Operation Ark. Like every other man and woman under Pei's command, he was about to give his life to ensure that Operation Ark succeeded, and the admiral couldn't tell him that his own commanding officer was part of a plot against the people charged with making that success happen. Do you think we gave them enough of a shock that they may start actively innovating, sir? Tyson asked after a moment. Pei looked at him and raised one eyebrow, and the chief of staff shrugged with a crooked smile. I'd like to think we at least made the bastard sweat, sir. Oh, I think you can safely assume we did that, Pei replied with a humorless smile of his own. As to whether or not it will change them, I really don't know. The xenologist's best guess is that it won't. They've got a system and culture which have worked for them for at least eight or nine thousand years. We may have been a bigger bump in the road than they're accustomed to, but the formula worked in our case, too, in the end. They'll probably be a little nervous for a century or three, if only because they'll wonder if we got another colony away somewhere without their noticing. But then they'll settle back down. Until the next poor dumb suckers come stumbling into them, Tyson said bitterly. Until then, Pei agreed quietly and turned back to the display. Eight or nine thousand years, he thought. That's the xenologist's best guess, but I'll bet it's actually been longer than that. God, I wonder how long ago the first Gababa discovered fire. It was a question he'd pondered more than once over the four decades it had taken the Gababa Empire to destroy the human race. For two things, the Gababa definitely were not, were innovative or flexible. At first, the Gababa had clearly underestimated the challenge mankind posed. Their first few fleets had only outnumbered their intended victims three or four to one, and it had become quickly and painfully obvious that they couldn't match humanity's tactical flexibility. The first genocidal attack had punched inward past Crestwell to take out three of the Federation's fourteen major extrasolar star systems, with one hundred percent civilian casualties. But then the Federation Navy had rallied and stopped them cold, the fleet had even counterattacked and captured no less than six Gababa star systems, which was when the full Gababa fleet mobilized. Commander Pei Kao Jur had been a fire control officer aboard one of the Federation's ships of the line in the Starfall system when the real Gababa Navy appeared. He could still remember the displays, see the endless waves of scarlet icons, each representing a Gababa capital ship as they materialized out of hyper-like curses. It had been like driving a ground car into crimson snowflakes, except that no snow had ever sent such an ice-cold shudder through the marrow of his bones. He still didn't know how Admiral Thomas had gotten any of her fleet out. Most of Thomas' ships had died with her, covering the flight of a handful of survivors whose duty had been not to stand and share her death, but to live with the dreadful news. To flee frantically homeward, Arriving on the very wings of the storm to warn mankind, apocalypse was coming. Not that humanity had been taken totally unawares. The severity of the opening Gababa attack, even if it had been thrown back, had been a brutal wake-up call. Every Federation world had begun arming and fortifying when the first evidence of the Gababa's existence had appeared, ten years before Crestwell. After Crestwell, those preparations had been pressed at a frenetic pace, and a star system made an awesome fortress. The surviving fleet elements had fallen back on the fixed defenses, standing and fighting to the death and defense of humanity's worlds, and they'd made the Gababa pay a hideous price in dead and broken starships. But the Gababa had chosen to pay it. Not even the xenologists had been able to come up with a satisfactory explanation for why the Gababa flatly refused to even consider negotiations. They, or their translating computers at any rate, obviously comprehended standard English, since they'd clearly used captured data and documents, and the handful of broken, scarred human prisoners who'd been recovered from them had been interrogated with a casual, dispassionate brutality that was horrifying. So humanity had known communication with them was at least possible, 
yet they'd never responded to a single official communication attempt except to press their attacks harder. Personally, Pei wondered if they were actually still capable of a reasoned response at all. Some of the ships the Federation had captured or knocked out and been able to examine had been ancient almost beyond belief. At least one, according to the scientists who'd analyzed it, had been built at least two millennia before its capture. Yet there was no indication of any significant technological advance between the time of its construction and its final battle. Ships which, as Alban had suggested, were brand new construction, had mounted identical weapons, computers, hyperdrives, and sensor suites. That suggested a degree of cultural stagnation, which even Pei's ancestral China, at its most conservative rejection of the outside world, had never approached. One which made even ancient Egypt seem like a hotbed of innovation. It was impossible for Pei to conceive of any sentient beings who could go that long without any major advances. So perhaps the Gababa no longer were sentient in the human sense of the term. Perhaps everything, all of this, was simply the result of a set of cultural imperatives so deeply ingrained they'd become literally instinctual, none of which had saved the human race from destruction. It had taken time, of course. The Gababa had been forced to reduce humanity's redoubts one by one, in massive sieges which had taken literally years to conclude. The Federation Navy had been rebuilt behind the protection of the system fortifications, manned by new officers and ratings, many of whom, like Nimue Alban, had never known a life in which humanity's back was not against the wall. That Navy had struck back in desperate sallies and sorties, which had cost the Gababa dearly, but the final outcome had been inevitable. The Federation Assembly had tried sending out colony fleets, seeking to build hidden refuges, where some remnants of humanity might ride out the tempest. But however inflexible or unimaginative the Gababa might be, they'd obviously encountered that particular trick before, for they'd englobed each of the Federation's remaining star systems with scout ships. Escorting Navy task forces might attain a crushing local superiority, fight away through the scouts and the thinner shell of capital ships backing them up, but the scouts always seemed able to maintain contact or regain it quickly, and every effort to run the blockade had been hunted down. One colony fleet had slipped through the scouts, but only to transmit a last despairing hypercom message less than ten years later. It might have eluded the immediate shell of scout ships, but others had been sent out after it. It must have taken literally thousands of them to scour all of the possible destinations that colony fleet might have chosen, but eventually one of them had stumbled across it, and the killer fleets had followed. The colony administrator's best guess was that the colony's own emissions had led the Gababa to them, despite all of the colonists' efforts to limit those emissions. Pei suspected that long-dead administrator had been right. That, at any rate, was an underlying assumption of Operation Arc's planners. At least we managed to push their damned scout ship far enough back to give Breakaway a fighting chance of working, Thiessen observed. Pei nodded. The comment came under the heading of blindingly obvious, but he wasn't about to fault anyone for that at a moment like this. Besides, Joe probably meant it as a compliment, he thought, with something very like a mental chuckle. After all, Breakaway had been Pei's personal brainchild, the sleight of hand intended to convince the Gababa they'd successfully tracked down and totally destroyed mankind's last desperate colonization attempt. That was why the 46 dreadnoughts and carriers, which had accompanied the rest of his task force in stealth, had not fired a missile or launched a fighter during the fight to break through the shell of capital ships covering the Gababa scout globe around the Sol system. It had been a stiff engagement, although its outcome had never been in doubt. But by hiding under stealth, aided by the background emissions of heavy weapons fire and the dueling electronic warfare systems of the opposing forces, they had hopefully remained undetected and unsuspected by the Gababa. The sacrifice of two full destroyer squadrons who'd dropped behind to pick off the only scout ships close enough 
to actually hold the escaping colony fleet on sensors had allowed Pei to break free and run, and deep inside, he'd hoped they'd managed to stay away from the Gababa scouts. That despite all odds, all of his fleet might yet survive. But whatever he'd hoped, he'd never really expected it. And that was why those ships had stayed in stealth until this moment. When the Gababa Navy arrived, and it would, for all of their age, Gababa ships were still faster than human vessels, it would find exactly the same number of ships its scouts had reported fleeing Saul. Exactly the same number of ships its scouts had reported when they finally made contact with the fugitives once again. And when every one of those ships was destroyed, when every one of the humans crewing them had been killed, the Gababa would assume they'd destroyed all of those fugitives. But they'll be wrong, Pei Kao Jir told himself, softly, coldly. And one of these days, despite everything people like Langhorn and Bedar can do to stop it, we'll be back. And then, you bastards, you'll... Admiral, Nimue Alban said quietly, long-range sensors have picked up incoming hostiles. He turned and looked at her, and she met his eyes levelly. We have two positive contacts, sir, she told him. CIC makes the first one approximately 1,000 point sources. The second one is larger. Well, he observed almost whimsically. At least they cared enough to send the very best, didn't they? He looked at Tyson. Send the fleet to action stations, if you please, he said. Launch fighters and begin pre-positioning missiles for launch. September 7th, 2499. Lake Pei Enclave, Continent of Haven, Safehold. Grandfather, Grandfather, come quickly, it's an angel! Timothy Harrison looked up as his great-grandson thundered unceremoniously through the open door of his town hall office. The boy's behavior was atrocious, of course, but it was never easy to be angry with Matthew, and no one Timothy knew could stay angry with him, which meant, boys being boys, that young Matthew routinely got away with things which ought to have earned a beating at the very least. In this case, however, he might be excused for his excitement, Timothy supposed, not that he was prepared to admit it. Matthew Paul Harrison, he said sternly, this is my office, not the shower house down at the baseball field. At least a modicum of proper behavior is expected out of anyone here, even, or especially, out of a young hooligan like you. I'm sorry, the boy replied, hanging his head. But he simultaneously peeped up through his eyelashes and the dimples of the devastating smile which was going to get him into all sorts of trouble in another few years danced at the corners of his mouth. Well, Timothy harumphed, I suppose we can let it go without harping upon it this time. He had the satisfaction of noting what was probably a genuine quiver of trepidation at the qualifier, but then he leaned back in his chair. Now, what's this you were saying about an angel? The signal light, Matthew said eagerly, eyes lighting with bright excitement as he recalled his original reason for intruding upon his grandfather. The signal light just began shining. Father Michael said I should run and tell you about it immediately. There's an angel coming, grandfather. And what color was the signal light? Timothy asked. His voice was so completely calm that, without his realizing it, it raised him tremendously in his great-grandson's already high esteem. Yellow, Matthew replied, and Timothy nodded. One of the lesser angels, then. He felt a quick little stab of regret, for which he scolded himself instantly. It might be more exciting to hope to entertain a visit from one of the archangels themselves. But mortal men did well not to place commands upon God, even indirectly. Besides, even a lesser angel will be more than enough excitement for you, old man, he told himself scoldingly. Well, he said, nodding to his great-grandson, if an angel's coming to Lakeview, then we must make our preparations to receive him. Go down to the docks, Matthew. Find Jason, and tell him to raise the signal for all the fishing boats to return to harbor. As soon as you've done that, go home and tell your mother and grandmother. 
I'm sure Father Michael will be ringing the bell shortly, but you might as well go ahead and warn them. Yes, Grandfather. Matthew nodded eagerly, then turned and sped back the way he'd come. Timothy watched him go, smiling for a moment, then squared his shoulders and walked out of his office. Most of the town hall staff had paused in whatever they were doing. They were looking in his direction, and he smiled again, whimsically. I see you all heard Matthew's announcement, he said dryly. That being the case, I see no need to expand upon it further at this time. Finish whatever you were doing, file your work, and then hurry home to prepare yourselves. People nodded. Here and there, chairs scraped across the plank floor as clerks, who'd already anticipated his instructions, hurried to tuck files into the appropriate cabinets. Others bent over their desks, quill pens flying as they worked towards a reasonable stopping point. Timothy watched them for a few seconds, then continued out the town hall's front door. The town hall stood upon a hill at the center of the town of Lakeview. Lakeview was growing steadily, and Timothy was aware that it wouldn't be long before it slipped over that elusive line dividing town from small city. He wasn't certain how he felt about that, for a lot of reasons. But however he might feel about it, there was no doubt how God and the angels felt, and that made any purely personal reservations on his part meaningless. Word was spreading, he saw. People were hurrying along the cobblestone streets and sidewalks, heads bent in excited conversation with companions, or simply smiling hugely. The signal light on the steeple of Father Michael's church was deliberately placed to be visible by as much of the town as possible, and Timothy could see its bright amber glow from where he stood, despite the brightness of the summer sun. The bell in the church's high bell tower began to ring. Its deep, rolling voice sang through the summer air, crying out the joyous news for any who had not seen the signal light, and Timothy nodded around a bright, lilting bubble of happiness. Then he began walking towards the church himself, nodding calmly to the people he passed. He was, after all, Lakeview's mayor, which gave him a certain responsibility. More to the point, he was one of Lakeview's slowly but steadily declining number of Adams, just as his wife Sarah was one of the town's Eves. That left both of them with a special duty to maintain the proper air of dignified respect, adoration, and awe due one of the immortal servants of the god who had breathed the very breath of life into their nostrils. He reached the church and Father Michael was waiting for him. The priest was actually younger than Timothy, but he looked much older. Michael had been one of the very first of the children brought forth here upon safe hold in response to God's command to be fruitful and multiply. Timothy himself had not been born at all, of course. God had created his immortal soul with his own hand, and the Archangel Langhorn and his assistant, the Archangel Shan Wei, had created Timothy's physical body according to God's plan. Timothy had awakened right here in Lakeview, standing with the other Adams and Eves in the town square, and the mere memory of that first glorious morning, that first sight of Safehold's magnificent blue heavens, and the brilliant light of cow jur as it broke the eastern horizon like a dripping orb of molten copper, of the towering green trees, the fields already tilled and rich with the waiting harvest, the dark blue waters of Lake Pei, and the fishing boats tied up and waiting at the docks, still filled his soul with reverential awe. It was the first time he'd ever laid eyes upon his Sarah, for that matter, and that had been a miracle all its own. But that had been almost sixty-five years ago. Had he been as other men, men born of the union of man and woman, his body would have begun failing long since. Indeed, although he was four years older than Father Michael, the priest was stoop-shouldered and silver-haired, his fingers beginning to gnarl with age, while Timothy's hair remained dark and thick, untouched by white, although there were a few strands of silver threading their way into his beard here and there. Timothy remembered when Father Michael had been a red-faced, wailing babe in his mother's arms. Timothy himself had already been a man full-grown, a man in the prime of early manhood, as all Adams had been at the awakening, 
and being what he was, the direct work of divine hands, it was to be expected that his life would be longer than the lives of those further removed from the direct touch of the Godhead. But if Michael resented that in any way, Timothy had never seen a single sign of it. The priest was a humble man, ever mindful that to be permitted his priestly office was a direct and tangible sign of God's grace, that grace of which no man could ever truly be worthy, which did not absolve him from attempting to be. Rejoice, Timothy, the priest said now, eyes glowing under his thick white eyebrows. Rejoice, father, Timothy responded and went down on one knee briefly for Michael to lay a hand upon his head in blessing. May Langhorn bless and keep you always in God's ways and laws until the day awaited comes to us all, Michael murmured rapidly, then tapped Timothy lightly on the shoulder. Now get up, he commanded. You're the Adam here, Timothy. Tell me I shouldn't feel this nervous. You shouldn't feel this nervous, Timothy said obediently, rising to put one arm around his old friend's shoulders. Truly, he added in a more serious tone, You've done well, Michael. Your flock's been well tended since the last visitation, and it's increased steadily. Our flock, you mean? Father Michael replied. Timothy started to shake his head, then suppressed the gesture. It was kind of Michael to put it that way, but both of them knew that however conscientiously Timothy had sought to discharge his responsibilities as the administrator of Lakeview and the surrounding farms, all of his authority ultimately stemmed from the archangels, and through them from God himself, which meant that here in Lakeview, the ultimate authority in any matter, spiritual or worldly, lay with Father Michael, as the representative of Mother Church. But it's like him to put it that way, isn't it? Timothy thought with a smile. Come, he said aloud. From the pattern of the signal light, it won't be long now. We have preparations to make. Side 2 Off Armageddon Reef by David Weber Continuing on page 24 by the time the glowing nimbus of the Kiao Se He appeared far out over the blue waters of Lake Pei, all was ready. The entire population of Lakeview, aside from a few fishermen who'd been too far out on the enormous lake to see the signal to return, was assembled in and around the town square. The families from several of the nearer farms had arrived as well, and Lakeview Square was no longer remotely large enough to contain them all. They overflowed its bounds filling the approach street solidly, and Timothy Harrison felt a deep, satisfying surge of joy at the evidence that he and his fellow Adams and Eves had, indeed, been fruitful and multiplied. The Kiao say he sped nearer, faster than the fastest horse could gallop, faster than the fastest slash lizard could charge. The globe of light grew brighter and brighter as it swept closer to the town. At first it was only a brilliant speck, far out over the lake. Then it grew larger, brighter. It became a star, fallen from the vault of God's own heaven. Then, brighter still, a second sun, smaller than Cao Jir, but brilliant enough to challenge even its blinding brightness. And then, as it flashed across the last few miles, swift as any stooping wyvern, its brilliance totally surpassed that of any mere sun. It blazed above the town, without heat, and yet far too bright for any eye to bear, etching shadows with knife-edged sharpness despite the noonday sun. Timothy, like every other man and woman, bent his head, shielding his eyes against that blinding glory, and then the brilliance decreased as rapidly as it had come, and he raised his head slowly. The Kiao Se He was still above Lakeview, but it had risen so high into the heavens that it was once more a little brighter than Cao Jir. Still far too brilliant to look upon, yet far enough removed that merely mortal flesh could endure its presence. But if the Kiao Se He had withdrawn, the being whose chariot it was had not. All across the town square people went to their knees in reverence and awe, and Timothy did the same. His heart sang with joy as he beheld the angel standing on the raised platform at the very center of the square. That platform was reserved solely and only for moments like this. No mortal human foot could be permitted to profane its surface other than those of the consecrated priesthood 
responsible for ritually cleansing it and maintaining it in permanent readiness for moments like this. Timothy recognized the angel. It had been almost two years since the last visitation, and the angel hadn't changed since his last appearance in Lakeview. He did have the appearance of having aged, slightly at least, since the first time Timothy had ever seen him, immediately after the awakening. But then the writ said that although the angels and archangels were immortal, the bodies they had been given to teach and guide God's people were made of the same stuff as the mortal world. Animated by the Surgoi Kasai, the great fire, of God's own touch, those bodies would endure longer than any mortal body, just as the bodies of Adam's and Eve's would endure longer than those of their descendants. But they would age. Indeed, the day would ultimately come when all of the angels, even the archangels themselves, would be recalled to God's presence. Timothy knew God himself had ordained that, yet he was deeply grateful that he himself would have closed his eyes in death before that day arrived. A world no longer inhabited by angels would seem dark, shadowed, and drab to one who'd seen God's own messengers face to face in the glory of that world's very first days. In many ways, the angel looked little different from a mortal. He was no taller than Timothy himself, his shoulders no broader. Yet he was garbed from head to foot in brilliant, light-shimmering raiment, a marvelous garment of perpetually shifting and flowing colors, and his head was crowned by a crackling blue fire. At his waist he bore his staff, the rod of imperishable crystal half as long as a man's forearm. Timothy had seen that rod used. Only once, but its lightning bolt had smitten the charging slash lizard to the earth in a single cataclysmic thunderclap of sound. Half the slash lizard's body had been literally burned away, and Timothy's ears had rung for hours afterwards. The angel looked out across the reverently kneeling crowd for several seconds in silence. Then he raised his right hand. Peace be with you, my children, he said, his voice impossibly clear and loud yet not shouting, not raised. I bring you God's blessings and the blessing of the Archangel Langhorn, who is his servant, glory be to God, and to his servants, the response rumbled back, and the angel smiled. God is pleased with you, my children, he told them. And now, go about your business, all of you rejoicing in the Lord. I bring tidings to Father Michael and Mayor Timothy. After I have spoken with them, they will tell you what God desires of you. Timothy and Michael stood side by side, watching as the crowded square and surrounding streets emptied, quickly and yet without hurrying or pushing. Some of the farmers from outside town had ridden hard, or in some cases literally run for miles, to be here for the moment of the angel's arrival. Yet there was no resentment, no disappointment in being sent about their business once again so quickly. It had been their joyous duty to welcome God's messenger and they knew they had been blessed beyond the deserts of any fallible sinful mortal to have beheld the angel with their own eyes. The angel descended from the consecrated platform and crossed to Timothy and Michael. They went to one knee again before him, and he shook his head. No, my sons, he said gently. There will be time enough for that, for now we must speak. God and the archangel Langhorn are pleased with you, pleased with the way in which Lakeview has grown and prospered but you may be called to face new challenges, and the Archangel Langhorn has charged me to strengthen your spirits for the tasks to which you may be summoned. Come, let us go into the church, that we may speak in the proper setting. Pei Kao Yang sat in the comfortable chair, his face an expressionless mask, as he listened to the debate. The G6 son they had named Kao Jir in honor of his brother shone down outside. It was just past local noon, and the northern summer was hot, but a cool breeze off Lake Pei blew in through the open windows, and he grimaced mentally as it breathed gently across him. The bastards couldn't heap enough honors on us, could they? Named the local son after Kao Jir. The lake after him, too, I suppose, or maybe they meant to name it after both of us. Maybe even Shan Wei at the time. But that's as far as they're going to go. I wonder if Mission Control picked Langhorn and Bedar because the planners knew they were megalomaniacs. He tried to tell himself that that was only because of the weariness almost sixty standard years, almost sixty-five local years, of watching the two of them in operation had made inevitable. 
Unfortunately, he couldn't quite shake the thought that the people who'd selected Eric Langhorn as the colony's chief administrator and Dr. Adore Bedard as its chief psychologist had known exactly what they were doing. After all, the survival of the human race at any cost was far more important than any minor abridgments of basic human rights. And we implore you once again, the slender silver-haired woman standing in the center of the breezy hearing room said, to consider how vital it is that as the human culture on this planet grows and matures, it remembers the Gababa, that it understands why we came here, why we renounced advanced technology. Cao Young regarded her with stony brown eyes. She didn't even look in his direction, and he felt one or two of the counselors glancing at him with what they fondly imagined was hidden sympathy, or in some cases, concealed amusement. We've heard all of these arguments before, Dr. Pei, Eric Langhorn said. We understand the point you're raising, but I'm afraid that nothing you've said is likely to change our established policy. Administrator, Pei Shenwei said, your established policy overlooks the fact that mankind has always been a toolmaker and a problem solver. Eventually, those qualities are going to surface here on Safehold. When they do without an institutional memory of what happened to the Federation, our descendants aren't going to know about the dangers waiting for them out there. That particular concern is based on a faulty understanding of the societal matrix we are creating here, Dr. Pei. Adore Bedar said. I assure you, with the safeguards we've put in place, the inhabitants of Safehold will be safely insulated against the sort of technological advancement which might attract the Gababa's attention. Unless, of course, the psychiatrist's eyes narrowed, there's some outside stimulus to violate the parameters of our matrix. I don't doubt that you can, that you have already, created an anti-technology mindset on an individual and a societal level, Shanwei replied. Her own voice was level, but it didn't take someone with Beidao's psychological training to hear the distaste and personal antipathy under its surface. I simply believe that whatever you can accomplish right now, Whatever curbs and safeguards you can impose at this moment, 500 years from now or a thousand, there's going to come a moment when those safeguards fail. They won't, Bedar said flatly. Then she made herself sit back a bit from the table and smile. I realize psychology is in your field, doctor, and I also realize one of your doctorates is in history, because it is you are quite rightly aware of the frenetic pace at which technology has advanced in the modern era. Certainly on the basis of humanity's history on old earth, especially during the last five or six centuries, it would appear the innovation bug is hardwired into the human psyche. It isn't, however. There are examples from our own history of lengthy, very static periods. In particular, I draw your attention to the thousands of years of the Egyptian Empire, during which significant innovation basically didn't happen. What we've done here on Safe Hold is to recreate that same basic mindset, and we've also installed certain institutional and physical checks to maintain that mindset. The degree to which the Egyptians and the rest of the Mediterranean cultures were anti-innovation has been considerably overstated, Shanwei said coolly. Moreover, Egypt was only a tiny segment of the total world population of its day, and other parts of that total population most definitely were innovative. And despite the effort to impose a permanent theocratic curb on... Dr. Pei, Langhorn interrupted. I'm afraid this entire discussion is pointless. The colony's policy has been thoroughly debated and approved by the Administrative Council. It represents the consensus of that council and also that of myself as Chief Administrator and Dr. Baidar as Chief Psychologist. It will be adhered to by everyone. Is that clear? It must have been hard for Shen Wei not to even look in his direction, Cao Young thought, but she didn't. For fifty-seven years, the two of them had lived apart, divided by their bitter public disagreement over the colony's future. Cao Young was one of the moderates, the group that might not agree with everything Langhorn and Baidar had done, but which fervently supported the ban on anything which might lead to the reemergence of advanced technology. Cao Young himself had occasionally voiced concern over the degree to which Bedar had adjusted the originally proposed psych templates for the colonists. 
but he'd always supported Langhorne's basic reasons for modifying them, which was why he remained the colony's senior military officer, despite his estranged wife's position as the leader of the faction whose opponents had labeled them techies. With all due respect, Administrator Langhorne, Shanway said, I don't believe your policy does represent a true consensus. I was a member of the council myself, if you will recall, as were six of my colleagues on the present Alexandria board. All of us opposed your policy when you first proposed it. Which, Cao Young thought, split the vote eight to seven, too short of the supermajority you needed under the colonial charter to modify the templates, didn't it, Eric? Of course, you'd already gone ahead and done it, which left you with a teeny tiny problem. That's why Shen Wei and the others found themselves arbitrarily removed from the council, wasn't it? That's true, Langhorne said coldly. However, none of you are current members of the council, and the present council membership unanimously endorses this policy. And whatever other ancient history you might wish to bring up, I repeat that the policy will stand and it will be enforced throughout the entire colony which includes your so-called Alexandria Enclave. And if we choose not to abide by it? Shenway's voice was soft, but spine stiffened throughout the hearing room. Despite the decades of increasingly acrimonious debate, it was the first time any of the techies had publicly suggested the possibility of active resistance. That would be unwise of you, Langhorn said after a moment, glancing sidelong at Cao Young. To date, this has been simply a matter of public debate of policy issues. Now that the policy has been set, however, active non-compliance becomes treason. And I warn you, Dr. Pei, that when the stakes are the survival or extinction of the human race, we are prepared to take whatever measures seem necessary to suppress treason. I see. Pei Shanwei's head turned as she slowly swept all of the seated counselors with icy brown eyes so dark they were almost black. They looked even darker today, Cao Young thought, and her expression was bleak. I'll report the outcome of this meeting to the rest of the board, Administrator, she said finally, her voice an icicle. I'll also inform them that we are required to comply with your official policy under threat of physical coercion. I'm sure the board will have a response for you as soon as possible. She turned and walked out of the hearing room without a single backward glance. Pei Kao Young sat in another chair, this one on a dock extending into the enormous dark blue waters of Lake Pei. A fishing pole had been set into the holding bracket beside his chair, but there was no bait on the hook. It was simply a convenient prop to help keep people away. We knew it could come to this or something like it, he told himself. Kao Jir, Shan Wei, Nim Wei, Mi, Proctor. We all knew from the moment Langhorn was chosen instead of Halverson. And now it has. There were times when, anti jerome treatments or not, he felt every single day of his hundred and ninety standard years. He tipped farther back in his chair, looking up through the darkening blue of approaching evening, and saw the slowly moving silver star of the orbiting starship. TFNS Hamilcar, the final surviving unit of the 46 mammoth ships which had delivered the colony to Cao Jir. The gargantuan task of transporting millions of colonists to a new home world would have been impossible without the massive employment of advanced technologies. That had been a given, and yet it had almost certainly been the betraying emissions of that same technology which had led to the discovery and destruction of the only other colony fleet to break through the Gababa blockade. So Operation Ark's planners had done two things differently. First, Operation Ark's mission plan had required the colony fleet to remain in hyper for a minimum of ten years before even beginning to search for a new homeworld. That had carried it literally thousands of light years from the Federation far enough that it should take even the Gababa scouting fleet centuries to sweep the thicket of stars in which it had lost itself. Second, the colony had been provided with not one but two complete terraforming fleets. One had been detached and assigned to the preparation of safehold, while the other remained in close company with the transports, 
hiding far from Cowger as a backup. If the Gababa had detected the ships actually laboring upon Seifold, they would undoubtedly have been destroyed, but their destruction would not have led the Gababa to the rest of the fleet, which would then have voyaged onward for another ten years on a totally random vector before once more searching for a new home. Hamilcar had been with that hidden fleet, the flagship of Operation Ark's civilian administration, and she'd been retained this long because the basic plan for Operation Ark had always envisioned a requirement for at least some technological presence until the colony was fully established. The enormous transport, half again the size of the Federation's largest dreadnought, was at minimal power levels, with every one of her multiply redundant stealth systems operating at all times. A Gababa scout ship could have been in orbit with her without detecting her unless it closed to within two or three hundred kilometers. Even so, and despite her enormous value as administrative center, orbiting observatory, and emergency industrial module, her time was running out. That was what had prompted the confrontation between Shanway and Langhorn and Baydar this afternoon. The Safehold colonial enclaves had been up and running for almost sixty standard years, and Langhorn and his council had decided it was finally time to dispose of all the expedition's remaining technology, or almost all of it at any rate. Hamilcar's sister ships were already long gone. They'd been discarded as quickly as possible by the simple expedient of dropping them into the star system's central fusion furnace once their cargoes had been landed. Not that those cargoes had been used exactly as Mission Control had originally envisioned, thanks to Bedar's modifications to the Psyche templates. A deep fundamental part of Pei Kao Young had felt a shudder of dismay when Mission Control first briefed him and his brother on everything involved in Operation Ark. Not even the fact that every one of the cryogenically suspended colonists had been a fully informed volunteer, had been enough to overcome his historical memory of his own ancestors' efforts at thought control. And yet he'd been forced to concede that there was an element of logic behind the decision to implant every colonist with what amounted to the detailed memory of a completely false life. It almost certainly would have proved impossible to convince eight million citizens of a highly developed technological civilization to renounce all advanced technology when it came down to it. No matter how willing they all were before they set out for their new home, no matter how fit, young, and physically vigorous they might be, the reality of a muscle-powered culture's harsh demands would have convinced at least some of them to change their minds. So Mission Control had decided to preclude that possibility by providing them with memories which no longer included advanced technology. It hadn't been an easy task, even for the Federation's tech base. But however much Cao Young might despise Adore Vedar, he had to admit the woman's technical brilliance. The colonists had been stacked like cordwood in their cryo capsules, as many as half a million of them aboard a single ship in the case of really large transports, like Hamilcar, and they'd spent the entire ten-year voyage with their minds being steadily reprogrammed. Then they'd stayed in cryo for another eight standard years, safely tucked away in hiding, while the far less numerous active mission team personnel located their new home world, and the Alpha terraforming crew prepared it for them. The world they'd named Safehold was a bit smaller than Old Earth. Cow Jur was considerably cooler than Sol. And although Safehold orbited closer to it, the planet had a noticeably lower average temperature than Old Earth. Its axial tilt was a bit more pronounced as well, which gave it somewhat greater seasonal shifts as a result. It also had a higher proportion of land area, but that land was broken up into numerous smallish, mountainous, continents and large islands, and that helped to moderate the planetary climate at least a little. Despite its marginally smaller size, Seifold was also a bit more dense than mankind's original homeworld. As a result, its gravity was very nearly the same as the one in which the human race had initially evolved. Its days were longer, but its years were shorter, only a bit more than 301 local days each, and the colonists had divided it into only ten months 
each of six five-day weeks. The local calendar still felt odd to Cao Young. He supposed it made sense, but he missed January and December, damn it. And he'd had more trouble than he expected adjusting to the long days. But overall, it was one of the more pleasant planets mankind had settled upon. Despite all of its positive points, there'd been a few drawbacks, of course. There always were. In this case, the native predators, especially the aquatic ones, presented exceptional challenges. The ecosystem in general had proved rather less accommodating than usual to the necessary terrestrial plant and animal strains required to fit the planet for human habitation. Fortunately, among the units assigned to each terraforming task group, Mission Control had included a highly capable bio-support ship whose geneticists were able to make the necessary alterations to adapt terrestrial life to safehold. Despite that, those terrestrial life forms remained interlopers. The genetic modifications had helped, but they couldn't completely cure the problem, and for the first few years, the success of safehold terraforming had hung in the balance. That had been when Langhorn and Baydar needed Shan Wei, Cao Young thought bitterly. She'd headed the terraforming teams, and it was her leadership which had carried the task through to success. She and her people, watched over by Cao Young's flagship, TFNS Gulliver, had battled the planet into submission, while most of the colony fleet had waited motionless, holding station in the depths of interstellar space, light years from the nearest star. Those had been heady days, Cao Young admitted to himself, days when he'd felt he and Shan Wei and their crews were genuinely forging ahead. Although that confidence had been shadowed by the constant fear that a Gababa scout ship might happen by while they hung in orbit around the planet. They'd known the odds were overwhelmingly in their favor, yet they'd been too agonizingly aware of the stakes for which they played to take any comfort from odds, despite all the precautions mission planning had built in. But they'd still had that sense of purpose, of resting survival from the jaws of destruction, and he remembered their huge sense of triumph on the day they realized they'd finally turned the corner and sent word to Hamilcar that Safehold was ready for its new inhabitants. And that was the point at which they'd discovered how Vedar had modified the sleeping colonists' psychological templates. No doubt she'd thought it was a vast improvement when Langhorn initially suggested it, but Cao Young and Shan Wei had been horrified. The sleeping colonists had volunteered to have false memories of a false life implanted. They hadn't volunteered to be programmed to believe Operation Ark's command staff were gods. It wasn't the only change Langhorn had made, of course. He and Vedar had done their systematic best to preclude the possibility of any re-emergence of advanced technology on Safehold. They deliberately abandoned the metric system, which Cao Young suspected had represented a personal prejudice on Langhorn's part. But they'd also eliminated any memory of Arabic numerals or algebra in a move calculated to emasculate any development of advanced mathematics just as they had eliminated any reference to the scientific method and reinstituted a Ptolemaic theory of the universe. They'd systematically destroyed the tools of scientific inquiry, then concocted their religion as a means of ensuring that it never re-emerged once more, and nothing could have been better calculated to outrage someone with Shan Wei's passionate belief in freedom of the individual and of thought. Unfortunately, it had been too late to do anything about it, Shan Wei and her allies on the Administrative Council had tried, but they'd quickly discovered that Langhorn was prepared for their resistance. He'd organized his own clique, with judicious transfers and replacements among the main fleet's command personnel, while Shan Wei and Cao Young were safely out of the way, and those changes had been enough to defeat Shan Wei's best efforts. Which was why Cao Young and Shan Wei had had their very public falling out, it had been the only way they could think of to organize some sort of open resistance to Langhorn's policies, while simultaneously retaining a presence in the heart of the colony's official command structure. Shanway's reputation, her leadership of the minority bloc on the administrative council, would have made it impossible for anyone to believe she supported the administrator. 
until their roles had been established for them, and they'd drifted further and further apart, settled into deeper and deeper estrangement. And all for nothing in the end. He'd given up the woman he loved. Both of them had given up the children they might yet have reared, sacrificed fifty-seven years of their lives to a public pretense of anger and violent disagreement for nothing. Shanway and the other techies, just under thirty percent of the original Operation Arc Command crew, had retired to Safehold's southernmost continent. They'd built their own enclave, their Alexandria enclave, taking the name deliberately from the famous library at Alexandria and rigorously adhered to the original mission orders where technology was concerned. And even more unforgivably, from the perspective of Langhorn and Vedar's new plans, they'd refused to destroy their libraries. They'd insisted on preserving the true history of the human race and especially of the war against the Gababa. That's what really sticks in your craw, isn't it, Yarrick? Kao Young thought. You know there's no risk of the Gababa detecting the sort of pre-electric technology Shan Wei still has up and running at Alexandria. Hell, any one of the air cars you're still willing to allow your command staff personnel to use as their angelic chariots radiates a bigger, stronger signal than everything at Alexandria combined. You may say that any indigenous technology, even the memory of that sort of tech, represents the threat of touching off more advanced, more readily detectable development. But that's not what really bothers you. You've decided you like being a god, so you can't tolerate any heretical scripture, can you? Cao Young didn't know how Langhorn would respond to Shan Wei's threat of open defiance. Despite his own position as Safehold's military commander, he knew he wasn't completely trusted by the administrator and the sycophants on Langhorn's administrative council. He wasn't one of them, despite his long-standing estrangement from Shan Wei, and too many of them seemed to have come to believe they truly were the deities Vedar had programmed the colonists to think they were. And people who think their gods aren't likely to exercise a lot of restraint when someone defies them, he thought. Pei Kao Young watched Hamilcar's distant gleaming dot sweep towards the horizon, and tried not to shiver as the evening breeze grew cooler. Father, father, Timothy Harrison muttered something from the borderland of sleep, and the hand on his shoulder shook him again harder. Wake up, father. Timothy's eyes opened and he blinked. His third-born son, Robert, Matthew's grandfather, stood leaning over the bed with a candle burning in one hand. For a moment Timothy was only bewildered, but then Robert's shadowed expression registered, despite the strange lighting falling across it from below as the candle quivered in his hand. What is it? Timothy asked, sitting up in bed. Beside him, Sarah stirred, then opened her own eyes and sat up. He felt her welcome, beloved presence warm against his shoulder, and his right hand reached out, finding and clasping hers as if by instinct. I don't know, father, Robert said worriedly and in that moment Timothy was once again reminded that his son looked far older than he himself did. All I know, Robert continued, is that a messenger has arrived from Father Michael. He says you're needed at the church immediately. Timothy's eyes narrowed. He turned and looked at Sarah for a moment, and she gazed back. Then she shook her head and reached out with her free hand to touch his cheek gently. He smiled at her as calmly as he could though she was undoubtedly the last person in the world he could really hope to fool, then looked back at Robert. Is the messenger still here? Yes, father. Does he know why Michael needs me? He says he doesn't, father, and I don't think it was just a way to tell me to mind my own business. In that case, ask him to return immediately. Ask him to tell father Michael I'll be there just as quickly as I can get dressed. At once, father, Robert said not even attempting to hide his relief as his father took charge. Michael? Timothy paused just inside the church doors. The church, as always, was softly illuminated by the red glow of the presence lights. The magnificent mosaic of ceramic tiles and semi-precious stones, which formed the wall behind the high altar, was more brightly illuminated by the cut crystal lamps, 
which were kept filled with only the purest oil from fresh water crocken. The huge lordly faces of the Archangel Langhorn and the Archangel Vedar gazed out from the mosaic, their noble eyes watching Timothy as he stood inside the doors. The weight of those eyes always made Timothy aware of his own mortality, his own fallibility before the divinity of God's chosen servants. Usually it also filled him with reassurance, the renewed faith that God's purpose in creating Safehold as a refuge and a home for mankind must succeed in the end. But tonight, for some reason, he felt a chill instead. No doubt, it was simply the unprecedented nature of Michael's summons, but it almost seemed as if shadows moved across the archangel's faces, despite the unwavering flames of the lights. Timothy, Father Michael's voice pulled Timothy away from that disturbing thought, and he looked up as Michael appeared in a side door just off the sanctuary. What's all this about, Michael? Timothy asked. He paused to genuflect before the mosaic, then rose, touching the fingers of his right hand to his heart and then to his lips, and strode down the central aisle. He knew he'd sounded sharp, abrupt, and he tried to smooth his own voice. But the irregularity, especially so soon after the visitation, had him on edge and anxious. I'm sorry to have summoned you this way, Father Michael said, but I had no choice. I have terrible news, terrible news. He shook his head. The worst news I could possibly imagine. Timothy's heart seemed to stop for just an instant as the horror in Michael's voice registered. He froze in mid-stride, then made himself continue towards the priest. What sort of news, Michael? he asked, much more gently. Come. It was all the priest said, and he stepped back through the door. It led to the sacristy, Timothy realized as he followed. But Michael continued through another door on the sacristy's far side. A narrow flight of stairs led upward, and the priest didn't even pause for a candle or a taper as he led Timothy up them. The stairs wound upward, and Timothy quickly recognized them, although it was over forty years since he'd last climbed them himself. They led up the tall rectangular bell tower to the huge bronze bells perched under the pointed steeple at the very top. Timothy was panting by the time they reached the top, and Michael was literally stumbling with exhaustion from the pace he'd set. But he still didn't speak, nor did he pause. He only put his shoulder under the trap door, heaped it up, and clambered through it. A strange, dim radiance spilled down through the opened trap door, and Timothy hesitated for just a moment. Then he steeled his nerve, reached for his faith. He followed his friend and priest through the trap door, and the radiance strengthened as the one who had awaited them turned towards him, and the power of his presence reached out. Peace be with you, my son, the angel said. Fifteen minutes later, Timothy Harrison found himself staring at an angel with the one expression he had never expected to show one of God's servants. One of horror. And so, my children, the angel said, his own expression grave, although I warned you only days before that new challenges might await you, not even I expected this. He shook his head sorrowfully, and yet, if it would not have been impious, Timothy would have called the angel's expression as much worried as grave. Perhaps it is, the mayor thought, and why shouldn't it be? Not even angels, not even archangels, are God themselves. And to have something like this happen. It is a sad and a terrible duty to bring you this word, these commands, the angel said sadly. When God created Safehold for your home, the place for you to learn to know him and to serve his will, it was our duty to keep it safe from evil. And now we've failed. It is not your fault, but ours, and we shall do all in our power to amend it. Yet it is possible the struggle will be severe. In the end we must triumph, for it is we who remain loyal to God's will, and he will not suffer his champions to fail. But a price may yet be demanded of us for our failure. But that's not... Timothy began and closed his mouth firmly as the angel looked at him with a small smile. Not fair, my son, he said gently. Timothy stared at him, unable to speak again, and the angel shook his head. 
the archangel Shanwei has fallen, my sons, and we did not keep the watch we ought to have kept. Her actions should not have taken us by surprise, but they have, for we trusted her as one of our own. She was one of our own, but now she has betrayed us as she has betrayed herself. She has turned to the darkness, brought evil into God's world through her own vaunting ambition, blind in her madness to the sure and certain knowledge that no one, not even an archangel, may set his will against gods and triumph. Maddened by her taste for power, no longer content to serve, she demanded the power to rule, to remake this world as she would have it, and not as God's plan decrees. And when the archangel Langhorn refused her demands and rebuffed her mad ambition, she raised impious war against him. Many lesser angels and even some other archangels, seduced to her banner, gathered with her, and not content to damn their own souls, they beguiled and misled many of their mortal flock to follow in their own sinful path. But, but what shall we do? Father Michael asked in a voice which scarcely even quavered, Timothy noted. But was that because the priest had found his courage once again, or because the enormity of the sin the angel had described was simply too vast for him to fully take in? You must be prepared to weather days of darkness, my son, the angel said. The sorrow that she who was one of the brightest among us should have fallen so low will be a hard thing for your flock to understand. There may be those among that flock who require reassurance, but you must also be vigilant. Some even among your own may have been secretly seduced by Shan Wei's minions, and they must be guarded against. It is even possible that other angels may come here, claiming visitation in Langhorn's name when in fact they serve Shan Wei. Forgive me, Timothy said humbly, but we're only mortals. How shall we know who an angel truly serves? That is a just question, my son the angel said, his expression troubled. And in honesty, I do not know if it will be possible for you to tell. I am charged by the archangel Langhorn, however, to tell you that if you question the instructions you are given by any angel in his name, he will forgive you if you hesitate to obey them until you have requested their confirmation from me, who you know serves his will and God's still. And... The angel's expression heartened into one of anger and determination, almost hatred, such as Timothy had never expected to see upon it. There will not be many such angels. The archangel Langhorn's wrath has already been loosed, with God's holy fire behind it, and no servant of darkness can stand against the light. There is war in safe hold, my children, and until it is resolved, you must... The angel stopped speaking abruptly, and Timothy and Father Michael wheeled towards the open side of the belfry as a brilliant blinding light flashed upon the northern horizon. It was far away, possibly all the way on the far shore of the enormous lake, but despite the vast distance, it was also incredibly bright. It split the darkness, reflecting across the lake's waters as if they were a mirror, and as it blazed, it rose higher and higher like some flaming mushroom rising against the night. The angel stared at it, and it was probably just as well that neither Timothy nor the priest could tear his own eyes away from that glaring beacon to see the shock and horror in the angel's expression. But then, as the column of distant flame reached its maximum height and began slowly, slowly to dim, the angel found his voice once more. My children, he said, and if the words weren't quite steady, neither of the two mortals with him was in any shape to notice it. I must go. The war of which I spoke has come closer than I, than we expected. The Archangel Langhorn needs all of us, and I go to join him in battle. Remember what I have told you, and be vigilant. He looked at them one more time, then stepped through the belfry opening. Any mortal would have plunged to the ground, undoubtedly shattering his body in the process. But the angel did not. Instead, he rose quickly, silently, into the blackness, and Timothy summoned the courage to lean out and look up after him. 
A brilliant dot blossomed far above as he looked, and he realized that the angels, Kiao Se He, had lifted him up. Timothy. Michael's voice was soft, almost tiny, and he looked imploringly at the mayor, then back to the distant glare, still fading on the horizon. I don't know, Michael, Timothy said quietly. He turned back to the priest and put his arm about him. All we can do is place our faith in God and the archangels. That much I understand. But after that? He shook his head slowly. After that, I just don't know. October 1st, 3249. The Mountains of Light, Safehold. She woke up, which was odd because she didn't remember going to sleep. Sapphire eyes opened, then narrowed, as she saw the curve of a glass smooth stone ceiling above her. She lay on her back on a table of some sort, her hands folded across her chest, and she'd never seen this room before in her life. She tried to sit up, and the narrowed eyes flared wide when she discovered she couldn't. Her body was totally non-responsive, and something very like panic frothed up inside her. And then abruptly she noticed the tiny digital ten-day clock floating in one corner of her vision. Hello, Nimue, a familiar voice said, and she discovered she could at least move her head. She rolled it sideways and recognized the holographic image standing beside her. Pei Kao Young looked much older. He wore casual civilian clothing, not his uniform. His face was grooved with lines of age, labor, and grief, and his eyes were sad. I'm sorrier than I can ever say to be leaving this message for you, his image said, and I know this is all coming at you cold. I'm sorry about that, too, but there was no way to avoid it. And for whatever it's worth, you volunteered, in a manner of speaking, at least. His lips quirked in an almost smile, and his image sat down in a chair which suddenly materialized in the hologram's field. I'm getting a little old, even with anti geron or standing around during lengthy explanations, he told her, and I'm afraid this one's going to be lengthier than most. I'm also afraid you'll find you won't be able to move until I've finished it. I apologize for that, too, but it's imperative that you stay put until you've heard me completely out. You must fully understand the situation before you make any decisions or take any action. She watched his expression, her thoughts whirling, and she wasn't surprised to discover she wasn't breathing. The digital display had already warned her about that. As I'm sure you've already deduced, you aren't really here, Commodore Pay's recorded message told her. Or rather, your biological body isn't. The fact that you were the only member of what I suppose you'd have to call our conspiracy with a last-generation Pika, was what made you the only practical choice for this particular mission. If she'd been breathing, she might have inhaled in surprise. But she wasn't, because, as Pei had just said, she wasn't actually alive. She was a Pika, a personality-integrated cybernetic avatar, and a grimly amused little corner of her mind, if, of course, she could be said to actually have a mind, reflected, she was a top-of-the-line Pika at that, a gift from Nimue Alban's unreasonably wealthy father. I know you won't recall any of what I'm about to tell you, the Commodore continued. You hadn't realized there'd be any reason to download a current personality record until just before we went aboard ship, and we didn't have time to record a new one before you transferred to Excalibur. For that matter, we couldn't risk having anyone wonder why you'd done it even if there'd been time. Her eyes, the finest artificial eyes the Federation's technology could build, faithfully mimicking the auto-responses of the human wetware they'd been built to emulate, narrowed once again. For most people, Pikas had been simply enormously expensive toys since they were first developed, almost a century before Crestwell's world which was precisely how David Alban had seen his gift to his daughter. 
For others, those with serious mobility problems not even modern medicine could correct, they'd been something like the ultimate in prosthetics. For all intents and purposes, a Pika was a highly advanced robotic vehicle, specifically designed to allow human beings to do dangerous things, including extreme sports activities, without actually physically endangering themselves in the process. First-generation Pikas had been obvious machines, about as aesthetically advanced as one of the utilitarian, tentacle-limbed, floating oil drums on counter-grav surface bots used by sanitation departments throughout the Federation. But second- and third-generation versions had been progressively improved until they became fully articulated, full-sensory interface, virtual doppelgangers of their original human models. Form followed function after all, and their entire purpose was to allow those human models to actually experience exactly what they would have experienced doing the same things in the flesh. To which end, Pika's muscles were constructed of advanced composites, enormously powerful, but exactly duplicating the natural human musculature. Their skeletal structure duplicated the human skeleton, but again, was many times stronger, and their hollow bones were used for molecular circuitry and power transmission. And a final generation, Pika's Molycirc brain, located about where a flesh-and-blood human would have kept his liver, was almost half the size of the original protoplasmic model. It had to be that large, for although Apica's nerve impulses moved literally at light speed, somewhere around a hundred times as fast as the chemically transmitted impulses of the human body, matching the interconnectivity of the human brain required the equivalent of a data bus literally trillions of bits wide. A pika could be directly neurally linked to the individual for whom it had been built, but the sheer bandwidth required limited the linkage to relatively short ranges, and any pika was also hardwired to prevent any other individual from ever linking with it. That was a specific legal requirement designed to guarantee that no one else could ever operate it, since the individual operating a pika was legally responsible for any actions committed by that pika. Eventually, advances in cybernetics had finally reached the level of approximating the human brain's capabilities. They didn't do it exactly the same way, of course. Despite all the advances, no computer yet designed could fully match the brain's interconnections. Providing the memory storage of a human brain had been no great challenge for molecular circuitry. Providing the necessary thinking ability had required the development of energy state CPUs so that sheer computational and processing speed had finally been able to compensate. A pika's brain might be designed around completely different constraints, but the end results were effectively indistinguishable from the original human model, even from the inside. That capability had made the remote operation of a pika possible at last. A last-generation Pika's owner could actually load a complete electronic analog of his personality and memories – simple data storage had never been a problem after all – into the Pika in order to take it into potentially dangerous environments outside the direct neural linkage's limited transmission range. The analog could operate the Pika without worrying about risk to the owner's physical body and when the Pika returned, its memories and experiences could be uploaded to the owner as his own memories. There'd been some concern when that capability came along about possible rogue Pikas running amok under personality analogs which declined to be erased. Personally, Nimue had always felt those concerns had been no more than the lingering paranoia of what an ancient writer had labeled the Frankenstein complex. The public opinion had been adamant, which was why the law required that any downloaded personality would be automatically erased within an absolute maximum of 240 hours from the moment of the host PICA's activation under an analog's control. The last personality recording you downloaded was made when you were still planning that hang gliding expedition in the Andes, Commodore Pay's holograph reminded her. But you never had time for the trip because, as part of my staff, 
you were tapped for something called Operation Arc. For you to understand why we're having this conversation, I need to explain to you just what Operation Arc was and why you, Cao Zhe, Shan Wei, and I set out to sabotage it. Her eyes, and despite everything, she couldn't help thinking of them as her eyes, widened, and he chuckled without any humor at all. Basically, he began, the concept was... So, Pei Kao Young told her a good hour later, from the moment we found out Langhorn had been chosen over Franz Halverson to command the expedition, we knew there was going to be a lot of pressure to dig the deepest possible hole, crawl into it, and fill it in behind us. Langhorn was one of the we brought this down on ourselves through our own technological arrogance types, and, at the very least, he was going to apply the most stringent possible standard to the elimination of technology. In fact, it seemed likely to us that he'd try to build a primitive society that would be a total break with anything which had come before, that he might decide to wipe out all record that there had ever been a technologically advanced human society, in which case, of course, all memory, or at least all accurate memory, of the Gababa would have to be eliminated as well. He couldn't very well explain we'd encountered them once we attained interstellar fight without explaining how we'd done that, after all. None of us could question the necessity of going bush to evade detection, at least in the short term, yet where Langhorn was determined to prevent any new confrontation with the Gababa, we felt that one was effectively inevitable. Someday, despite any effort to preclude the development of a high-tech civilization, the descendants of our new colony's inhabitants would start over again on the same road, which had taken us to the stars and our meeting with them. He shook his head sadly. In light of that, we began considering very quietly ways to prevent those distant descendants of ours from walking straight back into the same situation we were in. The only solution we could see was to ensure that the memory of the Gababa wasn't lost after all that our descendants would know they had to stay home without attracting attention in their single star system until they'd reached a level of technology which would let them defeat the Gababa. The fact that the Gababa have been around for so long was what suggested they'd still be a threat when mankind ventured back into space, but the fact that they've been around so long without any significant advances also suggested that the level of threat probably wouldn't be much higher than it was today. So if there was some way for our descendants to know what level of technological capability they required to survive against the Gababa, they would also know when it ought to be safe, or relatively safe, for them to move back into interstellar flight. One way to do that would be to maintain a pre-electric level of technology on our new home for at least the next three or four centuries, avoiding any betraying emissions while preserving the records of our earlier history and the history of our war with the Kababa, assuming we could convince Langhorn or at least a majority of the administrative council to go along with us, we would also place two or three of the expedition's ships in completely powered down orbits somewhere in our destination star system, where they'd be only a handful of additional asteroids without any active emissions impossible to detect or differentiate from any other hunk of rock without direct physical examination, but available for recovery once indigenous spaceflight was redeveloped. They would serve as an enormous bootstrap for technological advancement, and they'd also provide a yardstick by which to evaluate the relative capabilities of later further developments. His holographic face grimaced, his eyes bitter. That was essentially what the original mission plan for Operation Arc called for, and if Halverson had been in command, it's what would have been done. But frankly, with Langhorn in command, we never gave it more than a 40% chance of happening, although it would obviously have been the best scenario. But because the odds of achieving it were so poor, we looked for a second option. We looked hard, but we couldn't find one. Not until we were all sitting around after dinner on the very evening before our departure, when you and Elias Proctor came up with the idea which led to this conversation. 
You were the one who pointed out that the same technology which had gone into building the Pikas could have been used to build an effectively immortal advisor for the colony. An advisor who actually remembered everything which ought to have been in the records we were all afraid Langhorn wouldn't want preserved and who could have guided or at least influenced the new colony's development through its most dangerous stages. Unfortunately, there was no time to implement that idea. Even if there had been any way Operation Ox planners would have signed off on any such notion. And even if the mission planners had agreed to it, someone like Langhorn would almost certainly order the advisor's destruction once he was out on his own. But Elias was very struck by your observation, and he pointed out, in turn, that the only thing preventing an existing off the shelf Pika from being used to fulfill the same role were the protocols limiting PICAs to no more than 10 days of independent operation. But those protocols were all in the software. He was relatively certain he could hack around them and deactivate them, and a single PICA, especially one with its power completely down, would be relatively easy to conceal, not just from the Kababa, but from Langhorn. The pika on the table, which had decided she might as well continue to think of herself as the young woman named Nimue Alban, whose memories she possessed, would have nodded if she could have moved her head. Dr. Elias Proctor had been the most brilliant cyberneticist Nimue had ever known. If anyone could hack a pika software, he could. Of course, trying to would have been a felony under Federation law, punishable by a minimum of fifteen years in prison. Unfortunately, Pei Kao Young's expression turned sad once again. The only last generation Pika belonging to anyone we knew we could trust was yours, and there wasn't time to acquire another, certainly not without making Mission Control wonder what in the world we wanted it for. In fact, you were the one who pointed that out to us. So I signed off on a last-minute cargo adjustment that included your Pika in your personal baggage allotment on the basis that it might prove useful for hostile environment work somewhere along the line. And then, after all our personnel and cargo had been embarked, you volunteered to transfer to Cow Jer's staff aboard Excalibur. Nimue's eyes went very still, and he nodded slowly as if he could see them. That's right, you volunteered for service on the flagship, knowing it would be destroyed if Operation Breakaway worked. And when you were transferred to Excalibur, the official manifest on your gear included everything you'd brought aboard Gulliver, including your Pika. But you didn't actually take it with you, and I personally transferred it to a cargo hold where it could be permanently lost. It was the only way to drop it completely off all of the detailed equipment lists in Langhorn's computers. His image seemed to look straight into her eyes for several seconds. Then he drew a deep breath. It wasn't easy to let you go, he said softly. You were so young with so much still to contribute. But no one could come up with a counter scenario that offered us as good a chance of success. If you hadn't been gone before we reached safe hold, the master manifests would have shown you still holding the pika. You would have been forced to turn it over to Langhorn for destruction. And if you'd announced you'd lost it somehow, Instead, all sorts of alarms would have gone off, especially given how late in the process it was added to your allotment. So, in the end, we really had no choice. Yet, to be perfectly honest, despite the fact that you'd chosen to deliberately sacrifice your life to give us this option, we all hoped we'd never actually need it. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we do. He settled back in his chair, his face hard, set with an expression she'd seen before as Gababa warships appeared on his tactical display. Langhorn and Beda have turned out to be not just fanatics, but megalomaniacs. I've left a complete file for you with all the details. I don't have the heart to recite them all for you now. But the short version is that it turns out Langhorn and his inner clique never trusted me quite as completely as I thought they had. They deployed a complete orbital kinetic strike system without ever telling me, as their senior military officer, a thing about it. I never knew it was there, couldn't take any steps to neutralize it. 
And when Shan Wei and her supporters resisted their efforts to turn themselves into gods, they used it. They killed her, Nim Wei, her and all of the people trying to openly maintain any memory of our true history. Apika had no heart, not in any physical sense, but the heart Nim Wei all but no longer possessed twisted in anguish, and he cleared his throat, then shook his head hard. To be honest, I thought about waking you up, having this conversation with you in person, but I was afraid to. I'd lived a long time now, Nim Wei, but you're still young. I didn't want to tell you about Shan Wei, for a lot of reasons, really, including the fact that I know how much you loved her, and I was too cowardly to face your pain, but also because I know you. You wouldn't have been willing to go back to sleep until you'd personally done something about her murder, and I can't afford to lose you, not now, not for a lot of reasons. Besides, you'd probably try to argue with me about my own plans, and when you come right down to it, no time will pass for you between now and when you actually see this message, will it? His bittersweet smile was crooked, but when he spoke again his voice was brisker, almost normal sounding. We did our best to give you at least some of the tools you'll need if you decide, if you decide, as the person you are now, not the Nimue Alban, who originally volunteered for this, to continue with this mission. We didn't really think we'd be able to do that, since we hadn't known Langhorn would decide to keep Hasdrubal, with the main fleet instead of personally overseeing safeholds terraforming. We were delighted that he did at the time because it gave us a lot more freedom. Of course, he smiled bitterly. We didn't realize then why he was staying there. Even without him looking over our shoulder, though, we couldn't begin to give you everything I would have liked to. There were still limits to what we dared to disappear from the equipment lists, but Shan Wei and I showed a little creativity during the terraforming operations. So you'll have some computer support, the most complete records we could provide, and at least some hardware. I've set the timer to activate this depot, I suppose, 750 standard years after I complete this recording. I arrived at that particular timing because our best projections indicate that if the Gababa didn't decide Cao Jur's fleet was all of Operation Arc's units, and if their scout ships continue to sweep outward, it ought to take them a maximum of about 500 years to pass within easy detection range of radio emissions or neutrinos from this system. So I've allowed a 50% cushion to carry you through the threat zone of immediate detection. That's how long you will have been asleep. He shook his head again. I can't begin to imagine what it's going to be like for you, Nimue. I wish there'd been some way, any way, I could have avoided dropping this burden on you. I couldn't find one. I tried, but I couldn't. He sat silent once more for several seconds, his holographic eyes gazing at something no one else had ever been able to see, then blinked back into focus and straightened in his chair. This is the final message, the last file which will be loaded to your depot computer. Besides myself, only one other person knows of your existence, and he and I have an appointment with Administrator Langhorn and the Administrative Council tomorrow evening. I don't know if it will do any good, but Langhorn, Bedar, and their toadies are about to discover that they aren't the only people with a little undisclosed military hardware in reserve. There won't be any survivors. It won't bring back Shan Wei or any of the rest of my, our friends, but at least I'll take a little personal satisfaction out of it. He seemed to look at her one last time, and he smiled once more. This time it was an oddly gentle smile. I suppose it could be argued that you don't really exist. You're only electronic patterns inside a machine, after all, not a real person but you're the electronic pattern of a truly remarkable young woman I was deeply honored to have known, and I believe that in every way that counts you are that young woman. Yet you're also someone else, and that someone else has the right to choose what you do with the time and the tools we've been able to give you. Whatever you choose, the decision must be yours, and whatever you decide, know this. Shan Wei and I love Nimue Orbin very much. We honored her memory for sixty years, and we're perfectly satisfied to leave the decision in your hands. 
whatever you decide, whatever you choose, we still love you. And now, as you once said to me, God bless him way. Goodbye. May, Year of God, 890. 1. The Temple of God, City of Zion, the Temple Lands. The Temple of God's colonnade soared effortlessly against the springtime blue of the northern sky. The columns were just over 60 feet high, and the central dome which dominated the entire majestic structure rose higher yet, to a height of 150 feet. It shone like a huge, polished mirror in the sunlight, plated in silver and crowned with the gem-encrusted solid gold icon of the Archangel Langhorn. Tablets of law clasped in one arm, the scepter of his holy authority raised high in the other. That icon was eighteen feet tall, glittering more brilliantly even than the dome under the morning sun. For over eight centuries since the very dawn of creation, that breathtakingly beautiful archangel had stood guard over God's home on Saifold, and it and the dome under it were both as brilliant and untouched by weather or time as the day they were first set in place. The temple sat atop an emerald green hill which lifted it even further towards God's heavens. Its gleaming dome was visible from many miles away, across the waters of Lake Pei, and it glittered like a golden alabaster crown above the great lakeside city of Zion. It was the city's crown in more than one way, for the city itself, one of the half-dozen largest on all of Safehold, and by far its oldest, existed for only one purpose, to serve the needs of the Church of God awaiting. Eric Dennis, Archbishop of Cheris, strolled slowly towards the temple across the vast plaza of martyrs, dominated by the countless fountains whose dancing jets, splashing about the feet of heroic sculptures of Langhorn, Bedar, and the other archangels, cast damp, refreshing breaths of spray to the breeze. He wore the white cassock of the episcopate, and the three-cornered priest's cap upon his head bore the white cockade and dovetailed orange ribbon of an archbishop. The fragrant scents of the northern spring wafted from the beds of flowers and flowering shrubs the temple's gardening staff kept perfectly maintained. But the archbishop scarcely noticed. The wonders of the temple were a part of his everyday world, and more mundane aspects of that same world often pushed them into the background of his awareness. So, he said to the younger man walking beside him, I take it we still haven't received the documents from Brygart. No, your eminence, Father Marqueo Brown replied obediently. Unlike his patrons, his priest's cap bore only the brown cockade of an upper priest, but the white crown embroidered on his cassock's right sleeve marked him as a senior archbishop's personal secretary and aide. A pity, Dennis murmured, with just a trace of a smile. Still, I'm sure Gerald did inform both him and Harold that the documentary evidence was necessary, while the Church has done her best to see to it that both sides are fairly presented before the ecclesiastical court. Of course, Your Eminence, Father Matteo agreed. Unlike the prelate he served, Brown was careful not to smile, even though he knew about the private message from Dennis to Bishop Executor Gerald Adamson instructing him to administratively lose the message for at least a five-day or two. Brown was privy to most of his patron's activities, however discreet they might be. He simply wasn't senior enough to display amusement or satisfaction over their success. Not yet, at least. Someday he was sure that seniority would be his. The two clerics reached the sweeping, majestically proportioned steps of the colonnade, Dozens of other churchmen moved up and down those steps, through the huge, open bas-relief doors, but the stream parted around Dennis and his aide without even a murmur of protest. If he'd barely noticed the beauty of the temple itself, the archbishop completely ignored the lesser clerics making way for him, just as he ignored the uniformed temple guards standing rigidly at attention at regular intervals, cuirasses gleaming in the sunlight, bright-edged halberds braced. He continued his stately progress, hands folded in the voluminous orange-trimmed sleeves of his snow-white cassock, while he pondered the afternoon's scheduled session. He and Brown crossed the threshold into the vast, soaring cathedral itself, 
The vaulted ceiling floated eighty feet above the gleaming pavement, rising to almost twice that at the apex of the central dome. In ceiling frescoes depicting the archangels laboring at the miraculous business of creation, circled the gold and gem-encrusted ceiling. Cunningly arranged mirrors and skylights set into the temple's roof gathered the springtime sunlight and spilled it through the frescoes in carefully directed shafts of brilliance. Incense drifted in sweet-smelling clouds and tendrils, spiraling through the sunlight like lazy serpents of smoke, and the magnificently trained voices of the temple choir rose in a quiet, perfectly harmonized a cappella hymn of praise. The choir was yet another of the wonders of the temple trained and dedicated to the purpose of seeing to it that God's house was perpetually filled with voices raised in his praise, as Langhorn had commanded. Just before the morning choir reached the end of its assigned time, the afternoon choir would march quietly into its place in the identical choir loft on the opposite side of the cathedral, where it would join the morning choir's song. As the afternoon singer's voices rose, the morning singer's voices would fade, and to the listening ear, Unless it was carefully trained, it would sound as if there had been no break or change at all in the hymn. The archbishop and his aides stepped across the vast, detailed map of God's world, inlaid into the floor just inside the doors, and made their way around the circumference of the circular cathedral. Neither of them paid much attention to the priests and acolytes around the altar at the center of the circle, celebrating the third of the daily morning masses for the regular flow of pilgrims. Every child of God was required by the writ to make the journey to the temple at least once in his life. Obviously, that wasn't actually possible for everyone, and God recognized that. Yet enough of his children managed to meet that obligation to keep the cathedral perpetually thronged with worshippers. Except, of course, during the winter months of bitter cold and deep snow. The cathedral pavement shone with blinding brightness where the focused beams of sunlight struck it, and at each of those points lay a circular golden seal two feet across, bearing the sigil of one of the archangels. Like the icon of Langhorn atop the temple dome and the dome itself, those seals were as brilliant, as untouched, by wear or time, as the day the temple was raised, each of them like the gold-veined lapis lazuli of the pavement itself and the vast map at the entry was protected by the three-inch thick sheet of imperishable crystal which covered them. The blocks of lapis had been sealed into the pavement with silver, and that silver gleamed as untarnished and perfect as the gold of the seals themselves. No mortal knew how it had been accomplished, but legend had it that after the archangels had raised the temple, they had commanded the air itself to protect both its gilded roof and that magnificent pavement for all time. However they had worked their miracle, the crystalline surface bore not a single scar, not one scuff mark, to show the endless generations of feet which had passed across it since the creation, or the perpetually polishing mops of the acolytes responsible for maintaining its brilliance. Dennis and Brown's slippered feet made no sound, adding to the illusion that they were, in fact, walking upon air, as they circled to the west side of the cathedral and passed through one of the doorways there into the administrative wings of the temple. They passed down broad hallways, illuminated by skylights and soaring windows of the same imperishable crystal, and decorated with priceless tapestries, paintings, and statuary. The administrative wings, like the cathedral, were the work of divine hands, not of mere mortals and stood as pristine and perfect as the day they had been created. Eventually they reached their destination. The conference chamber's door was flanked by two more temple guards, although these carried swords, not halberds, and their cuirasses bore the golden starburst of the grand vicar quartered with the archangel Schuler's sword. They came smartly to attention as the archbishop and his aide passed them without so much as a glance. Three more prelates and their aides, accompanied by two secretaries and a trio of lawmasters, awaited them. So here you are, Eric. At last, one of the other archbishops said dryly as Dennis and Brown crossed to the conference table. I beg your pardon, Jason, Dennis said with an easy smile. I was unavoidably delayed, I'm afraid. I'm sure. Archbishop Jason Connor snorted. Connor, a lean, 
fairly built man was Archbishop of Glacierheart in the Republic of Sittermark, and while Dennis Cassock bore the black scepter of the Order of Langhorn on its right breast, Connors showed the green-trimmed, brown-grain sheaf of the Order of Sondheim. The two men had known one another for years, and there was remarkably little love lost between them. Now, now, Jason, Irvin Miller, Archbishop of Sodar, chided. Miller was built much like Dennis himself, too well-fleshed to be considered lean, yet not quite heavy enough to be considered fat. He also wore the black scepter of Langhorn, but where Dennis' graying hair was thinning and had once been golden blonde, Miller's was a still thick salt and pepper black. Be nice, he continued now, smiling at Connor. Some delays truly are unavoidable, you know. Even, he winked at Dennis, Eric's. Connor did not appear mollified, but he contented himself with another snort and sat back in his chair. Whatever the cause, at least you are here now, Eric, the third prelate observed. So let's get started, shall we? Of course, Willem, Dennis replied, not obsequiously, but without the insouciance he'd shown Connor. Willem Reno, Archbishop of Changwu, was several years younger than Dennis, and unlike a great many of Mother Church's bishops and archbishops, he had been born in the province, which had since become his archbishopric. He was short, dark, and slender, and there was something dangerous about him. Not surprisingly, perhaps, while Dennis Connor and Miller all wore the white cassocks of their rank, Reno, as always, wore the habit of a simple monk in the dark purple of the Order of Schuler. The bared sword of the Order's patron stood out starkly on the right breast of that dark habit, white and trimmed in orange to proclaim his own archbishop's rank. But its episcopal white was less important than the golden flame of Zhuo Zheng, superimposed across it. That flame-crowned sword marked him as the Schulerite Adjutant General which made him effectively the executive officer of Vicar Jasper Clinton, the Grand Inquisitor himself. As always, the sight of that habit gave Dennis a slight twinge. Not that he'd ever had any personal quarrel with Reno. It was more a matter of tradition than anything else. Once upon a time, the rivalry between his own order of Langhorn and the Schulerites had been both open and intense. But the struggle for primacy within the temple had been decided in the Schulerites' favor generations ago. The Order of Schuler's role as the guardian of doctrinal orthodoxy had given it a powerful advantage, which had been decisively strengthened by the judicious political maneuvering within the temple's hierarchy which had absorbed the Order of Zhuo Zheng into the Schulerites. These days, the Order of Langhorn stood clearly second within that hierarchy, which made the Schulerite practice of dressing as humble brothers of their order, regardless of their personal rank in the Church's hierarchy, its own form of arrogance. Dennis sat in the armchair awaiting him, Brown perched on the far humbler stool behind his archbishop's chair, and Reno gestured to one of the lawmasters. Begin, he said. Your eminences... The lawmaster, a monk of Dennis' own order, said, standing behind the neat piles of legal documents on the table before him. As you all know, the purpose of the meeting of this committee of the ecclesiastical court is to consider a final recommendation on the succession dispute in the earldom of Hanth. We have researched the applicable law, and each of you has received a digest of our findings. We have also summarized the testimony before this committee and the documents submitted to it, as always, we are but the court's servants. Having provided you with all of the information available to us, we await your pleasure. He seated himself once more, and Reno looked around the conference table at his fellow archbishops. Is there any need to reconsider any of the points of law which have been raised in the course of these hearings? He asked. Heads shook silently in reply. Are there any disputes about the summary of the testimony we've already heard or the documents we've already reviewed, he continued, and once again, heads shook. Very well. Does anyone have anything new to present? If I may, Willem, Connor said, and Reno nodded for him to continue. The lean archbishop turned to look at Dennis. 
At our last meeting, you told us you were still awaiting certain documents from Bishop Executor Gerald. Have they arrived? I fear not, Dennis said, shaking his head gravely. Gerald Adamson was officially Dennis' assistant. In fact, he was the de facto acting archbishop for Dennis' distant archbishopric and the manager of Dennis' own vast estates there. Cheris was the next best thing to 12,000 miles from the temple, and there was no way Dennis could have personally seen to the pastoral requirements of his parishioners and also dealt with all of the other responsibilities which attached to his high office. So, like the vast majority of prelates whose seas lay beyond the continent of Haven or its sister continent, Howard, to the south, he left those pastoral and local administrative duties to his bishop executor. Once a year, despite the hardship involved, Dennis traveled to Cheris for a month-long pastoral visit. The rest of the year he relied upon Adamson. The bishop executor might not be the most brilliant man he'd ever met, but he was dependable and understood the practical realities of church politics. He was also less greedy than most when it came to siphoning off personal wealth. But you did request that he send them, Connor pressed, and Dennis allowed an expression of overtried patience to cross his face. Of course I did, Jason, he replied. I dispatched the original request via semaphore to Cloner over two months ago, as we all agreed, to be relayed by sea across the cauldron. Obviously, I couldn't go into a great deal of detail in a semaphore message, but Father Matteo sent a more complete request by a wyvern the same day, and it reached Cloner barely a five-day later. We also notified Sir Howard's man of law here in Zion of our requirements and informed him that we were passing the request along to his client. Two months ago, doesn't leave very much time for any documentation to arrive from so far away, particularly at this time of year, given the sort of storms they have in the cauldron every fall. Connor observed in a deliberately neutral tone, and Dennis showed his fellow prelate his teeth in what might possibly have been called a smile. True, he said almost sweetly. On the other hand, the message was sent over two months ago, which seems more than sufficient time for Gerald to have relayed my request to Sir Howard, and for Sir Howard to have responded, and for a dispatch vessel from Cheris to cross back to Cloner, whether or no weather, with at least a semaphore message to alert us that the documents in question were on their way. In fact, I've exchanged another complete round of messages with Gerald on other topics over the same time frame, so I feel quite sure the dispatch boats are surviving the crossing despite any autumn gales. Connor looked as if he was tempted to launch another sharp riposte of his own, but if he was, he suppressed the temptation. Reno and Miller only nodded, and Dennis hid a mental smirk. He often found Connor's brand of personal piety rather wearing, although he had to admit it gave his rival a certain cachet in the temple's hierarchy. He wasn't quite unique, of course, but most of the archbishops and vicars charged with administering God's affairs were too busy for the sort of simple-minded pastoral focus Connor seemed to prefer. Dennis was prepared to admit that, that was even more true in his case than in many others. It could scarcely be otherwise with Cheris so far from Zion and the temple. Connor's archbishopric was less than half his distance, although, to be fair, most of the weary miles to Glacier Heart were overland, and Connor made two pastoral visits per year, not just one. But he could also make the journey without being totally out of touch with the temple. Thanks to the semaphore chains the church maintained across Haven and Howard, the two-way message time between Glacier Heart and the temple was less than three days. Side 3 Off Armageddon Reef by David Weber Continuing on page 52 Dennis had occasionally wondered if a part of Connor's enmity might not stem from the differences between their archbishoprics. He knew that at least a portion of the bad blood between them came from the fact that Connor had been the son of a minor Doloran nobleman, whereas Dennis was the son of an archbishop and the grand-nephew of a grand-vicar. 
Connor stood outside the traditional great ecclesiastic dynasties which had dominated the temple for centuries, and he'd never seemed to quite grasp how those dynasties played the game. That game, as Dennis was well aware, explained how he'd gotten Cheris and Connor hadn't. Despite the other prelate's ostentatious piety, he couldn't be totally dead to ambition, or he would never have attained a bishop's ruby ring, far less his present rank, and Connor's archbishopric was a mere province of the Republic of Sidarmark, whereas Dinnis was the entire kingdom of Cheris. It was always possible that fact did indeed account for Connor's hostility, although Dinnis rather doubted it in his calmer moments. Craggy, mountainous Glacier Heart was barely a quarter the size of Cheris proper and sparsely populated compared with the rest of Haven, but it probably had almost as many inhabitants as the entire kingdom, although not, he reflected complacently, a tenth as much wealth. Haven and Howard were the principal land masses of Safehold, and Langhorn and his fellow archangels had planted humanity far more thickly across them than anywhere else. Even today, eight, or possibly even as many as nine, out of every ten inhabitants of Safehold were to be found there, so it was little wonder Mother Church's attention was so fully fixed there as well. The long chains of semaphore stations, reaching out from Zion in every direction, allowed the temple to oversee its far-flung archbishoprics, bishoprics, cathedrals, churches, congregations, monasteries, convents, and ecclesiastical manors, as well as the intendants assigned to the various secular courts, parliaments, and assemblies. Those semaphores belonged to Mother Church, and although she permitted their use by secular authorities, that use was always subject to availability, and as more than one prince or king or governor had discovered, availability could be quite limited for anyone who had irritated his local ecclesiastical superiors. But not even Mother Church could erect semaphore stations in the middle of the sea. And so the only way to communicate with such distant lands as Cheris, or the League of Coruscant, or Chisholm, was ultimately by ship, and ships, as Dennis had long since discovered, were slow. An additional semaphore chain had been extended across Raven's Land and Chisholm, on the far side of the Markovian Sea. But even there, messages must cross the passage of storms, a water gap of almost 1,200 miles between the semaphore stations on Rollings Head and Iron Cape. That gave Jerome Vincent, the Archbishop of Chisholm, a two-way message time of almost 17 days, but the situation was even worse for Dennis. It took only six days for a message to travel from the temple to the Cloner semaphore station in southern Sittermark, but then it had to cross over 3,000 miles of seawater to reach Tellisburg, which meant, of course, that it took 25 days Five, five days, on average, for one of his messages just to reach his bishop executor. The actual voyage from the temple to Telesburg, however, took two full months, one way, which explained why Dennis simply could not absent himself from Zion and the temple for more than a single pastoral visit per year, usually in late autumn. That got him out of the temple lands before Xing Wu's passage froze over and let him spend the temple's ice-blasted winter in Cheris, which was not only in the southern hemisphere, but less than 1,300 miles below the equator. Summer in Telesburg was ever so much more pleasant than winter in Zion. Of course, that same distance from Zion and the temple also explained why some of those more distant lands, like Cheris itself upon occasion, were sometimes just a bit more fractious than those closer to Zion. Eric has a point, Jason, Reno said now. Certainly everyone involved in this dispute has been arguing back and forth long enough to recognize how important it is to comply with any documentary requests we may have. If Brygart hasn't seen fit even to acknowledge the receipt of our request, that speaks poorly for him. It may speak more poorly of the quality of his purported evidence, Miller pointed out. If he truly has proof Montale's claims are false, he ought to be eager to lay that evidence before us. Connor shifted in his seat and Reno quirked one eyebrow at him. Yes, Jason. 
I only wanted to observe that from the very first, Sir Howard Rygart, the Archbishop of Glacier Heart stressed the title and surname very slightly, has maintained that Montale's claim to descent from the 14th Earl was false. And, he looked around the conference table, he accompanied his initial arguments with depositions to that effect from over a dozen witnesses. No one is disputing that he did, Jason, Dennis pointed out. The point under consideration is Brygott's assertion that he's uncovered proof, not depositions, not hearsay evidence, but documented proof, that Tadeo Montale is not Frederick Brygott's great-grandson. It was that proof we asked him to share with us. Precisely, Reno agreed, nodding solemnly, and Connor clamped his lips firmly together. He glanced at Miller, and his lips thinned further as he read the other prelate's eyes. Dennis could read the other's expressions just as well as Connor could, and he couldn't quite completely suppress his own smile. Miller's support for his position was hardly a surprise. Not only were they both Langhornites, but the two of them had been scratching one another's backs for decades, and both of them knew how Mother Church's politics worked. Reno had been a bit more problematical, but Dennis had confidently anticipated his support as well. The Inquisition and Order of Schuler had been less than pleased by Cheris growing wealth and power for almost a century now. The kingdom's obvious taste for innovation only made that worse, and the energy the Cheresian Royal College had begun displaying over the last ten or fifteen years rubbed more than one senior Schulerite on the raw. The view that religious orthodoxy waned in direct proportion to the distance between any given congregation and Zion was an inescapable part of most Schulerites' mental baggage. Reno, despite his own sophistication and ecclesiastical rank, still regarded such distant lands as Cheris with automatic suspicion. In Cheris' case, the power of its trade-based wealth and apparent inventiveness, coupled with the Royal College's active support, for that inventiveness, and the Armok dynasty's domestic policies, made him even more suspicious. And the fact that Harald of Cheris, unlike the majority of safe holds rulers, had stayed out of debt to the temple's moneylenders was one more worry for those, like Reno, who fretted over how to control him if the need should arise. The Schulerites' dominant position in the church hierarchy would have been enough to put Cheris under a cloud in the church's eyes all by itself. But the kingdom's steadily growing wealth and the influence its vast merchant fleet gave it in lands far beyond its own borders made a bad situation worse in many respects. While most of the more mundane suspicion and ire of the Council of Vicars focused on the Republic of Sidermark simply because of the Republic's proximity to the Temple lands, there were those, including the Grand Inquisitor himself, who felt that Cheris' attitudes and example were even more dangerous in the long run. Dennis' own view, buttressed by reports from Gerald Adamson and Father Peter Wilson, the Order of Schuler's own intendant in Tellisburg, was that Reno's suspicions of Cheris' fidelity to Mother Church's doctrines were baseless. True, Cheresians' willingness to find new and more efficient ways to do things required a certain degree of vigilance. And equally true, the Cheresian branch of the church was rather more permissive on several issues than the Council of Vicars would truly have preferred. And yes, it was even true that this College of Haralds was actively seeking new ways to combine existing knowledge, which could only enhance that national fetish for efficiency. That, however, was exactly why Father Pater was there, and his reports, like those of his immediate predecessors, made it quite clear that nothing going on in Cheris came remotely close to a violation of the prescriptions of Zhuo Zheng. As for domestic policies and dangerous examples, Dennis was willing to grant that King Harald's great-grandfather's decision to legally abolish serfdom throughout his kingdom could be construed as a slap in Mother Church's face if one were determined to view it that way. Dennis wasn't, especially given the fact that there'd never been more than a relative handful of serfs in Cheris even before the institution was officially abolished. Nor did he believe the claims, mostly from the Cheresians' competitors, 
that his parishioners' focus on trade and the acquisition of wealth was so obsessive that it inspired them to ignore their obligations to God and Mother Church and skimp on the kingdom's tithe. Bishop Executor Gerald and his tithe collectors would certainly have made their own displeasure known if they'd suspected there was any truth to those tales. Adamson might not be the most brilliant man ever to attain a bishop's ring, but he was no fool either, and Mother Church had centuries of experience with every way kings or nobles might try to hide income from the tithe assessors. And the churches and inquisitions grip on the mainland populations was surely firm enough to suppress any dangerous notions which might creep across the seas aboard Cheresian merchantmen. No, Dennis had no fear Cheris was some sort of hotbed of potential heresy. Not that he hadn't been prepared to play upon Reno's suspicions and the Council of Vicar's basic distrust and dislike for the kingdom. Which, he reflected, made the fact that Harald was clearly one of Brygart's strongest supporters the kiss of death as far as Willem was concerned. He supposed it was actually a sign of Reno's moral integrity that it had taken him this long to come openly out in support of Tadeo Montale's claim. His fraudulent but extremely well-paying claim, Dennis reflected silently, allowing no trace of his inner satisfaction to show, and the fact that Liam Turn, the Archbishop of Emerald, was going to owe him a substantial favor for supporting Prince Narmon's candidate wasn't going to hurt either. I think, Reno, as the senior member of the court, continued, that in light of Brygart's failure to provide his supposed proof, or even to respond to our request in a timely fashion, we must make our decision based upon the evidence already presented. Rather than rush to a conclusion, however, I would suggest we adjourn for lunch and afterwards spend an hour or so meditating upon this matter in privacy. Let us reconvene at about the fifteenth hour and render our decision, brothers. The others nodded in agreement, Connor a bit grudgingly, and chairs scraped as the archbishops rose. Connor nodded to Reno and Miller, managed to ignore Dennis completely, and strode briskly from the conference room. Reno smiled slightly like an indulgent parent with two sons who were continually at odds, then followed Connor. Will you share lunch with me, Eric? Miller asked after the others had left. I have a small matter which will be coming before the Office of Affirmation next five days that I'd like to discuss with you. Of course, Irvin, Dennis replied brightly. I'd be delighted to. And it was true, he reflected. He actually looked forward to the inevitable dragon trading with Miller. It was part of the game, after all. The sizable gift about to land in his private purse and the opportunity to remind Harald Armok where the true authority in Cheris lay would have been enough to place him firmly on Montale's side, but even more seductive than mere wealth was the exercise of power, not simply within his own archbishopric, but within the only hierarchy which truly mattered, right here in the temple. I understand the kitchens have something special waiting for us this afternoon, he continued. Shall we partake of it in the main dining hall, or would you prefer to dine on the plaza? 2. Royal Palace, Telesburg, Kingdom of Cheris Father, you know as well as I do who's really behind it. Crown Prince Caleb folded his arms across his chest and glared at his father. King Harald, however, endured his elder son's expression with remarkable equanimity. Yes, Caleb, the King of Cheris said after a moment. As it happens, I do know who's really behind it. Now, just what do you suggest I do about it? Caleb opened his mouth, then paused. After a moment, he closed it again. His dark eyes were, if anything, even more fiery than they had been, but his father nodded. Exactly, he said grimly. There's nothing I'd like better than to see Tadeo's head on a pike over my gate. I'm sure he and his... Associates feel the same about mine, of course. Unfortunately, however much I'd like to see his there, there's not much prospect of my collecting it any time soon. And since I can't... 
He shrugged and Caleb scowled, not in disagreement but in frustration. I know you're right, Father, he said finally. But we're going to have to find some answer. If it were only Tadeo, or even just him and Narmon, we could deal with it easily enough. But with Hector behind the two of them, and with Eric and Gerald sitting in their purses... His voice trailed off, and Harald nodded again. He knew, whether his son chose to admit it or not, that at least half of Caleb's frustration sprang from fear. King Harald wasn't about to hold that against his heir, however. In fact, fear could be a good thing in a monarch, or a future monarch, as long as it was not allowed to rule him, and as long as it sprang from the right causes. Cowardice was beneath contempt. Fear of the consequences for those one ruled was a monarch's duty. If I had the answer you want, Caleb, he said, I wouldn't be a king. I'd be one of the archangels come back to earth. He touched his heart and then his lips with the fingers of his right hand, and Caleb mirrored the gesture. Since, however, I'm merely mortal, Harold continued, I'm still trying to come up with something remotely like an answer. The king climbed out of his chair and crossed to the window. Like most Cheresians, Harold was a little above average height for safehold in general, with broader shoulders and a generally stockier build. His son was perhaps an inch or two taller than he, and Caleb's frame was still in the process of filling out. He was going to be a muscular, powerful man, Harald thought, and he moved with a quick, impatient grace. I used to move like that, Harald reflected, back before that crocken tried to take my leg off. Was that really twenty years ago? He stopped by the window, dragging his stiff-kneed right leg under him and propping his right shoulder unobtrusively against the window frame. His son stood beside him, and they gazed out across the broad, sparkling blue waters of South Howell Bay. The bay was dotted with sails out beyond the city's fortifications and the wharves. There were at least sixty ships tied up at the docks or awaiting wharf space. Most were the relatively small one- and two-masted coasters and freight haulers, which carried the kingdom's internal trade throughout the enormous bay but over a third were the bigger, heavier, and clumsier-looking galleons, which served Safehold's oceanic trade. Most of the galleons had three masts, and they loomed over their smaller, humbler sisters, flying the house flags of at least a dozen trading houses, while far beyond the breakwaters, three sleek galleys of the Royal Cheresian Navy strode northward on the long spider legs of their sweeps. That's the reason we're not going to find many friends, Harald told his son, jutting his bearded chin at the merchant ships thronging the Telesburg waterfront. Too many want what we have, and they're foolish enough to think that if they league together to take it away from us, their friends will actually let them keep it afterward. And at the moment there's no one who feels any particular need to help us keep it. Then we have to convince someone to feel differently, Caleb said. True words, my son, Harold smiled sardonically. And now for your next conjuration, who do you propose to convince? Charleyan is already half on our side, Caleb pointed out. But only half, Harold countered. She made that clear enough this past spring. Caleb grimaced, but he couldn't really disagree. Queen Charleyan of Chisholm had as many reasons to oppose the League of Coruscant as Cheris did, and her hatred for Prince Hector of Coruscant was proverbial. There had been some hope that those factors might bring her into open alliance with Cheris, and Harald had dispatched his cousin, Calvin, the Duke of Tyrion, to Chisholm as his personal envoy to explore the possibility. Without success. You know how convincing Calvin can be, and his position in the succession should have given any suggestion from him far greater weight than one from any other ambassador, the king continued. If any one could have convinced her to ally with us, it would have been him, but even if she'd been certain she wanted to support us fully, she'd still have had her own throne to consider. Coruscant is as close to her as to us, 
and she has that history of bad blood between her and Hector to think about. Not to mention the fact that the temple isn't exactly one of our greater supporters just now. Caleb nodded glumly. However much Charlayan might despise Hector, she had just as many reasons to avoid open hostilities with him. And, as his father had just implied, she had even more reasons for not antagonizing the men who ruled the temple, and few compelling reasons to come to the aid of what was, after all, her kingdom's most successful competitor. What about Sidamark? the crown prince asked after several seconds. We do have those treaties. The Republic is probably about the most favorably inclined of the major realms, Harald agreed. I'm not sure the Lord Protector would be especially eager to get involved in our little unpleasantness, but Stonar recognizes how valuable our friendship's been over the years. Unfortunately, he has even more reason than Charlayan to be wary of irritating the Church's sensibilities, and those treaties of ours are all trade treaties, not military ones. Even if they weren't, what would Sidermark use for a fleet? I know. Caleb pounded lightly on the window frame, chewing his lower lip. It's not as if this really comes as a surprise, his father pointed out. Tadeo's been pressing his so-called claim for years now. Admittedly, he was mostly trying to make himself enough of a nuisance for me to buy him off and be done with him. But is it really a surprise that he suddenly started ticking himself seriously now that he's finally found someone to back him? It ought to be, Caleb growled. Tadeo has no legitimate claim to Hanth, even if that ridiculous lie about his grandmother's being Earl Frederick's bastard daughter had an ounce of truth in it, Howard would still be the rightful heir. Except that Mother Church is going to say differently. Harold's tone was light, almost whimsical, but there was nothing amused or lighthearted in his expression. Why shouldn't she, when Narmon and Hector are so willing and eager to pour gold into Dinis' purse? Caleb snarled. Besides, the council's always— He broke off abruptly as his father laid a hand on his shoulder. Carefully, Caleb, Harald said, his voice soft, carefully. What you say to me is one thing, but you are my heir. What you say where other ears can hear and use it against you, against us, is something else entirely. I know that, father. Caleb swung away from the window and looked into his father's eyes. But you know, and I do, that it's exactly what's happened. And you know why the Council of Vickers is allowing it to stand, too. Yes, Harold admitted, and there was as much sorrow as anger in his eyes now. If all Mother Church's priests were like Michael, or even Father Pater, it would never have happened. Or at least, I wouldn't be worried that my son would be executed for heresy simply because he spoke the truth in the wrong ear. But they aren't, and I am. So guard your tongue, my son. I will, Caleb promised, then turned to look back out across the busy bay once more. But you also know this is only the beginning, father. Forcing you to accept Tadeo as Earl of Hanth is only the first step. Of course it is, Harald snorted. This is Hector's doing. He's a sand maggot, not a slash lizard. Narmon's too impatient to take any longer view than he absolutely must. But Hector has always preferred to let someone else take the risk of making the kill. He's content to get fat on the leavings until one day the slash lizard looks over its shoulder and discovers it's straight into the surf and the maggots grown into a kraken. No doubt, but that doesn't change the fact that Tadeo is only the opening wedge. Nor the fact that he's going to begin looting Hanth the instant he's confirmed as Earl. Harold agreed, his expression hard. And I won't be able to protect his people from him either. Not when the whole world knows I was forced to accept him by church decree. Any attempt I make to rein him in will be the same as openly defying the church once his agents in the temple get done telling the tale to the vicars, and many on the council will be prepared to automatically believe them. But he and his masters aren't going to stop trying to undermine you. Or our house just because you can't crush him like the bottom feeder he is. Of course not. Harold turned away from the window and began limping back towards his chair. He seated himself heavily in it and looked up at his son. I believe we still have some time, he said then, his expression somber. How much I can't say. At least a few months, though, I think. We're not entirely without advocates in the temple even today. 
even if our own archbishop has ruled against us in this matter. And even our foes in Zion are eager to drape their actions in the mantle of fairness and justice, so for at least a little while, Tadeo and his patrons are going to be leery of anything that could be construed as an open move against us. And while I'm seldom happy to see Dennis, if he holds to his usual schedule, he'll be here by February or March, which should put a sea anchor on affairs in the temple until he returns to Zion next fall. But once the situation's settled a bit, they're going to begin pushing again, even without him there to speak in their support. That's my thought as well, Caleb said. I wish I felt more confident that I knew how they'll begin pushing, though. Not openly, I think, his father said slowly, lips first as his fingers drummed on the arms of his chair. I almost wish they would. If it were only a matter of our fleet against that of the League, even with Narmons thrown in, I believe we could more than hold our own. But Hector will know that as well as I do. Before he commits to any sort of open warfare, he'll find a way to strengthen their combined naval power. How? Caleb asked. I don't know. Not yet. My guess, though, would be that he's already talking to Gorja. Caleb frowned. King Gorja III, ruler of the Kingdom of Taro, was officially one of his father's allies. On the other hand... That would make sense, wouldn't it? He murmured. Gorja's never been all that happy with our treaty, Harald pointed out. His father was another matter, but Gorja resents the obligations he's found himself saddled with. At the same time, he recognizes the advantages of having us for friends rather than enemies. But if Hector can work on him, convince him that with Gorasand and Emerald both prepared to support him... The king shrugged and Caleb nodded, but then his eyes sharpened and he cocked his head to one side. I'm sure you're right about that, father. You usually are. You are one of the canniest men I know. But there's something else going on inside that head of yours. Harold looked at him for several seconds, then shrugged again. It was a very different shrug this time, as if his shoulders had become heavier since the last one. Your mother is dead, Caleb, he said softly. She was my left arm and the mirror of my soul, and I miss her counsel almost as much as I miss her. Nor will I get any more heirs and Jeanne is barely eight years old, while Jeannette is only two years older and a girl child. If my enemies truly wish to cripple me, they'll take away my strong right arm, as I've already lost the left. He looked into his elder son's eyes, his own level, and Caleb looked back. Remember the sand maggot, Harald told him. The slash lizard might fling himself against us fangs and claws first, but not the maggot. Watch your back, my son, and watch the shadows. Our enemies know us as well as we know them, and so they'll know that to kill you would take not simply my arm, but my heart. 3. The Mountains of Light The Temple Lands Nimue Alban leaned back in the comfortable chair and frowned. There was really no actual need for her to use the chair, just as there was no need aside from purely cosmetic considerations for her to breathe. But as she'd discovered the very first time she used a pika, habits transcended such minor matters as simple physical fatigue. Although, she reflected with a wry smile, breathing the preservative nitrogen atmosphere with which Pei Kao Young had filled the depot wouldn't have done a flesh-and-blood human much good. She'd spent most of the last three local days sitting in this very chair, studying the data files Pei Kao Young had left for her the hard way, because Elias Proctor's modifications to her software had inadvertently disabled her high-speed data interface. She was pretty sure Proctor hadn't realized he'd created the problem, and while she would have been confident enough about attempting to remedy it herself under other circumstances, she had no intention of fiddling around with it under these. If she screwed up, there was no one available to retrieve the error, and it would be the bitterest of ironies if, after all the sacrifices which had been made to put her here, she accidentally took herself permanently offline. In a way, having to wade through all the information the old-fashioned way had been something of a relief, really. Sitting there, reading the text, viewing the recorded messages and video instead of simply jacking into the interface 
was almost like a concession to the biological humanity she'd lost forever, and it wasn't as if she were exactly in a tearing hurry to start making changes. Owl, she said aloud. Yes, Lieutenant Commander, a pleasant, almost naturally modulated tenor voice replied. I see here that Commodore Pei left us a ground-based surveillance system. Is it online? Negative, Lieutenant Commander, Al replied. That was all he said, and Nimue rolled her eyes. Why not? she asked. Because I have not been instructed to bring it online, Lieutenant Commander. Nimue shook her head. Owl, the name she'd assigned to the Ordonius Westinghouse Lytton Rapier Tactical Computer, Pei Kao Young had managed to lose for her, wasn't exactly the brightest crayon in the cybernetic box. The AI was highly competent in its own areas of expertise, but tactical computers had deliberately suppressed volitional levels and required higher levels of direct human command input. Owl wasn't precisely brimming with imagination or the ability or desire to anticipate questions or instructions. In theory, Owl's programming was heuristic, and something more closely resembling a personality ought to emerge eventually. On the other hand, Nimue had worked with a lot of rapiers, and none of them had ever impressed her as geniuses. What I meant to ask, she said now, is whether or not there's any hardware problem which would prevent you from bringing the array up. Again, there was no response, and she pressed her lips rather firmly together. Is there any such hardware problem? she amplified. Yes, Lieutenant Commander. What problem? she demanded a bit more testily. The array in question is currently covered by approximately 13 meters of ice and snow, Lieutenant Commander. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Her sarcasm simply bounced off the AI's silence, and she sighed. Is it otherwise in operable condition? she asked in a tone of deliberate patience. Affirmative, Lieutenant Commander. And can the ice and snow be removed or melted? Affirmative, Lieutenant Commander. And you are connected to it by a secure landline? Affirmative, Lieutenant Commander. All right, Nimue nodded. In that case, I want you to bring it up, passive systems only, and initiate a complete standard sky sweep for orbital infrastructure, and give me an estimate for time required to complete the sweep. Activating systems now, Lieutenant Commander. Time required to clear the array's receptors of ice and snow will be approximately 31 standard hours. Time required for a passive sweep after clearing receptors will be approximately 43 standard hours, assuming favorable weather conditions. However, optical systems efficiency may be degraded by unfavorable weather. Understood. Nimue's tight smile showed perfect white teeth. What I'm looking for ought to be fairly easy to spot if it's really up there. Owl didn't say anything else, and for just a moment, Nimue tried to imagine what it must be like to be a genuine artificial intelligence rather than a human intelligence, which had simply been marooned in a cybernetic matrix. She couldn't conceive of just sitting around indefinitely, patiently waiting for the next human command before doing anything. She grimaced at the direction of her own thoughts. After all, she'd been sitting around doing absolutely nothing herself for the last eight standard centuries almost nine Saifoldian centuries, counting all the years since Nimue Alban's biological death. Of course, it didn't seem that way to her, not at least until she thought of all the people she'd never see again, or the fact that while she'd slept, the Gababa had undoubtedly completed the destruction of the Terran Federation and all human life on every single one of its planets, including Old Earth. A shiver ran through her, one which had absolutely nothing to do with the temperature of the air about her, and she shook her head hard. That's enough of that, Nimue, she told herself firmly. You may be a Pika, but your personality is still the same, which probably means you're entirely capable of driving yourself crackers if you dwell on that kind of crap. She climbed out of the chair and clasped her hands behind her as she began to pace up and down. Aside from the fact that a Pika never experienced fatigue, it felt exactly the way it would have felt in the body nature had issued her, which was precisely how it was supposed to feel. The polished glass stone ceiling was a smoothly arched curve, almost four meters above the absolutely level, equally smooth floor at its highest point. 
She was in one of a dozen variously sized chambers, which had been carved out underneath one of the planet safe holds innumerable mountains during the terraforming process. This particular mountain, Mount Olympus, in what had become known as the Mountains of Light, was lousy with iron ore, and Commodore Pei and Shan Wei had thoughtfully tucked her hideaway under the densest concentration of ore they could find. She was barely forty meters above sea level, and Mount Olympus was almost a third again the height of old Earth's Everest. There were twelve thousand meters of mountain piled on top of her, and that was more than enough to have made the tiny trickle of energy from the geothermal power tap keeping the depot's monitoring computers online completely undetectable after Langhorn and the main fleet had arrived. She'd wandered through the rest of the complex, physically checking the various items she'd found on the equipment list stored in Al's memory. Some of it seemed bizarre enough that she suspected that the Commodore and Shan Wei had added it simply because they could, not because they'd envisioned any compelling use for it, and exactly how they'd managed to drop some of it off of Langhorn's master lists was more than Nimue could imagine. The three armored personnel carriers, for example, and the pair of forward recon skimmers, not to mention the all-up assault shuttle, which was the size of an old pre-space jumbo jet, the small but capable fabrication unit in the cave complex's lowest and largest chamber made sense, and so, she supposed, did the well-stocked arms locker, although exactly how Cao Young had expected a single Pika to use 200 assault rifles and two million rounds of ammunition all by herself was a bit of a puzzlement. The fully equipped medical unit from the transport Remus was another puzzlement, given her cybernetic nature. It even had cryosleep and anti-gerone capability, and although she would have hesitated to use any of its drugs after eight centuries, even with cryonic storage, the nanotech portion of the therapies were still undoubtedly viable. Not that a pika had any need for either of them, of course. She sometimes wondered if Cao Young's and Shen Wei's emotions had insisted that they remember the flesh and blood Nimue Alban, rather than the being of alloys and composites which had replaced her. Whatever their reasoning had been, there was even a complete kitchen, despite the fact that a pika had no particular need for food. Other parts of the depot, which she'd found herself thinking of as Nimue's cave, made a lot more sense. The library, for example. Cao Young and Shan Wei had somehow managed to strip the library core out of the Romulus as well, before the ship was discarded. They hadn't managed to pull the entire library computer, which was a pity in a lot of ways, since its AI, unlike Owl, had been specifically designed as an information processing and reference tool. Nimue wondered if that had been a size issue. The entire data core consisted of only three spheres of molecular circuitry, none larger than an old earth basketball, which could undoubtedly have been smuggled past others' eyes more easily than the entire computer system. But they'd still gotten the core down and connected it to OWL, which meant Nimue had access to the equivalent of a major Federation core World University's library system. That was undoubtedly going to be of enormous value down the road. The hefty store of snarks, self-navigating, autonomous reconnaissance and communication platforms were also going to be incredibly useful. The stealthy little fusion-powered robotic spies were only very slightly larger than Nimue herself, but they had decent AI capability, were capable of speeds of up to Mach 2 in atmosphere, they could manage considerably better than that outside it, of course, could stay airborne for months at a time, and could deploy recoverable, almost microscopic-sized remotes of their own. She had sixteen of them up at this very moment, hovering invisible to the eye, or to any more sophisticated sensors, had there been any, above major towns and cities. For the moment, they were concentrating on recording the local languages and dialects. Without the Pika data interface, Nimue was going to have to learn the hard way to speak the considerably altered version of standard English spoken by present-day Safeholdians. It looked as if the written language and grammar 
had stayed effectively frozen, but without any form of audio recording capability. The spoken form's pronunciation had shifted considerably, and not always in the same directions in all locations. Some of the dialects were so different now as to be almost separate tongues, despite the fact that virtually every word in them was spelled the same way. Fortunately, she'd always been a fair hand with languages, and at least her present body didn't need sleep. Her human personality did need occasional down periods. She'd discovered that the first time she'd operated a pika in autonomous mode, although the cybernetic brain in which that personality resided didn't. She didn't really know whether she was completely shut down during those periods, or if she was at some level of standby readiness. Functionally, it was the equivalent of going to sleep and dreaming, although she needed no more than an hour of it every few days or so, and she suspected it was going to be rather more important to her in her present circumstances than it ever had been before. After all, no one had ever contemplated maintaining a pika in autonomous mode indefinitely, which meant no one had any experience in doing that for more than ten days at a time. Knack for language or not, it was going to take her a while to master the local version sufficiently for her to even consider attempting direct contact with any native Saifoldians. There was also the minor matter that she was female on a planet which had reverted, by and large, to an almost totally male-dominated culture. There was something she could do about that, although she didn't really care for the thought particularly. But there was also the fact that almost all the skills she'd learned growing up in a society which took advanced technology for granted were going to be of limited utility in this one. She'd always been an enthusiastic sailor, when she had time, but only in relatively small craft, like her father's favorite ten-meter sloop. That might be useful, she supposed, but unlike some of her fellow military personnel, she'd never been particularly interested in survival courses, marksmanship, hand-to-hand -hand combat training, blacksmithing, or the best way to manufacture lethal booby traps out of leftover ration tins and old rubber bands. True, Commodore Pei had gotten her interested in kendo several years before Operation Arc. She'd done fairly well at it, as a matter of fact, although she'd scarcely thought of herself as a mistress of the art. Still, that was about the only locally applicable skill she could think of, and she was none too sure just how useful even that one was going to prove. Those were problems she was going to have to address eventually. In the meantime, however, she had plenty of other things to think about. Cao Young's notes, almost a journal, really, had given her an insider's perspective on what Langhorn and Bedar had done to the colonists. With that advantage, she hadn't required any particular level of genius to begin discerning the consequences of their original meddling, despite her current imperfect understanding of the locals' conversations. Safehold was unlike any other planet which had ever been inhabited by humans. Even the oldest of the Federation's colony worlds had been settled for less than two centuries when humanity first encountered the Gababa. That had been long enough for the older colonies to develop strong local cultural templates. But all of those templates had begun from the frothy intermingling of all of Old Earth's cultural currents. There'd been enormously diverse elements bound up in all of them, and, of course, Old Earth herself had been the most diverse of all. But whereas the cultures on all of those other planets had been created by blending different societies, belief structures, ideologies, philosophies, and worldviews into a pluralistic whole, Safehold had begun with an absolutely uniform culture, an artificially uniform culture. The human beings who made up that culture had all been programmed to believe exactly the same things, so the differences which existed here on Safehold were the consequences of eight standard centuries of evolution away from a central matrix rather than towards one. On top of that, there was the way Langhorn and Vedar had programmed the colonists into an absolute belief in the religion they'd manufactured. Nimue's library included the original text of the Safeholdian Holy Writ, which Maruyama Chihiro, one of Langhorn's staffers, had composed, and she'd skimmed it with a sort of horrified fascination. 
According to the Church of God Awaiting, God had created Safehold as a home where his children could live in simple harmony with one another, embracing a lifestyle uncomplicated by anything which might come between him and them. Towards that end, he had selected archangels to help with the creation and perfection of their world, as well as to serve as mentors and guardians for his children. The greatest of the archangels, of course, had been the archangel Langhorn, the patron of divine law and life, and the archangel Bedar, the patron of wisdom and knowledge. The version of the church's scripture available to Nimue had almost certainly undergone significant revision following the events Commodore Pei had described in his final message. She had no way of knowing exactly what those revisions might have been until she could get her hands, or rather get one of her snark's hands, on a more recent edition. But since the original version listed Pei Shan Wei as one of the archangels herself, the archangel Langhorn's main assistant in bringing Safehold into existence in accordance with God's will, she was fairly sure that particular portion had seen some changes after Shan Wei's murder. Then there was the little matter of Cao Young's intention to kill Langhorn and Bedar as well. No doubt some judicious editing had been necessary to account for that, too. But it was clear that the fundamentals, at least, of the plan Langhorn and Bedar had concocted had been put into effect. The Church of God awaiting was a genuine, universal, worldwide church. For all intents and purposes, the original colonists truly had been created in the instant they stepped onto Safehold soil, and the false memories implanted in them took effect. They hadn't simply believed Langhorn, Bedar, and the other members of the Operation Ark command crew were archangels. They'd known they were. The fact that all of the original command crew would have continued access to the anti jerome treatments had also been factored into Langhorn's original plan. The colonists had had those treatments themselves prior to leaving Old Earth, but in their new environment, they would be unable to keep up the program of booster treatments. Since the command crew would be able to keep it up, they could expect total lifespans of as much as three centuries, and many of them had been as young as Nimue herself when they were assigned to the mission. The original Adams and Eves would live far longer than any human who'd never received the base anti gerone therapy, probably at least a century and a half. And the nanotech aspects of the original therapy would keep them disease and infection free. Given the colonists' average ages when Operation Ark was mounted, that would give them each at least 120 years of fully adult life here on Safehold more than enough to distinguish them from their shorter-lived descendants by giving them, Nimue made a moo of distaste, lifespans of truly biblical proportions coupled with immunity from disease. Yet the angels would live even longer, which meant the colonists and the first five or six generations of their descendants would have direct physical contact with immortal archangels. The fact that literacy had been universal among the original colonists was yet another factor. The sheer mass of written, historically documentable, first-hand accounts of their creation here on Safehold, of their later interaction with the archangels into whose care God had committed them, and of their enormously long lives must be overwhelming. Safehold's church wasn't confined to the writings of a restricted number of theologians, or to a relatively small seminal holy writ. It had the journals, the letters, the inspired writings of eight million people, all of whom had absolutely believed the accuracy of the events they'd set down. No wonder Bedar felt so confident her theocratic matrix would hold, Nimue thought sourly. These poor bastards never had a chance. And even if Cao Young had succeeded in his plan to kill Langhorn and his senior followers, someone had clearly survived to take charge of the master plan. The Temple of God and City of Zion were evidence enough of that, she thought grimly, for neither had existed prior to Shan Wei's murder. And the temple, especially, was the centerpiece of the physical proof of the Holy Writ's accuracy. She hadn't dared to let her snarks operate too freely in or around Zion, 
after she'd realized there were still at least a few low-powered energy sources somewhere under the temple. And she'd decided against using them inside the temple itself at all, despite the hole she knew that was going to make in her information gathering net. Unfortunately, she had no idea what those energy sources might be, and no desire to find out the hard way. But she hadn't had to get very close to the temple to appreciate its undeniable majesty and beauty, or the fact that it would probably outlast most of the local mountain ranges. It was ridiculous. She'd seen Planetary Defense Command bunkers, which had been flimsier than the temple, and she wondered which brilliant lunatic had decided to plate that silver dome in armor plast. It looked as if the plating was at least seven or eight centimeters thick, which meant it would have been sufficient to stop an old pre-space 40-centimeter armor-piercing shell without a scratch. It seemed just a little excessive as a way to keep the dome and that ludicrous statue of Langhorn bright and shiny. On the other hand, the simple existence of the temple and the miraculous armorplast and other advanced materials which had gone into it, not to mention the fact that its interior appeared to be completely climate-controlled even now, which probably explained those power sources, proved archangels truly had once walked the surface of Safehold. Surely no mere mortal hands could have reared such a structure. And yet, for all its size and majesty, the temple was actually only a tiny part of the church's power. Every single monarch on the planet was ruler by the grace of God and the Archangel Langhorn, and it was the church which extended or denied that legitimacy. In theory, the church could depose any ruler anywhere, anytime it chose. In fact, the church had always been very cautious about exercising that power, and had become even more so as the great kingdoms like Har Chong and Thittermark had arisen. But the church was still the mightiest, most powerful secular force on Seifold in her own right. The temple lands were smaller than Har Chong or Sittermark, with a smaller population, but they were larger and more populous than almost any other Seifoldian realm. And not even the church truly knew how much of the planet's total wealth it controlled. Every single person on Seifold was obligated by law to deliver a tithe of 20% of his income every single year. Secular rulers were responsible for collecting that tithe and delivering it to the church. The church then used it for charitable projects, the construction of yet more churches, and as capital for a profitable business lending funds back to the local princes and nobility at usurious rates. Plus, of course, the lives of incredible wealth and luxury it provided to its senior clergy. It was a grotesquely top-heavy structure, one in which the absolutism of the church's power was matched only by its faith in its own right to that power, and Nimue hated it. And yet, despite all of that, a part of her had actually been tempted to simply stand back and do nothing. The entire purpose of Operation Ark had been to create a refuge for humanity without the betraying high-tech spore which might draw Gababa scout ships to it. And so far, at least, Langhorn's megalomaniacal concoction seemed to be doing just that. But another part of her was both horrified and outraged by the monstrous deception which had been practiced upon the Safeholdians, and perhaps more to the point, what her snarks had already reported to her indicated that the facade was beginning to chip. It doesn't look like anyone's challenging the basic theology. Not yet, she thought. But the population's grown too large, and the church has discovered the truth of that old saying about power corrupting. I wish I could get the snarks inside the temple proper. But even without that, it's obvious this council of vicars is as corrupt and self-serving as any dictatorship in history. And even if it doesn't realize that itself, there have to be plenty of people outside the council who do. It's only a matter of time until some local Martin Luther or Jan Hus turns up to demand reforms, and once the central matrix begins to crack, who knows where it may go? Any safe hold reformation's going to be incredibly messy and ugly, 
given the universality of the church and its monopoly on temporal power. And these people absolutely believe the archangels are still out there somewhere watching over them. The believers will expect the archangel Langhorn and his fellows to come back, come to the aid of the church or of the reformers, and when they don't, somebody's going to proclaim that they never really existed in the first place, despite all the evidence, and that their entire religion has been a lie for almost a thousand local years. And when that happens, she shuddered, a purely psychosomatic reaction she knew, and her expression tightened. August, Year of God, 890 1. City of Telesburg and Harith Foothills, near Rothar, Kingdom of Cherith. Your Highness, I don't think this is such a good idea, Lieutenant Falcon said. In fact, I think it's a very bad idea. Crown Prince Caleb looked at his chief bodyguard and raised one eyebrow. It was an expression of his father's, which he'd been practicing for some time now. Unfortunately, it didn't seem to have quite the same effect when Caleb employed it. It's all very well for you to give me that look, Falcon told him. You are the one who's going to have to explain to the king what happened to his heir if something unfortunate does happen. And with my luck, the instant I let you out of my sight, something will. Arnold, it's only a hunting trip, Caleb said patiently, as he handed his tunic to Galvin Dykin, his valet. If I take a great thundering herd of bodyguards along, how am I going to hunt anything? And if it should turn out someone is inclined to be hunting you? Things are just a bit unsettled lately, you know. And the last time I looked, there were several people on Seyfold who didn't cherish feelings of great warmth where your house is concerned. Arnold Falcon, the youngest son of the Earl of Sharpset, was only nine years older than Caleb himself. He was also an officer in the Royal Cherisian Marines, however, and by tradition, the Marines, and not the Royal Guard, were responsible for the heir to the throne's security, which meant young Falcon hadn't exactly been picked for his duties at random. It also meant he didn't let his youth keep him from taking his responsibilities to keep the heir to the Cherisian throne alive, very seriously indeed, and Caleb hated it when he resorted to unfair tricks like logic. They'd have to know where I was to begin with, Caleb said, and I haven't said I'm not willing to take any bodyguards along. I just don't see any reason to drag the entire detachment up into the hills less than twenty miles from Telesburg. I see. And just how large a part of the detachment were you thinking in terms of? Well, that's what I thought, Lieutenant Falcon folded his arms and leaned his broad shoulders against the wall of his prince's airy blue-painted sitting room and Caleb was almost certain he'd heard a snort of agreement from Dykin as the valet left the room. The least I'll settle for is a minimum of five men, Falcon announced. Five? Caleb stared at him. We won't need to stand off a regiment, Arnold, unless you think Narmon or Hector can get an entire army past the navy. Five, Falcon repeated firmly. Plus me, any fewer than that, and you aren't going at all. Unless I'm mistaken, I am the prince in this room, Caleb said just a bit plaintively, and I'm afraid princes actually have less freedom than a lot of other people. Falcon smiled with true sympathy. But as I say, I'm not going to face your father and admit I let anything happen to you. Caleb looked rebellious, but there was no give in Falcon's eyes. The lieutenant simply looked back patiently, waiting until his youthful, sometimes fractious, Charge's basic good sense and responsibility had time to float to the surface. All right, Caleb sighed at last. But only five, he added gamely. Of course, your highness, Lieutenant Falcon murmured, bowing in graceful submission. Excuse me, your highness, Lieutenant Falcon said the following day, as the crown prince, Falcon, and five marine bodyguards rode across a rolling valley through a winter morning which was working its way steadily towards noon. This close to the equator, the weather was still quite warm, despite the official season, and the lieutenant was sweating in his cuirass's airless embrace. That wasn't the reason for his sour expression, however. That stemmed from the fact that the small town of Rothar, a prosperous farming village eighteen miles from Talisburg, lay two hundred yards behind them, 
along with the local mayor, who'd just finished answering Prince Caleb's questions. Yes, Arnold? It's just occurred to me that there seems to have been a small failure in communication here. Unless, of course, you ever mentioned to me exactly what you were going hunting for, and I've simply forgotten. What? Caleb turned in his saddle and looked at the Marine officer with wide, guileless eyes. Did I forget to tell you? I rather doubt that, Falcon said grimly, and Caleb's lips twitched as he valiantly suppressed a smile. The crown prince, Falcon decided, had inherited every bit of his father's talent for misdirection. He'd gotten Falcon so tied up in arguing about numbers of bodyguards that the lieutenant had completely forgotten to ask about the hunt's intended quarry. Certainly you don't think I deliberately failed to tell you, Caleb asked, his expression artfully hurt, and Falcon snorted. That's exactly what I think, Your Highness, and I'm half inclined to turn this entire expedition around. I don't think we'll do that, Caleb said, and Falcon's mental ears twitched at the subtle but clear shift in tone. He looked at the prince, and Caleb looked back levelly. This slash lizard's already killed two farmers, Arnold. It's got the taste for man flesh now, and more and more people are going to be out working the fields over the next few five days. It's only a matter of time before it takes another one, or a child. I'm not going to let that happen. Your Highness, I can't argue with that desire, Falcon said, his own tone and expression equally sober. But letting you personally hunt something like this on foot comes under the heading of unacceptable risks. Caleb looked away for a moment, letting his eyes sweep over the foothills leading up to Cheris' craggy spine. The dark green needles of the tall, slender pines moved restlessly, rippling like resinous waves under the caress of a strong breeze out of the south, and the white-topped, dark-bottomed anvils of thunderclouds were piling up gradually on the southern horizon. Looking back to the west, towards Tellisburg, the green and brown patchwork of prosperous farms stretched across the lower slopes. Above them, to the east, the mountains towered ever higher. It was already noticeably cooler than it had been in the capital, and that would become steadily more pronounced as they climbed higher into the hills. Indeed, there was snow on some of the taller peaks above them year-round, and high overhead he saw the circling shape of a wyvern riding the thermals patiently, as it waited for some unwary rabbit or hedge lizard to offer itself as breakfast. It was a beautiful day, and he inhaled a deep, fresh draft of air, the air of Cheris, the land to whose service he'd been born. He let that awareness fill his thoughts as the air had filled his lungs, then looked back at the lieutenant. Do you remember how my father nearly lost his leg? He was almost as young and foolish as you are at the time, I understand, Falcon replied, rather than answering the question directly. Maybe he was, Caleb conceded. But however that may be, it didn't happen because he was running away from his responsibilities to his subjects. And there are at least a dozen children in Tellisburg today who have fathers because my father remembered those responsibilities. The crown prince shrugged. I'll admit, I didn't tell you about the slash lizard because I want to go after it myself. That doesn't change the fact that hunting it down, or at least seeing to it that it is hunted down, is my responsibility. And in this case, I think Father would support me. After he got done administering the thrashing of your life, Falcon growled. Probably, Caleb chuckled. I'm getting a bit old for that sort of thing. But if you were to tell him about the way I threw dust into your eyes, He'd probably be just a little upset with me. Still, I think he'd agree that now that I'm here, I shouldn't be turning around with my tail between my legs. He wouldn't be any too pleased with me for letting you throw dust into my eyes, either. Falcon observed glumly. Then he sighed. Very well, Your Highness. We're here, you fooled me, and I'm not going to drag you home kicking and screaming. But, from this point on, you're under my orders. I'm not going to lose you to a slash lizard of old damned things, so if I tell you to get the hell out of the way, you get the hell out of the way. He shook his head as the prince started to open his mouth. 
I'm not going to tell you you can't hunt the thing or how to go about doing it, but you're not taking any foolish chances, like walking into any thickets after a wounded lizard, for example. Clear? Clear, Caleb agreed, after a moment. Good. Falcon shook his head. And just for the record, Your Highness, from now on I want to know what you're hunting, not just where and when. Oh, of course, Caleb promised piously. However Caleb might have misled him in order to get here in the first place, Falcon had to admit that the Crown Prince was in his element as they moved cautiously across the mountain slope. Caleb's tutors had their hands full getting him to pay attention to his books even now. When he'd been younger, that task had been all but impossible, but the royal huntsmen and armsmasters couldn't have asked for a more attentive student. And however much Falcon would have preferred to see someone else, anyone else actually, hunting this particular slash lizard, the prince was showing at least a modicum of good sense. Slash lizards were one of Safehold's more fearsome land-going predators. A fully mature mountain slash lizard could run to as much as 14 feet in length, of which no more than 4 feet would be tail. Their long snouts were amply provided with sharp triangular teeth, two complete rows of them, top and bottom, which could punch through even the most tightly woven mail, and their long-toed feet boasted talons as much as five inches long. They were fast, nasty-tempered, territorial, and fearless. Fortunately, the fearless part was at least partly the result of the fact that they were pretty close to brainless as well. A slash lizard would take on anything that moved short of one of the great dragons, but no slash lizard had ever heard of anything remotely like caution. Caleb knew all of that at least as well as Falcon did, and he was making little effort to stalk his quarry. After all, why go to the trouble of looking for the slash lizard when he could count on it to come looking for him? Falcon didn't much care for the logic inherent in that approach, but he understood it. And, to be honest, he also accepted that Prince Caleb was much handier with the lizard spears they all carried than any of his bodyguards were. The lieutenant didn't much care for that either, but he knew it was true. The crown prince was actually whistling loudly, tunelessly, and off-key as they wandered as obviously as possible through the heart of the slash lizard's apparent range. They were on foot, and Falcon supposed he should at least be grateful Caleb wasn't singing. King Harald had an excellent singing voice, a deep resonant bass, well suited to the traditional Cheresian sea chanties. But Caleb couldn't have carried a tune in a purse sane, which did not unfortunately prevent him from trying to on all too many occasions. None of the bodyguards was trying to be particularly quiet either. All of them, and the prince, were, however, staying as far away from any undergrowth as they could manage. Fortunately, the shade under the tall, straight-trunked pines creeping down from the higher slopes had choked out most of the tangled wire vine and choke tree, which formed all but impenetrable thickets lower down in the foothills. That gave them, and the slash lizard, fairly long, relatively unobstructed sight lines and assuming the local farmers' reports about the slash lizard's recent habits were accurate, then they ought to be... A sudden blood-curdling scream came out of the woods on the slopes above them. No one who'd once heard an enraged slash lizard could ever mistake its war cry for anything else. The high-pitched wailing whistle somehow still managed to sound like the tearing canvas of a sail splitting in a sudden gale. It was the voice of pure, distilled rage, raised in furious challenge, and the entire hunting party wheeled towards the sound as the broad, low-slung creature who'd made it erupted from the woods behind it. It wasn't a fully mature slash lizard after all, a corner of Falcon's mind noted as he muscled his eight-foot lizard spear around. This one was barely eleven feet from snout tip to tail tip, but all six legs churned Furiously as it charged, gaping maw spread wide to show all four rows of wetly shining fangs. The lieutenant was still wrestling his spear into position when Prince Caleb shouted back 
at the charging lizard. The prince's shout was as obscene as it was loud, accusing the creature's mother of certain physically impossible actions. But content was less important than volume. Although it shouldn't have been possible for the slash lizard to hear anything through the sheer racket of its own bellow, it obviously heard Caleb just fine. And with the single-minded territorial fury of its kind, it recognized the raised voice of a puny counter-challenge. Falcon swore even more obscenely than Caleb as the hurtling predator's trajectory altered slightly. It thundered directly towards Caleb, as fast as or faster than any charging horse, and not one of the prince's bodyguards was in position to intercept it, which, of course, was precisely what the crown prince had intended. Caleb turned his body almost at right angles to the slash lizard's charge. His lizard spear's long, broad, leaf-shaped head came down with the precision of a Sittermark pikeman. His right foot extended slightly towards the lizard, and his left foot slid back and came down on the butt of his spear shaft to brace it. It all happened almost instantaneously, with the muscle memory instinct of a swordsman and a polished perfection of form any of the prince's hunting mentors would have been proud to see. Then the lizard was upon him. The creature's thick, squat neck stretched forward, the white lining of its opened mouth and gaping gullet shocking against the dark gray-green of its winter pelt as its jaws reached for the foolhardy foe who'd dared to invade its territory. And then the wailing thunder of its challenge turned into a high-pitched squall of anguish as the prince's razor-edged spearhead punched unerringly into the base of its throat. The twenty-inch spearhead drove into the center of its chest, and its own hurtling weight hammered the knife-edged point home with a power no human arm could have achieved. The stout eighteen-inch crossbar a foot below the base of the spearhead prevented that same weight from driving it straight down the spear shaft to reach Caleb. The shock of impact still nearly bowled the prince over. Despite his impeccable form and braced position, but it didn't and the slash lizard's squall turned into a choking scream as the spearhead punched straight into its heart. The lizard slammed to a halt, writhing and thrashing in pinned agony, blood fountaining from opened mouth and nostrils. Its death throes almost accomplished what the force of its charge had failed to, shaking the crown prince like one of the port's mastiffs, shaking a spider rat. It could still have killed Caleb with a single blow from one of its massively clawed forefeet, but the prince clung to his spear shaft, using it to fend off the half-ton of mortally wounded fury. To Lieutenant Falcon it seemed to take a brief eternity, but it couldn't actually have been anywhere near that long. The lizard's screams turned into bubbling moans, its frantic thrashing slowed, and then, with a last almost pathetic groan, it folded in upon itself and went down in a twitching heap. Shanway, take it, the shortest of the men lying belly down on the ridgeline snarled in disgust. Why couldn't that accursed lizard have done its job? Never really much chance of that, sir, his second-in-command observed dryly. That was as pretty a piece of work as I've ever seen. Of course there wasn't, the leader acknowledged sourly. Still I could hope, couldn't I? His subordinate simply nodded. Well, the leader sighed after a moment. I suppose it just means we'll have to do it the hard way after all. Well, Arnold Falcon said, looking at his crown prince across the slash lizard's still shuddering carcass. That was certainly exciting, wasn't it? Caleb's answering laugh was exuberant, despite his chief bodyguard's less than fully approving tone. Then the prince braced one foot on the lizard's shoulder, gripped the spear shaft in both hands, bent his back, and grunted with effort as he pulled the long, lethal head free. Actually, it was, he agreed, as he began scrubbing blood off the spear by wiping it through the low-growing near heather. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Falcon said repressively, and Caleb grinned at him. The lieutenant tried to glower back, but despite his best efforts, his own grin leaked through. He started to say something else, then shook his head and looked at one of his subordinates instead. Pater? Yes, sir. 
Sergeant Peter Faircaster replied crisply, although he couldn't quite suppress a smile of his own. The prince's bodyguards might all deplore the way their charge's insistence on doing things like this complicated their own duties, but there was no denying that it was more satisfying to protect someone who wasn't afraid of his own shadow. Take someone back with you for the horses, and send someone else back to take a message to Rothar. Tell the mayor to send out a cart to haul this— He poked the lizard with the toe of one boot. Back with us. I'm sure, he gave the prince a sweet smile, that his majesty is going to be fascinated to see what sort of small game the prince was out hunting this morning. Oh, that's a low blow, Arnold, Caleb acknowledged, raising one hand in the gesture a judge used to indicate a touch in a training match. I know, your highness, Falcon agreed, while the rest of the prince's bodyguards chuckled with the privilege of trusted retainers. Lewis, Faircaster said, pointing to one of the other troopers. You and Sigmon. Aye, Sergeant. Lewis Farmon's broad mountain accent was more pronounced than usual, and he was still grinning as he touched left shoulder with right hand in salute and jerked his head at Sigmon Ormaster. We'll do that thing. He and Ormaster handed their spears to Franz Dimitri. Then the two of them trotted off with Faircaster, leaving Dimitri and Corporal Jacques Dragoner with Falcon and the Prince. Now, isn't that handy? The short man on the ridgeline murmured in much more satisfied tones. It suits me right down to the ground, sir, his second-in-command agreed feelingly. Cheresian marines had a well-earned reputation, and they didn't get assigned as royal bodyguards for their sweet dispositions and retiring ways. Well, the leader said after a moment, I suppose we'd best get to it, and at least we've got ground we can work with. He and his men had been shadowing the prince's party ever since it left Rothar, and while he would have preferred for the lizard to do their job for them, the opportunities the present terrain offered were obvious to his experienced eye. Let's go, and remember, he glared at the rest of his men, I'll personally cut the throat of anyone who makes a sound until the crossbows are into position. Heads nodded, and eleven more men, all dressed in the same gray-brown and green garments, two of them armed with crossbows, climbed to their feet behind him and his sergeant. Just as a matter of curiosity, your highness, Lieutenant Falcon asked as he paced the length of the slash lizard's outstretched body, how did you come to hear about this? Hear about it, Caleb repeated, eyebrows raised, and Falcon shrugged. As a general rule, palace gossip spreads faster than a crown fire in a pine wood, he said. In this case, though, I hadn't heard a whisper about this fellow. He jerked a thumb at the dead lizard. That's why you were able to get this little expedition past me. I'm just curious about how you managed to hear about it before anyone else. I don't really remember, Caleb admitted, after considering it for a few seconds. He scratched one eyebrow, frowning thoughtfully. I think it may have been from Taimon, but I'm not really sure about that. Taimon would have known about it if anyone did, Falcon acknowledged. Taimon Greenhill, one of King Harald's senior huntsmen for over eighteen years, had been Caleb's chief hunting mentor, since the king's crippled leg had prevented him from filling that role himself. He does have a way of hearing about things like this, Caleb agreed, and he— Get down, your highness! Arnold Falcon's head snapped up as a voice he'd never heard before in his life shouted the four-word warning. The short man whirled in shock as the deep, powerful voice shouted from behind him. He and his men had gotten to within fifty yards of their intended prey. The thick carpet of pine needles had muffled any sound their feet might have made, and the steep-sided gully of a dry, seasonal streambed's twisting course had provided cover for their approach. His two crossbowmen had just settled into firing position, bracing their weapons on the raised lip of the stream bed and waiting patiently for the moving marine lieutenant to clear their line of fire to their target. Not surprisingly, every scrap of the leader's attention at that moment was concentrated on the Cheresian crown prince and his three remaining bodyguards, which was why he was totally unprepared to see the man charging across that same carpet of pine needles towards him with a drawn sword in his hands. Lieutenant Falcon reacted out of instinct and training, not conscious thought. His right hand swept towards the hilt of his sword, but his left reached out simultaneously, 
It caught Crown Prince Caleb by the front of his tunic and yanked brutally. The sudden heave took Caleb completely by surprise. He unbalanced and went down in an ungainly sprawl, just as a crossbow bolt hissed through the space he'd occupied an instant before. The same bolt could not have missed Falcon by more than six inches, and a second bolt slammed into Jack Dragoner's chest. The corporal crumpled backward without even a scream, and the lieutenant's blade hissed out of its sheath. Franz Dimitri tossed aside the lizard spears he'd been holding and snatched out his own cutlass almost as quickly as Falcon's sword cleared the scabbard. The two surviving marines, still reacting before conscious thought could catch up with them, moved to place themselves between the prince and the apparent source of the attack. The assassin's leader just had time to draw his own sword before the interfering madman came bounding down into the dry water course towards him. Finish the job, the leader shouted to his second in command. I'll deal with this bastard. His subordinate didn't even hesitate. The leader's reputation as a master swordsman was well deserved. It was also one of the reasons he'd been chosen for this mission in the first place. And the second in command heaped himself up out of the stream bed on the side closest to the Cheresians. Come on, he barked. Falcon swore viciously as at least ten men seemed to appear out of the very ground. Two of them carried crossbows, but all the rest had drawn swords, and the crossbowmen dropped their ungainly slow-firing weapons and reached for their own swords. Run, Highness, the lieutenant shouted as he sensed Caleb bouncing back to his feet behind him. Fuck that, the crown prince spat back, and steel scraped as he drew his own blade. God damn it, Caleb, run! Falcon bellowed, and then the attackers were upon them. The assassin leader was confident in his own skill, but a faint warning bell rang somewhere inside him as his unexpected opponent's peculiar stance registered. The mysterious newcomer held the hilt of his weapon in both hands just above eye level, with one foot advanced and his entire body turned at a slight angle. It was unlike any stance the assassin had ever seen, but he had no time to analyze it. Not before the hovering weapon hissed forward like a steel lightning bolt. The sheer blazing speed of the stroke took the assassin by surprise, but he was just as good as his reputation claimed. He managed to interpose his own broadsword, despite his opponent's speed, and even though he'd never encountered an attack quite like this one, it didn't help. He had one brief instant for his eyes to begin to widen in shocked disbelief as the newcomer's blade sliced cleanly through his own, and then his head leapt from his shoulders. Arnold Falcon parried frantically as the first sword came chopping in, steel jarred on steel with an ugly anvil-like clang, and he twisted aside as a second blade reached for him. He heard more metal clashing on metal, and swore with silent desperation as he realized Caleb, instead of running while he and Dimitri tried to slow the assassins, had fallen into formation with them. Only three things kept the crown prince and either of his marines alive for the next few seconds. One was the two crossbowmen's need to discard one weapon and draw another, which slowed them and dropped them a little behind the other ten attackers. The second was the fact that all of the assassins coming at them had expected those crossbows to do the job without any need to engage anyone hand to hand. They'd been just as surprised by the mysterious stranger's intervention as Falcon had been by their own attack and their rush towards the prince and his bodyguards was a scrambling, unorganized thing. They didn't come in together in a tightly organized attack. And the third thing was that Caleb had ignored Falcon's order to run. The first assassin to reach the crown prince leapt towards him, sword slashing only to stumble back with a sobbing scream as Caleb unleashed a short, powerful lunge. King Harald had imported a weapons master from Kiznetsif in South Harchong, and while the Empire might be decadent, might be corrupt, and was definitely insufferably arrogant, it still boasted some of the finest weapons instructors in the world. Master Domnek was at least as arrogant as any Harchong stereotype, but he was also just as good at his craft as he thought he was, and a relentless taskmaster. Most Safeholdian swordsmen were trained in the old school, but Caleb had been taught by someone who recognized that swords had points for a reason. His savage economic lunge drove a foot of steel through his opponent's chest, and he'd recovered back into a guard position before his victim hit the ground. A second assassin came hurtling in on the crown prince, only to collapse, 
this time with little more than a gurgling moan, as Caleb's second thrust went home at the base of his throat. Falcon was too heavily engaged against two other opponents to allow his attention to stray, but he was agonizingly aware that the assassins were concentrating their efforts against Caleb. The fact that they were was probably the only reason Falcon and Dimitri were still alive, yet he didn't expect to stay that way for long against three-to-one odds. But then something new was added. The assassin second-in-command heard a scream from behind them and grinned nastily at the evidence that his commander had dealt with the interfering busybody who'd spoiled their ambush. But then he heard a second scream, and he backed off a couple of paces from the confusion of blades and bodies around the Cherisian prince and his outnumbered bodyguards and turned to look back the way he'd come. He just had time to take in the crumpled bodies of his two crossbowmen and then the man who'd killed both of them was upon him in a swirl of steel. Unlike his late commander, this assassin had no time to register anything peculiar about his opponent's stance. He was too busy dying as the newcomer drove a two-handed thrust straight through his lungs and heart, twisted his wrists, and recovered his blade, all in one graceful movement and without ever breaking stride. Died 4. Off Armageddon Reef by David Weber, continuing on page 84. Arnold Falcon got through to one of his attackers. The man fell back with a groan, dropping the dirk in his offhand as his left arm went limp. But then the lieutenant grunted in anguish as a sword got through his own guard and gashed the outside of his left thigh. He staggered, staying on his feet somehow, but his sword wavered and another blade came driving at him. He managed to beat the attack aside, carrying his attacker's sword to the left, but that left him uncovered on the right, and he sensed another assassin coming in on him. And then that assassin went down himself, instantly dead, as a gory steel thunderbolt impacted on the nape of his neck like a hammer and severed his spinal cord. Falcon wasted no time trying to understand what had just happened. There were still armed men trying to kill his prince, and he used the distraction of the stranger's attack to finish off his wounded adversary. He heard Dimitri groan behind him, even as the dead man fell, and cursed as the marine went down, uncovering Caleb's left side. Falcon knew the prince was exposed, but the wounded lieutenant was still too heavily engaged with his sole remaining opponent to do anything about it. Caleb saw Dimitri collapse from the corner of one eye. He knew what that meant, and he tried to wheel to face the man who'd cut down his bodyguard. But the two men already attacking him redoubled their efforts, pinning him in place. The prince's mind was clear and cold, focused, as Master Domnek had taught him. Yet beyond the shield of that focus was a stab of cold terror, as he waited for Dimitri's killer to take him from the flank. But then, suddenly, someone else was at his side, someone whose flashing blade cut down two foes in what seemed a single motion. The three surviving would-be assassins abruptly realized that the odds had somehow mysteriously become even. They fell back, as if by common consent, but if they'd intended to break off the attack, they'd left it too late. Caleb stepped forward, lunging in cart. Another of his attackers folded forward over the bitter thrust of his blade, and the stranger who'd mysteriously materialized at his left side lopped off another head in almost the same instant. It was the first time Caleb had actually heard of anyone managing that in a single, clean, one-handed blow, outside some stupid, heroic ballad, at least, and the sole remaining assassin seemed as impressed by it as the crown prince. He whirled to flee, and Caleb was in the act of recovering his stance, unable to interfere as the man turned to run, but the stranger's sword licked out with blinding speed, and the assassin shrieked as he was neatly hamstrung. He collapsed, and the stranger stepped forward. A booted foot slammed down on the back of the wounded man's sword hand, evoking another scream as it crushed the small bones. The assassin twisted, his left hand scrabbling at the hilt of the dagger at his hip, and the stranger's sword licked out again, severing the tendons in his wrist. It was over in a heartbeat, and then Caleb found himself facing the stranger who had just saved his life across the sobbing body of the only surviving attacker. It occurred to me, the stranger said in an odd clipped accent, strange sapphire eyes bright, that you might want to ask this fellow a few questions about... Who sent him, Your Highness? 2. 
Harith foothills near Rothar, kingdom of Cheris. Crown Prince Caleb knew he was staring at his totally unanticipated rescuer, but he couldn't help it. The newcomer looked unlike anyone he'd ever seen before. His complexion was paler even than Father Peter Wilson's, and Caleb had never seen eyes of such a deep, dark blue. Yet while Father Peter's complexion and gray eyes went with an unruly shock of bright red hair, this man's hair was as dark as Caleb's own, and he was taller even than Caleb by a full two inches. He was also quite improbably handsome, in spite of the thin white scar which seamed his right cheek. In some ways, his features were almost effeminate, despite his fiercely waxed mustachios and neat dagger beard. Yet that, like the piratical-looking scar, only gave his face a certain exotic cast. All in all, a most impressive character, and one who'd arrived at the proverbial last second. Which, of course, raised the question of just how he'd managed to do that. Caleb might not have been the most bookish scholar his tutors had ever encountered, but he'd been well-grounded in basic logic, history, and statecraft, and his father had personally undertaken his instruction in the essential suspicion any head of state required. While he was perfectly well aware that coincidences truly did happen, he was also aware that some coincidences were made to happen, especially when the people responsible for them were engaged in a shadowy struggle for the highest stakes imaginable. I hope you'll forgive me for pointing this out, the prince said, without cleaning or sheathing his own blade. But you appear to have a certain advantage. You know who I am, but I have no idea who you are, sir. Which must certainly appear suspicious under the circumstances. Your Highness, the stranger observed with a smile and bowed ever so slightly, I'm called Merlin, Prince Caleb, Merlin Athrawis, and the reason the circumstances appear suspicious is because they are... I scarcely happened along by accident, and explaining exactly how I did come to arrive will require some time. For now, however, he bent and ripped a handful of fabric from his last whimpering victim's tunic, used it to wipe his blade, and sheathed the steel smoothly. Both this fellow here and Lieutenant Falcon would seem to require a little attention. Caleb twitched as he was reminded, and looked quickly at the lieutenant. Falcon sat on the pine needles, his eyes glassy as he used both hands to stanch the flow of blood from his wounded thigh, and the crown prince took a quick step in his direction. Then he froze, his eyes whipping back to Merlin, as he realized how thoroughly and effortlessly the stranger had redirected his attention. But the other man simply stood there, arms folded across his chest, and raised one sardonic eyebrow. Caleb flushed. On the other hand, if the stranger had wished him harm, there'd been no reason to interfere in the ambush in the first place. That didn't mean he might not have some deeper, subtly inimical purpose in mind. But it seemed unlikely that burying a dagger in the prince's back was among his immediate plans. The crown prince dropped to his knees beside Falcon. Rather than waste time cleaning his own sword and returning it to the scabbard, he laid it on the pine needles, then drew his dagger and began slicing open the leg of the lieutenant's breeches. The wound was ugly enough and bleeding freely, but without the heavy, pulsing flow of arterial blood. He unbuttoned the huntsman's pouch on his left hip and quickly extracted the rolled bandage of boiled cotton. He covered the wound with a pad of Fleming moss, then wrapped the bandage tightly around Falcon's thigh, applying pressure to the wound. If pressure and the absorbent healing moss didn't stop the bleeding, he had a packet of curved needles and boiled thread to close the wound with stitches, but he was scarcely a trained surgeon. He preferred to leave that sort of repair to someone who knew what he was doing. The lieutenant had slumped back, eyes closed, while the prince worked on him. By the time Caleb tied the bandage off, though, Falcon's eyes were open once more. The marine turned his head, and his mouth tightened with more than the physical pain of his own wound as he saw Dragoner's and Dimitri's bodies. Then he looked outward at the sprawled corpses of the assassins, and his eyes narrowed as he saw the mysterious Merlin kneeling beside the one surviving attacker. Merlin's hands had been busy attending to the other man's wounds, even as Caleb saw to Falcon's, although it was apparent from the assassins' sounds that the stranger wasn't wasting a great deal of gentleness upon him. 
Falcon's head rolled back, his gaze met Caleb's, and both eyebrows rose in question. Caleb looked back at him, then shrugged. The lieutenant grimaced, then pushed himself up, with the prince's assistance and a grunt of pain, into a sitting position. Caleb positioned himself unobtrusively to allow the marine to lean back against him, and Falcon cleared his throat. "'Excuse me,' he said, looking up at the man who'd saved not only the prince's life but his own. "'But I think we need a few answers, sir.' The man who'd introduced himself to Caleb as Merlin, and who had decided he really needed to work on never thinking of himself as Nimue Alban, smiled. The expression was rather more confident than he actually felt, but he'd known this moment, or one very like it, was going to come. Well, not exactly like this one, he amended. It was sheer serendipity that his snark had not only stumbled across the plot to assassinate Crown Prince Caleb, but that he'd actually managed to arrive in time to help foil it. Good thing I did, too. I already knew Caleb was a good-looking kid, but I hadn't realized quite how much presence he has, especially for someone who's barely nineteen standard. If I can just get him to trust me, I can do something with him. Assuming, of course, that I can figure out a way to go on keeping him alive. I am known, he told Falcon, as I have already informed Prince Caleb, as Merlin Athrawis, and I'm not at all surprised you have questions, Lieutenant Falcon. I certainly would in your place. And while I may be confident I cherish no ill designs upon the Prince, there's no reason you should feel that way. So if you have questions I can answer, ask them. Falcon cocked his head, his expression wary, then bought a little time by easing his wounded leg's position with a wince of pain which was not at all feigned. He was uncomfortably aware that his own light-headedness scarcely made this the ideal time for a probing, insightful interrogation. Unfortunately, this was the only time, and the only wit he had. Besides, something about Merlin's manner made him suspect he would be outclassed in any battle of wits with him at the best of times. Since you've been courteous enough to acknowledge that my duty to my prince requires me to be suspicious of apparent coincidences, he said after a moment, perhaps you might begin by telling me how you happened along at such an extremely opportune moment. Caleb stirred slightly behind him, but stilled as Falcon reached back unobtrusively and squeezed his ankle. He knew the Crown Prince well enough to be aware that, despite Caleb's own recognition of the need to be cautious, he retained sufficient of childhood's romantic faith in heroic ballads and how the characters in them ought to act to feel uncomfortable at such a direct challenge. But this Athrawis, and what sort of surname was that anyway, seemed more amused than offended. He took time to recheck his rough but efficient repairs to the crippled assassin, then folded down gracefully to sit tailor fashion on the pine needles. To begin at the beginning, Lieutenant, he said then in that strangely clipped accent. I come from the Mountains of Light. Although I wasn't born there, I've made my home among their peaks for many years, and after long and careful study I've been blessed with some, at least, of the powers of a Sejin. Falcon's eyes narrowed, and Caleb inhaled audibly behind him. The Mountains of Light contained the second holiest site of Safehold, the mighty peak of Mount Olympus, where the archangel Langhorn had first set foot upon the solid earth of Safehold, when God established the firmament in the misty dawn of creation. And the Sejin were a legend in their own right, warriors, holy men, sometimes prophets and sometimes teachers. Only the archangels themselves could endure Surgoi Kasai, God's own mystic fire. But the Seijin had been touched by Anshin Ritsume, God's little fire, and it rendered them men forever set apart from other mortals. To the lieutenant's knowledge, no authentic Seijin had ever visited the kingdom of Cheris, and the mere fact that someone claimed to be one proved nothing. Although he conceded, it would take more nerve than most people possessed to claim Seijin status falsely. That's an interesting statement, sir, Falcon said slowly after a moment. And one difficult to prove, Merlin agreed. Believe me, Lieutenant, you can't be more aware of that fact than I am. He smiled wryly and leaned back, stroking one waxed mustachio with the fingers of his right hand. 
In fact, I must admit that I never anticipated I might find myself called to such a role. Still, I believe the writ warns us that our tasks in life will seek us out, wherever we may be, and whatever we may plan. Falcon nodded. Again, he had the distinct impression that Athrawis was amused by his questions, his suspicion. Still, he sensed no malice in the other man. His own current dizziness made him distrust his instincts, yet he found he felt more curious than threatened. For quite some time, Merlin continued, his expression more serious, I've been gifted with the sight. I sometimes see events which take place thousands of miles away, although I've never seen into the future or the past, as some have claimed to do. That ability to see distant events is what led me to Cheris at this time. While I may not be able to see the future, I have seen other visions. Visions concerning Cheris, Crown Prince Caleb and his father and their enemies. Somehow I find it difficult to believe such visions would be given to me if I weren't meant to act upon them. Forgive me, Caleb said, his expression intent. But if, as you say, you can't see the future, then how did you know about this? He took one hand from Falcon's shoulder and waved at the carnage all about them. Your Highness, Merlin said almost gently, surely you aren't so naive as to believe this attack simply materialized out of thin air this morning. You have enemies, Prince, enemies who, whether they realize it or not, serve darkness, and I've seen many visions of their plans and plots, of correspondence and orders passing between them. I've known for almost half a year that they intended to bring about your death in any way they could. This isn't their first plan, but simply the first which came this close to success. I've been traveling from the Temple Lands to Cheris for many five days now, ever since I became aware that they were preparing to move from mere plans to actual execution, if you'll pardon the choice of words. He smiled, showing improbably white, perfect teeth, and Caleb frowned. Don't think me ungrateful, he said, but I find it difficult to believe I'm so righteous that God himself would send a sage in to save me. I suspect you are more righteous than many, Your Highness, possibly even than most. After all, at your age, how much opportunity have you had to become unrighteous? Merlin chuckled and shook his head. However, I'm not at all sure your personal righteousness has anything to do with it. You seem a nice enough young man, but I rather suspect that what brought me here has more to do with what you may accomplish in the future than anything you've already done. Accomplish in the future? Caleb stiffened, and Merlin shrugged. As I've already said, Your Highness, it's never been given to me to see the future. I do, however, see the patterns of the present, and what I've seen of your father's rule gives me a very good opinion of him. I know, he held up one hand with an easy smile, I know, presumptuous of me to judge the worth of any king, and especially of a king not my own. Still there it is. His people are happy and prosperous, and until certain other parties began actively plotting against him, they were secure as well and he's spent years training you, which suggests you would continue in the same mold as king. At any rate, and for whatever reason those visions have come to me, it seemed evident your enemies were prepared, or preparing, to strike directly at either you, your father, or both. There was nothing I could do about it from my home, and so I took ship for Cheris. I arrived three days ago aboard Captain Charles' ship. Marie Charles? Falcon asked more sharply than he'd intended to, and Merlin nodded. Yes, I traveled cross-country to Siddhar, and I was fortunate enough to find Wave Daughter there with a load of Zebedian tea. Captain Charles had run into some sort of problem with the customs officers, which took several five days to straighten out, but he'd finally gotten it taken care of just before I arrived. He was headed home with a cargo of Siddermark brandy, and I needed a ride. Merlin smiled again. If the good captain is typical of the way you Cheresians haggle, it's small wonder so many envy your trading ship's successes. Captain Charles drives a hard bargain, Falcon agreed. I suppose it comes from all the years he spent as a purser in the Navy. You need more practice at trapping liars, Lieutenant, Merlin told him with a chuckle. Captain Charles was never a purser. In fact, I believe he told me he holds a reserve commission in your Navy as a full shipmaster, if I recall correctly. Caleb snorted behind Falcon, and Merlin winked at the crown prince. Besides, he added, it would be particularly stupid of me to give you the name of both captain and ship if I were lying, wouldn't it? 
Yes, it would, Falcon acknowledged. Still, given the uncanny nature of your tale, I'm sure you realize we will be speaking to Captain Charles. Merlin simply nodded with another small smile, and Falcon inhaled deeply. So, you arrived in Tellisburg three days ago. Why didn't you make your presence known sooner? Oh, come now, Lieutenant. This time Merlin laughed out loud. Suppose I'd walked up to the palace gate three days ago, rung the bell, and informed the commander of the palace guard that I'd journeyed all the way from the temple lands to Cheris because I had a vision that the crown prince was in danger. And could I possibly have a personal audience with him to explain all that, please? Given all the political currents and cross-currents swirling about between Cheris, Emerald, Coruscant, and Tarot, how do you think Colonel Ropewalk would have reacted? Not well, Falcon admitted, noting once more that whoever and whatever else this Athrawis might actually be, he was fiendishly well informed about events and people here in Cheris. Not well is putting it mildly, Lieutenant, Merlin snorted. I'm sure he would have been at least reasonably polite about it, but I'd still be sitting in a cell somewhere while he tried to figure out which of your many enemies had sent me. He shook his head. I'm afraid Colonel Ropewalk doesn't have a very trusting disposition. Which is why he's the commander of the palace guard, Falcon pointed out. I'm sure, but without any way to prove my bona fides, it seemed best to me to find myself an inn and take a room while I waited to see what would happen next. At that time I had no knowledge of any immediate specific threat to the king or to the prince. Indeed, Merlin said with total honesty, it was only late yesterday evening that I became aware of this particular plot. In my visions I'd already seen these men's commander, a jerk of his head indicated the bodies sprawled around them, receiving instructions and passing on instructions of his own. But only last night did I see him issuing the orders for this attack. And, by the way, it was he who saw to it that one of the prince's huntsmen heard about this slash lizard as well. I'm afraid he and his masters had a very good idea of how the prince would react to the news. Thanks to my vision, I knew what was intended, but I had absolutely no evidence I could have presented to anyone. Had I been in your boots, lieutenant, I would have been most suspicious of any total stranger who arrived on my doorstep this morning with tales of hidden assassins lurking in the forest. I would have had the stranger in question detained, at least until I could get to the bottom of his preposterous story, which would just happen to have put the only person, other than the murderers, of course, who knew anything about the plan, in a position from which he could accomplish nothing. So instead of trying to warn you, I came ahead, determined to do what I could to spoil their plans myself. Merlin paused, and his strange sapphire eyes darkened as he gazed briefly at the two dead marines. I regret that I couldn't find a way to do it, which would have kept the rest of your men alive, Lieutenant. Perhaps if I could see the future, I might have been able to. Falcon sat silent for several minutes, gazing at the blue-eyed stranger. The lieutenant felt certain there were a great many things this Athrawis wasn't telling or was glossing over, and yet he also felt oddly certain the mysterious foreigner truly did wish young Caleb well. And whatever else he might be up to, without his intervention, the prince would most assuredly be dead at this moment. Moreover, it was Athrawis who'd seen to it that they had at least one of the assassins to interrogate, which he would hardly have done if that interrogation might implicate him in any plots. It was always possible Athrawis, or someone he worked for, had designs of his own upon Cheris. He might know exactly who'd sent the assassins and be working at cross-purposes to that particular enemy without being a friend himself. At the same time, however, he'd provided a wealth of detail about his own arrival in Cheris, which could be readily checked, and it might well be possible to test his claim to see visions as well. For the moment, the lieutenant decided, he had no choice but to take the Sajin claim at least tentatively seriously. Where that might lead, if indeed it proved accurate, was anyone's guess. Except, of course, that those who wished his kingdom ill would not be at all pleased to hear about it. 3. Telisburg, Kingdom of Cheris What happened? How do I know? Oscar Mulvane replied irritably. He glowered at Jaspar Maison. 
his immediate superior. The two of them sat at a table in a street-side cafe only two blocks from the wharves, sipping cups of strong, sweet Dolaran chocolate. The cafe was on the west side of the street, which had put it into cool shadow as the sun moved steadily towards evening, for which both men were devoutly grateful. And seabirds and sand wyverns foraged for scraps in a square across from it, where the produce hucksters had just closed their booths for the day. Despite the noise and bustle of a typical busy Tellisburg day, the scene was reassuringly normal and calm, which might well change in the next few hours, Mulvane thought, and shrugged one shoulder. Caleb went out, he came back, alive, he said. That much I've figured out for myself, Mason said sarcastically, and I know two of his bodyguards came back dead, and another one came back wounded, too. Then you should also know the gate guard was told to expect a pair of wagons shortly. One's supposed to have a dead slash lizard in it, the other one's supposed to be piled up with dead assassins. A full wagon load, over a dozen. Mulvane bared his teeth in a caricature of a smile. I don't suppose you'd care to guess just who all of those dead assassins might be? Shan Wei, Mason muttered. How could they screw up that badly against just five bodyguards? Well, Mulvane said philosophically, at least we don't have any explaining to do. He paused and looked at his superior closely. We don't, do we? Not likely, Mason snorted. You think I'd be sitting around here talking to you if there were any chance something like this might lead back to me? It would seem a little foolish, Mulvane agreed. The only thing more foolish I could think of right offhand would be going home to tell him in person that I'd been involved in anything this stupid. Mulvane chuckled, although in truth neither of them felt particularly amused. He started to say something else, then paused as the waiter stopped by their table to offer refills on their chocolate. Mason raised one eyebrow at him, and Mulvane nodded. The imported chocolate was expensive, but Mulvane's cover as the representative of a Desneri banking house, and Mason's cover as the owner of a small fleet of merchant ships, gave them the resources to indulge themselves from time to time. The waiter poured, then departed, and Mulvane waited until the young man was out of earshot before speaking again. Their table was right at the edge of the slightly raised sidewalk, which put them very close to the cobblestone street. It was hardly a preferred location for most of the cafe's patrons. The noise of horse hooves, the grating roar of iron-shod wheels over cobbles, the burbling whistles of draft dragons, and the constant surf of background voices made it difficult to carry on a comfortable conversation. That same racket, however, also made it extremely difficult for anyone to overhear what they might have to say to one another. Actually, Mulvane said in a more serious tone, when he was certain no one else was in earshot, from the rumors I've heard, it ought to have worked. The rumors are already busy? Mason looked amused, and Mulvane shrugged. The rumors are always busy. In this case, the mayor of Rothar sent a messenger ahead. The yokel he chose passed his message to the gate guards, then found himself a tavern and had a few beers. Mulvane raised one hand and waggled it back and forth. By the time he had three or four of them inside him, he was waxing eloquent. How much of it was accurate, I don't know, of course. Of course, Mason nodded. Half a spy's job consisted of picking up rumors which might or might not be true and passing them along. If he was smart, he eliminated all the ones he could demonstrate were inaccurate and was honest with his employer about the ones whose veracity he doubted. Not that all spies were smart, in Mason's experience. Bearing that in mind, Mulvane continued, it sounds like everything went pretty much according to plan. They had the prince out in the woods, and he'd sent two or three of his bodyguards back for horses, and they'd brought along crossbows, so they shouldn't even have had to get into sword's reach of them. Mason looked impressed, almost against his will. He cupped his chocolate in both hands, sipping thoughtfully, then shook his head. If they had a wagon load of men, and they had the target just where they wanted him, what the hell went wrong? That's the interesting part, Mulvane said. According to our beer-loving messenger, everything was going exactly the way it should have, 
until some mysterious stranger interfered. Mysterious stranger, Mason repeated. That's what he said. Some fellow with strange blue eyes who killed at least a dozen assassins single-handedly. Of course he did, Mason snorted sarcastically. I may not have been overly impressed with the quality of our associates' brains, Oscar, but they were reasonably competent in their own limited area. Agreed, but this fellow was pretty insistent. According to him, and he stuck by it through at least three complete repetitions before I had to leave to make our appointment here, it was the stranger who warned Caleb's bodyguards about the attack. And then he apparently slaughtered the attackers right and left himself. If we're going to believe the messenger's version of things, Caleb and this stranger were the only two still on their feet when it was all over. Really? Mason leaned back lips first. That is interesting, he murmured so softly even Mulvane could scarcely hear him through the background noise. If this fellow was that insistent, then he was probably telling the truth, at least as far as he knows the truth. Did he have anything to say about how this stranger of his happened to be there? According to him, the stranger was obviously sent by God, Mulvane said. The two of them looked at one another across the table, their eyes amused. After all, how else could he have arrived at exactly the right moment to save the crown prince? Somehow, I doubt God had a great deal to do with it, Mason said dryly, which isn't to say someone else didn't. Were our friends indiscreet, do you think? They must have been, although, Mulvane frowned, I wouldn't have expected it of them. Admittedly, they were basically blunt instruments, but they knew Harald's agents are watching everywhere for assassins these days, and they were experienced. Not the sort to blab about their plans where someone might hear, you mean? Exactly. Besides, if that was what happened, why was only one stranger involved? We're talking about Caleb. If they'd truly believed someone meant to try to kill him, they'd have had an entire regiment out there, not just one man. Unless that one man was the only one who'd realized what our less adroit associates intended to do. Mason said thoughtfully. Even then he should have gone straight to the guard with it, Mulvane argued. Unless he truly is a stranger, not a reason at all, and he saw this as an opportunity to win the prince's confidence. Ah? Mulvane scratched one eyebrow, frowning thoughtfully out across the busy street, then looked back at Mason. That could be it, he conceded. A rather risky strategy, though, I'd have said. One man would stand a pretty good chance of getting himself killed trying to play hero against a wagon load of assassins. Assuming this really was the work of the people we think it was, and I'm pretty sure it was, there'd have been at least a dozen of them. Pretty steep odds, don't you think? I certainly wouldn't care for them, Mason nodded. On the other hand, I suppose a lot would depend on just how good with a sword you actually were. That's not my area of expertise, after all. Actually, the riskiest part of the entire strategy would be that the assassins might succeed despite your intervention. You wouldn't win much of Caleb's confidence if he was dead. Besides, if he'd been killed and you looked like you'd known about the attempt ahead of time, Harald would probably have had a few unpleasant things to say to you about your failure to bring it to someone else's attention. At the very least, Mulvane made a face at the oblique reminder of all of the unpleasant things King Harald and his interrogators might have to say to one Oscar Mulvane under certain best-not-thought-about circumstances. But, Mason continued thoughtfully, if this stranger did manage to stymie an attempt to kill the prince, He's undoubtedly going to find himself cordially received at the palace. If he plays his cards properly, that could lead to all sorts of rewards. Or, he looked back across the table at his subordinate, influence. Influence to accomplish what? Mulvane wondered. Who knows? Mason shrugged. Still, I suspect our employer won't be overly pleased to discover that a new player's taken a hand. 
This broth's rich enough without adding another cook to the kitchen. What do you want to do about it? Mulvane asked. He's going to want to know about this as soon as possible, Mason replied. Unfortunately, Captain White's just sailed. Should we use one of the alternate couriers? An interesting question. Mason took another sip of chocolate and considered Mulvane's query. Captain Stephen White's merchant ship plied a regular trading route from Tellisburg up Hal Bay and the Throat and across the Cheris Sea to Coruscant, picking up whatever cargo charters he could. That ought to be enough to make him a guaranteed object of suspicion to Harald's agents. But White's vessel was a miserable, barely seaworthy tub, and White himself was a drunk who spent most of his time in port, cozy up to a cask of cheap wine. No one in his right mind would trust him or his ship with anything remotely important or confidential. Unless that was they knew Captain White was actually Lieutenant Robert Bradley of the League Navy. Lieutenant Bradley didn't even like the taste of cheap wine, and he was far from incompetent. He couldn't afford to be, since his sea cloud was almost as ramshackle as she looked. The Royal Cheresian Navy was unlikely to be fooled by surface appearances, so she truly was as down at the heels and poorly maintained as she seemed, which made nursing sea cloud back and forth between Telesburg and Coruscant a non-trivial challenge even for a sober captain. Bradley and his counterpart, Lieutenant Fraser Mathis, better known in Cheris as Walter Seatown, maintained Mason's communications with Prince Hector. Voyage time was almost forty days each way at Sea Cloud's best speed, however, and Mathis' equally disreputable frame scene wouldn't arrive back at Telesburg for another three five days which meant Hector wouldn't have Mason's report for another seven minimum if he used the regular channels for it. There were arrangements for emergency alternates, but Mason was reluctant to use them because none of the alternative courier's covers were as good as White's or Mathis. Their best protection was that they'd never been used, and he had no desire to risk exposing them or himself to Cheresian agents for something which wasn't demonstrably critical. I think we won't use any of the others, he said finally. Not at once, at any rate. Better to use the time until Sea Town's return to see what additional information we can pick up. He shook his head slowly, eyes distant. It's only a feeling so far, but something tells me a new cook is indeed about to begin stirring this particular pot, whether we like it or not. Wonderful, Mulvane sighed. He finished his cup of chocolate and stood. In that case, I suppose I'd better get started picking up that information, he said, and nodded briskly to Mason before he turned away from the table. Mason watched him go, then stood himself, tossed a handful of coins onto the table, and headed off in the opposite direction. Stupid damned idiots, Brady Lang muttered savagely as he watched Crown Prince Caleb riding past below his second-story window vantage point. The royal guards who'd been dispatched to meet the prince at the gate formed a solid, vigilant ring around him, and a marine lieutenant rode in a stretcher suspended between two horses, while three other marines rode tight-shouldered at Caleb's back. That much Lang had more or less expected, given the preliminary reports he'd already received. What he hadn't expected was the civilian riding with the prince, and his eyes narrowed as he gazed down at the dark-haired stranger. So that's the bastard who screwed all of our plans to hell and gone, he thought sourly. He still didn't have a clue how the mysterious civilian had gotten wind of the operation in the first place, or how his highly paid mercenaries could have been so inept as to allow a single busybody to completely negate so many days of careful planning. It ought to have worked. It would have worked if not for him. Lang kept his bitter anger out of his expression, but it was harder than usual to make sure his face said only what he wanted it to say. Prince Narmon was going to be... displeased. He watched the cavalcade move on up the street towards the palace, then turned away from the window. He crossed the main chamber of his modest, if comfortable, lodgings, and climbed the stairs to the roof. A chorus of whistling hisses and clicking jaws greeted him, and he smiled with genuine pleasure 
his frustration and anger fading, and hissed back. The wyverns in the big, subdivided rooftop coop pressed against the lattice work, crowding together as they whistled for treats, and he chuckled and reached through the lattice to rub skulls and stroke necks. It was in many ways a foolhardy thing to do. Some of the wyverns in that coop had wingspans of over four feet. They could have removed a finger with a single snap of their serrated jaws, but Lang wasn't worried. He made a comfortable living without ever having to touch the funds his prince could have made available to him by raising and training hunting and racing wyverns for the Cheresian nobility and wealthier merchants. And the wyverns in these coops were not only his friends and pets, but also his cover in more than one way. They provided his income, and his profession explained why he had a constant influx of new wyverns to replace those he sold, which conveniently hid the fact that two or three in each shipment he received were homing wyverns from Prince Narmon's own coop in a raster. Now Lang took the enciphered report from his tunic pocket. It was written on the finest harchong paper, incredibly thin and tough, and commensurately expensive, although that was the least of his concerns as he opened the coop door and crooned a distinctive sequence of notes. One of the wyverns inside the coop whistled imperiously at its companions. A couple of them were slow to move aside, and it slapped them smartly with its forward wings until they bent their heads obsequiously and got out of its way. Then it stood in the coop door, stretching its long neck so that Lang could scratch its scaly throat while it crooned back to him. He spent a few moments petting the creature, then lifted it out of the coop and closed and carefully secured the door behind it. The wyvern perched on top of the coop, obediently extending one leg and watching alertly, head cocked, as he affixed the report to the message-holding ring. He made sure it was securely in position then gathered the wyvern in both arms and walked to the corner of the roof. Fly well, he whispered in its ear and tossed it upward. The wyvern whistled back to him as it flew one complete circle around the rooftop. Then it went arrowing off to the north. He gazed after it for a moment, then drew a deep breath and turned back towards the stairs. His preliminary report would be in Prince Naraman's hands within the next six days, but he knew his master well. The prince was going to want full details of how the plan to assassinate the Cheresian heir had failed, and that meant it was going to be up to Brady Lang to find out what had happened, hopefully without losing his own head in the process. 4. Royal Palace, Telesburg, Kingdom of Cheris the man called Merlin Athrawis looked around the sitting room of his guest suite in the royal palace of Telesburg, capital of the kingdom of Cheris. It was a pleasant, airy chamber, with the high ceilings favored in warm climates, on the second level of Queen Maritha's tower. It was also comfortably furnished and had an excellent view of the harbor, and a room in Queen Maritha's tower was an indication of high respect. The tower, where foreign ambassadors were customarily lodged, lay on the boundary between the royal family's personal section of the palace and its more public precincts. Of course, there were no doors which led directly from the tower into the royal family's quarters, and there just happened to be that permanently manned guard post at the tower's only entrance and exit, solely, no doubt, to protect the ambassadors' highly respected persons. Merlin smiled and strolled across to the mirror above the beautifully inlaid chest of drawers in the suite's bedchamber. The mirror was of silver-backed glass, and he studied the surprisingly clear, sharp reflection in its slightly wavery depths, almost as if it were a stranger's, which, after all, it was in many ways. He grimaced, then chuckled ruefully and ran a fingertip along one of his waxed mustachios. It was, he was forced to admit, a masterful disguise. One of the features of a full-capability last-generation Pika had been its owner's ability to physically reconfigure it. It wasn't a feature Nimue Alban had ever used, but then she hadn't used her Pika at all very often, certainly not as much as her father had hoped she would. To be honest, she'd known he would have vastly preferred for her never to have joined the Navy in the first place, and he'd deeply resented the demands it had placed upon her time. He'd loved her very much, 
and a man of his wealth and position had known the truth about the ultimate hopelessness of the Federation's position early on, she'd suspected that he hadn't intentionally brought her into a doomed world in the first place, that her birth had been an accident her mother had arranged, which very probably helped explain their divorce when she was only a child. Even if her suspicions were correct, that hadn't kept him from loving her once she'd been born. But he'd been afraid that as a serving officer in the Navy, she would die sooner than she had to. He'd wanted her to live as long as she could and to pack as much living as possible into the time she had before the inevitable happened. Well, Merlin thought, his smile going bittersweet, it looks like your decision to give me a pika worked out after all. I'm going to have a very long time to live indeed, Daddy. He gazed deep into his own reflected blue eyes, looking for some sign of the biological person he once had been, then brushed that thought aside and gave his mustachio another twirl. Nimue Alban had never been tempted to shift genders, either in her own biological case or even temporarily using her pika. Others had been rather more adventurous, however, and pikas had been designed to be fully functional in every sense. And since the technology had been available, the Pika designers had seen no reason not to allow their customers to reconfigure the gender, as well as the general physical appearance, of their marvelous, expensive toys. Given the male-dominated nature of Safeholdian society, Nimue finally had used the capability. There were inevitably some limitations for even the most capable technology, a pika couldn't be made significantly shorter or taller than it already was. There was some flex, but not a great deal. Shoulders could be broadened, hips could be narrowed, genitalia and pelvic structures could be rearranged, but the basic physical size of the pika itself was pretty much fixed by the size of its original human model. Fortunately, Nimue Alban had been a woman of rather more than average height even for her birth society, whose members had been blessed with excellent medical care and adequate diet from childhood. As a woman on safe hold, she would have been a giantess, and Merlin was quite a bit taller than most of the men he might meet. Nimue had added several judiciously placed scars here and there, like the one on Merlin's cheek as well. Merlin was a warrior, and she hadn't wanted anyone to wonder how someone had attained his years and prowess without ever even being wounded. The decision to become male hadn't been an easy one, despite the logic which made it effectively inevitable. Nimue Alban had never wanted to be a man, nor had she ever felt any particular physical attraction to women, and looking at Merlin's nude, undeniably male and very masculine physique in a full-length mirror for the first time had left him with very mixed feelings. Fortunately, Nimue had allowed herself, or rather had allowed Merlin, two of Safehold's thirty-day months to become accustomed to his new body. In light of the plan Nimue had evolved, Merlin was impressively muscled, not so much for brute strength as for endurance and staying power. The fact that a pika's basic frame and musculature were stressed to approximately ten times the strength and toughness of a normal human, and that a pika never tired, were simply two of the little secrets Merlin intended to hold in reserve. At the same time, accomplishing his mission would require him to earn the respect of those about him. And this was a muscle-powered society in which a man who aspired to influence must be prepared to demonstrate his own prowess. Enough wealth might buy respect, but Merlin couldn't simply appear with bags full of gold. And he certainly had no patent of nobility. His chosen Seijin's role would help in that respect, but he would have to demonstrate its reality and that meant living up to a Seijin's reputation, which almost any flesh-and-blood human being would have found difficult. That was why Merlin had spent quite a bit of time experimenting with the governors on his basic physical capabilities. Nimue had never done a great deal of that, but Merlin was likely to find himself in much higher-risk environments than any into which Nimue had ever ventured in her pika. More to the point, Merlin's survival was far more important than Nimue Alban's had ever been. So he'd set his reaction speed to a level about 20% higher than any human could have matched. He could have set it higher still. His nervous impulses traveled at light speed, 
through molecular circuitry and along fiber optic conduits without the chemical transmission processes upon which biological nerves depended, and he still had that extra speed in reserve for emergencies. But it was only for emergencies, and fairly dire ones at that. Even a Seijin would be looked at askance if he seemed too quick and agile. By the same token, Merlin had adjusted his strength to about 20% above what might have been expected out of a protoplasmic human with the same apparent musculature. That left him with quite a lot of literally superhuman strength in reserve as well, and he'd set the overrides to let him call upon it at need. It had taken him every day of the five days Nimue had allowed to learn not simply to move like a man, but to adjust for his enhanced reaction speed and strength. Well, that and the fact that his body's center of gravity had moved vertically upward quite a bit. He'd spent a lot of that time working out with the katana and the wakazashi he'd used Pei Kao Young's fabrication module to build. He'd had Owl design and actually fabricate the weapons, and he'd cheated just a little bit with them, too. The blades looked like the work of a Harchong master swordsmith, with the characteristic ripple pattern of what Old Earth had called Damascus steel. They even carried the proof marks of Hennick Reinhard, one of the legendary sword makers of Harchong, but they were actually made of battle steel orders of magnitude harder and tougher than any purely metallic alloy. Merlin could have had Owl give them an edge which was literally a molecule wide, but he'd resisted that temptation. Instead, he'd settled for one which was only as sharp as a safe hold surgeon's finest scalpel for the katana. The wakazashi was quite a bit sharper than that, since he anticipated using it only in dire emergencies. The katana would be Merlin's primary weapon, and since it was made of battle steel, he could do little things like using his reserve strength to slice completely through the assassin leader's blade without worrying about nicking or dulling his own. He intended to make very certain no one but he ever cared for either of those weapons. He also intended to spend quite a lot of time carefully inspecting their edges, honing them on a regular basis, seeing to it that they were properly oiled and guarded against rust, and everything else a blade made of true steel would have required. On the other hand, a Seijin was supposed to be a mysterious figure with more than merely mortal capabilities, and Merlin had no objection to carrying a sword, which evoked at least a little awe. That was one reason he'd stayed with the katana, which had no exact counterpart on Safehold, the fact that it was specifically suited to the only style of fencing Nimue Alban had ever studied was another factor, but its exotic appearance should contribute to the image he needed to create. He chuckled again, then turned away from the mirror with a final stroke for his absolutely genuine, inasmuch as any of him could be called genuine, mustachio. Apica had fully functional taste buds and a stomach so that its owner could sample novel cuisine while running it in remote mode. And since it might well have organic material in the aforesaid stomach, the designers had seen no reason not to utilize that material as efficiently as possible. The nanotech built into what passed for Merlin's digestive tract was fully capable of converting any food he ate into naturally growing fingernails, toenails, and hair. It couldn't begin to use all of the food an organic human being consumed in a day, however, and if Merlin was going to be forced to eat regularly, which he undoubtedly was, he'd have to dispose of the unused material at regular intervals. So I guess I'll still have to hit the head after all from time to time, he thought with a grin, as he strolled back across to the window. Although Queen Maritha's tower had long since been renovated into comfortable modern guest quarters, it had been a portion of the original royal castle's outer walls when it had first been built. The wall of the tower itself was a good meter and a half thick. Five feet, he corrected himself irritably, once again cursing that maniac Langhorn for abandoning the metric system. And he pushed the diamond-paned windows open and leaned his elbows on the immensely deep windowsill. The city made an impressive sight. It was built mainly of stone and brick, the kingdom of Cheris had far better uses for good timber than wasting it building houses. 
and the area near the waterfront was a vast sprawl of substantial warehouses, shipyards, rope walks, chandlers, and business offices. Farther inland, away from the warren of taverns, bistros, and bordellos, which served the mariners who manned the kingdom's merchant vessels, were the homes of the thousands of workmen who labored in those same warehouses and other establishments. And farther inland still, on the rising land moving away from the harbor along the banks of the Tellus River towards the palace itself, were the townhouses and mansions of noblemen and wealthy merchants. The city's total population was in the vicinity of a hundred thousand, which made it huge for Cheris, and much more than merely respectable for Safehold generally. It also meant Telesburg was completely ringed by farmland, whose sole purpose was to keep the city's population fed. Even so, it was necessary to import vast quantities of food on a regular basis. The Cheresian merchant marine was more than equal to the task as long as the Royal Cheresia Navy maintained control of Howell Bay. But a hundred thousand was still an enormous population for a city built by a civilization powered only by wind, water, and muscle. It was also a remarkably clean city. Safeholdian notions of public hygiene and waste disposal were far more stringent than anything Old Earth had known at any comparable technology level. Merlin was delighted that they were, too, the sorts of pestilences and plagues which had routinely swept through pre-industrial old earth cities were very rare occurrences on Safehold. Besides, it also meant Telesburg smelled far better than its old earth counterparts ever had. He smiled, but then the smile faded as he saw the church spires which dominated the city's low-lying skyline. He could see literally dozens of them from where he stood and every one of them was part of the lie which had brought him to Cheris in the first place. On the other hand, he thought, every single one of them has at least one bell in its tower, too. Big ones at that, and that means foundries. Lots and lots of foundries. That's going to come in handy as hell in the not-too-distant. The dark blue waters of Howell Bay stretched northward as far as even his eyes could see. The bay was very nearly half the size of Old Earth's Mediterranean. If the body of water called the throat were added, their combined length would have been 80% of the Mediterraneans, although they would also have been much narrower. Like the Mediterranean, the throat and Howell Bay were almost completely landlocked, except where the throat opened onto the Cheris Sea. And they and the Cheris Sea were utterly dominated by the Royal Cheresian Navy at the moment. Merlin pursed his lips and whistled tunelessly as he considered King Harald VII's dilemma. The kingdom of Cheris was one of Safehold's more substantial kingdoms. It had grown, although the local histories didn't remember it exactly that way, out of one of the original colonial enclaves, in fact, the original site for the city of Telesburg had been chosen by Pei Shan Wei herself during her terraforming operations. Given Shan Wei's place in the revised version of Langhorne's religion, it wasn't surprising that no one remembered that, and Telesburg hadn't been a very large enclave. Most of those had been located on the larger landmasses of Haven and Howard, where the bulk of the planet's population was located even today. Nor had Telesburg received much in the way of outside support, possibly because of its parentage. Yet it had grown anyway, slowly but steadily, and it had begun establishing colonies of its own about 500 local years ago. Those colonies had quickly established their independence as feudal territories in their own right, but Telesburg had always remained the largest and most powerful of the Cheresian states, first among equals, one might say. Then, about 200 local years ago, the House of Armok had risen to power in Telesburg under Harald III, the present king's direct ancestor. Over the last two centuries, the Armok dynasty had gradually extended its control over the entire landmass known as Cheris Island. Personally, Merlin considered that something of a misnomer. The island in question would have been considered a continent on most planets, of course, its sparsely inhabited upper third or so was almost completely severed from the rest of it by the throat and Howl Bay. The mountainous isthmus, which connected it to the lower two-thirds and formed the bay's western coast, 
between the bay and the cauldron, was barely fifty-five kilometers. Thirty-four miles, he corrected sourly, wide at its narrowest point. That upper portion had long been considered a completely separate land mass. In fact, it had been given its own name, Margaret's Land, and only added to the rest of the kingdom of Cheris about eighty local years ago. Across the Cheris Sea lay Emerald Island, about the size of Margaret's Land, and just as sparsely settled, but independent from, and resentful of, Cheris. Prince Narmon of Emerald walked carefully around Cheris, but his hatred of Harald and the huge Cheresian merchant marine which dominated the carrying trade of Safehold was both deep and profound. The House of Bates had acquired title to Emerald less than two generations ago, following the unfortunate demise of every male member of the previous ruling house. As such, Narmon had a lively awareness of how a ruler's fortunes could shift abruptly. That, coupled with the fact that he was perhaps not unreasonably, suspicious that Cheris's long steady expansion meant the Armok dynasty ultimately had designs upon Emerald as well, only added fuel to his hatred for all things Cheresian. Silverlode Island, southeast of Emerald and directly across the smaller Middle Sea and Windhover Sea from Cheris, was almost as big as Cheris itself. Combined with Cheris, Margaret's Land, and Emerald, Silverlode comprised the thoroughly inaccurately labeled Cheresian Archipelago. Silverload itself was even more sparsely settled than Cheris, mostly because of its terrain, which was considered rugged even by Safeholdian standards. What population there was tended to be clustered along the long western coastline, sheltered from the dreadful storms which all too often blew in off of the Carter Ocean to the southeast. Most of the Silverload town cities and petty nobles although nominally independent of the Cheresian crown, owed personal fealty of one sort or another to King Harald and his house, and, for all practical purposes, they were an integral part of the kingdom he ruled. It had taken Cheris centuries of patient effort to attain her present position, but today she was the unquestioned mistress of Safehold's oceans. Her merchant marine was the largest on the entire planet, by a very considerable margin. Her navy was at least equal to that of any two of her potential rivals, and her wealth reflected that. Yet, for all that, Cheris was not quite in the top rank of Safehold's great powers. In many respects, she hovered on the cusp of crossing over to that status, but for the present, she was definitely not in the same league as the densely populated Harchong Empire, or the Republic of Sidermark, or the Desnarian Empire, or, of course, the Temple Lands. Fortunately for Cheris, none of those great powers, with the possible exception of the Desnarians, had any extensive naval tradition or, for that matter, ambitions. Unfortunately for Cheris, the League of Coruscant, to the east of Emerald and Silverlode, and the steadily unifying Corsair kinglets of Trelheim, even farther to the east, most certainly did. For that matter, so did the Kingdom of Chisholm which dominated the somewhat larger continent of the same name, not to mention the kingdom of Dolar or the kingdom of Taro. The latter might be an official ally of long standing, but its present monarch resented the arrangement, not without some reason, since he found himself virtually a tributary vassal of Harald's. Oh, yes, there were lots of people who had their own reasons for resenting, envying, hating, or fearing Cheris, including, unfortunately, the church. Merlin frowned at that thought, watching the busy harbor unseeingly while he contemplated it. He remained unable, or at least unwilling, to risk inserting his snark's listening devices into the temple's precincts. There was simply too much danger that those unidentified power sources might connect to something he really, really didn't want to disturb. But that meant that the one set of meetings he most longed to snoop upon those of the Council of Vickers, were beyond his reach. He could operate a bit more freely in Zion, farther away from the temple, but it wasn't the same, because virtually all of the Vickers, the Church of God's equivalent of the College of Cardinals, lived in the temple itself, in the vast, comfortable suites which were part of the original structure. Lesser prelates, like Cheris' own Archbishop Eric, 
had luxurious lodgings elsewhere in the city, and Merlin was able to listen in on their conversations in the restaurants, coffee houses, gaming houses, and discreet brothels where much of their business was conducted. He was well aware of the advantages that gave him, but it also made his lack of access inside the temple even more irritating. From what he could pick up, however, it was obvious the church cherished long-standing suspicions about Cheris, and he sometimes suspected that dim memories of Shan Wei's initial sponsorship of Telesburg still lingered. Whether that was so or not, the kingdom's distance from the temple and Zion would probably have been enough to make the church weary of its doctrinal reliability, and the local clergy was accustomed to a sort of benign neglect. When it took two months for the temple to send a message to Telesburg and receive a reply, there was simply no way the Council of Vicars could keep the local church as firmly under thumb as it could the clergy of Haven and Howard. From what Merlin had been able to discover, fears of Cheresian heresy were unfounded, but Cheresian attitudes were increasingly, if quietly, critical of the vicars' flagrant abuses of power. No one was going to be stupid enough to say so openly. The Inquisition operated even here, after all, which made it difficult for even Merlin to judge what sort of resentment simmered beneath the surface. But it was enough to bring at least some softly spoken criticism out of the Church's own clergy here in the kingdom, which probably did amount to heresy in the vicar's eyes, Merlin admitted. And it was obvious that the kingdom's steadily growing wealth and international prestige was another factor in the disfavor with which Mother Church regarded Cheris. But while there were many people prepared to resent or envy Cheris, there were relatively few, with the probable exception of Gregor Stonar, Lord Protector of Sidermark, effectively the elected dictator of the Republic, who felt any particular urge to help the kingdom and Sidermark, unfortunately, despite the well-deserved reputation of its matchless pike-armed infantry, had no navy beyond a purely coast defense force which Narmon of Emerald could handily have defeated all by himself. All in all, Cheris's future looked rather bleak. Not today, not this five day, or possibly even next year or the year after, but her enemies were drawing the noose steadily tighter about her, with what amounted to the Church's tacit approval. So far, Harald's canny diplomacy had managed to stave off outright disaster, but his enemy's recent success in having Tadeo Montale's claim to the earldom of Henth confirmed over that of Howard Brygart marked a serious downturn in his fortunes. Henth was the largest of the feudal territories of Margaret's land, and the one which had longest resisted Cheresian authority. Having it handed to what everyone recognized, whether they were willing to admit it or not, as a usurper with no legitimate claim to the title, would have been a blow to Harald at any time. At this particular time, that blow might well prove mortal, or at least the first of the thousand cuts his enemies had in mind for him. By Merlin's current estimate, it was likely Harald would manage to pass his throne and crown to Caleb. It was unlikely Caleb would ever pass them to a son or daughter of his own, unless something changed. Merlin straightened, folding his arms as he watched the busy shipping along the wharves and docks of Telesburg. There was power and vitality in Cheris. Harchong was decadent, Desnair was too focused on conquest, and Sidermark was too preoccupied with securing its own frontiers against the threat of Harchong and Desnair alike. But Cheris... There was wealth, art, and literature in Cheris. In many ways, the kingdom reminded Merlin of what Nimue had read of Old Earth's England in the 17th or 18th centuries, or perhaps Holland of roughly the same time period. There were no burgeoning scientists, for the Church of God awaiting would never have permitted that. But at the same time, it was obvious to Merlin that Langhorne's plan had begun to slip, if ever so slightly. The critical, challenging mindset of Old Earth's scientific revolution might not have arisen yet, but that didn't mean all advances had been frozen. Here in Cheris, for example, there was a yeasty, bubbling ferment, 
and the Royal College Harald's father had founded had gathered together a body of truly formidable scholars. It might be true that none of them had ever heard of the scientific method, but they were deeply devoted to the collection and preservation of knowledge, as well as teaching, and the present king had begun quietly appointing some of his kingdom's best mechanics to the college's fellows. The college's collective work helped foster a sense of opening horizons in applied techniques as well as the traditional humanities, which extended to other aspects of the kingdom's life. Like the burgeoning industrial base, of sorts at least, which underlay much of its growing wealth. The Holy Writ's prescriptions against any sort of advanced technology were unchallenged, even in Cheris, but there'd already been a certain amount of leakage. Safeholdian metallurgy, for example, was at the level of Old Earth's early 18th century, or even a bit further advanced. And the planet's agriculture, built around the teaching of the Archangel Sondheim, disc harrows, animal-drawn reapers, and terrestrial food crops genetically engineered for disease and parasite resistance, not to mention high yields, was productive enough to create a surplus labor force. It wasn't that huge a surplus as a percentage of the total population, especially not in places like Harchong, where the social structure had stratified centuries ago around a surf-based agricultural economy. It still took a lot of farmers to keep people fed, but there were a lot of artisans almost everywhere as well. And the situation was even worse from Langhorne's perspective here in Cheris, whose climate permitted year-round agriculture in much of the island. Cheris was a land with a sparse population and a widespread trading empire. Those factors had conspired to create a degree of inventiveness which would have horrified Langhorne and Bedard, and the Royal College's interest in the mechanical arts had begun to shape and direct that inventiveness. That thought alone would have been enough to incline Merlin favorably towards Cheris, and to explain the church's suspicions of it, even if it hadn't suited the kingdom so well to his needs. If any of Langhorne's sycophants had studied history the way Shan Wei had, he suspected, the writ would have incorporated far more stringent controls on things like the use of water power. But they appeared to have overlooked the fact that Old Earth's industrial revolution had begun with water wheels, not steam engines, and Cheris manufactories were well on the road towards the same destination. Nor was that the only thing which had slipped through the cracks of Langhorne's great plan. These people had gunpowder, for example. It wasn't very good gunpowder. It was still meal powder, weak and dangerous to work with, and they hadn't had it very long. But he rather suspected that the gunpowder genie alone would have been enough to topple Langhorne's neat little scheme eventually. Merlin wondered exactly how its introduction had gotten past the church. He suspected that the answer was a fairly massive bribe, probably from Harchong, where it had originally been introduced. Approving it for any reason struck Merlin as an act of lunacy on the church's part, given the system it was dedicated to maintaining. But in fairness, the church might well not have recognized its military potential when it first arrived. As nearly as Merlin could tell so far, it had been introduced primarily for use in mining and engineering projects, not warfare. And even now, 80 or 90 years later, it was obvious Safehold was still feeling its way towards the compound's military applications. At the moment, their firearms and artillery were about as primitively designed as their gunpowder. The best infantry firearm they had was a crudely designed matchlock and no one appeared to have thought even of the wheel lock yet, much less the flint lock. Their artillery wasn't much more advanced, conceptually, but that wasn't because their metallurgy wasn't good enough to produce much better weapons, assuming someone were to suggest how that might be done. Coupled with the Cheresians' manufacturing base, general inventiveness, and tightening circle of enemies, that offered all sorts of possibilities for opening the nascent cracks in Langhorne's foundations just a bit wider. But even more importantly, there was a social openness in the kingdom of Cheris as well. No one would ever confuse Cheris with a representative democracy. King Harald would probably suffer an apoplectic attack at the very notion. 
but the Royal Teresian Navy had a centuries-long tradition of accepting only the service of freemen. Outright serfdom had been abolished in Cheris well over a century ago, and by the standard of any other safe Holdean state, Teresian commoners were undeniably uppity, which, coupled with the centrality of trade and traders to Teresian prosperity, helped explain why Harald's parliament was an active vital part of his government. For the most part it did what it was told, but it zealously guarded its prerogatives, and Harald was wise enough to side with the commons against the lords sufficiently often to leave no doubt in anyone's mind where the true power lay. For that matter, most of the Cheresian nobility was actively involved in trade without the arrogant hauteur of the landed nobles of Harchong or Desner. They recognized ability as being just as vital as blue blood. The mere possession of a title did not excuse sloth or indolence, and a Cheresian commoner of ability and energy could expect to rise far higher than his counterpart in almost any other safe Holdian realm. That was why Merlin was here. The basic matrix of Cheresian politics and society offered the most fertile soil for the seed he had to plant. There was still the minor problem of Langhorne's insurance policy, which Owl had discovered in his orbital survey. Figuring out a way to deal with that was going to be a challenge. But even after it was overcome, it was obvious to Merlin that he couldn't possibly try to impose technology upon Safehold any more than he could single-handedly overthrow the church. The changes he had to induce must be organic, must grow out of a genuine shift in basic attitudes and belief structures, Merlin had come to think of himself as a virus. The analogy wasn't perfect, but it worked. By himself he could accomplish nothing. But if he found the proper cell, invaded it, made it over in the necessary image, it would spread the infection for him. And Cheris was the perfect host, assuming, of course, that he could prevent its destruction. Fortunately, he continued to share one common trait with Nimue Alban. Both of them had always liked a challenge. 5. Royal Palace, Eraster, Emerald Island What's so damned important? Prince Narmon demanded in a surly tone. The prince wore a light robe of harchong cotton silk over his pajamas, and his expression was not happy as Hall Shander, the fifth baron of Shander, was shown into his breakfast parlor. Narmon, as every male of the House of Bates seemed to be, was short. Unlike his late father, however, he was also a corpulent man with a round baby face which was capable of beaming with the simple joy of human kindness whenever its owner required it to. At such times the casual observer might be forgiven for failing to note the hard, calculating light which burned behind its apparently mild brown eyes. At other times, like now, Narman's expression was a clear warning that he was in a foul mood and when that was true, no one would have called his eyes mild. "'I crave your pardon for disturbing you so early, my prince,' Shander replied, bending in a deep and profound bow. "'I wouldn't have done so had the situation not required your immediate attention.' Narman grunted. The sound managed to combine dubiousness and irritation in almost equal measure. Shander noted unhappily. Narman hated having his leisurely breakfast routine interrupted by business, especially when the business in question included things he wasn't going to like hearing about. And there were very few bits of news, Shander knew, which he was going to be less happy to hear about over the post-breakfast pastries. On the other hand, the Prince of Emerald recognized Shander's value, and however irritable and demanding Narmon could be, he also recognized the value of loyalty. Unpleasant scenes were far from rare for those unfortunates who found themselves bringing him bad news, but in the long run he was a craftsman who cared for his tools, and he didn't really have the messenger beheaded. Not often, at any rate. The prince looked at him for several moments, keeping him standing. That wasn't a particularly good sign in Shander's experience, but it wasn't necessarily a disastrous one, either. The baron stood as calmly as he could under his prince's scrutiny, waiting. 
Morning breeze blew gently through the wide open window, stirring the sheer drapes, and the luxuriously furnished room was quiet enough that Shanda could hear the rattle of near palm fronds and the twittering of birds from the palace gardens, the more distant whistle of wyverns from the palace mews, and the occasional zinging whine of a spider beetle as it droned past the window. Then the prince snapped his fingers at the servant standing behind his chair. A cup of chocolate for the baron, he said, and the footman produced cup and chocolate pot as if by magic. Narman pointed at a chair at the foot of his table, and Shander seated himself and waited, with carefully hidden relief, until the cup arrived in front of him. Leave the pot, Narman directed the servant. Yes, sir, the man murmured. He set the pot at Shander's elbow, then bowed himself out of the room. That was one thing about Narmon's servants, Shander reflected as he sampled the delicious chocolate. They were well-trained and knew the value of discretion. All right, Narmon said as the dining parlor door closed behind the servant. I don't imagine you came calling this early to bring me good news. I'm afraid not, my prince, Shander admitted. In fact, the baron would vastly have preferred to wait. Unfortunately, while Narmon was never in a good mood when business interrupted his morning routine, he would have been in an even worse mood whenever he eventually discovered that Shander had delayed bringing him this particular bit of information. Well, spit it out, Narmon commanded. My prince, we've received a report from Lang. Caleb is still alive. Narmon's round chubby face tightened and his eyes narrowed ominously. Shander, as the man ultimately responsible for the planning and execution of all of Narmon's clandestine operations, had seen that expression on several occasions, and he ordered his own expression to remain calm. Why? Narmon asked coldly. Lang wasn't certain when he wrote his report, my prince. Shander replied, reminding himself that he and his network of agents succeeded in Narmon's service far more often than they failed. As you know, he added delicately, Lang wasn't completely free of constraints when he organized the assassination. Narmon's lips tightened further for just an instant, but then they relaxed and he nodded curtly. He knew exactly why Shander had raised that point, but the semi-excuse had more than a little validity and he recognized that as well. Granted, the prince said after a moment. On the other hand, I thought the people he'd chosen were supposed to be professionals. They were, my prince, Shander said. At least they came highly recommended, and under the circumstances I have to agree with Lang, and for that matter with the Duke, that using any of our own people would have been unwise. Not if they'd succeeded. Narmon growled, but then he shook his head. In fairness, Lang had been against the operation from the outset, and not just because of the tactical difficulties of arranging it, but the Duke had convinced Narmon to overrule his agent on the spot, and Lang hadn't been picked for that assignment at random. The fact that he'd initially opposed the attempt to kill Caleb wouldn't have kept him from doing his very best to make the assassination succeed. And given the way things seemed to have worked out, he'd obviously been right about the need to maintain the greatest possible degree of deniability on Emerald's part. No, you're right, Hall, he conceded at last. Even if they'd succeeded, they might have been taken, made to talk. From Lang's report, it sounds as if at least one of them was taken, my prince, Shander said. Narman grimaced, and his spymaster shrugged. At the moment, it appears unlikely the fellow knows much about who hired him. It sounds as if he was one of the common swordsmen. Thank Langhorn for small favors, Narmon muttered, then inhaled deeply. What went wrong? he asked in a calmer tone, reaching for his own chocolate cup and sipping with a delicacy which always seemed a bit odd in someone as rotund as he. Lang is still working on the details. Shander gave another small shrug. Obviously, he has to be particularly careful just now. 
Suspicion in Telesburg has to be running high, and Wave Thunder is going to be looking very carefully at anyone who seems to be poking around for information at a time like this. From the preliminary reports and rumors he'd been able to pick up before dispatching his message, though, it sounds like something out of a children's tale. Narman's eyebrows arched, and Shander chuckled humorlessly. According to Lang, the story going around in Telesburg is that the assassins almost succeeded, that they would have succeeded if not for the intervention of some mysterious stranger. Stranger, Narman repeated. That's what Lang says, my prince. So far, there aren't any reliable details on just who this stranger might be, but the gossip running around Telesburg already has him bigger than life. Some of the wilder tales insist he's some sort of Seijin, probably with a magic sword to boot. But almost all of the rumors, even the more reasonable ones, agree it was he who warned Caleb and his bodyguards at the very last moment. The attackers still managed to kill or wound all of Caleb's guards, but between them, Caleb, his guardsmen, and this stranger killed all but one of the assassins. Most of the gossip agrees that the stranger killed over half of them himself. It sounds like we should have hired him, Naraman observed with bleak humor, and Shander allowed himself a small smile in response. The prince sat back in his chair, nibbling on a pastry rich with nuts and sticky with honey, while he considered Shander's report. Shander often wondered how the man could savor such sweet, heavy treats given the climate of a sea-level capital city, almost directly upon the equator. But Narmon's sweet tooth was proverbial. He chewed thoughtfully, steadily, for at least five full minutes, and the baron sat equally silent, sipping his own chocolate. Finally, Narmon finished the pastry, wiped its stickiness from his fingers with a napkin, and drained his own cup. I assume you've told me everything we know so far, he said. I have, my prince. As I've said, Lang is working to get us more details, and I expect we'll hear from the duke eventually. This time he and Narmon grimaced at one another. Until then, however, the baron continued, we really know nothing. Granted, still, if the rumors and gossip all insist this stranger, whoever the Shen Wei he was, was responsible for whatever went wrong, I think we need to discover all we can about him. Somehow I doubt he's just going to disappear, not after saving the Crown Prince's life. Side 5. Off Armageddon Reef by David Weber. Continuing on page 110. You may well be right, my prince, but it's also possible he's no more than a common adventurer who was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. If you truly believe that's likely, Hall, then perhaps I need a new chief spy. Narman snorted. I didn't say it was likely, my prince. I simply pointed out that it was possible, and it is. I agree that we need to discover all we can about him, especially how he may have learned about our plans ahead of time. At the same time, it's never wise to allow oneself to become too wedded to any set of assumptions before they can be confirmed or denied. A valid point, Narman conceded. Still, I want to know everything we can about him. Of course, my prince, and I think we need to consider our own exposure, Narman continued. I know Lang's links to the Duke are well hidden, but Wave Thunder's no fool, and well hidden isn't the same as invisible. Harald is bound to suspect us, and if they've figured out more than we think they have, they may know exactly who Lang is and pull him in for questioning. How much damage can he do us if they do? A great deal, I'm afraid, Shander admitted. He's in charge of all our operations in Telesburg, and he coordinates almost all of our agents outside the capital as well. And although we never told him what our ultimate objectives might be, He's bound to have recognized, especially with the Duke's participation, that it was a direct attack on the monarchy, not just on Caleb. The Baron sighed. To be effective, he has to know enough, and be intelligent enough, to be dangerous, my lord. 
Should we consider his retirement? I honestly don't know. Shander frowned, one fingertip tracing circles in a brilliant patch of sunlight on the table's waxed and polished surface as he thought about it. I'm sure he has plans in place to quietly disappear at need, the Baron said after a few seconds. How good those plans may be is impossible to say, of course, especially from this distance. If the Cheresians know or suspect who he really is, the chance of his managing to simply vanish probably isn't very good. They'd have to be prepared to pounce the instant he looked as if he might be trying to get out of town. Given the fact that it's what he knows that makes him dangerous to us, ordering him to try to leave Talisburg might be the worst thing we could do if it did cause them to go ahead and arrest him for interrogation. It would probably be simpler and safer to simply have him removed, my prince. That would be relatively straightforward, and there are enough Cheresians we could hire through a proper intermediary to kill him for any number of ostensible reasons without implicating ourselves. But he is our chief agent in Cheris, and he's always been effective for us. Losing him and all of his contacts and background knowledge would be a serious blow. It would take months, probably years, for anyone else to develop the same capabilities and sources. I know, but if Wave Thunder arrests him, we lose him anyway, with the added risk that they may be able to prove we were involved. My Prince Harald needs no proof of your enmity, Shander pointed out. From that perspective, what happens to Lang is completely beside the point. Not if it inspires him to respond in kind, Narman observed dryly. Agreed, but if they aren't certain we were directly behind the attempt, they have to suspect everyone else as well. Hector must be on their list of suspects, for example. Even Montail could have been responsible for it. If Wave Thunder has connected Lang to us, then killing him would probably convince them we were the primary movers. After all, if we weren't, why would we want to remove him? Decisions, decisions, Narman sighed. There is one other aspect to consider, my prince, Shander said. Narman looked at him, then gestured for him to continue. There's always the Duke to bear in mind, the spymaster pointed out. I don't trust his ultimate reliability any more than I feel sure he trusts ours, but he has had direct contact with Lang. If Lang is interrogated, the Duke is just as exposed as we are, and also right where Harald can get at him. I feel confident he's keeping his own eye on Lang, and that he has his own plans already in place to ensure Lang never has the opportunity to betray him, which means... Which means, Narman interrupted, that we can rely on his self-interest, he nodded. That doesn't mean his plans will work, of course, but he's right there in Telesburg, while we're two thousand miles away. Exactly, my prince, Shander nodded. And if he should have Lang killed, and if Wave Thunder hasn't identified Lang as our agent, then any investigation would lead to the Duke before it led to us. Narman plucked at his lower lip, then nodded. A good point, he agreed. I'd really prefer to tie off that particular loose end ourselves, if it becomes necessary, but I think we'll have to rely on the Duke to worry about that for us. Of course, that leaves the problem of the Duke himself, doesn't it? Shander's eyes widened ever so slightly at the prince's biting tone, and Narman chuckled coldly. It's not as if I've ever trusted him, Hall. And we both know that even now he could probably make some arrangement with Harald if it came to it. Which, given how much he knows, could be unfortunate for our other arrangements in Cheris. My prince, Shander began very carefully. Are you suggesting... He broke off, allowing the question to hover, and Narmon snorted. Part of me would like nothing better, but no, he said. Not yet, at any rate. And at least, he smiled thinly and coldly, if the time does come, we already have our own man in place to do the job. He considered for several more seconds, then sighed. All right, I suppose that's about all we can decide right now. 
In the meantime, however, I want you to brief Travis and Garth as well. Shander nodded. Travis Olson, Earl of Pine Hollow, was Naramon's cousin and chief counselor, and Garth Ralston, the Earl of Mondier, was the commander of the Emerald Navy. Shall I brief them fully, my prince? the Baron asked, arching one eyebrow, and Narmon frowned. Tell Travis everything we know or suspect, he directed after a moment. Tell Garth that we have to assume Harald will suspect we were involved, whether or not we actually were, and that I want him to be thinking about ways we can improve our own preparedness just in case. Yes, my prince. In addition, I want you to put together reports for Thomas and Hector as well. Narmon continued. In Thomas's case, I'll write a letter of my own to go with it. For Hector, though, I think we'll just let you send your own report, purely as a professional courtesy, since we obviously don't have any first-hand information, to chorus. Shander nodded again. Grand Duke Thomas of Zebediah was the closest thing Prince Hector of Coruscant had to a rival for control of the League of Coruscant. Unfortunately for Thomas' dreams of glory, he wasn't very much of a rival. Although he was the preeminent noble of the island of Zebediah and the hereditary leader of the Council of Zebediah, the entire island was firmly under Hector's thumb. Thomas functioned as little more than the governor of Zebediah in Hector's name, and however much he might aspire to greater heights, it was most unlikely he would ever attain them. Still, Narmon had been careful to cultivate the man. One never knew when one might need any counterweight one could get, after all. Philip Osgood, the Earl of Chorus, on the other hand, was Shander's own counterpart in Hector's service. Shander had a lively respect for Chorus' native ability, and he didn't for a moment think the Earl would believe Narmon hadn't been a primary mover behind the attempt on Caleb. Still, appearances had to be maintained, and Hector was scarcely likely to press the point as long as Narmon chose to maintain the fiction. After all, Hector wouldn't exactly have shed any tears if the assassins had succeeded. Of course, my prince, he murmured aloud, and Narmon grunted in satisfaction. In that case, I think you should probably be on your way, he said, and Shander rose, bowed respectfully, and backed his way out of the dining parlor. Neither he nor his prince had noticed the almost microscopic insect hanging from the ceiling above the table. Even if they had noticed it, they would have paid it no attention, of course, for neither of them had ever heard of something called a snark, and certainly not of the remote sensors one of them could deploy. 6. Royal Palace, Telesburg, Kingdom of Cheris Sajin Merlin your Majesty, the Chamberlain said quietly as he stepped through the open doorway and bowed. Merlin followed him into this small presence chamber, more of a working office really, it seemed, and bowed a bit more profoundly than the Chamberlain. King Harald's court was looked down upon by the courtiers of such sophisticated lands as Harchong because of its casual informality and ability to get along without a veritable horde of servitors. Still, Harald was a king, and one of the more powerful ones on the face of Safehold, whatever others might think. Say, Jin, Harald said, and Merlin looked up. He saw a man of mill years, stocky for a Cheresian, and taller than most, although shorter than his son, and considerably shorter than Merlin. Harald wore the traditional loose-cut breeches and thigh-length linen over-tunic of the Cheresian upper class although his tunic was bright with bullion embroidery and beadwork. The belt about his waist was made of intricately decorated, seashell-shaped plaques of hammered silver, the golden scepter badge of one who made his required pilgrimage to the temple gleamed on his shoulder brooch, and the glittering fire of the emerald-set golden chain, which was his normal badge of office, glowed upon his chest. He had a neatly trimmed beard, somewhat more luxuriant than Merlin's own, and the slight epicanthic fold common to most of Seyfold's humanity. Harald VII was fifty-two local years old, just over forty-seven standard, and he'd sat on his throne for just over twenty local years. 
In that time, he'd come to be known, by his own subjects at least, as Harald the Just, and his level eyes considered Merlin thoughtfully. He was putting on a bit of extra flesh these days, Merlin noticed. Judging from his chest and shoulders, he'd been a man of heroic physique in his youth. But maintaining that sort of fitness, especially at his age, must have been the next best thing to impossible, given his immobile right knee. His leg stretched out straight in front of him, his heel resting on a footrest, as he sat in a comfortable but not particularly splendid armchair, behind a desk cluttered with documents and slates. One other person was present, a bishop of the Church of God awaiting, with silvering dark hair and a splendid patriarchal beard stood at the king's right shoulder. His three-cornered cap bore the white cockade of a senior bishop, but lacked the ribbon of an archbishop. His eyes were bright as they considered Merlin, and his white cassock bore the oil lamp emblem of the Order of Bedar. The sight of that lamp set Merlin's teeth instantly on edge, but he made himself suppress the instinctive reaction firmly. Much as he hated to admit it, the order which bore Adoré Bédard's name had changed over the years into something far different from anything its ostensible patron would have wanted to see. Besides, he'd seen this bishop often enough through his snarks to strongly suspect what impelled Harald to trust him so totally. Your Majesty, he murmured in reply to the king's greeting, after only the briefest of pauses, you do me honor to receive me privately. Perhaps, Harald said, studying his visitor intently, some might feel I've slighted you by not greeting you and thanking you for my son's life in a more public audience. But at that more public audience, Your Majesty, I would undoubtedly have been uncomfortably aware of all of the spanned crossbows watching me so alertly. Here, Merlin smiled charmingly. I need only worry about the two bodyguards behind that screen. He nodded towards the exquisitely detailed lacquered Harchangese screen behind the king, and Harald's eyes narrowed. The bishops, however, only considered Merlin with a sort of calm curiosity. Interesting, Merlin thought, but his attention was mainly focused on the king waiting for his reaction, which came after a heartbeat in a single word. Indeed, Harald said, and Merlin smiled again. This is Thursday, Your Majesty. Assuming you've stuck to your regular duty schedule, it should be Sergeant Harper and Sergeant Gardiner. The Chamberlain stepped quickly to one side, right hand falling to the dagger sheathed at his hip. The bishop touched the golden scepter of Langhorn hanging upon his breast, and even Harald sat up straighter in his chair. But the king also raised one hand and shook his head sharply at the Chamberlain. No, Powell, he said. After all, our guest is a Sejin, is he not? Or something else, sire, the Chamberlain said darkly. He glowered at Merlin with eyes full of suspicion, and his hand left his dagger hilt only reluctantly. Your Majesty, Merlin said, my weapons have all been left in my chamber. Your guardsmen were extremely courteous, but they also searched me very carefully before permitting me into your presence. Surely one unarmed man is no threat to a monarch whose servants are as loyal to him as yours are to you. Somehow, Sajin Merlin, I doubt a man such as you is ever unarmed, as long as he has his brain, Harald said with a slow, appreciative smile of his own. One tries, Your Majesty, Merlin conceded. The bishop's lips twitched in what might almost have been a stillborn smile, and Harald leaned back in his chair once more, considering the blue-eyed stranger even more thoughtfully than before. Then he nodded and looked at the chamberlain. Powell, I believe we might offer Sajin Merlin a chair. Powell Hallman looked moderately outraged, but he also carried a straight-backed but upholstered chair from the corner of the room and set it down facing Harald's desk. Please, Sajin, Harald invited. Be seated. Thank you, Your Majesty. Merlin settled into the chair and cocked his head, his eyebrows raised. Yes, say Jim, Harald said with a suspiciously grin-like smile. The interrogation will now begin. 
I'm at your service, your majesty. Merlin inclined his head again, politely, and Harald chuckled. I find that difficult to believe, Sejin, he said. Somehow I have the distinct impression that it's more a case of Cheris finding herself at your service. Merlin smiled, but behind that smile he winced. Harald VII, in person, was even more impressive than he'd been observed from afar by a snark. Before we begin, Harald said more seriously, allow me to extend my personal thanks for your intervention on Caleb's behalf. Without you, he would be dead, and for that I and my house stand in your debt. How may I reward you? Your Majesty, Merlin said with matching seriousness. While I'm sure some token of your gratitude is in order, it might be as well to draw as little attention to me as possible. And why might that be? Harald asked. Because I'll be far more useful to Cheris if my presence here doesn't become general knowledge. And why should you care to be of use to me? Your pardon, Your Majesty, Merlin said almost gently. But I didn't say of use to you. I said of use to Cheris. The two are closely related, but not, I fear, identical. The king is the kingdom, Halman snapped, then flushed darkly as he realized he'd spoken out of turn. But despite the flush, there was no hiding the fresh anger in his eyes. No, my lord Chamberlain, Merlin disagreed. The king is the heart and soul of the kingdom, but he is not the kingdom itself. Were that true, then the kingdom would perish with his death. The church teaches that king and crown are one, the bishop observed, speaking for the first time, and his voice and expression were both carefully neutral. And I don't dispute that point with the church, Bishop Michael, Merlin said, and the priest's head cocked to one side as the stranger named him correctly. I simply observe that the king who is the heart of the kingdom isn't merely a single individual, but all individuals who hold that office and discharge those duties in the name of the kingdom. And so, while the king and the kingdom are one, the mortal man who holds that office is but one man in an endless chain of men who hold their crowns in trust for those they are charged to guard and protect. Harold glanced up at Bishop Michael, then returned his attention to Merlin, and gazed at him without speaking for the better part of a full minute. Finally he nodded slowly. A valid distinction, he said, not one all monarchs would agree with, but one I can't dispute. And the fact that you can't, Your Majesty, is the reason I'm here, Merlin said simply. While all kings may be ordained by God, all too few prove worthy of their coronation oaths. When one sees the visions which I've been given to see, that fact becomes sadly evident. Ah, uh, yes, those visions of yours. Harold pursed his lips, then chuckled and raised his voice slightly. Charles, you and Gorge may as well come out and join us. A moment later, the lacquered screen shifted to one side, and the two royal guard sergeants stepped out from behind it. Both wore black cuirasses, the breastplates emblazoned with the golden crocken of Charis. They also carried spanned steel-bowed arbalists, and they regarded Merlin warily as they took their places at their king's back. I must admit, Harald said, that I found your performance rather impressive, Sejin Merlin, as no doubt you intended I should. Of course, it's always possible sufficiently good spies could have provided you with that information. On the other hand, if my personal household is that riddled with spies, my house is already doomed. So, since you obviously want me to ask the question, I will. How did you know? Despite his whimsical tone, his brown eyes sharpened, and he leaned slightly forward in his chair. Your Majesty, Merlin replied, these three men, he waved one hand, taking in the two guardsmen and the chamberlain, are, I believe, loyal unto death to you, your son and your house. I trust them as fully as I trust you yourself, and Bishop Michael has been your confessor for, what, fifteen years now? But while what I'm about to tell you may prove difficult to believe, I hope to be able to offer you proof I speak the truth, and I believe that if I can prove that to you, you'll understand why it must be kept as secret as possible for as long as possible. He paused, and the king nodded without even glancing at his retainers. 
The three of them continued to regard Merlin with wary eyes, but Merlin saw how their shoulders straightened and their expressions firmed at the king's obvious confidence in their trustworthiness. Bishop Michael simply moved a half-step closer to Harold's chair and rested one large, powerful hand lightly on its back. As I'm sure Prince Caleb and Lieutenant Falcon have already told you, Your Majesty, he began, I've lived for many years in the Mountains of Light, and in the process I've developed some, though far from all, of the reputed powers of the Sejin. It isn't a title I would lightly claim for myself, yet it may be that it fits. At any rate, it's been given to me to see visions of distant places and events, to hear the voices of distant people. It's as if an invisible bird perched on the wall there, he pointed at a spot on the plastered wall not far from an open window, or on the branch of a tree, and I saw through its eyes, heard through its ears. I've never seen the future, and I can't call up the past. I see only the present, and no man can see all that transpires everywhere in the entire world. But the things which I have seen have focused more and more tightly upon Cheris, upon your house and upon Caleb. I don't believe that would happen by accident. Harald's eyes seemed to bore into Merlin's. The king of Cheris had a reputation for being able to pull the truth out of any man, but Merlin gazed back levelly. After all, everything he'd said was completely truthful. If eight standard centuries at the same address didn't count as living for many years in the mountains of light, he couldn't imagine what would. And his visions had focused more and more upon Cheris, and definitely not by accident. What sorts of visions? Harald asked after a long still moment. Of whom? As I've said, I see and hear as if I were physically present. I can't read a page if it isn't turned. I can't hear a thought if it isn't spoken. I can't know what passes in the secret places of someone's heart, only what they say and do. I've seen visions of you, Your Majesty. I've seen you in this chamber with your personal guards, seen you with Chamberlain Halman. I've seen you discussing the Hanth succession with Caleb and matters of policy with Earl Grey Harbour. I saw and heard you discussing the new patrols off Triton Head with High Admiral Lock Island when you instructed him to reinforce Falcon and Warrior with Rock Shoal Bay and her entire squadron. Harald had been nodding slowly, but he froze abruptly at the mention of Lock Island. Not surprisingly, Merlin thought, given that he and the High Admiral had discussed those reinforcements and the reasons for them, under conditions of maximum security. None of their precautions, however, had been directed at a snark which could deploy reusable parasite spy bugs. I've seen visions of Caleb, Merlin continued, not just in conversation with you, but riding to the hunt with his arms master even at his books. Merlin smiled slightly and shook his head at that, and I've seen him sitting in council with you and on shipboard. And just as I've seen those visions, I've seen your people. I told Caleb that what I've seen gives me a good opinion of you, Your Majesty, and it does, in all honesty, and without seeking to curry favor with you. I haven't been given a vision of any other king of safehold who comes as close as you do to the ideal the Church proclaims. You aren't perfect. Indeed, if you'll forgive me, you're far from it. But you also know you aren't and perhaps even more importantly, you've taught your heir to know the same thing. Those qualities, that sense of responsibility, are too rare and precious for me to see them lightly cast aside. I believe the reason I've seen what I've seen has been to bring me here to offer my services, such as they are, to the preservation of this kingdom and the tradition of service its monarchs strive to uphold. The praise of the praiseworthy is especially welcome, Harold said after another long, thoughtful pause. I trust you'll forgive me, however, for pointing out that praise and flattery sometimes blur. Especially when the one offering them desires something, Merlin agreed. And to be honest, Your Majesty, I do desire something. Harold's eyes narrowed and Merlin smiled. I desire to see Cheris become all she may become he said. All she may become, Harald repeated, 
Why, Cheris, even if everything you've said about my myriad good qualities were accurate, why pick this kingdom? It can't be because of any sense of loyalty to my house, since the one thing you obviously aren't is a Cheresian. So if you'll forgive me, say Jin Merlin, it must be because of something you want out of Cheris, some goal or objective of your own. And while I'm deeply grateful for your part in saving my son's life, and although only a fool could fail to recognize the value of an advisor who sees what you appear to see, no king worthy of his crown could accept such services without knowing that what you want is also what he wants. Merlin leaned back in his own chair, gazing thoughtfully at the Cheresian monarch, then nodded mentally. Harald VII was just as tough-minded as Merlin had expected, but there was a hard core of honesty close to the king's surface. This was a man who could play the game of deception, of bluff and counter-bluff, with the best of them, but it wasn't the game he preferred. Of course, it remained to be seen if Bishop Michael was equally tough-minded and resilient. Normally, Merlin wouldn't have been very optimistic about that where a bishop of the Church of God awaiting was concerned, but Michael was hardly typical of the breed. For one thing, the king's confessor was a Cheresian. So far as Merlin had been able to determine, he'd never left the kingdom in his entire life, except to make his own pilgrimage to the temple, and he was the highest-ranking native Cheresian in the entire archbishopric's hierarchy. Harald's choice ten years before of Michael Stainer to be Bishop of Telesburg, as well as his confessor, had not been popular with Archbishop Eric's predecessor. But Harald had clung stubbornly to his prerogative to nominate the priest of his choice to the capital C, and over the years Michael had become a member of the king's inner circle of advisers, which could be a good thing, or a very bad thing indeed. Your Majesty, Merlin said finally, why did your great-grandfather abolish serfdom here in Cheris? Harald frowned, as if surprised by the question, then he shrugged. Because it's what he believed God wanted of us, he said. But serfdom exists in Emerald, Merlin pointed out, and in Taro, Coruscant, and Chisholm. In Hartong, the lot of a serf is little better than that of a beast of the field. Indeed, they treat their draft animals better than they do their serfs, because those animals are more expensive, and in Desnair and Trelheim, they practice outright slavery. Even in the Temple Lands, he looked up from the king's face to meet Bishop Michael's eyes with just a hint of challenge, men are bound to the land of the great church estates, although they aren't called serfs, yet not here. Why not? You say it's not what God wants of you, but why do you believe that? The writ teaches that God created every Adam and every Eve in the same instant, the same exercise of his will through the archangel Langhorn, Harald said. He didn't create kings first or nobles or wealthy merchants. He breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of all men and all women. Surely that means all men and all women are brothers and sisters. We may not be born to the same states in this later, less perfect world. Some of us are born kings now, and some are born noble, or to wealth, or all three. Yet those born more humbly are still our brothers and sisters. If God sees men that way, then so must we. And if that's true, then men aren't cattle, or sheep, or horses, or dragons. Not something to be owned. He half glared at Merlin, and Merlin shrugged. And would you agree with that, Bishop Michael? he asked quietly. I would. The priest's voice was deep and powerful, well suited to preaching and prayer, and there was a glitter in his eyes. They weren't quite as hard as Harald's, but there was no retreat in them either, and Merlin nodded slowly. Then he looked back at the king. Other rulers would appear to disagree with you, Your Majesty, he observed. Even the Church feels differently, to judge by her own practices in her own lands at any rate. But you do believe it, and that, Your Majesty, is my goal, my objective, 
I believe the same thing you do, and I see no other powerful kingdom which does. I respect you, and in many ways I admire you, but my true loyalty? He shrugged once more. That belongs not to you, or to Caleb, but to the future. I will use you if I can, Your Majesty. Use you to create the day in which no man owns another. No man thinks men born less nobly than he are cattle or sheep. Halman glared angrily at him, but Harold only nodded slowly, his expression thoughtful. And that's the true reason I want Cheris, not simply to survive, but to prosper, Merlin said. Not because I love empire, and not because I crave wealth, or because I confuse military might with the true strength of a kingdom. But while it may not be given to me to see the future, I know what future I would like to see. I know what values, what laws, what sort of monarchy I believe God wants called forth. And at this time, Your Majesty, Cheris offers the best hope for the future I would like to see to ever come to pass. Which is why I said from the very beginning that I came not to serve you specifically, but to serve Cheris, the idea of Cheris, of her future. Harold drummed lightly on one arm of his chair with the fingers of his right hand, then glanced up at Bishop Michael. Michael, he said quietly. Sire, the bishop said without hesitation, I can quarrel with nothing this man has said. I know your hopes, your aspirations, and I know what it is you most fear. His fingers stroked his pectoral scepter again, apparently unconsciously, and his nostrils flared. If I might, sire, Harald nodded, and the bishop looked back at Merlin. I've never met an actual sagein, he said. Once in my life I met a man who claimed to be a sagein, but what he was in reality was a charlatan. Your Eminence, Merlin said when the bishop paused, I haven't claimed to be a sagein. I've claimed only that I have some of the powers ascribed to sagein. I observed that, Michael said with a small smile. Indeed, while I would never claim to be the equal of my esteemed colleagues in the temple as a theologian, I've engaged in my share of theological debate, and perhaps as a consequence of that, I was struck by several things you didn't say. You were? Merlin's politely attentive expression never wavered, but internal alarms began to sound as the bishop gazed at him levelly for several seconds. According to many of the tales I read when I was younger, Michael said finally, a true sage and frequently is known only after the fact by the nature of his deeds. Others may give him the title. He seldom claims it for himself. The nature of these visions of yours, however, will strike many as ample evidence that whatever else you may be, you are not as other mortal men. So perhaps we can all agree. Seijin is the word best suited, for now at least, to describing whatever it is you are. But, having agreed to that, what are we to make of you and your purposes? That, I'm sure you will agree, is the critical question, and my answer to it is that the writ teaches that the true nature of any man will be shown forth in his actions. It matters not whether that man is a king, a merchant, a seijin, or a peasant. In the end, he cannot conceal what he truly is, what he truly stands for. So far, you've saved Caleb's life. Whether or not God sent you to us for that specific purpose, I don't know. But in my judgment, it was not the act of one who would serve darkness. The bishop looked at his monarch and bent his head in a curiously formal little bow. Your Majesty. He said, I sense no evil in this man. I may be wrong, of course. Unlike the Grand Vicar or the Chancellor, I'm merely a humble, unlettered, provincial bishop. But my advice to you is to listen to him. I know the darkness which is settling about us. Perhaps this man and the services he offers are the lamp. He touched the embroidered sigil of his order on the breast of his habit. You require. Had Merlin been a being of flesh and blood, he would have let out a long, quiet exhalation of relief. But he wasn't. 
and so he simply sat, waiting, while Harald looked deeply into his confessor's eyes. Then the king returned his attention to Merlin once again. And how would you serve Cheris? he asked intently. With my visions, as they're given to me, with my sword as I must, and with my mind as I may, Merlin said simply. For example, I'm certain you've interrogated the one assassin we managed to take alive. But you managed to take alive, Harald corrected, and Merlin shrugged. Perhaps, Your Majesty, but while I've had no vision of his interrogation, as I say, I see much but not all. I do know who sent him. Halman and the two guardsmen leaned slightly forward, eyes intent. Bishop Michael's bearded lips pursed thoughtfully and Merlin's smile was cold. I know it must have been tempting to lay the blame on Hector of Coruscant, he said, but in this case it would be an error. The men who attempted to kill Prince Caleb were mercenaries, destinarians hired by Prince Narmon and certain others, but Prince Hector wasn't even consulted, so far as I'm aware, which isn't to say he isn't involved in plots of his own. Indeed, his objection to your assassination, Your Majesty, or Caleb's, is purely tactical, not a matter of any sort of personal qualm. From what he's said to his own closest advisers and servants, and what I've read of his letters to Narmon, he simply believes assassins are unlikely to succeed, and I think fears how your kingdom might react if an attempt did succeed. He has no desire to meet you ship to ship at this time, not yet, and he believes that if Caleb were killed and you believed Coruscant was behind it, that's precisely what he would face, which is why he prefers to undermine your strength at sea in order to weaken you for a decisive blow by more conventional means. You once called him a sand maggot, not a slash lizard, when you and Caleb discussed him, and I believe it was an apt description. But in this case, the sand maggot is thinking in more conventional terms than his allies. Harald's eyes had grown more and more intent as he listened to Merlin. Now he sat back in his chair, his expression one of wonder. Sajin, Merlin, he said. When I summoned you to this audience, I didn't honestly expect to believe you. I wanted to, which is one reason I was determined not to but the finest spies in the world couldn't have told you all you've just told me, and every word you've said has been accurate, so far as my own sources are able to confirm. I know someone who's said what you've said here today will understand that despite all of that, your sincerity and trustworthiness must be tested and proved. For myself as an individual, as Harald Armach, I would trust you now. As King Harald of Cheris, I can give no man the trust I must give you if I accept the services you offer until he be proven beyond question or doubt. Your Majesty, Merlin said quietly, you're a king. It's your duty to remember men lie, that they deceive, and that often revealing a little truth makes the final deception all the more convincing. I don't expect you to accept my services or even the truth of my visions without testing thoroughly. And as you test, I beg you to remember this. I've said my service is to Cheris, and what Cheris may become. Not to you personally, and I meant it. I'll give you all the truth that lies in me, and the best counsel I may, but in the end my service, my loyalty, is to a future which lies beyond your life, beyond the lifespan of this person you call Merlin, and beyond even the lifespan of your son. I would have you understand that. Sage in Merlin, I do. Harald looked deep into those unearthly sapphire eyes, and his voice was soft. It's said the sage in serve the vision of God, not of man. That any man who accepts the advice of a sage in had best remember the vision of God need not include his own success or even survival. But one of the duties of a king is to die for his people if God requires it of him. Whatever God's vision for Cheris may demand, I will pay. And if you are a true Sejin, if you truly serve his vision, that's more than sufficient for me, whatever my own future may hold.
7. Telesburg and Stephen Mountains, Kingdom of Cheris, Armageddon Reef. Merlin sat once more in his chamber. A humid, windless night pressed heavily against its window. Nimue Alban, born and raised in Old Earth's Nor Europe, would have found that night uncomfortably warm, despite the season but Apica was unconcerned by such minor matters. Merlin was more struck by the moonless night's impenetrable blackness, which was still one of the most alien aspects of Seyfold for the man whose mind had been Nimue Alvin's. Nimue had been a child of a technological civilization, one of illumination, of light and energy that drove back the darkness and domed its cities in reflected cloud glow on the darkest of nights. Telesburg was well lit for a city of Seyfold, but the only illumination on this planet came from the simple flames of burning wood or wax, of tallow or oil, far too feeble to drive out the night. Like Telesburg itself, Merlin's chamber was well lit by Seyfoldian standards. It was illuminated not by candles, but by the fine, clear flame of lamps filled with crocken oil and equipped with the comparatively newfangled notion of polished reflectors placed behind their chimneys to concentrate and direct their light. Despite that, the available light was scarcely sufficient for comfortable reading, especially of the intricate calligraphy in the hand-lettered volume on Merlin's desk. It could be done, and had been, by generations of safehold-born humans, but not without a stiff penalty in eye strain. Merlin, however, had certain advantages. For one, his artificial eyes were immune to strain. They were also equipped with light-gathering technology, which made the room, and indeed the bottomless night outside it, daylight clear. He deleted the standard Pika ten-day countdown clock from his visual field, and there was nothing to distract him as he skimmed rapidly and steadily through the thick leather-bound copy of the Holy Writ of the Church of God awaiting. It was far from the first time he'd perused the writ, yet he found the book continually fascinating, in the way a homicide detective might have been fascinated by the autobiography of a sadistic serial killer he'd known as a boyhood friend. There were many aspects of its moral teachings with which Merlin could not take issue, however badly he wanted to. Maruyama Chihiro had borrowed heavily from existing religions and the core of his writ's moral teachings would have been familiar to almost any old earth theologian. For the most part, Merlin reflected, that was undoubtedly inevitable, for a stable society required an underlying framework of rules and laws which those living within it accepted. Throughout human history, religion had been one of the primary wellsprings of that legitimacy, and it was that portion of the writ which produced priests like Bishop Michael. But the religions from which Maruyama had lifted his core commandments and moral precepts had been the product of a genuine effort to understand, or at least conceptualize, God or whatever higher power their adherents had sought. The Church of God awaiting seminal scripture wasn't. It was a deliberate fraud, perpetrated upon its followers by individuals whose actions had directly contradicted the principles and beliefs of the religions in which so many of them had been raised. It was a lie, using the hunger within human beings which had driven them to seek God, by whatever name or in whatever form, throughout the human race's entire history, not simply to control but to program, to stifle any sense of inquiry which might threaten the fraudulent template Eric Langhorn and Adore Bedard had manufactured to hammer any future human society into the pattern they had found good. Merlin had to admit that between them, Langhorn, Bedar, and Murayama had managed to kill quite a few birds with the single stone of the writ. He turned back to the beginning of the volume and grimaced as he glanced once more at the table of contents, the Book of Langhorn, the Book of Bedar, the Book of Pascal, the Books of Sondheim, Truscott, Schuler, Zhuo Zheng, Chihiro, Andropov, Hastings. The list went on and on, each book attributed to one of the archangels. The writ contained no gospels written by mere mortals. 
such human-produced writings existed in the commentaries and the insights, not to mention the testimonies, which were also part of the Church of God Awaiting's central scripture and authority. But none of those merely human writings could compare to the legitimacy and centrality of the writ, for unlike them, its every word had been handed down directly from the mouth of God through his immortal angels. The writ wasn't just an instrument of social control either. True, the Book of Langhorn dealt with the law of God as taught by the Church of God awaiting. Merlin had gagged mentally more than once as he waded through the love-cloaked half-truths and outright falsehoods from which Langhorn or Murayama, writing for Langhorn at any rate, had woven the straitjacket into which he'd laced the inhabitants of Safehold. And the Book of Bedar was at least as hard for Merlin to take, a masterpiece of psychology in the service of deception and mind control that rejoiced in the subtitle of The Book of Wisdom and Self-Knowledge. But many of its other books were, in fact, a practical guide to terraforming and the colonization of an alien planet. The Archangel Hastings' book, for example, was actually an atlas, a very detailed atlas of the entire planet, based upon the meticulous maps Shan Wei's crew had made at the time of its original terraforming. The maps in Merlin's copy of the writ were on far too small a scale to be very useful, and quite a bit of distortion had crept in when the printer's engravings were made, but the master maps had been carefully preserved in the temple. Indeed, those master maps were some of the church's holiest artifacts. The advanced synthetics of their paper were fireproof, waterproof, about as tough as a five-millimeter sheet of hammered copper, and virtually immune to the effects of age, all of which, of course, aptly proved their miraculous nature. Almost equally importantly, however, the Book of Hastings required that copies of those maps be made available to the public as well as the church in the cathedral of every bishop. Safeholdians knew exactly what the geography of their world looked like, which had been of enormous importance when they set about deciding where to plant additional enclaves, and the writ's other books had given them a guide for how those enclaves were to be established. It was a guide that deliberately falsified the basis for many of the lessons it taught and the religious laws it handed down but it had provided the basic framework under which humanity had expanded from its initial enclaves on this planet. The Book of Sondheim dealt with agronomy and farming, including especially the necessary steps to prepare safehold soil for the essential terrestrial plants humanity required. The Book of Truscott did the same thing for animal husbandry, for native safeholdian species, as well as imports from Earth. The Book of Pascal contained religious laws to provide sanitation, good hygiene and diet, the treatment of wounds, and basic preventive medicine. Even the Book of Bedar, despite the purpose for which it had been written, contained quite a lot of sound psychological advice and insight, and the members of her order, like Bishop Michael, had taken its precepts in very different directions from anything she might have intended. The Order's successes in ministering to the mental and emotional needs of Safeholdian humanity were little short of amazing in many cases, and it was the Bedarites who administered the majority of the Church's charitable works. Yet all of the writ's directives were couched as religious laws, proper rituals and sacrifices to be performed by the devout. The Book of Pascal's injunctions never mentioned germs or the scientific basis on which his laws rested, for example. And if a healer failed to wash his hands in one of the holy waters, properly prepared and blessed by a priest, before treating a wound, and that wound became septic, or before delivering a baby and that mother died of childbed fever, then it was not infection or disease which was to blame, but sin. And the maps of the Book of Hastings, which conclusively demonstrated that their world was a sphere, also explicitly taught Safeholdians the Ptolemaic theory of the universe, and turned gravity itself into yet another of the Archangel Langhorn's miraculous gifts to man, through God's grace, 
Indeed, Langhorn had created the world as a round ball at the center of the crystal spheres of the moon, sun, stars, and God's own heaven, expressly as a means to demonstrate to man that God could accomplish anything he willed. After all, did it not require an act of divine will and power to keep people from falling off the bottom side of the world and crashing into the moon? And so, in addition to providing the directions by which the original enclaves had followed the Archangel Langhorn's direction to be fruitful and multiply and inhabit the world God had given them, the writ had aided powerfully in the systematic abortion of anything resembling the scientific method while simultaneously reinforcing the power of the Church as preceptor and governor of humanity. Then there were the Book of Zhuo Zheng and the Book of Schuler. Neither of them were as long as some of the others, but they went to the very heart of Langhorn's ultimate purpose here on Safehold. Zhuo Zheng handed down the official descriptions and definitions of that technology which God found acceptable, and that which he rejected as unclean or tainted or reserved solely for his archangels and angels. And Schuler, whose book was both the shortest and the most horrifying of them all, defined the punishment to be visited upon those who violated the prescriptions of Langhorn and Zhuo Jiang. The thought that anyone raised in the same society as Nimue Alban could have resurrected so many nightmares from the horrific closet of mankind's savagery to his own was enough to turn even Merlin's alloy and composite's stomach. Schuler must have spent endless hours poring over the history texts to come up with such a detailed catalog of atrocities to be visited upon the unbeliever in God's most holy name. But the most fascinating and infuriating of all, in many ways, was the Book of Chihiro. The book which had been added later after the close of the original copy of the writ, which had been stored in the computers in Nimue's cave. It seemed apparent that Pei Kao Young's vengeance for his wife and friends had eliminated almost all of Langhorn's leadership cadre. Indeed, from the sudden dearth of angelic visitations recorded in the testimonies, following his attack, it seemed likely he'd gotten a huge chunk of Langhorn's lower-level personnel as well. Unfortunately, Maruyama Chihiro hadn't been among the casualties, and he and his fellow survivors had managed to keep most of Langhorne's plan on track. The Archangel Chihiro, revered as the patron of personal protection and called the guardian of cities in the hagiography of the Church of God Awaiting, had been the official historian of God. He was the one who had recorded the miracle of Safehold's creation and he was also the recorder of how Shan Wei, Dark Mother of Evil, had tainted the purity of that creation in the name of ambition and greed. Maruyama had tied it all together well, Merlin thought bitterly. Shan Wei, brightest of all the Archangel Langhorn's assistants, had viewed Safehold not as a work of God which she had been privileged to help bring into existence, but as the work of her own hands. And from that hubris, that twisted sense of her own self-worth, and that vaunting pride had flowed all of the evil in Safehold. She had set herself against her rightful overlord, the Archangel Langhorn, and against God himself, and she'd gathered to herself the Archangel Proctor, who had opened the seals on temptation and forbidden knowledge, the Archangel Sullivan, who had taught humanity gluttony and self-indulgence, the Archangel Grimaldi, whose twisted version of the healing teachings of the Archangel Truscott had been the father and mother of pestilence. The archangel Stavrakis, who had preached the avarice of personal gain over the godly yielding to the church of God awaiting that first fruit of every harvest which was God's due. The archangel Rodriguez, who had preached the arrogant seductive lie that men were actually capable of setting their own fallible hands to the creation of the law under which they might live the archangel Asher, father of lies, whose so-called history's twisted version of the true writ had led those mortals foolish enough to believe anything Shan Wei said into equally dark damnation. And, of course, the fallen archangel who was, in so many ways, the darkest of them all, the archangel Kao Young, father of destruction, lord of treachery, 
who had smitten the Archangel Langhorn and the Archangel Bedar traitorously and without warning, after the grieving Langhorn had been compelled to unleash the Rakurai, the lightning bolt of God, upon Shanwei and her fallen followers, Cao Yang, who had been the most trusted of all Langhorn's subordinates, the warrior charged with guarding all that Safehold stood for, who had turned to Shan Wei's evil. It was Cao Yang's monumental treachery, darker even than Shan Wei's original sin, which had so terribly wounded the perishable bodies of the archangels Langhorn, Beidar, Pascal, Sondheim, and their most loyal followers, those closest to God himself, that they were forced to leave Safehold with their work unfinished. Merlin had no personal memory of the majority of Shan Wei's fallen archangels. Nimue had found most of them in the computers in her caves, but if the original Nimue had ever met or known them, that knowledge had never been uploaded to her pika. Yet some of them she had known, and especially Cao Yang and Shan Wei herself. To see them so vilified, to know that fifty generations of men and women they had died to free reviled them not as heroes, but as the darkest of devils, the source of all evil and unhappiness, was like a knife in Merlin's heart. Part of him longed desperately to denounce the writ, to break out his assault shuttle and his recon skimmers and turn the temple into a glowing crater to prove Langhorn's entire religion was built on lies. But he couldn't, not yet at any rate. But someday, he told himself yet again, someday the people of Safehold would be ready to hear the truth and to accept it. And when that day came, Shan Wei and Cao Yang and everyone who had died with them would be remembered for who they'd truly been, all they'd truly stood for. Merlin felt the anger stirring deep inside his Molly Sirk heart and mind and closed the book. He supposed he really shouldn't allow himself to dwell on it this way, but when it came right down to it, the writ and the so-called church it served were his true enemies. Prince Hector, Prince Narmon, and all of the others plotting against Cheris were impediments to his real struggle, nothing more. Still, he thought, lips quirking in a mustachioed smile, they're certainly the immediate problem, aren't they? So I suppose I ought to be getting on with it. He brought up the digital clock at the corner of his vision and checked the time. He'd recalibrated it to match Safehold's twenty-six and a half hour day, and it was two hours past the thirty-one minute period Safeholdians knew as Langhorn's watch. On any other human colonized planet, it would have been known as compensate, or simply comp, the adjustment period required to tweak an alien world's day into something neatly divisible into mankind's standard minutes and hours. On Safehold, anyone who found himself awake at the midnight hour was supposed to spend Langhorn's watch in silent meditation and contemplation of all God had done for him by Langhorn's intervention in the day just past. Somehow Merlin had never gotten around to spending the watch on just that purpose. He snorted at the thought and boosted the sensitivity of his hearing. The enhancing software sorted through the incoming sounds, confirming the slumbering quiet of Maritha's tower. Given the guard post at the tower's entrance, there was no need for guards or sentries elsewhere, and given the limitations of their nighttime lighting, Safeholdians tended to be early to bed and early to rise. By now, all the tower's small population of honored guests sounded to be deeply asleep, and even the attendant servants had retreated to the workrooms and waiting rooms set aside for them on the tower's lowest levels to await the ringing bell if some insomniac should require their services. Which was precisely what Merlin had been waiting for. Owl, he subvocalized. Yes, Lieutenant Commander, the AI's voice replied almost instantly over his built-in communicator. I'm ready. Merlin said. Send the skimmer in as previously directed. Yes, Lieutenant Commander. Merlin rose, extinguished the wicks of his lamps, and opened the chamber window. He clambered up onto the thick window ledge and sat there, dangling his legs into the night, leaning one shoulder against the wide embrasure, while he gazed out over the harbor. 
The waterfront was a scene of activity, even this late at night, as longshoremen worked to finish loading cargoes for skippers eager to catch the next tide. There was also, inevitably, activity among the taverns and brothels, and Merlin's boosted hearing carried him snatches of laughter, music, drunken song, and quarrels. He could also hear and see the sentries standing alertly at their posts or walking their beats on the palace's walls, and by zooming in on the guard towers of the harbor fortifications and defensive batteries, he could see the sentries standing watch there as well. He sat there for several minutes, waiting patiently before Owl spoke again. ETA one minute, Lieutenant Commander, it said. Acknowledged, Merlin subvocalized back, although he supposed it wasn't really necessary. The transmission from the compact, long-ranged communicator built into his Pika chassis about where a biological human would have carried his spleen bounced off the snark hanging in geosynchronous orbit over the anvil, the large sea or small ocean north of Margaret's Land, to Al's master array 14,000 kilometers. No, 8,700 miles, damn it, he corrected himself. Distant in the Mountains of Light. The snark, like the array itself, was heavily stealthed, which might not be quite as excessive a precaution as Merlin had thought when he originally arranged it, and so was the vehicle coming silently out of the north above him after loitering safely out at sea all day. Merlin reached out and up, hooking the fingers of his left hand into a crevice between two of Maritha's tower's massive stones for balance. Then he pulled himself into a half-standing position in the window opening. All right, Al, collect me, he said. Yes, Lieutenant Commander, the AI replied, and a tractor beam reached down from the recon skimmer hovering a thousand meters above Telesburg and scooped Merlin neatly off his window ledge perch. He rose effortlessly and silently through the darkness, watching the city beneath his boots. This was exactly how Langhorn and his so-called angels had managed to come and go so miraculously, and Merlin had been bitterly tempted to make open use of the same capability. His recon skimmer was configured for maximum stealth at the moment, which meant its smart skin fuselage was faithfully duplicating the night sky above it. Effectively, it was as transparent as the air in which it hovered, as invisible to the human eye, or even to Merlin's, as its stealth systems had already rendered it to the vast majority of more sophisticated sensors. But that same smart skin and its normal landing light systems could have been used to produce the blinding brilliance of the Kiao Se He, the angels had used. Coupled with the literally inhuman capabilities built into Merlin's Pika, not to mention the other bits and pieces of advanced technology Cao Young and Shan Wei had been able to hide away, he could easily have duplicated any feat the angels had ever performed. But Nimue had rejected that possibility almost immediately. Not only had she been instantly and instinctively revolted by the notion of following in Langhorn's and Beidar's footsteps, but there had been more practical objections as well. Sooner or later she was going to have to tell someone the truth, which was precisely the reason Merlin had never told an outright lie. Continuing to avoid lies was going to become both easier and harder, he suspected. But when the time came that the truth had to be openly revealed, he could not afford to have told a single lie of his own. Not if he wanted whoever it was to believe him when he told them of the far greater lie which had been perpetrated upon their entire planet for so many hundreds of years. Even more to the point, simply replacing one superstition, one false religion with another, would never accomplish the task to which Nimue Alban had set her hand. Decrees from God to be obeyed without question wouldn't engender the widespread independent inquiring mindset and attitudes which would be required in the decades and centuries to come. And the appearance of an angel preaching a doctrine fundamentally at odds with that of the church and the writ could not help but raise all sorts of accusations of demonic origin. 
which in turn would almost certainly lead to the religious war she'd feared was inevitable anyway, but hoped to at least minimize and hold off for a generation or two. The hovering skimmer's thick armor-plast bubble canopy slid back, and the tractor beam deposited Merlin on the extended, built-in ladder. He climbed it quickly and settled into the comfortable, if not exactly spacious, cockpit's forward flight couch as the ladder retracted back into the fuselage. The canopy slid itself shut over his head, locking with the quiet shush of a good seal, enclosing him in the cool, safe cocoon of the cockpit, and he felt the gentle, unbreakable embrace of the flight couch's activating tractor field as he reached out and laid his hand on the joystick. I have control, Al, he said. Acknowledged, Lieutenant Commander, you have control, the AI replied, and Merlin took the skimmer out of hover and eased back on the stick, angling upward as he goosed the throttle. The skimmer accelerated smoothly, and he watched the airspeed indicator climb to 700 kilometers per hour. He could have taken it higher. The atmospheric indicator was calibrated to a speed in excess of Mach 6. But he had no intention of creating sonic booms. Once or twice it might be taken for natural thunder, even on a cloudless night like tonight. But that wouldn't be the case if he made a practice of it. The time might well come when he wouldn't have a choice about that. In the meantime, however, he wasn't about to let himself get into bad habits. He headed northwest from Telesburg, almost directly away from the site of Caleb's encounter with the Slash Lizard and Narmon's assassins crossing the waterfront and sweeping out over the waters of South Howell Bay. From his increased altitude, he could see the dim lights of the fortresses on Sand Shoal Island and Helen Island, hundreds of kilometers out into the bay, but he wasn't interested in them tonight. Instead, he continued onward, swinging further to the west, until the steep-shouldered peaks of the Stephen Mountains loomed ahead of him. The Stevens rose like a rampart, a wall across the southern end of the isthmus connecting Cheris proper to Margaret's land. The pronunciation shift in the mountain range's name indicated that it had been christened long after the Archangel Hastings had prepared his maps, probably not more than a few hundred years earlier, and it was only lightly populated, even now. Its higher peaks rose to as much as 3,000 meters. 10,000 feet, Merlin corrected himself irritably. He had to get used to thinking in the units of the local measuring system, and population pressure hadn't been sufficient to push settlers up into its inhospitable interior, which suited it quite well to Merlin's requirements. He reached his objective just under 200 miles from the Cheresian capital and brought the skimmer back into a hover over the high alpine valley. It didn't look a great deal different from any other stretch of the uninhabited mountains. There were a handful of clusters of terrestrial vegetation, but they were few and far between, lost among the native pines, which really did look quite a bit like the earth tree of the same name, he reflected, aside from their smooth, almost silky bark and even longer needles, and tanglewood thickets. Without terrestrial plants to provide them with habitat, there were none of the transplanted animals and birds whose ranges were still washing steadily outward from the areas of the planet humanity had claimed. There were plenty of examples of Safehold's native fauna, however, and Merlin reminded himself that a slash lizard or a dragon wouldn't realize a pika was indigestible until after it had made the mistake of devouring one. He smiled at the thought of one of the native predators straining to pass the undigested chunks of an unwary pika and punched up the skimmer's terrain display of the detailed topographical map Owl had generated from the snark's overflights several five days earlier. There. That was what he wanted, and he sent the skimmer sliding slowly and gently forward. The cave entrance was a dark wound in the mountainside. It looked even bigger now that he was here in person, with the skimmer to use as a visual referent and he guided the slender reconnaissance vehicle through the opening. It was over twice as wide as the skimmer's fuselage and stub wings and widened still further once he was inside. The vertical stabilizer had ample clearance as well, and he took the skimmer almost a hundred meters, 
330 feet, he reminded himself as he made the conversion, this time almost automatically, farther in, then pivoted the vehicle in place until its nose pointed once more towards the open night beyond the cave. Not bad, he thought, not bad at all. In fact, it was almost perfect. Less than half an hour from Talisburg, even at the relatively modest velocity he'd allowed himself tonight, it was at least thirty or forty of the Safeholdians' miles from the nearest human habitation, and the cave was more than large enough to serve as the skimmer's hangar. It was a little on the damp side, with quite a bit of seepage on the southern wall, despite its elevation, but that wouldn't be a factor. Once the skimmer sat down and sealed its ports, Merlin could have submerged the thing in salt water and left it there without damaging it. There were signs that something large, probably a dragon, he thought, studying the leavings, and not one of the vegetarian variety, had laired here. But that was all right, too. In fact, it was another plus. Not even a great dragon was going to be able to damage the heavily armored recon skimmer very easily. And should some wandering hunting party actually penetrate into this high mountain valley, they were unlikely to go poking about in a cave which had been claimed by one of Safehold's most fearsome land-going predators. The rest of the gear isn't as tough as the skimmer, though, he reflected. Probably be a good idea to leave the sonic system on, anyway. His copies of Shan Wei's original terraforming notes and progress reports contained enormous amounts of information on the planet's native ecology, and she and her teams had determined the sonic frequencies most effective at repelling the local wildlife. If he played with the power levels a little, he ought to be able to come up with a sonic field which would keep even a dragon safely away from his local equipment depot without driving it into finding another lair. He hovered there, a meter or so, three feet, off the cavern's reasonably flat floor. The skimmer's adjustable landing legs were more than long enough to compensate for the inevitable irregularities, and he nodded to himself, pleased by the cave's suitability. Owl. Yes, Lieutenant Commander. This is going to work very well, he said. Go ahead and run the air lorry in tomorrow night but don't unload anything until I've been able to get back here and fiddle with the skimmer's sonic fences. Yes, Lieutenant Commander. And don't forget to avoid any population centers on its flight in, either. Yes, Lieutenant Commander. For just a moment, Merlin thought he'd heard something like a trace of exaggerated patience in the AI's voice. But that was ridiculous. Of course. Do you have the take from the day's surveillance? That's another redundant question, he told himself. Of course Owl has the day's take. Yes, Lieutenant Commander, the AI said. Good. Anything more from Narmon and Shander about Duke Tyrion's involvement in the assassination attempt? No, Lieutenant Commander. Merlin grimaced unhappily at that. He had nowhere near as much information on the Duke of Tyrion as he would have liked. He'd identify the noble as a player only relatively late in the game, and the Duke was very cautious about the people with whom he met and what he discussed when he met them. He couldn't prevent Merlin from eavesdropping on almost any meeting Merlin knew about, but there didn't seem to be very many meetings of any sort. Almost as irritating, the care he exercised in what he said to his human henchmen when he did meet with one or more of them, made analysis difficult. There was no question that he was deep in bed with Narmon, although Merlin had been unable to determine the exact point at which he intended to plant his own dagger in the Emerald Prince's back. Unfortunately, given the Duke's rank, relatives, and in-laws, accusing him of treason was going to be a delicate proposition, which was one reason Merlin hadn't brought it up with Harald, and equally a reason he'd hoped to acquire additional corroborating evidence before he sat down to talk to the king's most trusted counselors in the morning. I don't suppose the duke gave us anything new from his end, did he? he asked. No, lieutenant commander. Merlin grimaced again, this time with a chuckle. According to the manufacturer's manual, a rapier tactical computer's AI 
had a vocabulary of over a hundred thousand words. So far, he estimated Al must have used at least sixty of them. All right, Al, go ahead and burst transmit the take to the skimmer's onboard systems. I'll have time to skim through it before I head back to Talisburg. Yes, Lieutenant Commander. Al was perfectly capable of maintaining the critical bugs Merlin had emplaced in various and sundry locations about Safehold. At the moment, they were concentrated in Cheris, Emerald, and Coruscant, but he wasn't neglecting Zion or the Kingdom of Taro. For that matter, Queen Charlayan had one permanently parked on the ceiling of her throne room and another in her privy council chamber. Despite the fact that Merlin required far less sleep than any biological human, he couldn't possibly have found time to monitor all of those stealthy spies himself. But Owl had been carefully instructed about the names, places, and events in which Merlin was interested. The AI had also been given a list of more generalized trigger words and phrases, like assassinate, for example, or bribe. And unlike Merlin, it was both designed to monitor multiple inputs simultaneously and immune to boredom. The transmission took only a handful of seconds. Then a green light blinked, indicating completion of the transmission. Merlin nodded in satisfaction, then cocked his head. Anything more on your analysis of the Rakurai platforms, Al? He asked. Affirmative, Lieutenant Commander, the AI replied, then fell silent, and Merlin rolled his eyes. In that case, tell me what you've come up with on how to take them out. I have not been able to devise a plan to destroy them, Lieutenant Commander, Owl said calmly. What? Merlin sat straighter in his couch, eyes narrowing. Why not, Owl? The kinetic bombardment and solar energy platforms are nested in the center of a sphere of area defense systems and passive scanners which no weapons at my disposal can hope to penetrate, the AI told him. Analysis suggests that most of those defenses were in place after Commodore Pei's destruction of the original Lake Pei Enclave. After Langhorn was dead? Yes, Lieutenant Commander. Owl's response actually surprised Merlin a bit. The AI wasn't usually very good at recognizing questions, especially what might be rhetorical ones, appropriate for it to answer unless they were specifically directed to it. Do you have any hypothesis for why they might have been added at that time? Without better historical data, no reliable, statistically significant hypotheses can be offered, Owl said. However, modeling of the apparent strategy of the Langhorn administration prior to that time, particularly in light of the fact that Commodore Pei was kept in complete ignorance of the bombardment system's existence before its use against the Alexandria Enclave, would suggest the administrator's successors were concerned that there might be other disloyalists, particularly among the military units the Commodore had commanded. Assuming that to be true, it would perhaps have seemed logical to bolster the platform's defenses against additional attacks. Merlin frowned, not in disagreement, but in thought, for several seconds, then nodded slowly. That does make sense, I suppose, he mused aloud. Not that it helps our problems very much. Owl said nothing, and Merlin chuckled harshly at its lack of response. Then he thought some more. The kinetic bombardment platforms which had been used against Shan Wei were still there, sweeping silently in orbit around the planet. It was impossible to be certain, but Merlin was virtually positive the platforms were tasked to bombard and destroy any ground-based energy signature which might indicate that Safeholdians were straying from the dictates of the Book of Zhuo Zheng's limitations on technology. The energy footprint of an electrical generating plant, for example. The exact level of emissions necessary to activate them was impossible to estimate, but the Book of Chihiro clearly warned that the same Rakurai which had smitten the evil Shan Wei waited to punish anyone so lost to God as to attempt to follow in her footsteps. 
According to the writ, the lightning associated with natural thunderstorms was God's reminder of the destruction awaiting those who sinned, a sort of inverted mirror image of the symbology of the rainbow's promise to Noah following the deluge. Al had been able to get fairly good imagery of the platforms using purely passive systems, but the one snark which had gone active to probe for additional information had been picked off almost instantly by a laser-armed anti-missile platform. Another snark had attempted to penetrate the defended perimeter under maximum stealth, only to be detected and destroyed while it was still thousands of kilometers from the platforms. That had rather conclusively answered the question of whether or not the solar power-powered systems were still active. At the same time, the defensive systems had shown absolutely no interest in any stray emissions, Merlin's other snarks, skimmer flights, or calm transmissions might have let slip. Probably would have been just a bit of a problem for their own operations if it had gone around shooting the angels in the ass because of their emissions, he thought mordantly. So the damned thing almost certainly is waiting to kill the first sign of emerging technology outside the Zhuo Zheng parameters, which doesn't mean it couldn't be used for something else if those damned power sources hiding in the temple told it to. And it's got six loaded cells, each capable of covering half a continent at need, by Al's best estimate. Not good. Not good at all. We can't get anything close enough to do the job, Al, he asked after the better part of a full minute. Negative, Lieutenant Commander. Why not? Because none of the weapons stockpiled for your use have the range to engage the platforms from outside the range at which the platform's defensive systems can destroy them, Lieutenant Commander. Nor do any of the platforms available to you have the stealth capability to get deep enough into the defended zone to change that fact. I see, Merlin grimaced, then shrugged. Well, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. We'll just have to cross that bridge when we come to it, and I'm sure that between us we'll be able to come up with a solution eventually. Owl said nothing, and Merlin chuckled again. Tact or obtuseness, he wondered. Not that it mattered, but whichever it was, there was no point in beating his head against that particular wall right now. He put the problem aside and leaned back in the flight couch once more as he took the skimmer high and allowed its airspeed to climb to Mach 4 on a southwesterly heading. The flight he had in mind would take over an hour even at that speed, and he punched up the first of Owl's recordings. The local knight was much younger as Merlin switched off the playback from the surveillance bugs 5,000 kilometers and almost an hour and a half later. As always, most of the recorded surveillance data had been boring, irritatingly cryptic, or both. But equally, as always, there were more than a few nuggets tucked away amid all the background noise. At the moment, though, that wasn't really foremost in Merlin's thoughts, and his expression tightened as he gazed down at the terrain below him. Armageddon Reef, the locals called it. Once it had been called Alexandria, but that had been long ago, and its new name was grimly appropriate. Just under a thousand miles east to west, that was the width of Rakurai Bay, the bay at the heart of Armageddon Reef the most accursed spot on Safehold, which had once been home to the Alexandria Enclave. The island upon which that enclave had stood was still there, but it wasn't as large as it had been, and it had been battered into a near-lunar landscape by overlapping impact craters. Langhorn hadn't been content just to destroy Shanway's enclave and murder all of her friends and associates. There'd been colonists in that enclave as well, some in Alexandria itself, others scattered across the minor continent surrounding the vast bay. They, too, had had to be destroyed, for they might have been infected by Shanway's heretical teachings. Besides, Merlin thought harshly, the bastard wanted to make a statement. Hell, he wanted to play with his goddamned toy, that's what he wanted. Rock my ass. He realized his hand was tightening dangerously on the stick, 
Even with the governors he'd set on his peak of strength, he could damage the controls if he really tried, and he forced himself to relax. It was difficult. From his altitude, it was easy for his enhanced vision, despite the darkness, to see how the kinetic bombardment had shredded a roughly circular zone over 1,800 kilometers across. Not just once, either. Nimue had had plenty of time to run the reports from the snarks she'd dispatched to the site of that long-ago mass murder through OWL's analyzing software. It was readily apparent from the overlapping impact patterns that Langhorn had sent three separate waves of artificial meteors hammering across the continent, and he'd given Alexandria itself even more attention than that. At least five waves of kinetic strikes had marched back and forth across the island. Even now, almost 800 standard years later, the tortured, broken ruin he'd left behind was brutally evident from Merlin's present height. Side 6 Off Armageddon Reef by David Weber Continuing on page 137 But he didn't kill quite everyone, did he? Merlin told himself bitterly. Oh, no. He needed someone to bear witness, didn't he? For that was exactly what Langhorn had done. He'd spared a single settlement from destruction, so that its stunned and terrified inhabitants could testify to the rain of fiery thunderbolts, the Rakurai of God, which had punished Shanwei and her fallen fellows for their evil, the archangels who'd swooped down upon that surviving village in the aftermath of the bombardment had borne them away, distributing them in family groups to other towns and villages across Safold. Officially, they'd been spared because, unlike their fellows, they had been free of sin. As Lot and his family had been spared from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, they had been spared because they'd remained faithful to God and his revealed laws. In fact, they'd been spared solely so that they could testify to the might and fearsome power of God's fury, and the fate of any who rebelled against his viceroy on safehold, the Archangel Langhorn. There'd been no reason Merlin had to make this flight. Not really. He'd already known what had happened here, already seen the snark's imagery. There wasn't really any difference between that imagery and what his own artificial eyes reported to the electronic ghost of Nimue Alban, who lived behind them. Yet there was. Oh, but there was. Pikas were programmed to do anything humans could do, and to react naturally, with appropriate changes of expression, to their operators' emotions, unless those operators specifically instructed them not to. Merlin had not so instructed himself for those natural automatic reactions, like the scars Nimue had been careful to incorporate into his appearance, were a necessary part of convincing those about him that he was human. And, electronic analog or not, Perhaps he truly was still human. A corner of his cybernetic brain reflected as a tear trickled down his cheek. He hovered there, far, far above the scene of that ancient carnage, that long-ago murder which had happened only months ago, as far as he was concerned. He didn't stay long, actually, though it seemed far longer, just long enough to accomplish the thing he'd come here to do, to mourn his dead and to promise them that however long it took, whatever challenge might arise, the purpose for which they had died would be achieved. Langhorn and his adherents had named this place Armageddon Reef, the place where good had triumphed over evil for all time. But they'd been wrong, Merlin thought coldly. The atrocity they'd wreaked here had been not the final battle of that struggle, but its first and the end of the war it had begun would be very different from the one they had envisioned. He hovered there, feeling that promise sinking into his alloy bones, and then he turned the skimmer's nose back into the east, towards the approaching dawn, and left that place of sorrow once again. 8. Royal Palace, Telesburg, Kingdom of Cheris Your Majesty! the distinguished-looking man said, bending his head in a respectful bow as he entered the council chamber. Rageous, King Harald responded. 
The distinguished-looking man straightened and crossed to the chair at the foot of the long table. He paused and stood beside it, waiting, until Harold's waving hand invited him to be seated. He obeyed the gesture then and settled into the elaborately carved armchair. Merlin studied him from behind impassive eyes. His snarks and their parasite bugs had observed and listened to this man often over the past few months, but that wasn't quite the same as finally meeting him face to face. Rageous Yawence, Earl of Grey Harbor, was Harald VII's first counselor, the senior member of the Privy Council, effectively Cheris Prime Minister, although the term and office hadn't been invented yet on safehold. He was of less than average height for a Cheresian, but he carried his neat, compact frame with the confidence of a man who knew his worth. He was a few years older than Harald, and unlike the king, he was clean-shaven. The long hair pulled back in the old-fashioned sort of ponytail favored by the more rustic members of the minor nobility and serving sea officers was liberally streaked with silver, but his dark eyes were bright and alert. The chain of office around his neck was less elaborate than Harald's, without the glittering gem sets of the kings, and his tunic's embroidery was more subdued, although its fabric was just as rich, and he too wore the golden scepter of the pilgrimage. Despite the superb tailoring and obvious cost of his clothing, he carried an air of physical toughness, as well as the mental toughness one might expect out of the kingdom's first counselor, which probably owed something to the twenty years he'd spent as an officer in the Royal Navy before his childless older brother's death had dropped the Grey Harbor title on him and forced his resignation. The present Earl had gone to sea as a midshipman officer cadet at the ripe old age of eleven and risen to command his own ship by the age of twenty-eight, and he'd seen his share of sea fights and bloodshed before he'd become an effete politician. Grey Harbor looked back at Merlin, his face equally impassive, and Merlin smiled mentally. The first counselor had to be alive with curiosity, given all the rumors about the assassination attempt and the crown prince's mysterious rescuer which had been swirling about the palace. No doubt Grey Harbor had been considerably better informed than almost anyone else, but that wasn't saying a great deal. The king had just opened his mouth to say something more when the council chamber door opened again. Another man came through it, his step considerably more hurried than Grey Harbor's had been. The newcomer was at least a head taller than the earl, and although his clothing was made of rich fabric and jeweled rings glittered on his fingers, he lacked the first counselor's air of polish. He was also younger than Grey Harbor and considerably more weathered looking, and he was already going bold. His hooked beak of a nose was high arched and proud and his eyes were a lighter shade of brown, almost amber, than most Cheresians. "'Your Majesty,' he said just a bit gruffly, "'I apologize. I came as quickly as I could when my secretary gave me your message. "'There's no need to apologize, Benjamin,' Harold said with a smile. "'I understood you wouldn't return from Sand Shoal until late this evening or tomorrow. "'I didn't expect you to be able to attend at all, or we would have waited for you.' I've just returned, Your Majesty, Benjamin Rice, Baron Wave Thunder replied. The matter I'd gone to attend to required considerably less time than I'd anticipated. I'm glad to hear it, Harold told him. It will be much more convenient to discuss this with you and Rages at the same time. Please be seated. Wave Thunder obeyed the polite command, seating himself in what was obviously his regular place, two chairs down from Grey Harbor to the Earl's left. Harald waited until he'd settled fully into position, then waved his right hand in Merlin's direction. Rageous, Benjamin, this is the mysterious Merlin the two of you have undoubtedly heard so much about. Sajin Merlin, the Earl of Grey Harbor and the Baron of Wave Thunder. Grey Harbor's eyes grew narrower and even more intent as Harald gave Merlin the Sajin title, but the king continued calmly. Regis manages the Privy Council for me and does most of the hard work of running the kingdom. Benjamin, not to put too fine a point on it, is my spymaster, and very good he is at it, too. The three men nodded courteously, if warily, to one another, 
and Harald smiled. I realize all sorts of rumors about Sejin Merlin have been running around the palace ever since Caleb got home. Fortunately, no one seems to have realized Merlin really is a Sejin, or what that implies at least, and for reasons I believe will become clear, I very much want to keep it that way. Given what happened out there in the woods, and the stories, many of them far wilder than the palace gossip, I'm sure, which have to be running about the city as well, people will expect him to receive a certain amount of preference here at court. That's only natural, yet it's important we not show him too much preference. In order to make best use of his services, however, I believe it will be important for him to have access not simply to me, but also to the council. Exactly how to reconcile those two opposed considerations puzzled me for a time, but I think I've come up with a solution. I intend to name Sejin Merlin to the Royal Guard expressly to serve as Caleb's personal guardsman and bodyguard. Lieutenant Falcon will remain in command of Caleb's normal marine detail, but Merlin will be assigned directly to Caleb, with the understanding that he'll be cooperating with Falcon, but not directly responsible to the lieutenant. I'm sure some in the Marines will resent that, even see it as a slap in their service's face, but I also expect them to learn to live with it. And after such a close escape, no one will be surprised if we make some changes in our long-standing security arrangements. Assigning him permanently to Caleb will keep him physically close at all times, without officially admitting him to my inner circle of advisors. It's unlikely we'll be able to keep the fact that he's a Seijin from leaking out, of course. When it does, I suggest we all emphasize the tales of the Seijin's martial abilities and downplay any reference to any other unusual talents. Grey Harbor and Wave Thunder nodded almost in unison, although it seemed to Merlin that it was more in acknowledgment of Harald's instructions than from any understanding of why the king might have given those instructions in the first place, which, he reflected, wasn't very surprising after all. As part of the effort to divert attention from him, Harold continued, the two of you are the only members of the council who will know he's anything more than the exceptionally capable warrior assigned to protect Caleb, which he appears to be. Michael also knows, of course, but I intend to restrict that information as much as possible to the three of you, Caleb and myself, and our personal bodyguards. In time, we'll have to broaden that circle, but I want the minimum possible number of people admitted to the secret. In addition to keeping any of our less friendly neighbors, shall we say, from suspecting the true extent of his talents, that should also prevent him from becoming an object of the sorts of court suspicion and jealousy which would be inevitable if a complete stranger rose abruptly to a position of high power here in Cheris. The king's expression turned briefly grim. Nonetheless, the truth is that his talents extend far beyond the field of battle, he said. I'm strongly of the opinion that those other talents will be of far greater importance to us in the long run, and I expect the three of you are likely to spend quite a bit of time working together. He paused as if to allow that to sink in, then looked directly at Grey Harbor. Regis, Sejin Merlin managed to impress me even more during our interview yesterday morning than his intervention to save Caleb's life had already done. I went to that meeting prepared to be both skeptical and suspicious. I emerged from it with the belief that Sejin Merlin both means cherish well and has the ability to be of great service to us. I'm sure you'll form your own opinion of him. I value you and Benjamin for your independence of thought as much as for your loyalty and ability. But I want the two of you to listen very carefully to what he has to say. Before I turn all of you loose together, though, let me tell you exactly why he's impressed me as much as he has. To begin with, and since every single thing he told me matched perfectly with everything you've been able to confirm, Benjamin, the king finished his briefing of his counselors several minutes later, I had no choice but to accept that he truly does possess the sight. Of course, as I told him at the time, both his abilities and his trustworthiness must be proven before I can consider relying upon him 
as I already rely on the two of you. Sage and Merlin was courteous enough to accept that without rancor. He paused, and both of the counselors looked at Merlin with thoughtful expressions. Wave Thunder looked fascinated, if still faintly skeptical, which wasn't much of a surprise. Grey Harbor also looked skeptical, but unless Merlin was seriously mistaken, at least half of the first counselor's skepticism was reserved for the mysterious stranger's real motives and ambitions. Since Sajin Merlin is clearly much better informed about events and the people behind them here in Talisburg and in Cheris generally than most newcomers, the king continued dryly after a few moments, it seemed to me that the first thing for us to do would be for the three of you to discuss our concerns about our less friendly neighbors' representatives among us. I want you and Benjamin to combine what we already know with what Sajin Merlin can tell us, Regis. This attempt to murder Caleb wasn't exactly completely unexpected, but it does represent a decision on someone's part to significantly raise the stakes. I think it's time we considered suggesting to them that attempts to murder the heir to the throne are unwise. The king's tone was light, almost whimsical. His eyes were not. I understand, Your Majesty, Grey Harbor replied with a nod that was half a bow. Then he cocked his head slightly. Just how firmly would you like that message delivered, sire? Very firmly, where the individuals actually involved in this attempt are concerned. Harold said in a rather colder tone. That much I think everyone will expect, assuming we can determine just who was responsible. And frankly, I intend to take quite a bit of personal satisfaction out of seeing to it no one's disappointed in that respect. For the rest of our local spies, a somewhat more restrained reaction may be in order. I still want them made nervous, you understand. I believe we do, Your Majesty. Wave Thunder said gruffly. But just to be completely clear, you aren't instructing us to reverse our policy on known spies. Probably not, Harold said and shrugged slightly. Leaving the ones we know about in place to discourage their masters from sending in new ones has served us well so far. On the other hand, what almost happened to Caleb indicates they can still circumvent our surveillance. Besides, they have to know we've identified at least some of their agents. And after something like this, they'll expect us to devote some attention to house cleaning. If we don't move against at least a few of them, they'll wonder why we didn't. For now, assume any one on the secondary list is fair game, and use your own judgment as to which of them will be most useful, removed from play, and which left in place. On the primary list, get my approval before moving against anyone. And what shall we do with the information provided by Sage and Merlin? Grey Harbor asked in an almost painfully neutral tone. I'll trust your and Benjamin's judgment when it comes to deciding which list to put any new names on, Harald told him. Take no action against anyone you put on the primary list without first discussing it with me. As far as anyone on the secondary list is concerned, I am prepared to rely on your judgment. Understood, Your Majesty, Grey Harbor said. Thank you. Harold pushed back his chair and stood, and the other three quickly stood in turn, bending their heads respectfully. The king watched them, then smiled at his first counselor and shook his head slightly. I know exactly what you're thinking, Rages, he said. I suspect Sage and Merlin does too. Still, you're much too intelligent to allow that ingrained suspicion of yours to cloud your judgment. Besides, I predict you're going to be just as surprised by the Sajin's talents as I was. It's not Sajin Merlin's talents which concern me, sire, Grey Harbor said with a thin smile which acknowledged the accuracy of his monarch's observation. Oh, I know that, Harold chuckled, and so does the Sajin, but I still think you're going to be surprised. He smiled again, this time at all three of them and limped out of the council chamber. And Mulvane is running an entire ring of agents out of the crossed anchors for Mason. Merlin finished up his basic report the better part of an hour later. The tavern keeper is one of Mulvane's people, 
but most of the agents he's overseeing really think they're working for the representative of a legitimate foreign banker whose interests are firmly entwined with your own merchant houses. They think they're providing basically commercial information without realizing how useful that information could be to Hector or what can be deduced from it. Wave Thunder nodded without looking up from the several sheets of paper on which he was still busily jotting notes. Unlike Grey Harbor, the Baron had not been born to the nobility. His father had been a common ship's master and Benjamin Rice had earned his patent of nobility by rising from that beginning to become one of Tellisburg's great business magnates. He'd trained as a clerk along the way, and still had the fast, clearly legible handwriting he'd developed then. It continued to serve him well, since his duties as the head of Harald's intelligence apparatus left him disinclined to trust secretaries when it came to taking sensitive notes. Now he sat back finally, studying what he'd written, then glanced at Grey Harbor before looking at Merlin. I'm as pressed as His Majesty predicted, Sage and Merlin, he said, gathering up the dozen-plus sheets of closely written notes. By all the information you've just provided, of course, but also by your ability to keep track of all that without notes of your own. I, too, am impressed, Earl Grey Harbor agreed, lounging back in his own chair, regarding Merlin from hooded eyes. I'm also impressed, Wave Thunder continued, by the fact that so far as I'm aware, every single major foreign agent we've been able to identify is on your list as well. As I'm sure you're aware, that sort of corroboration is always valuable. And to be honest, it lends additional weight to your information about agents we haven't been able to identify. Like this entire secondary ring Lang is running in North Cape. He shook his head. I suppose I should have realized he'd have to have someone else to act as his eyes and ears that far from Tellisburg, but we've never had as much as a sniff of who it might actually be. I wouldn't feel too badly about that, Baron, Merlin said with a shrug. I have certain advantages your regular investigators don't. If I'd had to investigate the same way they do, I'd never have been able to discover as much as I'm sure you already know. No doubt, Grey Harbor said thoughtfully. At the same time, Sage and Merlin, I must admit I'm curious as to just how it happens that you've seen so much about Cheris. Merlin arched one eyebrow, and the first counselor shrugged. It just seems odd that a Sage in from the Mountains of Light should be granted such detailed visions of events this far from the Temple Lands that you can identify individual tavern keepers working for Prince Hector. Wave Thunder frowned slightly, sitting back in his own chair and looking back and forth between the other two men. Merlin, on the other hand, smiled slightly. It's not as odd as you might think, my lord, he said. I do have some control over the sorts of things I see, you know. Indeed? Grey Harbor sounded politely skeptical. In all the tales I have ever heard or read, the visions of a sage in seem to be cryptic, one might say or perhaps non-specific, yet your visions, Sage in Merlin, appear to be extremely specific. I would suspect, Merlin said, that quite a few of those non-specific visions from the tales you've heard were works of fiction. He leaned back in his own chair with an amused smile. Either they never happened at all, or else they were embroidered, let's say, by the people who reported them. While it pains me to admit it, I'm sure more than one Seijin was little more than a common charlatan. In a case like that, the more cryptic a so-called vision, the better. A little space for loose interpretation would go a long way towards maintaining someone's credibility. That's certainly true enough, Grey Harbor seemed a bit taken aback by Merlin's direct response. My lord, the blue-eyed stranger said. When I first began having these visions of mine, they came from all over Safehold. Indeed, they were quite bewildering in a great many ways. But I soon discovered that by concentrating on places and people of special interest, I could redirect, or possibly focus would be a better word, subsequent visions. And you chose to focus them here, on Cheris? Yes, I did. 
I don't blame you for being skeptical, my lord. That's one of your duties to the king. However, I've already explained to his majesty exactly what it was which attracted me to Cheris in the first place. And to be frank, at this particular moment, Cheris needs all the advantages she can get. That's true enough, Regis, Wave Thunder said. He began jogging his sheets of notes into a tidy sheaf. And while I'm as suspicious as the next man, the Baron continued, so far, at least, Sage and Merlin's credentials seem to be standing up quite well. I had my suspicions about who was behind that assassination attempt on the prince, but none of my people had picked up the connection between Lang and his mercenaries. Now that it's been pointed out, though, I expect we'll be able to confirm it. It makes sense, anyway. I know, Grey Harper sighed. I suppose it's just... The first counselor grimaced, then looked at Merlin with an odd little half-smile. "'You're certainly right about our needing every advantage we can get,' he said in a more open tone. "'Perhaps it's just that I've felt we were trying to stave off Krakens with a barge pole for so long that I simply find it hard to believe this sort of help could just fall into our laps, as it were.' "'I can understand that.' Merlin looked at him for several moments, then glanced back at Wave Thunder. I can understand that, he repeated, and because I do, I've hesitated to mention one more name to you. You have? Grey Harper's eyes narrowed, and Wave Thunder frowned. There's one more highly placed spy, Merlin said slowly, highly placed enough that I'd originally intended not to mention him at all until after you'd had the opportunity to evaluate the reliability of the other information I could provide. Where? Who are you talking about? Grey Harbor leaned forward, his voice once more edged with suspicion. My lord, if I tell you that, it will cause you great distress. I'll be the best judge of that, Sage and Merlin, the earl said with the crisp, hard-edged authority of the kingdom's first counselor. Very well, my lord. Merlin bent his head in a small bow of acknowledgement, not in submission. I'm afraid the Duke of Tyrion is not the man you think he is. Grey Harbor sat back abruptly. For a moment, his expression was simply shocked. Then his face darkened angrily. How dare you say such a thing? he demanded harshly. I dare a great many things, my lord, Merlin said flatly, his own expression unyielding. And I speak the truth. I told you it would distress you. That much at least was the truth. Grey Harbor snapped. I greatly doubt the rest of it was. Rageous, Wave Thunder began, but Grey Harbor cut him off with a sharp, abrupt wave of his hand, never taking his own furious eyes off of Merlin. When the king told us to work with you, I doubt very much that he ever suspected for a moment that you would tell us his own cousin is a traitor, he grated. I'm sure he didn't, Merlin agreed, and I'm not surprised by your anger, my lord. After all, you've known the Duke since he was a boy. Your daughter is married to him, and, of course, he stands forth in the succession, and he's always been King Harald's staunch supporter, both in the Privy Council and in Parliament as well. You've known me less than two hours. It would astonish me if you were prepared to take my unsupported word that a man you've known and trusted for so long is, in fact, a traitor. Unfortunately, that doesn't change the truth. Truth, Grey Harbor hissed. Is that what this has been all about? Who sent you to discredit the Duke? No one sent me anywhere except my own will, Merlin replied, and I seek to discredit no one except those whose own actions have already discredited them. Not one more lie. I won't rage us, Wave Thunder looked unhappy, but the sharpness in his voice pulled Grey Harbor's eyes back to him. The First Counselor glared, and Wave Thunder shook his head. Rage us, he said again his voice much closer to normal. I think we need to listen to what he has to say. What? Grey Harbor stared at his fellow counselor in disbelief. My own people have reported a few irregularities where the Duke is concerned, Wave Thunder said uncomfortably. What sort of irregularities? Grey Harbor demanded incredulously. Most of them were small things, Wave Thunder admitted. Company he kept, 
a few instances in which known emerald agents slipped through our hands in High Ratha when we'd alerted the authorities to take them, trading ventures that proved unusually profitable for him and in which emerald merchant interests were deeply involved. And the fact that he's been Lang's best customer for wyverns, as far as we can tell. Don't be ridiculous, Grey Harbor said coldly. The Duke, my son-in-law, I remind you, is addicted to the hunt. His wyvern coop is the biggest, most expensive one in the entire kingdom. Of course he's Lang's best customer. For God's sake, Benjamin. We've known all along that Lang's cover was chosen expressly to give him access to people just like Calvin. If you're going to accuse him on that basis, you'll have to accuse half the nobles in Cheris. Which is why I haven't accused him of anything yet, Wave Thunder said rather more sharply. I said it was small things, and no one is going to accuse someone in the Duke's position of treason on the basis of such flimsy evidence. Not when he's so close to the crown, and when he's so openly and strongly supported the king for so long. But that doesn't change the reports I've received, and it doesn't necessarily make Sejin Merlin a liar, which, the baron looked Grey Harbor straight in the eye, is exactly what you're accusing him of being. Hasn't he just accused the Duke of far worse? Grey Harbor snapped back. Yes, he has. Wave Thunder said, his voice even flatter than Merlin's had been. And what if he's right? The very idea is preposterous, which doesn't mean it can't be true, Wave Thunder said unflinchingly. This is my area of responsibility, Regis. I don't want Sajin Merlin to be right about the Duke, but it's my responsibility to consider the possibility that he might be and it's your responsibility to let me do my job and find out. Grey Harbor glared at him for several taut seconds. Then he looked back at Merlin, and his dark eyes were bitter with fury. Very well, he gritted. Do your job, Benjamin. And when you've proved there isn't a single word of truth in it, do your job and investigate this man, too. As for me, I'm afraid I have other duties at the moment. He stood, jerked an angry bow at Wave Thunder, and stalked out of the chamber without even glancing in Merlin's direction again. 9. Baron Wave Thunder's Office, Telesburg. I'm afraid it looks as if there may be something to it, my lord. Benjamin Rice leaned back in his chair, his expression unhappy. Sir Richard C. Farmer, his second in command, looked equally unhappy. Sir Richard had primary responsibility for Wave Thunder's counterintelligence operations, although that, too, was a term which had not yet been reinvented on Safehold. He was Wave Thunder's most trusted subordinate, both for his loyalty and his judgment, and he was also a very intelligent man. Wave Thunder hadn't told him the identity of the Duke's accuser, but the Baron felt confident Sea Farmer had deduced his identity. Sir Richard, however, had half a lifetime of experience in not asking questions about things he wasn't supposed to know, and Wave Thunder trusted his discretion completely. At the moment, Sea Farmer was also the man who'd just spent the last two days going back over every scrap of information they had on the Duke of Tyrion. The Duke had worked closely with Wave Thunder and Sea Farmer on more than one occasion, given his rank and his duties. Tyrion was inside many of the kingdom's critical strategies, privy to most of the king's secrets, both personal and political, and he'd been there literally for decades, which, because Sea Farmer was as experienced as he was intelligent, meant he understood precisely where this particular pocketful of worms could lead. I don't like admitting that for several reasons, Sea Farmer continued after a moment. First, of course, because of how messy this could turn out to be, and for how much it's going to hurt His Majesty. But I'm almost equally unhappy about the fact that without this new information, wherever it came from, he added dutifully, we probably never would have realized there could be anything serious to look at in the first place. Not too surprising, really, I suppose, 
waved Thunder sighed. He pinched the bridge of his proud nose, balding scalp gleaming in the sunlight streaming in through the window behind him, and shook his head. No one wants to be the first to point a finger at the kingdom's second-ranking noble, Richard. And no one wants to believe someone who stands that high in the succession could be a traitor in the first place. It's happened other places, Sea Farmer pointed out grimly. I should have borne in mind that it could happen here as well, my lord. You should have, I should have, Wave Thunder waved his hand. Neither of us did, and now that we have, I don't want us jumping to hasty conclusions of guilt because we feel like we ought to have been suspicious all along. Point taken, my lord. Sea Farmer nodded and Wave Thunder reached out to toy with a paperweight on his desk while he considered his subordinate's report. Wave Thunder himself was proof of how open the kingdom of Cheris nobility was, compared with those of most other kingdoms of Safehold, and he, and King Harald, believed in using the best talent available, regardless of how blue or not blue that talent's blood might be. That policy had served them well over the years, but it had its drawbacks, too. And one of them was that, however open the Cheresian aristocracy might be, commonly born men still hesitated to accuse great nobles of wrongdoing. Partly that was the result of innate respect, the belief that certain people simply had to be above suspicion. That, Wave Thunder felt sure, was the category to which Sea Farmer just as Wave Thunder himself had assigned Calvin Armach, the Duke of Tyrion, in his own mind. After all, the present Duke was the only living son of the king's only uncle. Although his father, Arryn, had been Harald VI's younger brother, he was actually a few years older than Harald, since Arryn, like Calvin himself, had married late. He and Harald had been raised more like brothers than like cousins, and he was Caleb's godfather as well as his cousin. He was also constable of Hyratha, the key fortress city on Tyrian Island. Hyratha was arguably the second or third most important naval base of the entire kingdom, placed to dominate the northern half of Howell Bay, and its constable was traditionally considered the senior Cheresian military officer after High Admiral Lock Island himself. Not only that, but Tyrion was one of the senior leaders of the King's party in the House of Lords, an unwavering advocate of King Harald's policies, one of the King's most trusted diplomatic representatives, and the son-in-law of the Kingdom's first counselor. Surely he, of all people, simply could not be a traitor. But, as Sea Farmer had just pointed out, it had happened other places, which was where the fact that so many of Wave Thunder's best investigators were common-born might well come into play. It was possible that someone who was nobly born himself might have been more willing to cherish suspicions about a fellow aristocrat. More to the point, however, he might have been more likely to risk voicing any suspicions he did cherish about such a powerful potential enemy. Even in Cheris, a commoner who made an enemy among the high aristocracy was unlikely to prosper, and the same held true for his family. It was a potential blind spot Wave Thunder was going to have to pay more attention to in the future, because although he'd just cautioned Sea Farmer against leaping to any conclusions, the Baron himself felt a sinking surety of the Duke's guilt. Merlin Athrawis had provided too much other information whose veracity could be tested and so far every single thing he'd told them, and which Wave Thunder's agents had been able to test, had proved accurate. It was always remotely possible that Grey Harbor's suspicion that it was all part of some elaborate, convoluted plot to damage the Crown's faith in the Duke was correct. The very factors which had placed Tyrion above suspicion made him vitally important to the kingdom and its security. If, in fact, he was as loyal as everyone had always believed him to be, then discrediting him, possibly even driving him into rebellion as his only defense against false accusations, 
would be a tremendous coup for any of Cheris's many enemies. But Wave Thunder didn't believe it for a moment, and had Grey Harbor been even a little less closely associated with Tyrion, the Baron suspected, the First Counselor wouldn't have believed it either. Unfortunately, the Earl was that closely associated with the Duke, and then there was the little matter of the fact that Tyrion was also King Harald's first cousin, and that both the king and the crown prince held him in deep affection. We have to move very cautiously here, Richard, the baron said finally. Sea Farmer didn't reply, but his expression was one of such emphatic agreement that Wave Thunder's lips twitched. Clearly that was one of the more unnecessary warnings he'd ever issued. Do you have any thoughts on how best to approach the problem? He continued. That depends upon the answer to a rather delicate question, my lord. I'm sure it does, Wave Thunder said dryly. And no, I don't think we want to tell the king about this until we're more confident there actually is something to tell him. He's going to be badly hurt, if there's any truth to it. And he's going to be angry, whatever happens, even if it all proves to be a false alarm. But if we tell him about this before we're sure, it's likely to adversely affect our investigation's secrecy. His Majesty is one of the canniest men I know, but I'm not certain how well he'd be able to dissemble if he thought the Duke was a traitor. And he chose not to add aloud, as long as we keep it just between ourselves, something I authorized without His Majesty's knowledge or approval. He'll have someone to throw to the crockins if it turns out the Duke is innocent after all. Wave Thunder didn't find contemplating that possibility especially cheering, but it came with his job, and if the Duke was in fact innocent, his importance to the kingdom would make placating his possible fury at having been wrongly suspected a high priority for King Harald. That limits the possibilities, my lord, Sea Farmer pointed out respectfully. He wasn't complaining. Obviously, he'd followed the same chain of logic, but simply considering the practical implications. The Duke's own guardsmen are very, very good, and they're intimately familiar with how we go about things. They ought to be. They've helped us do it often enough. So if we try anything like sneaking one of our people inside his household, we're more likely to alert him to the fact that we're suspicious than we are to succeed. And we can't get at his private correspondence either, Wave Thunder agreed. The Duke's public correspondence, associated with the offices he held by royal appointment, like his position as Constable of Hyratha, was another matter. That, the Baron was confident, he could gain access to without undue difficulty and he was quite confident it would do him absolutely no good after he'd done it. He'd do it anyway, of course, just in case, but he'd be astonished if anything were to come of it. If we knew exactly what he's doing, assuming, of course, that he is doing something, Sea Farmer qualified scrupulously, it would make things a lot easier. If we knew he was passing information, and suspected who he was passing it to, we could try planting false information on him and see how the other side reacted. But all I can really tell you is that he seems to be spending an inordinate amount of time with people we've determined are in Narmon's pocket, one way or another, like Baron Black Wyvern, and Lang, of course, and... Sea Farmer's expression turned grimmer. There's that little matter of those emerald agents who seem to keep getting lost in Hyratha. Wave Thunder nodded, but he hadn't missed the way Sea Farmer's eyes narrowed. Two of the suspected emerald agents who'd somehow managed to elude apprehension in Hyratha had cut the throats of a pair of Sea Farmer's most trusted investigators before making their escape. Investigators who'd come to Hyratha with what should have been perfect covers and the Duke's knowledge of their identities and mission. In fact, the Duke had been the only person in Hyratha 
who'd been informed of their presence, precisely because Narmon's agents there had so persistently escaped arrest in the past. Sea Farmer had double and triple checked to be certain of that, which meant the Duke was also the only person in Hyratha who could have given their identities away. That didn't necessarily prove anything. The secret might have been compromised at the Telesburg end when Sea Farmer first sent them out, or one of the investigators might have been known to the other side from a previous case. Unlikelier things had happened in the past, and would again. And even if the Duke was responsible for the information leakage, he might well have revealed it inadvertently. For that matter, Narmon might have succeeded in getting a spy inside the Duke's official household, in a position to compromise the information without his knowledge. The problem was finding out whether or not that was what had happened, and until Wave Thunder managed to do that, he couldn't really afford to act on any of the rest of Merlin's information. Certainly not on any of that information he couldn't independently confirm. All right, the Baron said after a moment. I think we need to go about this in two separate ways. First, I want the people we have watching him to be reinforced, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you how important it is to be absolutely sure of the loyalty of anyone we assign to this, Richard. Of course not, my lord. And second, Wave Thunder said grimly, I think we need to set a little trap. A trap, my lord? Sir Richard repeated, and Wave Thunder nodded again. As you say, if we knew who he was passing information to, we could try feeding him false information to pass them. Well, perhaps we do know, in a general sense, someone to whom he's passing it. Sea Farmer looked puzzled, and Wave Thunder snorted harshly. You just said it yourself, Richard. Narmon's people in Hyratha seem to have become rather more elusive than those anywhere else in the kingdom. Ah, I see, my lord, Sea Farmer said, and his eyes began to gleam. 10. Earl Grey Harbor's Townhouse, Telesburg You can't be serious, Benjamin, the Earl of Grey Harbor protested. I know you don't want to hear this, Rages, Wave Thunder said but I can't justify not taking it seriously. And have you told His Majesty about it? Grey Harbor demanded. Not yet. Wave Thunder conceded. His Majesty and Caleb are even closer to the Duke than you are. Until and unless I'm certain there's a fire somewhere under all this smoke, I'm not going to tell them anything which could hurt them this badly on a personal level. Surely you don't think I enjoy telling you that someone I know is this close to you and your daughter? The father of your grandchildren could be a traitor. Grey Harbor looked across at him with narrow eyes. The two of them sat in facing armchairs in a private sitting room in Grey Harbor Hall, the Earl's Tellisburg mansion. Each of them held a half-filled glass, and a bottle of excellent Sittermark whiskey sat on a table at the Earl's elbow. It was late afternoon, and heavy weather was rolling in from the southwest, sweeping through the passes of the Stephen Mountains and in from the cauldron, that shallow, current-wracked stretch of seawater between Cheris and Taro Island. The rising wind drove heavier waves against the harbor's breakwaters, and all along the waterfront crews were battening down in preparation for heavy weather. Overhead the morning sunlight had turned into the heavy dimness of cloudy early evening, and thunder muttered ominously. The clouds which had obscured the sun were black-bottomed and thick and lightning flickered here and there among them. The weather, Wave Thunder thought, was an unfortunately apt mirror of the tension inside this sitting room. No, of course I don't think you enjoy telling me, Grey Harbor said finally, which doesn't mean I think you're right, however. Believe me, Wave Thunder said with the utmost sincerity. In this case I would far, far rather discover my suspicions are misplaced and I have no intention of damaging the king's relationship with his cousin until and unless I'm certain there's a reason to. But you're not quite that concerned about my relationship with Colvin? Grey Harper said with a wintry smile. You know better than that, Rages. This time there was a bit of bite in Wave Thunder's voice, and he met the Earl's eyes very levelly. 
I wouldn't have told you anything until I knew one way or the other, either if the law didn't require me to. Grey Harbor gazed at him again for a second or two, and then unhappily nodded. The law was very clear and had been since Harald's great-grandfather's day. In Cheris, unlike most other lands, not even the most commonly born man could simply be seized and hauled off to prison. Not legally, at any rate, although Grey Harbor knew as well as any that the law had been bent and even outright violated upon occasion. Legally, however, any citizen of Cheris must be charged with some specific offense before a king's magistrate before he could be imprisoned, even on suspicion, by the secular authorities, and he must be convicted of that offence before the king's bench, before he could be kept there. The church's courts were another matter entirely, of course, and there was a certain tension between crown and church as a result, but both Harold and Bishop Executor Gerald attempted to minimize it as much as possible. Nobles enjoyed considerably greater protection, however, even in Cheris, which Grey Harbor would have said, if he'd ever bothered to consider the point at all, was the way it ought to be. In the case of a noble of Calvin Armach's stature, even the crown was required to move carefully. Wave Thunder could not legally initiate the sort of investigation he obviously intended to propose without the express approval of the king, or of his first counselor. In fact, it was entirely possible if Grey Harbor wanted to be a stickler about it, that Wave Thunder had already exceeded his legal authority in this case. A part of the Earl was tempted to make that point, but he put the temptation aside. The very idea that Calvin could possibly be a traitor was beyond ridiculous. Yet Wave Thunder was right. He did have a responsibility to examine even the most ludicrous allegations. And the fact that Calvin was Grey Harbor's son-in-law only made the situation more painful for both of them. I know you wouldn't have told me if you hadn't had to, Benjamin, Grey Harbor sighed after a moment, and I know this is damned awkward. I think the entire idea is preposterous and more than a little insulting, but I know where the original accusation came from. Personally, I think this so-called Seijin has overreached himself and I'm looking forward to seeing him try to explain to His Majesty why he's seen fit to falsely impugn the honor of a member of His Majesty's own family. But I realize you need my authorization before you can continue. So, tell me what you suspect, and how you intend to prove or disprove your suspicions. Unless, of course, he smiled thinly, Sajin Merlin has seen fit to accuse me of treason as well. Of course he hasn't. Wave Thunder said gruffly, then looked down into his whiskey glass. He considered the clear amber depths for a moment or two, then took a sip and looked back up at his host. Very well, Regis, he said. Here's what we have so far. First. Thunder rumbled loud and harsh, crashing across the heavens, and Regis Yowance, Earl of Grey Harbor, stood looking out an open window across the immaculate garden of his townhouse. Wind whipped branches and flowering shrubbery, flogging the dark, glossy leaves to show their lighter undersurfaces. The air seemed to prickle on his skin, and he smelled the sharp, distinctive scent of lightning. Not long, he thought. Not long until the storm breaks. He lifted his whiskey glass and drank, feeling its hot, honeyed fire burn down the back of his throat as he gazed into the darkness. Lightning flared suddenly out over the white-capped harbor, flaming through the clouds like the braided whip of Langhorn's Rakurai, etching the entire world ever so briefly in livid, blinding light, and fresh thunder exploded louder than ever in its wake. Grey Harbor watched for a few more seconds then turned away and looked around the comfortable lamp-lit sitting-room Wave Thunder had left a little more than two hours ago. The Earl walked back across to his armchair, poured more whiskey, and sat. His mind insisted upon replaying everything Wave Thunder had said, and he closed his eyes in pain. It can't be true, he thought. It can't be. There has to be some other explanation, some other answer, whatever Sea Farmer and Benjamin may think. 
but he was no longer as confident of that as he had been, and that lost assurance hurt. It hurt far worse than he'd believed it possibly could when he'd been so certain it could never happen. He opened his eyes once more, staring out the window, waiting for the first crashing waterfall of the gathering storm. He'd been prepared to reject any possibility of his son-in-law's guilt, not simply because Calvin was the king's cousin next in line for the throne after Harald's own children and the designated regent for his minor children, should something happen to Harald and Caleb, not simply because of Calvin's importance to the kingdom, and not simply because of the undoubted additional power and influence which his daughter's marriage to the duke had brought to Grey Harbor's own position or because Calvin had always been his staunch ally on the Privy Council and in Parliament. No, he'd been prepared to reject that possibility because Calvin had always been a kind and loving husband to his daughter, Jennifer, and a doting father to her two children, because he'd stepped into the place of Grey Harbor's long-dead son, Charles. Because the Earl of Grey Harbor loved his son-in-law. But... He admitted grimly to himself, if it had been anyone else, he would have found Wave Thunder's suspicions persuasive, not conclusive, he told himself, rallying gamely. But then his shoulders sagged again. No, not conclusive, but suggestive enough that they have to be investigated. Suggestive enough that they have to affect the way Harald feels about him, the extent to which Harald can trust him. Damn that so-called Seijin! He could have dismissed all of it without a qualm, but for the deaths of sea farmers investigators in Hiratha and Calvin's association in ventures with known emerald trading interests. Like many nobles, Calvin sometimes found the expense involved in maintaining the appearances expected of a man of his rank punishing, and his own taste for expensive hunting hounds, wyverns, and lizards and for occasional high-stakes wagers, put even more demands on his purse. He was far from a poor man, yet the financial strain was undeniable upon occasion, and although that was scarcely common knowledge, Grey Harbor had known about it for years. But somehow, whenever funds seemed to be growing a bit tight, one or another of his trading ventures always succeeded, and just a few too many of them, the Earl knew now, involved partnerships with men whose ultimate loyalty was suspect to say the very least. But there's no evidence Calvin knows he's dealing with people like that, Grey Harbor thought. His duties are mainly military, and he's not anywhere near as deeply involved as Benjamin and I in the day-to-day -day effort to ferret out Narmon's agents. He's never been briefed as thoroughly as I have. As far as I know, he's never had any reason to question the loyalty of his partners— or wonder if some of them have been using him without his knowledge. The Earl brooded over his whiskey glass as thunder rolled and rumbled again. The blue-white flicker of lightning flared once more, driving eye-searing fury across storm-purple heavens, and he heard the first few raindrops pelt down on the townhouse's slate roof. Was it truly possible that Calvin, his son-in-law, the king's first cousin, was a traitor? Could he have fooled everyone that completely for so long? Or was it all still a mistake? Only a matter of circumstantial evidence which ultimately meant nothing. Nothing but appearances manipulated into something suspicious by Sajin Merlin's accusations? The Earl drained his glass and refilled it. He knew he shouldn't. Knew he'd already drunk enough to impair his judgment. But it helped with the pain. He ran back over Wave Thunder's proposal, and his jaw tightened. The most damning evidence, if it could be called that, against Calvin, were the deaths of sea farmers investigators in Hiratha, the investigators whose identities only he had known. So sea farmer proposed to give him the identity of another of his investigators, along with the information that the man in question was hot on the heels of a highly placed emerald agent. From Sea Farmer's description of the suspected agent, it would be apparent to Calvin, assuming he was actually guilty, that the agent was one of Calvin's own business partners. And if he is guilty, 
Grey Harbor thought grimly. Sea Farmer's new investigator will go the same way as his predecessors. Or that's what would happen without the dozen additional men Calvin won't know about. If there was an attempt on Sea Farmer's man, or if the suspect in question abruptly disappeared, it still wouldn't prove anything. But the circumstances would be utterly damning, and a full-scale investigation would become inevitable. Grey Harbor emptied the whiskey glass yet again and refilled it. He was halfway through the second bottle, he noticed, and grimaced. 11. The Duke of Tyrion's Mansion, Kingdom of Cheris Your Grace, I'm sorry to disturb you, but you have a visitor. Calvin Armok, Duke of Tyrion, looked up from the correspondence on his desk and raised one eyebrow at his major domo. A visitor, Maurice, at this hour? The duke waved elegantly at the window of his study and the pelting sheets of rain running down its diamond panes. In this weather? Yes, your grace. Maurice Willems had been in Tyrion's service for the better part of sixteen years. His expression was almost serene, but Tyrion saw something else in his eyes and straightened in his chair. And who might this visitor be? he asked. It's Earl Grey Harbor, your grace. What? Despite himself, Tyrion was unable to keep the astonishment out of his voice, and Willems bowed slightly. The Earl himself, Tyrion pressed, and Willems bowed again. Did he— Tyrion cut himself off. Nothing he could think of would have brought his father-in-law out on a night like this one. Certainly not without having so much as previously hinted he might come to call, which meant it had to be some sort of dire emergency, but the Earl obviously— and not surprisingly, hadn't confided the nature of that emergency to Willems. The Earl, the Majordomo said after a moment, came by carriage, your grace. He is accompanied only by a single personal guardsman. I showed him and his man into the library and offered him refreshment before I came to announce his presence to you. He declined the offer. Tyrion's eyebrows went up again, this time in genuine alarm. The first counselor of Cheris had no business wandering about with only a single guard at any time, and especially not on a night like this. He started to speak quickly, then made himself stop and think for a moment first. Very well, Maurice, he said after a moment. I'll go to him immediately. He paused long enough to jot a few hastily scribbled words on a sheet of paper, then folded it and handed it to Willems. I can't imagine what brings the Earl out in this sort of weather, but I'm sure he didn't set out lightly. Have his coach and coachman sent to the stables. I have no idea how long the Earl will be staying, overnight if I can convince him not to go back out into the storm. But at the least, let's get his horses and his coachman out of the rain for as long as they're here. Of course, Your Grace. And after you've given instructions for that, please personally deliver that note to Captain Johnson. Franck Johnson was the commander of Tyrion's personal guard, the only one of his senior servants who'd been with him even longer than Willem's. Of course, Your Grace, the majordomo murmured yet again, and withdrew from the study at the Duke's gesture. Tyrion sat a moment longer, gazing unseeingly at the rain-lashed window. Then he drew a deep breath, stood, and walked out of the room. Father, Tyrion said as he stepped briskly into the library, Telesburg's temperatures virtually never dropped below freezing, but they could get a bit on the cool side, especially in the winter, and a night with weather like this was sufficiently chill for a fire to have been kindled. It was as much for emotional comfort as to drive off the physical chill, and the Earl of Grey Harbor stood in front of the hearth, holding out his hands to the crackling flame. The library was much larger than Tyrion's study. In fact, if Willems hadn't already ushered the Earl into it, Tyrion would have chosen a smaller, more intimate setting. The vast room had been added to the Tyrion townhouse by the present Duke's maternal grandfather, who'd been all but illiterate, as a wedding gift for his daughter. The old man had spared no expense to give his beloved oldest child the most impressive library collection in Telesburg and he'd insisted on providing proper housing for it as well. 
Many pained skylights were set into both sides of the vast chamber's vaulted ceiling. They ran in a wide circle around the look-through fireplace's stone chimney, arranged to provide natural sunlight for the reading desks at the library's heart. Now deluging rain beat on the thick glass with endless waterfall patience, while thunder rumbled and crashed overhead, and fresh lightning glared beyond the skylights, like the very fury of Schuler, as the Earl looked up at his son-in-law's entrance. Tyrion was shocked by Grey Harbor's expression. The Earl's face was drawn, clenched around some heavy burden, and his eyes were laden with misery. The Duke crossed to him quickly, holding out both hands, and his own concern deepened as he got close enough to smell his father-in-law's breath. Father, he said more gently, putting his hands on the shorter, more slightly built Earl's shoulders, what is it? What brings you out on a night like this? He jerked his head at the water-streaming skylights, and his alarm clicked up another notch as he noted the water dripping from the Earl's soaked ponytail. Had his father-in-law charged out into a raging storm like this one without so much as a hat? I... the Earl began, then stopped, staring up into his son-in-law's face, seeing the powerful family resemblance to King Harald. There was less of Caleb in Tyrion's features, but he could almost have been a slightly older mirror of the king. What? Tyrion asked gently his eyes dark with concern and affection. Surely Grey Harbor thought that concern, that love, had to be genuine. He couldn't be mistaken about that. And yet, and yet, tell me, the Duke commanded in a soft voice, simultaneously urging the Earl away from the hearth and towards a leather upholstered armchair. He pushed his father-in-law gently down into the chair just as Maurice Willems knocked lightly on the library door and entered, personally carrying a silver tray laden with a bottle of the Duke's finest Harchong brandy and two glasses. Tyrion hadn't ordered the brandy, but he nodded in approval as the majordomo set the tray on a small table by the Earl's chair and then withdrew as quietly as he'd appeared. The Duke unstoppered the brandy and poured two glasses, giving the obviously distraught Grey Harbor a few moments. Then he extended one glass to the Earl, took the other, and settled into the facing armchair. Father, he said firmly as Grey Harbor accepted his brandy glass. The Earl simply held it, not even sipping, and Tyrion continued in that same firm tone. You obviously didn't come out in weather like this on a whim, so tell me what brings you here. Tell me what I can do to help. To his astonishment, his father-in-law's eyes abruptly filled with tears. I shouldn't have come, Grey Harper said finally, and his voice was hoarse, his words more than a little slurred. Obviously, Tyrion realized he'd been drinking even more heavily than the Duke had guessed. I shouldn't have come, the Earl repeated. But I had to. I had to, Calvin. Why, father, what's happened? Calvin, you've been... Involved with some people you shouldn't have been, Grey Harbor said. Tyrion's eyes narrowed, and the Earl shook his head. I know you had no reason to suspect them, he continued. But some of the men with whom you've been doing business are... They aren't what you think they are. Father, Tyrion said slowly, I'm afraid I don't understand what you're talking about. I know, I know. Grey Harbor looked away, staring into the crackling fire, while George Howard, his personal guardsman, stood uncomfortably behind his chair. Howard had joined Grey Harbor's service over twelve years ago. He'd become the Earl's personal guardsman two years later, following his predecessor's accidental drowning on a fishing trip, and he'd long since proven his loyalty. Yet it was obvious Howard had no idea what had so perturbed the Earl, although Grey Harbor's longtime retainer was clearly concerned about whatever it was. Well, that was fair enough. Tyrion was concerned, too. Despite the heavy smell of whiskey on the Earl's breath, his sentences came out almost normally. The consequences, no doubt, of all of his years of political and diplomatic experience. 
That clarity of phrase could have fooled many people into underestimating the extent of his inebriation. But Tyrion knew him better than that. It was obvious to him that Grey Harbor was unfocused, searching not simply for words, but for the thoughts he wanted to put into words. Tyrion had never seen him like this, and he reached out and laid one hand on the older man's knee. What do you know, father? His gentle question was all but lost in the next crash of thunder, and Grey Harbor looked back from the fire to focus a bit owlishly on his face. Colvin, he said, some of your business partners, some of the men you think are friends, aren't... They're spies. Traitors. He shook his head, eyes no longer filled with tears, but still dark with concern. We shouldn't be associated with them. Spies? Tyrion sat back in his chair abruptly, his eyebrows lowering. Traitors? He shook his head. I don't know what you're talking about, father. I'm talking about men you do business with, who also work for Narmon of Emerald, Grey Harbor said. I'm talking about the man you buy hunting wyverns from. You're dealing with people who are the enemies of the king and the kingdom, Calvin, and... He drew a deep breath. There are some who suspect that you know you are. People suspect me of treason? Tyrion demanded sharply. Behind the Earl's chair, Howard's face went abruptly and totally expressionless. Clearly the guardsman wasn't at all happy about the turn the conversation had just taken. Some people, yes, Grey Harbor said. Who? Tyrion asked harshly. Who are they? I can't tell you that, you know that. I shouldn't have said as much as I already have. But I'm telling you, Calvin, you have to disassociate yourself from those men. I don't even know which men you're talking about, Tyrion protested. I can tell you that much, Greyhopper said. Lang, the wyvern trainer, he's one of Narmon's people. And Tyrell and Thorson, the merchants, they are too... And there are others. Which others? Tyrion set his own brandy glass back on the tray, and his eyes were narrow intent as they focused on the Earl's face. Those are the most important three, Grey Harbor told him, waving his left hand. Oh, there are a few others, but those are the ones we know are important to Narmon's operations here in Cheris. Who knows? Wave thunder, of course, Grey Harbor said a bit impatiently. Sea farmer, others. Does it really matter, Colvin? Of course it matters if they think I'm a traitor, too, simply because of men I know, men I do business with. The point is to demonstrate that you aren't a traitor. The point is that I want to know who would dare to accuse me of such a crime, Tyrion said hotly. I'm Harald's cousin for Langhorn's sake. I don't blame you for being angry, Grey Harbor replied. But no one wants to believe anything but the best about you. You must know that. It's just that... He broke off, shaking his head, and Tyrion glowered at him. Just what, father? He demanded. There's been an... Accusation, Grey Harbor said after a moment, glancing back at the fire. It's ridiculous, of course, but there it is. And given the person from whom it came, Benjamin had no choice but to consider it seriously. The person from whom it came, Tyrion repeated slowly, his eyes intent and thoughtful. Then he nodded to himself. It was the foreigner, he said, this Merlin, the one some people are calling a Seijin, wasn't it? I can't tell you that, I won't, Grey Harbor shook his head. I think it's nonsense that it may well be politically motivated, but I can't tell you its source. At least until Benjamin's disproved the charges, and, he looked back at Tyrion, his own eyes narrowing, the best way for you to help disprove them is to voluntarily disassociate yourself from Narmon's known agents and tell Benjamin and Sea Farmer everything you know about them. Everything I know? You make it sound as if you think I have been consorting with traitors. Damn it, Calvin, Grey Harbor said, his voice sharper than it had been. He set his own untouched glass back onto the tray forcefully enough to slop brandy over the rim and glared at his son-in-law. You have been. 
Whether you knew you were doing it or not is immaterial as far as that's concerned. We know they're Narmon's men. What matters now is for you to demonstrate that, now that you've been told who they are, you want to help us prove they are. Why? Tyrion asked harshly. If Wave Thunder already knows they're traitors, what am I supposed to add to his knowledge about them? Anything you can, Grey Harbor said slowly, his eyebrows tightening. Anything that might help. He sat back in his chair, gazing at the Duke narrowly. Surely you don't need me to tell you how it works, Culvin. I would have thought you'd be as eager as I am to do that. Why should I be? You aren't the one some unknown foreigner is accusing of treason. Tyrion snorted angrily and pushed himself up out of his armchair. He stamped over to the fire and glared down into the crackling flames, his back to his father-in-law, his hands clasped behind him and his shoulders tight. Why should I be so eager to defend my name, my family's name, against that sort of accusation? To discredit him in turn, Grey Harper said, still speaking slowly, staring at the younger man's rigid spine. Shanway with him, Tyrion growled. I'm the king's cousin, not some wretched little backcountry baron. Why should I care about the charges of some ragged adventurer? You shouldn't, the earl said, more slowly yet. Unless they're true. Tyrion wheeled back to face him just that little bit too quickly and saw it in his father-in-law's eyes. Saw that Grey Harbor hadn't been quite as drunk as Tyrion had thought he was. Saw the concern in those eyes turning into something else, something both far sadder and much harder, as the speed of his turn, or some flicker of his own expression, abruptly confirmed what Grey Harbor had so desperately wanted not to believe. Langhorn, the earl said softly. They are true, aren't they? You already knew Lang is Narmon's chief agent here in Talisburg. Tyrion opened his mouth, obviously, to deny the accusation, but then he paused. He stood for a moment, looking at the earl, then glanced at Howard. Yes, he said then, his voice clipped but composed. Yes, father. I knew Lang was one of Narmon's spies, and I'll admit he approached me, wanted to recruit me into a plot against Harald. And you never told anyone? Grey Harbor's words were no longer slurred. They came crisp, cold. There was anger in them and sorrow, and Tyrion shrugged. No, I didn't, he agreed. Why should I? If Lang wanted to use me in some plot against Harald, he'd have to give me some of the details, wouldn't he? How better to position myself to discover what Narmon was up to? If that's what you were really thinking, you should have taken the information to Benjamin the instant Lang approached you, and risk having the secret get out before I'd had the opportunity to actually learn anything? Tyrion began. I hardly think, spare me. Grey Harbor interrupted sharply. Tyrion looked at him, and the Earl shook his head. I've known Benjamin Rice for more than twenty-five years. You've known him almost that long. We both know that secrets entrusted to him don't get out. He shook his head again, slowly, sadly. No, Colvin. The only reason you wouldn't have told Benjamin would be that you were considering accepting Lang's offer. Despite the thunder grumbling overhead, despite the rain pounding on the skylights and the crackle of the fire, silence seemed to hover in the library. And then, finally, the Duke of Tyrion nodded. I was, he conceded. And why not? My blood's the same as that in Harald's veins. My grandfather was his grandfather. If that Trocken had taken his life and not simply his knee, the throne would have been mine. Why shouldn't I consider the possibility that it still could be? Grey Harbor stared at him as if seeing him for the very first time. I thought I knew you, the earl said at last, so softly his voice was all but drowned by the sound of the furious winter rain. But if you can ask me that, 
Then I never knew you at all, did I? Of course you did, Tyrion made a throwing away gesture. I've been your son-in-law for fourteen years. You've become my father in truth, not just in name. Anything I may have thought, may have done, where Harald is concerned, doesn't change that. It changes everything, Colvin, Grey Harbor said. Can't you even see that? I was the king's man, his servant, before I was ever your father-in-law. I swore an oath to him, the same one you swore, and I can't break it. Not for you, not for Jennifer or the boys, not even for me, for my love, for my daughter's husband. I see. Tyrion stood gazing at him for endless seconds, hands clasped behind him once again, then shrugged slightly. So I assume I can't talk you into forgetting about this or throwing your lot in with mine. The Duke smiled crookedly. We'd make a formidable team, Father. Think about it. The Kingdom's ranking Duke and the First Counselor? We could do it. If you could just forget about that oath of yours. Never, Grey Harbor said firmly, sadly. Which leaves... what? Benjamin's already more than half convinced Merlin's accusations were accurate, the Earl said. Sea Farmer's already investigating. And now I know the truth, Calvin. It's only a matter of time and not much of that until the King knows as well. I think you have only one chance to salvage anything from this, and that's to turn King's evidence. Confess what I've done? Throw myself on Harald's mercy and promise to tell him everything I know? What else can you hope for? I can still hope to win, Father, Tyrion said softly. Win? Grey Harbor repeated incredulously. How? It's over, Colvin. All you can do now is try to minimize the damage. You're Harald's cousin, and he and Caleb both love you. Of course, they'll be angry, furious. But you're also the most important nobleman in the entire kingdom, after Caleb himself. Obviously, this is going to change everything where their trust in you is concerned. But if you admit what you've done, do your best to help undo it. Harald will do all he can to keep the entire thing quiet. You know that. Dear, loving cousin Harald, Tyrion said, his voice harder, an ugly light glittering in his eyes. Father, it should be me on the throne, not him. Greyhubber's expression hardened. He looked at his son-in-law, and he saw the man he'd always known, and a total stranger. A stranger so soured by ambition and resentment that he'd become both traitor and would-be usurper, yet somehow been able to conceal the depths of that bitter emotion from everyone, even from those who loved him. Colvin, the first counselor said coldly, the throne is not yours. It never will be. Accept that now and do what you can to make amends with Harald while the opportunity still exists. I don't think so. Tyrion said. Grey Harbor stiffened in his chair, and Howard's hand dropped to the hilt of his sword, but the Duke ignored the guardsman, gazing straight into Grey Harbor's eyes. It seems I can't convince you to join me, he said, but I'm afraid you can't convince me to join you either, father, which leaves us with a bit of a problem, doesn't it? You can't win, Colvin. I disagree. Tyrion reached up to rest one hand on the mantelpiece of the fireplace beside him and smiled at his father-in-law. I know you, and I know Wave Thunder, he said easily, almost lightly. You wouldn't have blabbed about this to anyone else, not yet. Sea Farmer, yes, he nodded. I'll give you that. And Sea Farmer may have spoken to one or two people he knows and trusts. But that's all so far. And it's enough, Grey Harbor said flatly. No, father, it isn't, Tyrion disagreed. I'm afraid events are going to force me to do something I wanted to avoid, but this isn't exactly something I never planned for. What do you mean? Grey Harbor demanded, his voice suddenly taut. I mean, I'd hoped the only person I'd have to kill would be Caleb. 
Tyrion shook his head in what appeared to be genuine regret. I didn't want to do even that much. Maybe if I had, I would have planned better. You admit you planned to murder your own cousin? Your crown prince? Greyhawk presented as if he couldn't believe it, even now. It was my idea, Tyrion acknowledged. Lang was nervous. He and Narmon didn't want anything to do with it at first. But Narmon came around when I pointed out that I was Jeanne and Jeanne Regent. And the king? Greyhopper's voice was no longer taut. It was leached of emotion, flattened and yet fascinated. That would have been more difficult, Tyrion admitted. On the other hand, I felt reasonably confident Narmon would be so enthusiastic, shall we say, after Caleb's death, that I could trust him to make a respectable effort to remove Harald as well. I'd have preferred that, actually. Well, it isn't going to happen now, Greyhopper said. No, not that way. But I do have my own friends in the palace, and I am the king's cousin. I'm afraid it's going to be much messier this way, but this Merlin fellow of yours will help make it work for me. What are you talking about? It's simple. Tyrion smiled thinly. I'm afraid there are about to be several murders here in Talisburg tonight. Wave Thunder, Sea Farmer, most of Sea Farmer's senior investigators, since I don't know which of them he's talked to, I'll have to attend to all of them. And Lang will have to go, too. I can't have anyone who knows about my association with him or Narmon. Greyhubber's expression was appalled, less because of what he was hearing than because of who he was hearing it from. Everyone will be horrified when they hear the news, Tyrion continued. Fortunately, you will have come to me tonight and warned me of your suspicions about this Merlin. Your fear that he's actually in the employ of Narmon himself, part of some plot against the crown. Your concern that the king has given his trust too quickly, allowed this stranger too close to him and to Caleb by naming him one of Caleb's personal guards. Given your obvious concern about him, the moment I hear about the murder of Wave Thunder and so many of his most senior investigators, I'll immediately go to the palace with my own most trusted guardsmen. Obviously, if Merlin really is guilty of all you think he is, it will be essential to arrest him before he can do any more damage. Unfortunately, as everyone knows from his rescue of Caleb, he's a very gifted swordsman and, as it turns out, assassin. His entire reason for saving Caleb from his own employer's assassins was to get him inside the palace, where he could kill all of Harald's immediate family. By the time my guardsmen and I can reach him, he and the other members of Harald's own palace guard he's managed to suborn will have murdered the king and the crown prince. My guardsmen and I will, of course, kill the traitors in the guard and manage to save Jeanne and Janet's lives and I'll immediately proclaim a regency in Jeanne's name. That's insane, Grey Harbour said almost conversationally. No one would believe it. Side 7 Off Armageddon Reef by David Weber Continuing on page 163 I think differently, Tyrion smiled again. Some of my friends at court would be prepared to support me, whatever happened. Others, even if they doubt all the circumstances, will see Harald and Caleb dead, Jeanne a mere child, and enemies surrounding us on every side. If not me, then who? Or do you think they'll embrace a dynastic civil war with Narmon and Hector waiting to pounce? And who knows anything about this Merlin? He's a stranger, a foreigner who appeared under mysterious circumstances and who's been busily worming his way into the king's favor. Half the nobles at court probably already fear the influence he might come to wield, and none of them know him. They'll be happy enough to see the last of him, especially, his smile disappeared and his eyes narrowed, when Harald's own first counselor confirms the reasons for my suspicion of him. I won't do it, Grey Harbor said flatly. 
I think you should reconsider that, father. There was no threat in Tyrion's voice, only a tone of reason. Who will you support if Harald and Caleb are dead? Will you stand, father, to a civil war? Simply hand the kingdom over to Hector and Narmon? Or will you do what's best for Cheris and support the only person who can hold the kingdom together? You told me my only chance was to turn King's evidence for Harald. Well, I'm telling you that your only chance to serve the kingdom is to turn King's evidence for me. Never. Never is a long time, Father. I think you'll probably reconsider, given enough time to think about it. Grey Harbor started to stand up, then gasped in astonishment as a heavy hand pushed him firmly back down in his chair. His head snapped around, and he looked over his shoulder, eyes widening, as George Howard looked back at him. I'm sorry, Father, Tyrion said, and Grey Harbor's eyes whipped back around to him. The Duke shook his head and continued with that same note of sincerity. I'm afraid I realized a day like this might come. Have you forgotten Georges was in my service before yours? That I was the one who recommended him to you when you first retained him, not to mention putting in a good word for him when your last guardsman suffered his... accident. My God, Grey Harbor half-whispered. You've been planning this that long? In a manner of speaking, I suppose... And when you appeared so unexpectedly in this sort of weather, I took a few additional precautions. Tyrion took a small bill from the mantelpiece. I didn't truly expect to need them, but I believe in being prepared. He shook the bell once. Its voice was sweet, rising clear and sharp in an interval between thunderclaps, and the library door opened instantly. Franck Johnson and fourteen other members of Tyrion's personal guard filed in through it. The library was a huge room, but it was well populated with bookshelves and scroll racks, and the fifteen armed and armored men completely filled one end of it. I never planned for this actual moment, Tyrion continued, and whether you believe this or not, Father, I love you. I'll admit that I never planned on that in the beginning either. Jennifer, yes, but you were already First Counselor. I had to think of you in tactical terms, and, as I say, I believe in being prepared. Since I couldn't take a chance on how you might jump at a moment like this, I took precautions, wisely, it would appear. It doesn't change anything, Grey Harbor said. Your entire so-called plan is insane. But even if it works, I won't support you. I can't. We'll see about that. And I hope, for many people's sake, that you're wrong. In the meantime, however, I'm afraid it's time to... Lightning flared, thunder crashed again, and on the heels of that deep, rumbling roar came another crash. The crash of breaking glass as the skylight above Grey Harbor shattered into a thousand glittering pieces, and a rain-soaked, black-clad figure in the cuirass and mail of the royal guard came plunging through it. The intruder landed with impossible grace, as if the twenty-five-foot plunge from the roof above had been a mere two feet. His knees straightened, and the drawn sword in his hands hissed. George Howard staggered back with a high-pitched sound of shocked agony, left hand clutching the stump of his blood-spouting right forearm as the hand which had been on Grey Harbor's shoulder thumped to the library's floor. "'Your pardon, Your Grace,' Merlin Athrawis said politely. But I trust you'll understand if I take exception to your plans. Calvin Armach stared in shock at the dripping apparition before him. Merlin's abrupt, totally unexpected arrival had stunned every person in that library. Grey Harbor not least, and Merlin smiled thinly. He hadn't planned on this confrontation, hadn't wanted anything remotely like it, in fact— nor had he anticipated any likely need for it. But at least he'd been worried enough over how his accusation of Tyrion might work out that he'd kept an eye on Wave Thunder. He'd planted snark-deployed parasite bugs in several places in Telesburg by now, and he'd monitored the one in Wave Thunder's office on a real-time basis. That was the only reason he'd known about Sea Farmer's conclusions— 
or the fact that Wave Thunder would discuss those conclusions with Gray Harbor. He'd maneuvered the office bug onto Wave Thunder's shoulder for the trip to Gray Harbor's townhouse, then dropped it off onto the Earl instead. But he'd been slow to realize what Gray Harbor intended to do. In fairness, the Earl probably hadn't known what he was going to do before he started drinking so heavily, and he'd already summoned his carriage for the trip before Merlin realized where he was going. The fact that Merlin had been dining with Caleb at that moment had made things even more difficult. Fortunately, it had been a private dinner, and he'd managed to disengage himself from the prince rather more hastily than protocol would normally have permitted by claiming, accurately as it happened, that he was even then receiving a vision. The crown prince had accepted his newest bodyguard's excuse that he needed to retreat to his chambers to meditate upon the vision, and Merlin had retired with a hasty bow. He'd also instructed Owl to retrieve the recon skimmer even before he took leave of the prince, and given the quantity of thunder rumbling around the sky to disguise any sonic booms, the skimmer had made the trip at better than Mach 4. The moment it arrived, the A.I., at his command, had used its tractor to snatch Merlin from his chamber window and deposit him on the roof of Tyrion's Telesburg mansion instead. The trip through the wind-lashed rain and thunder, supported only by the tractor, while lightning flared and hissed, had been an experience Merlin could have done without indefinitely. Unfortunately, he'd had no choice but to make it. He'd arrived, still listening to the bug on Grey Harbor, about the time Tyrion handed his father-in-law the brandy glass, and he'd been almost as dumbfounded as Grey Harbor himself by Tyrion's calm admission of guilt, and by how long the Duke had been an active traitor. As Merlin himself had told Harald and Caleb, he couldn't see the past, and he'd had no idea Tyrion had been plotting against his cousins for so long which brought him to the present rather ticklish moment, confronting the King of Cheris first cousin and fifteen of his hand-picked guardsmen in the Duke of Tyrion's library. Take exception to your plans. The Earl of Grey Harbor sat paralyzed in his chair, looking at the back of the man who'd exploded out of the night, the man he'd distrusted and resented, who stood now between him and fifteen armed men in the service of a traitor and would be regicide. It would seem, his son-in-law said after what seemed a small eternity, that I've underestimated you, Sajin Merlin. Grey Harbor could scarcely believe how calm Calvin sounded. The Duke couldn't possibly really be that collected, that poised. Or possibly he could. Whatever else... The Earl knew now that the man he thought he knew was in fact a total stranger to him. I could say the same, Your Grace, Merlin replied with another of those thin smiles. The sage inn stood quite still, his body language almost relaxed, ignoring the man whose hand and wrist he'd amputated as Howard went to his knees and his blood spread in a coppery-smelling pool. The Sajin's own sword remained ready in his hands, in a stance Grey Harbor, no mean swordsman himself, had never before seen, and danger radiated from him like smoke as thunder rumbled and rolled overhead yet again. Certainly, Tyrion said, you are not foolish enough to believe you can somehow rescue my father-in-law and get out of this house alive. I'm not... Merlin sounded almost amused, Grey Harbor realized, with a fresh sense of disbelief. Come now, Tyrion actually chuckled as his guardsmen moved slowly and carefully, placing themselves between him and Merlin. There's no point pretending, I suppose. The way I see it, the only two choices you have are to join me or to die. I'll admit, in light of my previous underestimation of your capabilities, that you'd make a formidable ally. On the other hand, I'd already planned on killing you, so... He shrugged. It won't break my heart to stay with that solution if you choose to prove stubborn. Before you make that decision, though, I'd suggest you consider it carefully. After all, what do you think the odds are of your managing to defeat fifteen of my best? Better than average, Merlin replied, and attacked. 
Frank Janssen was a veteran of the Royal Cherisian Marines. He'd served her over eight years before he'd been recruited by a much younger Calvin Armok to become a sergeant in the Duke of Tyrion's personal guard. He was as hard-bitten, capable, and dangerous as he was loyal to his patron, and the men he'd assembled in response to Tyrion's hasty note, armored in the same cuirasses and mail hauberks as the royal guard, were his best. Every one of them was a veteran as well, and there were fifteen of them. They'd heard the wild rumors about Merlin's rescue of Crown Prince Caleb. They'd listened to all the tales, all the gossip, but they'd dismissed them as the sorts of absurdity to be expected when ignorant farmers or soft city merchants got together to discuss the shivery, shuddery details of such gory goings-on. They'd seen too much, done too much themselves to be taken in by that sort of heroic fantasy. That was unfortunate, because it meant that despite all the potential warnings, they had not the least idea what they faced in that moment. And because they didn't, the last thing they'd expected was for a single, outnumbered madman to attack. Grey Harbor lunged up out of his chair in disbelief as the lunatic sprang forward. The Earl, too, was a veteran of far more combat than most, and the man who'd captained his own cruiser had summed up the odds against Merlin as quickly as Tyrion or Jansen, which meant the Sejin's sudden attack surprised him just as badly. But however insane it might be, the Earl couldn't let Merlin face such odds alone— not when he knew it was his own unforgivable stupidity which had led the Sejin here to his death, and not when Grey Harbor's own survival might prove one more weapon against the king whose trust he'd betrayed by coming here in the first place. His hand fell to the hilt of the gem-encrusted dress dagger at his hip. It was a pretty toy, but no less lethal for its decoration— the finely tempered steel scraped from its sheath, and then he froze, jaw dropping. Merlin released the governors he'd set on his reaction time and strength, and his katana flashed with literally inhuman speed as he bounded a single long pace forward. The first guardsman never had time to grasp what was happening. His head leapt from his shoulders before he realized he'd seen the blade move, and Merlin's wrists turned as he brought the blade flashing back across in a flat figure eight. Another head flew before the first victim's knees had even begun to buckle. And then Merlin recovered, still with that impossible speed and precision, and drove the katana's chisel point straight through a third guardsman's cuirass, breast and back plate alike. He twisted his blade, withdrew it, and leapt backward, recovering his original position and stance, all in the same flashing movement before the first corpse had hit the floor. Calvon Armok's eyes went wide in disbelief as Merlin Athrawis savaged his guardsmen like a croc and rising, hungry from the depths. One instant, the Seijin was standing there, smiling at him. The next, the library exploded in blood, and then, suddenly, Merlin was back exactly where he'd been two seconds before. But he faced only twelve opponents. Johnson and the other guardsmen froze. It wasn't cowardice, wasn't panic. It was simple surprise, and even that wasn't their fault. For just a moment, they stared at their three dead fellows, the water-dripping apparition which had killed them, and the blood spreading across the library's parquet floor in a tide of crimson. Then, spread out, Johnson barked, and the survivors moved forward, fanning out to envelop their single opponent. Grey Harbor was at least as astonished as anyone else. He'd never imagined such speed and power, but he realized almost instantly that however lethal the Seijin might be, he faced one fatal disadvantage. He was trying to protect Grey Harbor. He was like a single war galley anchored to the defense of a fat, lumbering merchantman, while a dozen scruffy pirates lunged and dashed at his charge. Not one of them could hope to face him in single combat, but they didn't need to do anything so foolish. As long as he was tied down protecting the Earl, Tyrion's men could choose their moment and coordinate their attacks, and there was nothing Grey Harbor could do about it. Even if he'd been properly armed, he would only have gotten in Merlin's way, and he knew it, however humiliating admitting it might be. 
But if he couldn't help, then surely there had to be some way he could at least... Look to yourself, Sajin, he barked, and leapt directly away from the cautiously advancing guardsmen. Tyrion cursed as his father-in-law sprang for the wrought iron spiral stair to the balcony catwalk that served the library's upper rows of shelves. The Duke had installed that whimsically ornate creation as a gift for his wife on their third anniversary. Jennifer Armock loved books at least as much as her husband or father ever had, and she'd laughed in delight at the absurdity of his surprise. Not that it hadn't been practical as well. Certainly it was more convenient for someone in long skirts than the steep rolling ladders it had replaced. One of the Duke's guards recognized the Earl's intent quickly enough to lunge forward, trying to grapple with the older man before he reached the stair. But his effort brought him into Merlin's reach, and the Sajin's sword licked out with that same blinding speed. It bit effortlessly through flesh and bone. Blood exploded in a hot, stinking fan, and the guardsmen went down with a wailing scream as razor-sharp steel sheared through the thick bone of his femur as cleanly as an axe and amputated his left leg three inches above the knee. The other guards were slower to react, and Grey Harbor raced up the ornamental treads, dagger shining in his hand. From its top, he could hope to hold off even a sword-armed opponent, at least briefly. More importantly, it got him out of the reach of any immediate threat. Tyrion's remaining guardsmen realized what that meant almost as quickly as the Duke had, and their cautious advance became a sudden rush. They surged forward through their fallen fellow's shrieks, seeking to engulf Merlin before he took advantage of his sudden mobility. But quick as they were, they weren't quick enough. Merlin made no effort to evade them. He came to meet them. Captain Yowance of the Royal Cheresian Navy had been no stranger to combat, and the Earl of Grey Harbor recognized Carnage when he saw it. But he'd never imagined anything like this. Tyrion's guardsmen tried to swarm over Merlin, but it was like a school of herring trying to swarm a crocken. The Sajin seemed to stride forward almost casually, but his peculiar sword was a blur of motion. It moved literally too quickly for the eye to follow, and armor meant nothing before its impossible sharpness. Bodies and bits of bodies flew away from him in gory sprays of blood, and the peaceful library became an abattoir. Men screamed and cursed and died, and Merlin Athrawis moved through the chaos untouched, dealing death like the Archangel Schuler himself. Calvin Armok was no coward, but an icy wave of fear washed through him. Like his guards, he'd discounted the wild rumors and speculation about Merlin. Now, as he watched his men go down, some of them screaming in agony, most dead before they hit the floor, he knew he'd been wrong. He knew the ridiculous rumor that the mysterious foreigner was a Sajin was true after all, and that all the preposterous tales, all the stupid heroic ballads and children's stories about Sajin and their superhuman powers weren't preposterous at all. His surviving guardsmen, all six of them, were no longer advancing to envelop Merlin. They were falling back, huddling together. None of Tyrion's guards had ever lacked courage, but this was too much, something beyond their experience or comprehension. They hadn't panicked even now. There hadn't really been time for that. But the deadly sense of how totally outclassed they were had driven them completely onto the defensive, and even as Tyrion watched, another of them fell to Merlin's implacable blade. He's not human. The thought flashed through the Duke's mind, and he shook himself, fighting to throw off his own incipient panic. His brain raced, and he drew a deep breath. There was still a way. If he could only get out of the library before Merlin reached him. Willems was out there somewhere, and surely the clash of steel, the screams, had to have alerted the Major Domo. He must have already sounded the alarm for the rest of Tyrion's personal guards. If the Duke could reach those guards first, he could tell them how Merlin had exploded out of the night in an effort to assassinate him, how the supposed Sejin had taken Grey Harbor hostage. However deadly Merlin might be, Tyrion had the next best thing to another sixty men ready to hand, and most of them were as well trained with bows or arbalists as with swords. 
And if, in the process of retaking the library, there should be a tragic accident, or if Merlin should cut the Earl's throat rather than allow him to be rescued, or yet another guardsman folded up around the bitter steel buried in his belly, and Tyrion turned. A corner of Merlin's attention saw the Duke turn and race for the library's door. He realized instantly what Tyrion had in mind, but there were still four guardsmen between him and the traitor. He couldn't kill them quickly enough to— The Earl of Grey Harbor's belt dagger flashed in the lamplight as it flew across the library. It was heavy, awkward, and not really properly balanced for throwing, but the Earl's hand had not forgotten the captain's skill entirely and grief and terror had burned the alcohol out of his system. Calvin Armach, Duke of Tyrion, rose on his toes like a dancer, arms flung wide, spine arched, and mouth open in agony as ten lethal inches of steel drove into his back. A jeweled hilt blossomed between his shoulder blades, blood sprayed from his lips, and he crashed face down to the floor. Twelve. Brady Lang's Lodgings, Tellisburg. The pounding on Brady Lang's door was furious enough to wake him despite the tumult of the storm. His immediate reaction was one of panic. No spy wanted to hear an official fist battering on his door in the middle of the night, and he could think of very few non-official errands which might bring someone out on a night like this one. But then his panic eased just a bit. When Baron Wave Thunder's agents came to call on a suspected spy, they were seldom so polite as to bother to knock. Doors had a way of becoming splinters in the course of their visits, although on the rare occasions when they demolished the wrong person's door, they were very good about replacing it later. Still, it was unlikely that whoever was knocking at his door was here in any official capacity, and he felt his heart beat slow just a bit as he climbed out of bed. He'd selected his lodgings not simply because they were close to the heart of the city, or even because of the roof space available for his wyvern coops. Those were factors, of course, yet an even more important one was the fact that the building's ground floor was occupied by a ship chandler during the day, but empty at night. That gave Lang a certain degree of anonymity on the occasions when he was expecting callers after hours. He'd made a few additional judicious modifications without benefit of discussion with his landlord as well, and he paused well to one side of his second-story door and peered through the inconspicuous peephole he'd bored through the wall. There was no lamp in the hallway or on the stairs. Since there wasn't normally any traffic after dark, there was no point risking the accidental fire an unattended candle or lamp might lead to. But Lang's visitor had brought a bullseye lantern, and Lang's eyebrows rose as he recognized the other man by the light streaming from its opened slide. His initial alarm returned, if in a rather less acute version. Maurice Willems had delivered several messages to him over the past few years, and Lang was aware that Duke Tyrion trusted his majordomo's discretion implicitly. But Willems had never arrived in the middle of the night without warning or without any of the signals Tyrion and Lang had devised to alert one another that they needed to make contact. Unexpected messages like this, especially ones which carried such a risk of exposure, were only marginally more welcome to a spymaster than the heavy-handed minions of the Crown. He drew a deep breath, opened the door partway, leaving the safety chain latched, and peered out. What? He asked, his voice harsh. I have a package from the Duke, Willems replied. Well, hand it over, Lang said briskly, extending his hand through the gap. It won't fit, Willems said reasonably, and drew a fat package wrapped in oilskin against the weather out from under his streaming poncho. What is it? Lang asked, already reaching to unlatch the chain. He didn't tell me, Willems shrugged. There's been some trouble at the townhouse, though. I wouldn't be surprised if it's documents he needs to get rid of. Trouble? Lang's eye sharpened, and he opened the door fully. What kind of trouble? Nothing we can't handle, I think, Willem said, handing him the package. The spy took it almost absently, his eyes so focused on Willem's face that he never noticed the Major Domo's hand sliding back under his poncho until it reemerged with the dagger. Even then, Lang didn't really notice the blade— in fact, he still hadn't seen it when it severed his throat in a steaming gush of blood. 
Prince Narman's chief agent in Cheris thudded to the floor with a dying gurgle, and Willem stepped back, grimacing as he regarded the spray pattern on the front of his poncho. Well, no matter, he thought. The rain would wash away the stains quickly enough, just as Lang's death would wash away the information about Willem's true patron, which he might have provided to Wave Thunder's investigators. Now all Willems had to do was get back to Emerald himself. 13. Privy Council Chamber, Royal Palace, Telesburg. Harald VII's face was hard and grim, a mask of angry discipline over grief. His son sat beside him at the huge table in the lamp-lit council chamber, and Caleb's expression was even more mask-like than his father's. Both of them watched, silent and hard-eyed, as Merlin and the Earl of Grey Harbor stepped through the chamber's door. Benjamin Rice also sat at the table, accompanied by Sir Richard C. Farmer. Neither Bishop Michael nor any of the Privy Council's other members were present, and Merlin wondered whether that was a good sign or a bad one. At least the king seemed prepared to maintain Merlin's low profile for the moment. The royal guards had been courteous when they'd followed Grey Harbor's coachman back to Tyrion's mansion in obedience to the Earl's urgent summons, but they'd also been very, very firm. It was hard to blame them, really, considering the blood-spattered and body-littered scene which had greeted them in the recently deceased Duke of Tyrion's library. Being found standing over the bodies of the king's first cousin and fifteen of his personal guardsmen had to come under the heading of suspicious conduct, after all. At least they had been summoned by the Earl, and Lieutenant Hunter, the youthful officer who had accompanied the squad which had responded, had been willing to at least tentatively assume the first counselor knew what he was doing. That willingness had taken a hit when Hunter discovered just exactly whose dagger was planted in the Duke's back but it had been sufficient to at least ensure that the house would be sealed and that the entire matter would be kept secret until the king himself had been informed. That was as far as the lieutenant had been willing to go, however, and first counselor or not, Grey Harbor had found himself placed ever so politely under arrest. To Merlin's amusement, as much as anything could be amusing, under the circumstances, the young guardsmen had been almost as courteous to him as to the Earl. Both of them, however, had been relieved of all weapons before they were escorted to the council chamber. Owl, Merlin sub vocalized now. Communications on telemetry check. Communications link confirmed in normal operation, Lieutenant Commander, the AI replied. All skimmer telemetry links are nominal, it added and Merlin nodded mentally. He hoped things weren't going to turn out badly, but that didn't mean they weren't. It was always possible, however unlikely, that Harald might order their immediate execution, and Merlin couldn't let that happen. Not only would it be very inconvenient for him personally, but it would also mean the complete failure of Nimue Albin's mission on Safehold. That was why the recon skimmer was hovering directly above the royal palace, despite the rumbling thunderstorm, and it was also the reason the skimmer's weapons were fully online under Owl's control. Your Majesty, Lieutenant Hunter said quietly, Earl Grey Harbor and Lieutenant Athrawis. Thank you, Lieutenant. Harald's voice was harsh-edged, the courtesy automatic, and he never so much as glanced at the guardsmen. Leave us, please, and see to it we're not disturbed. As you command, Your Majesty, Hunter murmured. He withdrew and the massive council chamber door closed quietly behind him. The metallic clack of the latch was loud in the stillness, and then, as if on cue, another thunderous rumble of thunder shook the palace. So, Harald said after a long, still moment, I've spoken to Benjamin. I've spoken to Lieutenant Hunter. I've spoken to the most senior of Calvin's guardsmen we could find. Now I want to know what in Shanway's name happened. His voice was hard, colder than Merlin had ever heard it, in person or through one of his snarks, and his eyes were chips of brown ice. Your Majesty, Grey Harbor went down on one knee and bent his head before his monarch. Merlin saw Caleb's eyes widen, but Harald's expression didn't even flicker. Whatever happened was my fault, 
the first councillor said, his voice low-pitched and sad but firm. I will determine who was at fault, Harald told him, not you. Your Majesty, Wave Thunder began, but Harald held up a hand abruptly. No, Benjamin, he said coldly. I'm not exactly pleased with you at this moment either, you know, but I want to hear what Rages and Sejin Merlin have to say for themselves without any excuses from you. Wave Thunder settled unhappily back in his chair, mouth shut, and the king's eyes bored into the kneeling grey harbour. Why do you say it was your fault? he demanded. Because it was my stupidity which created the situation from which Sejin Merlin was forced to rescue me, Grey Harbour said unflinchingly. The Sejin warned Benjamin and me that Calvin was a traitor. I refused to believe it. Indeed, I went so far as to believe, to insist, that Merlin was lying for purposes of his own, even when Benjamin came to me, told me what Sir Richard had already discovered. I refused to believe, and because I did, I violated my oath as first counsellor. Instead of maintaining the secrecy of the information Benjamin had shared with me, I went to Calvin to tell him he was under suspicion, that he had to disassociate himself from the men we knew were Emerald agents, that he had to come to you, Your Majesty, tell you everything, prove Sejin Merlin's accusations were lies, but... He looked up at last, his face wrung with pain and his eyes glistening with unshed tears. They weren't lies. The chamber was still, a frozen tableau, as the kneeling father-in-law met the cousin's eyes. The silence stretched out for several seconds, almost a full minute, and more distant thunder grumbled quietly in the background. Then, finally, Harald's nostrils flared as he inhaled deeply. How do you know they weren't? he asked very, very softly. Because Calvan admitted it to me, Your Majesty. Grey Harbour's voice wavered at last, frayed by remembered pain. He admitted it? Harald repeated, as if even now he simply could not believe his own ears. Your Majesty, he admitted that the attempt to assassinate Caleb was his idea originally, not Narmon's. He told me he should have been king, not you. And because I'd revealed that he was under suspicion... He planned to murder you and Caleb this very night rather than face the disgrace and dishonor his crimes had earned. He actually believed he could steal the throne for himself if only you, Caleb, and Benjamin and his senior investigators were dead, and he invited me to join him in his treason. I don't believe it, Harold said flatly, but Merlin heard the tiny tremor in that hard voice's depths. Your Majesty, I'm talking about my son-in-law. Grey Harbour said, his own voice and eyes wretched. My daughter's husband, the father of my grandchildren. I loved him as if he'd been the son of my own body. Loved him so much I violated my oath to you to warn him he was under suspicion. Do you think I would lie about something like this? Something which will hurt Jennifer so terribly? Do you think I would kill my own grandchildren's father if I'd had any choice at all? Harold stared down at him and the king's frozen expression began to change. His jaw muscles clenched into hard-to-find lumps, then relaxed as his cheeks sagged and he closed his eyes at last. A single tear trickled down his right cheek, and the hard, angry shoulders sagged. Why, Rages? he asked hoarsely. Why didn't you and Benjamin come to me as soon as Sajin Merlin spoke? Benjamin, because he didn't want to hurt you, Your Majesty, Grey Harbour said softly, and I because I refused to believe. And now this, Harold opened his eyes once more and shook his head. Now this, Rages, you're right. It is your fault, and you did violate your oath when you went to warn a possible traitor he was suspected. If you hadn't, if you'd waited as you should have, Calvin would still be alive. We might yet have learned a great deal from him, and he would have been alive. My cousin, almost my brother, would have been alive. The earl bent his head once more and his shoulders shook, but he said nothing in his own defense. May I speak, Your Majesty? Merlin asked quietly, and the king's eyes darted to his face. For a moment they flashed with fiery anger, 
But then Harald made himself stand back from that instant automatic rage. Speak, he said curtly. Your Majesty, I told Baron Wave Thunder and Earl Grey Harbour I had no positive proof of my suspicion of the Duke. Yet had I possessed that proof, I would have laid it in their hands. I would not have laid it in yours. Harald's eyes glittered dangerously, but Merlin continued steadily, meeting the king's angry glare. He was your cousin, your majesty. You loved him, and I knew it. It wasn't my place to tell you something which would cause you so much pain, and even if it had been, I had no idea of the true depth of his treason. I told your ministers what I knew, what I suspected, but even I suspected only a fraction of the full truth, and I had no proof even of that. If they erred in the fashion in which they responded to what I told them, they did so out of concern and out of love of their own. Neither of them was prepared to shirk his duty to the crown to investigate any charge, however absurd, and both of them acted as they did out of their love for you and their desire to spare you pain. Baron Wave Thunder initiated that investigation without telling you because he knew how much it would hurt you if the charges proved well-founded, and because he wanted to spare you that pain until and unless he knew they were, and also, at least in part, to protect your relationship with your cousin, should those charges not prove valid, by arranging things so that you could blame him for proceeding without your authority, if the Duke proved innocent and learned he'd been suspected. And while the Earl flatly refused to believe the Duke could possibly be a traitor, he agreed with Baron Wave Thunder, out of his duty to you, that the charges must be investigated. If he acted unwisely in other ways, that too was out of love, love for you and for his own son-in-law. Perhaps they should have told you immediately. Perhaps I should have. But if we had, how would you have reacted? Would you have believed it? Or would you have done precisely what the Earl did? Given the cousin you loved the opportunity to disprove the ridiculous allegations being made against him by a foreigner about whom you truly know almost nothing. The king continued to glare at him for a few moments, but then the fire in his eyes ebbed once again. Precisely, Your Majesty, Merlin said softly. You did love him, as did the Earl. Neither of you would have wanted to believe, and because the Earl refused to believe, he was nearly killed by his own son-in-law, would have been killed if the Duke had decided his death was necessary to advance his own plans. Do not deceive yourself, Harald of Cheris. The cousin you loved planned your son's murder and yours. Had he become regent for Jeanne, he would undoubtedly have arranged his death as well, and possibly even Jeannette's, if it had proven necessary to secure his own claim to the throne. If you'd given him the opportunity to clear his name, he would have responded in precisely the same way he responded to Earl Grey Harbour's offer, and quite possibly have succeeded. Silence hovered once again, and then the king shook himself. He looked away from Merlin, away from the still kneeling Grey Harbour. What have you discovered so far, Benjamin? he asked harshly. I fear everything Sage and Merlin's told us about the Duke was true, sire. Wave Thunder said heavily. His major domo and at least twenty-three more of his personal guardsmen managed to disappear before Lieutenant Hunter and his men arrived at the Duke's mansion. The only reason I could think of for them to have done that was because they knew the Duke was a traitor and they were implicated in his treason. And I fear that at least one of them may have served two masters and not just the Duke alone. What do you mean? Harold demanded, and Wave Thunder nodded to Sea Farmer. I received a report from one of my agents just before Sage and Merlin and the Earl arrived here at the palace, Your Majesty, Sir Richard said. A man who may have matched the description of the Duke's major domo, Maurice Willems, went to Brady Lang's lodgings this evening. The weather is so bad tonight my man couldn't make a positive identification but because it's so bad, he was also suspicious about why someone might be out in the storm. So after the visitor left, 
he decided he should quietly check to be sure Lang was still there, that he hadn't crept out a back way as the first step in disappearing. What he discovered instead was that Lang had been murdered. Murdered? Harold repeated, and there was an almost bemused note in his voice, as if even someone as tough-minded as the King of Cheros was beginning to feel overloaded. Yes, Your Majesty, Sea Farmer nodded. I don't believe the Duke ordered his execution, sire, Wave Thunder said. I suspect that just as the Duke had inserted his own guardsmen into Rage's service, Narmon had inserted this Willems into the Duke's. He was probably the hidden dagger waiting to remove the Duke at a time of Narmon's choosing. But it would seem he was also charged with removing the one man who could have given us complete details on Narmon's network of spies here in the kingdom, especially if it appeared the Duke's downfall might lead us to Lang in turn. Langhorn, Harald sighed, and covered his eyes with his hand. He sat that way for quite some time, then made himself straighten once more, lowered his hand, and looked at Grey Harbor. Oh, stand up, Rages, he half snapped. The Earl's head came up once more, and Harald made an unhappy sound, halfway between a snort and something angrier. The Sajin's right, he said. Yes, you were stupid, and you violated your oath. And if you'd told me the way you should have, I would have done something equally stupid. Because, as Sajin Merlin says, I loved Calvin. God forgive me, but I still love him. And he would have used that love to kill me and Caleb, and probably Jeanne and Jeannette as well. Your Majesty, I— Grey Harbor began, but Harald shook his head sharply. No, don't say it. You're too valuable to me, to the kingdom, to be permitted to resign your post. And however, unwisely, the king smiled thinly, tightly at Merlin, you may have acted in this instance out of love. Certainly you've also given me the strongest possible proof of your own loyalty. Terrible as this has been for me and for Caleb, it will be even worse for you in the days to come. I can't do without a man willing to shoulder that much pain in the service of the oaths he swore to me into my crown. So stand up, come over here, and sit where you belong. Now. Grey Harbor hesitated an instant longer, then stood a bit unsteadily, walked across to take his place at the council table, and seated himself. That left Merlin standing alone before the table, and Harald leaned back in his chair and gazed at him. And so to you. Sajin, Merlin, he said softly. You carry deadly gifts. I regret that, Merlin said unflinchingly, but I told you I'd give you the truth, Your Majesty. You did, and you have. Harald raised one hand in a little throwing-away gesture. I thought truth was what I wanted to hear. Now I know better. It isn't what I want to hear. It's only what I need to hear. It will be a long time before I can truly forgive you, or Rages, or Benjamin, or, especially, myself, for what's happened tonight. But the truth is that you, and Rages, have quite possibly saved my life and my children's lives. And whether Calvin's plans would have succeeded ultimately or not, you've unmasked and destroyed the most dangerous traitor in the entire kingdom. And so, even though my heart cries out in anger, you aren't the proper target of that anger. Merlin bent his head, bowing silently, and Harald gave himself another shake. In addition, he continued more briskly, it would appear you've once again saved a valued servant of the crown from assassination, and against even more formidable odds than before. He regarded Merlin with an intent expression his eyes much closer to their normal, piercing sharpness. I've glanced over Lieutenant Hunter's preliminary report, Sage and Merlin. Fifteen armed and armored guardsmen, I believe he said. And while Calvin may have been a traitor, he was an excellent judge of fighting men. Yet, according to Lieutenant Hunter, you went through fifteen of his picked men like a scythe through grass, not to mention arriving... Once again, at a most opportune moment. He paused, obviously awaiting a response, and Merlin shrugged slightly. 
As I already told Prince Caleb during supper, Your Majesty, I had a vision of the Earl. It was sufficient to alert me to the danger in which he was about to place himself, but I feared it would be impossible to convince anyone else the Duke was a threat to him or to the Crown, or at least to convince anyone in time. So I went myself to do what I could. Caleb stirred slightly at his father's side. Merlin glanced at him, one eyebrow slightly quirked and the young man settled back into stillness. "'You went yourself,' Harald murmured, his attention so focused on Merlin that he paid no heed to the silent exchange with Caleb. "'And how, pray, did you manage to get out of Marutha's tower, and off the palace grounds, without so much as a single challenge from my reasonably competent guards?' "'Your Majesty,' Merlin replied with an easy smile, "'the night is dark,' It's pouring down rain by the bucketful. I'm dressed entirely in black, and I came to you from the mountains of light, where there are many steep cliffs upon which to practice climbing. And in all fairness to your guards, none of them have the training and other advantages I have. Harald cocked his head to one side, and if he'd still been a being of protoplasm, Merlin would probably have held his breath. So far, nothing he'd said had been an actual lie, and he wanted badly to keep it that way. I suppose, the king said finally, slowly, that when a man can come crashing down through a skylight to a floor twenty-five feet below him and kill not just fifteen armed guardsmen, but sixteen, including Rage's supposed guardsmen, it shouldn't be surprising if he can also scale palace walls like some sort of human fly. I feel, however, that I really ought to point out that you seem to be establishing a very difficult example for the next Seijin to live up to. That isn't my intention, Your Majesty, Merlin replied. In fact, I think it would be a very good thing if we could minimize my own part in this evening's events. That might be just a bit difficult, Wave Thunder observed dryly, and possibly pointless as well, Harald added. Difficult, perhaps, my lord, Merlin replied to the Baron, but not pointless. Your Majesty, if I may explain... "'By all means, Master Trainer,' Harald said, his tone even drier than Wave Thunder's had been, and Merlin surprised himself with a small chuckle. Master Trainer was a stock character out of the Safeholdian puppet theatre tradition, a sort of symbol of yin and yang, although the terms were unknown on Safehold. The name was given to a character within the play who was usually a bumbling conspirator, someone whose elaborate plans always miscarried, but, in a sort of backhanded joke, it was also the traditional nom de théâtre of the master puppeteer who controlled all of the marionette actors. "'Perhaps not master trainer, Your Majesty,' he said, "'but a conspirator of sorts, nonetheless. "'With the revelation of the Duke's treason "'and Lang's murder by Naraman's own man, "'all of Naraman's and Hector's other agents here in Cheris are going to be in what might charitably be called a state of consternation. All of them, I'm certain, will be wondering if Baron Wave Thunder's agents are about to pounce on them as well. And they're undoubtedly going to be wondering exactly how the Baron and his investigators tumbled to the Duke's involvement in the first place. I believe all of us are in agreement that concealing the existence and accuracy of my visions from Narman and Hector is desirable on a great many levels. On the level of grand strategy, keeping your enemies unaware of the advantage those visions offer you will only make them even more advantageous, and it would probably be a very good idea to keep those who wish you ill from looking too closely at any of my other activities as well. On a purely personal level, I would vastly prefer not to have to be perpetually on guard against the horde of assassins I'm sure the two of them would send after me to negate that advantage. I rather doubt any horde of assassins is going to succeed in killing you, Harald observed. So far, it's been rather the other way around, after all. Any mortal man can be killed, Your Majesty. I'd like to think it would be somewhat harder to kill me than some, but at the very least, slaughtering assassins in job lots would be fatiguing. Not to mention a distraction from all the other things I really ought to be doing. I see. 
For the first time since Merlin and Grey Harbor's arrival, there might actually have been a small flicker of amusement in the king's eyes. And I'd hate to have you inconvenienced in that fashion, of course. But that brings us to the minor matter of Benjamin's observation about the difficulty in concealing your modest part in this evening's activities. I'd prefer not so much to conceal it as to downplay it, Your Majesty, Merlin said in a more serious tone. And your decision to name me as Caleb's personal guard may make that easier. If you and Earl Grey Harbor are willing, I would prefer for the official version to be that Baron Wave Thunder's investigators became suspicious of the Duke after interrogating the single assassin we captured alive, not because of anything I may have said. After that, the Baron began a cautious investigation, and the Earl reacted much as he actually did by going to the Duke and suggesting that it was imperative for him to clear his name of any suspicion. However, instead of taking only his personal guardsmen, he requested that I accompany him as well, which I did. And why precisely did he request that? Harald asked. Partly to help convince the Duke of the serious nature of the charges, Your Majesty. I was, after all, present when the assassination attempt failed. As such, my presence tonight might have helped to rattle the Duke's nerve, if he'd been involved even peripherally with Narmon, and also as an additional witness to anything which transpired. That sounds a little thin to me, Harald mused, then shrugged. On the other hand, if we all say the same thing, and manage to keep our faces straight while we do it, we can probably make it stand up. So, Regis has gone to visit Calvin, and he's taken you along. And then... When the Duke was confronted, he responded exactly as he actually did, Your Majesty, except that he'd brought only five of his own guardsmen into the library at that time. When they attempted to seize the Earl, his guardsmen and I managed to prevent them from doing so, and in the process, killed or wounded most of them. At which point, the Duke summoned the other ten men he'd had waiting outside the library door. In the ensuing fight, the Earl's guardsman was killed but not before he, the Earl, and I, fighting together, had defeated the Duke's men. In the general chaos of the fight, the Duke himself was killed, after which the Earl summoned the Royal Guard, not surprisingly considering that a member of the Royal House had been killed, and Lieutenant Hunter and his men responded. Master trainer, indeed, Harold said after a moment, then looked at Wave Thunder and Grey Harbor and raised both eyebrows. It cuts against the grain to turn Georges into one of the heroes of this piece of fiction, Grey Harbor said heavily and shook his head. I believed for years that he truly was that loyal to me. It would be hard to maintain a straight face knowing he was actually a traitor and died a traitor's death. It may cut against the grain, Regis, Wave Thunder said, but it also might just work. Aside from you and Sejin Merlin, the only one left alive who knows what actually happened is probably this Willems, the Duke's majordomo. Even he wasn't there for the actual fight, although he does know you arrived without Sejin Merlin. He'll undoubtedly report that to Narmon, but there's nothing we can do to prevent that, unless we manage to catch him before he gets back to Emerald, which frankly, is unlikely, to say the least. All the same, I suspect Narmon and Baron Shander are going to tend to discount the more outrageous rumors about the Sejin, just as we would in their place. So they're going to know we're covering up something, but they won't know exactly what. And Sejin, Merlin, and the King are quite correct when they say his ability to see these Visions of his will be even more valuable to us if no one else knows he can do it. I think Merlin and Benjamin have a point, Regis, Harold said, and if it helps, think of it this way. Your man may have been a traitor, but this way his death will actually strike a blow against the very men for whom he actually worked. Very well, Your Majesty, Grey Harper inclined his head once more, then gave Merlin a lopsided smile. And I suppose under the circumstances that it's the very least I can do for Sage and Merlin in return for his saving my life 
after I'd openly accused him of being a traitor himself. Then that's settled, Harold said. Benjamin, I'll have a few words with Lieutenant Hunter myself, just to ensure that his final report doesn't disagree with Merlin's creativity. That would probably be wise, sire. In the meantime, I think Richard and I need to get back over to the office and decide which of Normand's other spies, the Duke, or something we found in his papers, might have implicated. With your permission, I intend to prune back Narmon's network rather severely. Consider my permission granted, Harold said grimly, then sat back in his chair and gazed speculatively at Merlin. Your Majesty, Merlin said politely after several seconds, and Harold snorted. I was just thinking, sage in Merlin. Thinking, Your Majesty, Merlin prompted obediently. When the king paused, thinking about how predictable and orderly life was before your arrival here in Tellersburg, I'm sure that in time we'll all adjust, but I hope you won't take it wrongly if I tell you I find myself more than a little terrified when I contemplate the future and reflect upon what's followed in your wake in the space of less than a single five day, especially because a part of me suspects the real chaos and confusion is yet to come. Merlin smiled crookedly and shook his head without speaking. There wasn't much other response he could have made. After all, the king was right. 14. A Private Audience Chamber, Royal Palace, Tellisburg. The small presence chamber's door opened. A woman in formal court attire stepped through it, accompanied by two small boys. She was in her mid-thirties, possibly a little older, but her figure was firm and trim. The light flowing drape of the cotton gowns enforced by Tellisburg's climate made that abundantly clear, but her face was tight-clenched, her eyes suspiciously swollen under the cosmetics which helped to mask their redness. She walked down the runner of carpet across the cool stone floor, holding the hands of her two sons as they walked beside her. The younger of them, perhaps five years old standard, looked more confused than anything else. He kept glancing up at his mother, worried and concerned by the emotions he sensed from her. The older boy, twice his younger brother's age, was different. He appeared shocked, almost like someone trapped in a terrible nightmare from which he could not awake. Like his mother and his brother, he was perfectly attired, complete to the dress dagger hanging at his right hip. But his eyes were as swollen as his mother's, and Merlin could almost physically feel the concentration it took to keep his lower lip from quivering. King Harald VII watched the small, pathetic procession coming towards him for perhaps three heartbeats. Then he pushed himself up out of his throne and in a total violation of every rule of court protocol, stepped down from the dais and went to meet them. He moved so quickly his habitual limp was far more evident than usual. So quickly neither of the bodyguards standing behind his throne could keep up with him. Then he reached the widowed mother and the grieving son and went awkwardly, awkwardly to his good knee, his right leg stretched painfully behind him. Regis, he said to the older boy, and reached out one hand to cut the back of the boy's head. Y your Majesty, the boy began, but then he stopped, eyes gleaming with tears, as his voice cracked, and he had to fight for control. No titles, Regis, the king told his first cousin once removed gently. Not yet. The boy nodded mutely, his face crumbling with the grief the king's tone told him it was all right to display, and Harald looked up at his mother. Jennifer, he said softly. Your Majesty, she half whispered. Her voice was more controlled than her son's, Merlin thought, but it was still husky, shadowed by sorrow and tears. Harald looked up at her for a moment, then began to push himself up off of his knee. Sire, Sergeant Charles Gardiner's voice was quiet, but he'd caught up with his king, and he held out a mailed arm. Harald grimaced, but he also took it and used it to pull himself back erect. 
He towered above the two boys, looking down at them for a moment, then scooped the younger up into his own arms. The boy clung to his neck, pressing his face into the king's tunic, and Harald held him with one arm while he extended the other hand to Regis. The older boy looked at that hand for a moment, then he took it, and Harald limped more slowly back to his throne. The king's mouth, Merlin noticed from his place at Caleb's left shoulder, behind the crown prince's flanking throne, tightened each time his weight came down on his right leg. Harald reached the dais, followed by Lady Jennifer Armach, who had just become the dowager duchess of Tyrion. He paused, setting the younger boy gently back on his feet, then lowered himself back into his chair and used both hands to lift his right leg until his foot rested once more on the stool before it. Jennifer, Regis, Calvin, he said then, softly. You know why you're here, but before we face the council and all the official details we have to deal with, I need to speak to all three of you as members of my family, not as a king to his subjects. Duchess Tyrion flinched slightly at the word family, and Harald held out his hand to her. She took it a bit hesitantly, and he drew her closer to his throne. Don't feel guilty for grieving, he told her very gently. Don't think I blame you for that, or that anyone ought to, and don't think Caleb and I aren't grieving as well. She looked into his eyes, her mouth quivering, and his grip on her fingers tightened comfortingly as tears trickled slowly down her cheeks. It's going to take us a long time to understand exactly what happened, where the Colvin we knew and loved turned into the man who could have done the things we know now that he did. The king continued. He looked back into Jennifer's eyes for a moment longer, then looked down at her older son. Rageous, he said, this is going to be hard for you, the hardest thing you've ever done. Some people are going to say horrible things about your father. Others are going to insist those things couldn't have been true. And there are going to be a great many men who believe that because of the things your father may have done, you may somehow become a threat or a danger to the crown some day. Rage's effort to control his expression wavered, and the king's free hand reached out to cut the back of his head gently once more. What's well, going to make it hurt worst of all? he told the boy, is that so many of those horrible things are going to be true. If I could protect you from hearing them, I would, but I can't. You're young to be faced with all of this, but no one else can face it for you. Regis looked back at him mutely for several seconds, then nodded in tight-mouthed understanding. In just a few minutes, the king continued, we're all going to appear before the council and before Bishop Michael and Bishop Executor Gerald as the church's representatives. They're going to ask you and your mother. He looked up at Jennifer briefly. A lot of questions. Some of them are going to make you angry. A lot of them are going to hurt and make you sad. All you can do is answer them as honestly as you can. And I want you to remember, I want all three of you to remember that you are my cousins. Nothing anyone, not your father, not the council, could do will ever change that. Do you understand that, Regis? The boy nodded again, tightly, and Harald drew a deep breath. There's one more thing, Regis, he said. One thing that's going to hurt worse than anything else, I'm afraid. Jennifer Armach made a soft, inarticulate sound, and her hand twitched, as if she wanted to reach out, stop the king. But she didn't, and Harald continued, speaking slowly and carefully, his eyes on both her sons. People are going to tell you, he said, that your grandfather killed your father. Calvin, the younger of the two, jerked, his eyes suddenly huge. Regis only looked back at the king, but his eyes were suddenly darker and filled with even more pain, and Merlin's heart twisted in silent sympathy for the heartbroken boy who'd just become a duke. The reason they're going to say that, Harald went on, is because it's true. He didn't want to because he loved your father, just as I did, just as Caleb did. But he had no choice. Sometimes even people we love do bad things, Regis, Calvin. 
Sometimes it's because there's a part of them we never knew was there, a secret part that wants things they shouldn't have and tries to take them. Your father and I were raised as if we were brothers, not cousins. I loved him the same way Calvin loves you, Rages. I thought he loved me the same way. Some people will say I was wrong to believe that, because in the end he wanted to steal the crown from me, and he tried to murder Caleb to do it. That was a terrible, terrible thing for him to do. But despite all of that, I wasn't wrong to love him, and I wasn't wrong to believe he loved me. People change sometimes, boys. There are sicknesses that don't affect our bodies, but our hearts and our minds. I believe that's what happened to your father. He wanted the crown so badly, it became a sickness, one that twisted things deep down inside him. When he and I were your ages, when we were growing up together here in the palace, before that hunger for the crown poisoned him inside, he did love me. And he did love Caleb, I believe, just as your grandfather loved him. But when he did what he did, and when he refused to step back from the plans he'd set in motion, your grandfather had to make a choice. He had to decide whether he was going to do the things his oaths to the crown and his own honor required, or whether he was going to join your father in doing the terrible things your father's ambition had driven him to do. And when your grandfather decided he couldn't support treason, no matter how much he loved the person committing it, your father ordered his personal guardsmen to seize him and hold him prisoner until after Caleb and I and quite a lot of other people had all been killed. Calvin was shaking his head again and again slowly with a five-year-old's expression of pain and loss and confusion. Regis was old enough to understand, however imperfectly, what the king was saying, and his chin quivered as the words sank home. Your grandfather couldn't let that happen, Harald said, his voice soft but unflinching. Your grandfather is my first counselor. He's one of my vassals. He was an officer in my navy. And your grandfather understands what honor means, what oaths mean. And so, as much as he loved your father, and he did love him, Regis, I swear that to you, when it came to open fighting, and your father's guards tried to seize or kill him, he honored those oaths and killed the man he loved for the crimes that man had committed. Both boys were weeping now, and so was their mother. Harald pushed himself back up out of his throne and drew Jennifer into his embrace. A moment later, two five-year-old arms locked around his left thigh, and he felt Calvin pressing his face into his hip. Rages stared up at him, his face working with desolation and loss, and the king reached one hand to him. The boy who had just become a duke, and in the process learned how hideously expensive a title could be, looked at his monarch through a veil of tears, and then he took the offered hand in both of his, clutching at it as a drowning man might cling to a spar. There's a reason your grandfather wasn't here to tell you this himself, Harald said, looking down and speaking to Jennifer as much as to her sons. He wanted to be. As painful as he knew it would be, he wanted to tell you himself, Rages. But I wouldn't let him. I'm your king, and you're one of my dukes now. There are obligations between kings and their nobles, and the fact that you're also part of my family makes those obligations stronger than ever. It was my duty to tell you. And I wanted you to hear it from me because I wanted you to know, to know in your heart as well as your mind, that nothing that's happened, nothing your father could have done, will ever change the way I feel about you and your mother. God judges all men in the end. Kings are sometimes required to judge men too. But a wise king judges any man or woman only on the basis of their own actions, not those of anyone else. I'm not always wise, however hard I try, however much I pray for guidance. But this much I promise you. When I look at you through the eyes of your cousin and remember your father, it will be the boy I loved, the good man I treasured, that I see in you. And when I look at you through the eyes of your king, it will be the boy you are and the man you become that I see. 
not the father who betrayed his trust. Merlin watched Jennifer's face, saw the pain and the loss mingled with acceptance of Harald's words. And as he saw those things, Merlin knew he'd been right. Kings like Harald VII were what had made Cheris a kingdom worth saving. Whatever your father may have done at the end of his life, Harald finished gently. He and your mother and your grandfather taught you and Calvin well first. Remember those lessons, Regis. Always remember them. And honor the man he was when he taught them to you. And you'll grow into a man worthy of anyone's love. The boy stared up at him, weeping freely now and the king gave Jennifer one more squeeze, then released her so he could bend over and gather the youthful, broken-hearted Duke of Tyrion into a crushing hug of comfort. He embraced Regis for several seconds, then released him and straightened. And now, Your Grace, he said quietly to his cousin, let us go and meet the council. Fifteen, Tellisburg Cathedral, Tellisburg. The mighty organ's rich, powerful voice filled Tellisburg Cathedral with music. The organist's assistants pumped strongly, steadily, fueling its voice, and Merlin Athrawis, Lieutenant Athrawis, now of the Royal Guard, stood at one corner of the royal box as it flowed over him. The circular cathedral was awash in a polychromatic sea of light as the morning sunlight streamed in through the stained glass clear story, which completely encircled it, and the magnificent mosaic of the Archangel Langhorn and Archangel Bedar looked out over the congregation with stern eyes. Merlin gazed back at it, meeting those majestic eyes, outwardly calm and composed despite his internal rage. One day, he promised Pei Shanway's ghost, and theirs. One day... He looked away from the mosaic, more to distract himself from the anger he dared not display than for any other reason. Even here and even today, or perhaps especially today, Caleb and Harald could not be left unguarded, and Merlin was scarcely the only armed and armored guardsman present. Lieutenant Falcon and four of his marines stood between the box and the central aisle as well, and their eyes were just as hard, just as alert as Merlin's, as they surveyed the huge crowd filling the cathedral's pews. As always, the aristocracy and upper class were heavily represented, glittering with jewels and bullion embroidery. At a guess, there had to be at least 2,000 people in the cathedral, enough to strain even its normal capacity, and there was something odd about their mood. Well, of course there is, he thought, given Tyrion's death and the wave of arrests, wave thunders launched. Everybody in the entire kingdom is probably feeling a little anxious, and none of the nobility could possibly risk missing this service without absolutely ironclad proof that it was literally impossible for them to be here. But still, word of the king's cousin's treason and death had spread like wildfire. Things like that simply didn't happen in Cheris, and no one doubted for a moment that they wouldn't have happened now if someone from outside the kingdom hadn't made them. King Harald and his council might not be prepared to name names, but Cherisians in general were far more aware of political realities than the subjects of most Safeholdian realms. That was probably inevitable, given the way international politics routinely affected the trade relationships upon which Cheris' prosperity depended. Harald might have chosen not to point any fingers, but there was no question in his subjects' minds about who'd been responsible, and Merlin could almost physically taste their rage, like acid, on his tongue. Yet there was more to it than anger. There was fear. No, he thought, fear isn't the right word for it either. That's part of it. But there's more to it. These people know there's more going on here than just the routine power games between rival princes, and they're turning to their church for reassurance. A sudden shift in the organ music drew his mind away from its thoughts, and he turned his head as the cathedral's doors swung wide. An acolyte stepped through them, 
bearing the golden scepter of Langhorn upright before him on a gleaming night-black staff of ironwood bound in rings of engraved silver. Two candle-bearers flanked him, and two under-priests followed them, swinging censers that trailed fragrant strands of incense like white drifting ribbons in the light of the stained glass windows. Behind the under-priests came the massed choir in its green cassocks and white surplices. As the first rank passed through the open doors, the entire choir burst into song, and despite Merlin's hatred for all the Church of God awaiting represented, the beauty of those superbly trained voices washed through him like the sea. It took a long time for the choir to pass through the doors and wend its way to the choir lofts on either side of the archangel's mosaic. Behind them, following them through the storm of music, came Bishop Michael, another dozen acolytes, and half that many priests and under-priests, followed by yet another scepter-bearer and two more thurifers. The bishop paced slowly down the central aisle, his vestments glittering with gems his usual priest's cap replaced by the simple golden coronet of his ecclesiastic rank. Heads bent in reverent courtesy as he passed, and his expression was serene as he reached out, touching shoulders, heads, the hair of children, in quiet benediction as he walked past them. That, Merlin knew, was scarcely standard practice on the part of Mother Church's bishops, and one eyebrow arched slightly as he saw people daring to touch the bishop in return. He'd known Michael Stainer was deeply respected here in Tellisburg. Until this morning, he hadn't realized how deeply the bishop was loved. The bishop entered the sanctuary and genuflected before the altar and its mosaic. Then he stood, turning to face the congregation, while his assistants made their way to their own places, it was all as precisely choreographed as any formal ball, and the last acolyte found his position at the same instant the final note of the processional hymn died. There was utter silence for a moment, and then Bishop Michael's superbly trained voice rang out in the stillness. "'May Langhorn be with you, my children.' "'And with you, my father,' rumbled back at him. Let us pray for the intercession of Langhorn and the guidance of God upon our worship this day, Michael said, and turned once more to face the altar and dropped to his knees. Our Father who is in heaven, he began, blessed be your name. May the day awaited come. May the law proclaimed in your name by the blessed Langhorn be done on safe hold as it is in heaven. Give us... Merlin tuned it out. He had to. Nimue Alban had been raised in the church. She had not perhaps been as observant as her parents and religious instructors might have desired, but she'd discovered here on Safehold that it had stuck. Now, as he listened to the utter sincerity in Michael Stainer's voice, Merlin reminded himself the bishop had been taught from childhood to believe in the teachings of the Church of God awaiting. It was hard to remember as the words which had meant so much to Nimue were perverted to Langhorn's purposes, and yet it was true. And how could Merlin condemn a manifestly good and caring man for honoring the belief system in which he had been raised? None of which made it any easier to stand by and watch. Merlin was just as glad Langhorn had decided to build the Safeholdian year around a five-day week, which no longer included Saturday or Sunday, and established the middle day of those five as his church's holy day instead. Simply attending at all was hard enough without doing so on Sunday. It had to be the greatest irony in the history of mankind, he thought. The last Christian in the entire universe was a machine. Legally, that was all even an autonomous pika had ever been, although Merlin had long since ceased to apply that legal definition to himself. Still, it was a question he wished he could have discussed with someone else. Was he, in fact, the human being whose memories he possessed? Or was he simply an echo, a recording, an AI with delusions of grandeur? And did he have the immortal soul in which Nimue Alban had always believed? Or had Nimue taken that soul with her at the moment of her biological body's death? 
He had no answer to any of those questions. For a time, he'd even wondered if a being of Molly Sirks and Alloy had any right to so much as ask God about them. Then he'd decided God must be able to understand what impelled his questions, just as he'd decided that the fact that the Church of God awaiting was an enormous, obscene lie could never shut God's ears to the sincerity of the prayers rising about him even now. But he did know he had another responsibility over and beyond any duty to prepare the surviving human race to meet the Gababa again one day. He was the last surviving Christian. In a sense, he was also the last surviving Muslim, the last Jew, the last Buddhist, Hindu, Shintoist. The library computer in Nimue's cave was the final repository for millennia of human religious thought, of human striving for divine inspiration, and Merlin Athrawis was the only being who knew it was there. Someday that repository would be opened, for that, too, was Merlin's responsibility. He was the protector and guardian of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, all of them. And whether he was merely a machine or not, it was one of his tasks to restore that rich, varied heritage to the humanity from whom it had been stolen. He only hoped that when that day came, the human race's ability to believe would not have been destroyed by the realization of the lie which had enslaved it for almost a thousand years. It was a mass of thanksgiving, not a funeral mass, under the doctrine of the Church of God awaiting. Traitors were forbidden burial in holy ground, or at least, Merlin corrected himself, proven traitors were forbidden, which was probably just as well. From his own observations to date, at least a quarter of Safehold's aristocracy, and probably as much as half its vicars, would otherwise have been buried outside the cemetery wall. But the definition of traitor, unfortunately, by his own admission, applied to Calvin Armach, once Duke of Tyrion. That had been hard on Harald and Caleb. Despite everything, as Harald had told Jennifer Armach and her sons, they'd loved their cousin, to be denied the right to bury him in the church, to be forced to have his body interred in unconsecrated ground, had caused them both enormous pain. Yet they'd had no choice. Not even Bishop Michael could change that for them. However much he might have longed to, but what he could do, he had. The Mass thanked God for preserving the lives of the king, the crown prince, and the kingdom's first counselor, but the sermon which accompanied it focused on the fallibility of humans and the cost of sin to others. And so, Shan Wei did not lead men into evil by appealing to their evil nature. Merlin gritted his teeth, his expression calm, as Michael's voice reached out to every corner of the vast cathedral with a projection any trained actor would have envied. The writ tells us that not even Shan Wei herself was evil to begin with. Indeed, she was one of the brightest of all the archangels. And when she herself had fallen into evil, it was not man's evilness to which she appealed, but his goodness. She tempted him not with power over his fellows, not with dominion, but with the promise that all men everywhere would partake of the power of the archangels themselves that their children, their wives, their fathers and mothers, their friends and neighbors would all become as God's own angels if they simply reached out their hands to what she promised them. And so it is that even good men can unwittingly open the door to evil. I do not tell you, my children, that there are no evil men. I do not tell you that those who turn to betrayal, to theft, to murder and treason do so only because they are good men who have been led astray. I tell you only that all men begin as good men. What they are taught as children, what is expected of them as young men, is either the armor about that goodness or the flaw that allows evil in. Merlin rested one hand on the scabbard of his katana and gazed straight ahead. The bishop's voice was compassionate, caring, 
and yet everything he'd said was straight out of the Church of God awaitings doctrine and theology. But then, yet we must not forget our responsibility to teach them correctly, to discipline when discipline is required, yes, but also to use gentleness and love whenever we may, to be sure that that which we discipline is indeed a wrongful act, and to teach our children to know wrong from right themselves, to teach them to judge with clear eyes and unclouded hearts fearlessly, to teach them it does not matter who tells them something is right or wrong, but whether or not it is right or wrong, to teach them the world is a vast and wondrous place, one which holds challenges, promises, and tasks fit to test the mettle of any mortal." to teach them that to truly know God, they must find him in themselves and in the daily lives they live. Side 8, Off Armageddon Reef, by David Weber, continuing on page 191. A stir went through the cathedral, more sensed than seen, and Merlin twitched at the unanticipated direction of Michael's text. It was a small thing in many ways, but not here, not in a sermon from the third-ranking prelate in all of Cheris. The Church of God awaiting acknowledged a personal relationship between God and each of his children, but it did not encourage those children to seek that relationship. It was the function of the Church to teach and inform, to decree to the faithful what God's will for them was, and to find their personal relationship with him for them. The writ did not specifically proclaim the infallibility of the church as it had that of the archangels, but the church's doctrine did extend that same infallibility to the vicars who were heirs to the archangels' authority. Michael had not openly assailed that doctrine. What he'd said was simply an argument that even the best teachers could fail, but that was also an argument that those teachers could be wrong and so his words could be interpreted as an attack upon the infallibility of the Church, which was every Safeholdian teacher, especially here in Cheris, where independence of thought was openly encouraged. We strive to teach all our children those lessons, the bishop continued calmly, as if completely unaware he'd said anything at all out of the ordinary, and sometimes, despite all our efforts, we fail. There is evil in the world, my children. It can be found anywhere, among any men, and it waits patiently, and its snares are cunning. Men, powerful or weak, nobly born or common, wealthy or poor, fall into those snares and thus into sin, and it is our responsibility as God's people to hate sin, to reject it and cast it out when it arises among us. Yet it is also the responsibility of God's people to love one another to hate the sin but love the sinner, and not to feel guilt or self-hatred because we do love the sinner. It is meet and right that we should give thanks this day for the preservation of our king, our crown prince, and our first counselor. It is meet and right for us to condemn and hate the crime of treason which threatened them, and through them all of us. Yet even as we give thanks, let us remember that the evil which threatened them and was thwarted, still claimed its victims from among us. Those who fell into temptation's grasp, and lent themselves to these evil actions, are as lost to us as Crown Prince Caleb would have been, had their plans succeeded. What they've done will forever mark their memory among those who love them, and the price for their immortal souls will be higher than any of God's children should be called to pay. And so I beseech you all, as you join me in our closing prayer of thanks, to pray also for the souls of all who have perished, and for the wounded hearts of those who loved them. He gazed out over the cathedral's silent pews for perhaps ten seconds, then drew a deep breath and turned back to face the altar and the enormous faces of Langhorn and Bedard as he raised his hands in prayer. Merlin looked at the bishop's sword straight spine, as the words of Michael's prayer flowed over him. He hardly even heard the actual words, although Apica's perfect memory would recall them later if he wanted to. 
but the important words had already been said, and Merlin wondered if Harald and Caleb had suspected where their bishop's sermon was headed. 16. Archbishop's Palace, Talisburg Perhaps you would care to explain the text of your sermon, Bishop? Bishop Executor Gerald Adamson inquired icily, turning from the window of his study to face his guest. Forgive me, Your Eminence, Michael Stainer said calmly, but I'm not certain what part of the text you're referring to. His eyes met the Bishop Executor's stony gaze levelly, and Adamson's fists clenched in the flowing sleeves of his cassock. He'd never been happy about Stainer's accession to the capital C. The man was too, too, too Cheresian. But Harald's stubborn insistence on nominating the priest of his own choice to the empty throne in Telesburg Cathedral had given the previous archbishop pause. He could have rejected the nomination. As far as Adamson was concerned, he damned well ought to have rejected it and the bishop executor had said so at the time. But the archbishop had flinched from the king of Cheris, adamantine will. Archbishop Roger had been old and tired, already fading. He'd wanted only peace for his final years in the archbishopric, and perhaps he'd feared that if he pressed Harald too hard, it would create a situation which would force the council of vicars and the inquisition to act. And so, instead of dealing with it himself, he left it to fall onto my plate, Adamson thought bitterly. I have been told, he said to Michael now, that your sermon called into question the primacy and authority of Mother Church. Your Eminence, Michael said, his expression one of total innocence. I'm afraid I simply can't conceive of how anything I may have said might have called Mother Church's legitimate primacy and authority into question. What portion of my sermon could have led anyone to think for a moment that such was my intention? Adamson's fists clenched more tightly, and his nostrils flared as he inhaled deeply. Did you or did you not say that it was the responsibility of any godly individual to decide for himself what constitutes right or wrong? Of course I did, Your Eminence. Michael's surprised tone couldn't have been improved upon by the most skilled of actors, Adamson thought. Isn't that what both the writ and the commentaries teach us? That God and the archangels, his fingers touched his heart, then his lips, expect all of us to be armored against evil? That it's our duty as godly men and women to be eternally upon our guard, and to recognize evil for ourselves when we see it? Adamson's teeth grated as his jaw muscles tightened. He wanted to reach out and slap the bland-faced Cheresian in front of him. Both of them knew what Michael had really been saying, yet the bishop's glib response was drawn directly from the church's most central doctrines. I don't disagree with the statement that God and the archangels— It was Adamson's turn to touch his heart and then his lips— Expect us to recognize evil when we see it, but it's dangerous both in a doctrinal sense and in terms of maintaining Mother Church's legitimate authority, both in this world and the next, to suggest her teachings may be in error. With all due respect, Your Eminence, but I said nothing of the sort, Michael asserted firmly. I spoke of a parent's responsibility to teach his children to recognize right from wrong and to be wary, alert to the fact that others, less responsive to their obligations, or for their own evil and corrupt purposes, may attempt to mislead them, to couch false arguments in terms of acceptable beliefs. I never suggested that Mother Church might fall into the error of false teaching. If you believe I've done so, I beg you to instruct me as to where and how I might have set forth such an unforgivable accusation. Adamson glared at him for a moment, then wheeled back to the window while he fought to get his own expression and temper back under control. Whether or not you intended that accusation, he said finally, your words, as reported to me, could be interpreted in that sense by those inclined to set up their own judgment 
in opposition to that of Mother Church. I assure you, Your Eminence, that I've never had any intention of questioning Mother Church's legitimate authority. If any words of mine could be interpreted in that fashion, I do most humbly apologize. Adamson continued to glower out the window. The sun was settling steadily into the west. The western horizon was a solid mass of crimson coals, reaching out to paint Howell Bay with an ominous tinge of red, and the bishop executor drew another deep breath. I am most displeased with the evident carelessness of your choice of words, Bishop Michael. You are, after Archbishop Eric and myself, the senior bishop of the entire kingdom of Cheris. You have a responsibility to God and to Mother Church to remind the sheep of your flock where their duty and the safety of their souls lie, and it follows that you have an equal responsibility to avoid inadvertently driving potential wedges between them and the safety afforded by Mother Church's authority. He made himself speak calmly, reasonably, although he knew perfectly well that neither he nor Stainer had any doubt that the Cheresian bishop had done precisely what Ottomson had accused him of doing. But, by the same token, Stainer had covered himself. His interpretation of what he'd meant, however inaccurate and self-serving it might be, sounded both plausible and reasonable, or would have, anywhere except here in Cheris. I regret that you have reason to feel displeased with me, Your Eminence, Stainer said. I'm sure you do, Autumnson smiled out the window without any humor at all. Technically, he had the authority to remove Stainer temporarily from his see. Without Archbishop Eric's agreement, he couldn't remove the Cheresian permanently, however, and he wasn't at all certain the Archbishop would support him. And that's partly your own fault, Gerald, he told himself coldly. You've known for years how stubborn these Cheresians are, and yet you've persistently assured the Archbishop that the situation was under control. You've downplayed the reports of people like Hector and Narmon as exaggerations, because they are exaggerated wildly, damn it, for too long. If you simply report Stainer's words now, after all that, and accuse him on that basis of seeking to undermine the Church's authority, you'll sound as if you're starting to exaggerate as well. Without seeing the man's face, listening to his tone, sensing the mood of his parishioners, Everything he's said will sound completely reasonable, and any allegations you may lay against him will sound hysterical and alarmist. The bishop executor's smile turned into a glare as he gazed at the smoldering horizon and wondered if that crimson pile of cloudy embers was an omen of some sort. Stainer was worrisome, of course, but that was at least partly because of the composition of the Cheresian priesthood in general. One huge reason Stainer's elevation to the Telesburg Sea stuck in Ottomson's craw was that it flew in the face of the Church's normal policy of moving and assigning senior clergy, especially bishops and auxiliary bishops, so that they served outside the kingdoms or provinces of their birth. It was never a good idea, in Ottomson's opinion, to allow the leadership of the local church to develop a feeling of loyalty to the secular realm it served. As far as he was concerned, that was particularly true in lands such as Cheris, which were so far from the temple and Zion. But convincing members of the priesthood to move to such distant and isolated hinterlands was always difficult. Those with patrons of their own could always find some way to weasel out of it, while Cheris wealth offered a certain level of enticement, the truth was that assignment here was regarded as exile. At the best, it would be a severe blow to the potential career of anyone sent here. Ottomson's own case was atypical. He'd amply demonstrated his reliability, but he lacked that necessary patronage at the very highest level to ever become an archbishop in his own right. Since that was the case, Cheris had suited him just fine, when it was offered, it was far enough from the temple and Zion to give him a degree of independence and autonomy, 
plus manifold opportunities for acquiring personal wealth. But better than nine out of every ten members of the church's clergy here in Cheris were Cheresian born, just like Stainair. The numbers were higher in the lower ranks of the priesthood, and among the various monastic orders, of course. But that was the very thing which made admitting a Cheresian to the third highest church office in the entire kingdom so worrisome. Those lower ranking priests and underpriests were undoubtedly listening to anything their bishop said. I'll accept your assurance that you didn't intentionally assail Mother Church's authority and right to declare error, he said finally, turning back to face Stainer after several silent moments. That doesn't abate my displeasure, however, nor, I feel sure, would the Council of Vicars or the Inquisition be pleased by the potential for error contained in your unfortunately chosen words. You aren't some simple parish priest. You're a bishop, one of Mother Church's bishops, and as such you will be rightly held to a higher standard. Is that understood, Bishop Michael? It is, of course, Your Eminence, Stainer said, bowing his head very slightly. These are perilous times, Adamson continued levelly. Danger threatens Cheris on many levels, as, indeed, the treason of the king's own cousin clearly illustrates. Do not increase that peril. I'll take your warning to heart, Your Eminence, Stainer said with another slight bow. See that you do, Adamson said. Be very careful to see that you do. Neither my patience, nor the archbishop's, nor the Office of Inquisitions, is without limit. If your failure in your duties leads to consequences for others, then the weight of those consequences will be upon your own immortal soul, and Mother Church will demand an accounting of you. Stainer said nothing, but neither did he flinch, and there was no give in his steady eyes. Well, he'd been warned, and whatever else the man might be, he wasn't a fool. That would have to be enough. For now, at least. You may go, Adamson said coldly, and extended his ring for Stainer to kiss. Thank you, Your Eminence, the Bishop of Telesburg murmured, as he brushed his lips lightly across the golden scepter inlaid into the blood-red ruby of the ring. I assure you that I'll remember everything you've said to me today. September, Year of God, 890 1. Madame Angelique's City of Zion Archbishop Eric Dennis smiled happily as he bade Madame Angelique Fonda a heartfelt good night. As always, it's been a delightful evening, Angelique, he said patting her delicate, perfumed fingers between both of his own well-manicured hands. You're always too kind, Your Eminence, Madame Angelique said with the gracious smile, which had been so much a part of her success during her own working days. I'm afraid you flatter us more than we really deserve. Nonsense, nonsense, Dennis said firmly. We've known one another far too long for me to stand on ceremony or worry about polite nothings with you and your charming ladies. In that case, thank you, Your Eminence. Madame Angelique bent her head in a small bow. We're always delighted to see you, especially now. We weren't certain we'd have the chance to entertain you again before your departure for Cheris. Not something I'm looking forward to, to be honest. Dennis sighed with a small grimace. Of course I can't delay much longer. In fact, I should already have left. The first snows have fallen in the mountains according to the semaphore's reports. It won't be much longer before Xing Wu's passage starts to freeze, and I'm afraid the voyage itself won't be very much fun at this time of year, even after we clear the passage. I know, Your Eminence. Still, they say summer in Telesburg is much more pleasant than winter here in Zion, so at least you have something nice to look forward to at journey's end. Well, that's certainly accurate enough, Dennis agreed with a chuckle. In fact, I sometimes wish the archangels hadn't been quite so immune to the effects of waist-deep snow when they chose the temple's site. I love Zion's climate in the summer, you understand, but winter is something else again entirely. Even, alas, despite your own charming company. 
It was Madame Angélique's turn to chuckle. In that case, Your Eminence, and in case I don't see you again before you leave, allow me to wish you a comfortable voyage and a safe return to us. From your lips to the Archangel's ears. Dennis touched his heart and then his lips, smiling into her eyes, and she rose on tiptoe to kiss him chastely on the cheek. It was, he reflected through a pleasant glow of memory, the only chaste thing which had happened to him since entering her door several hours before. Madame Angélique's door was one of the more discreet portals in all of Zion. While the Holy Writ recognized that human beings were fallible, and that not all of them would seek the approval of Mother Church's clergy upon their relationships, it was quite strict on the subjects of fornication and infidelity, which complicated Eric Dennis life somewhat, since both the writ and the Church's own regulations also required that any churchman who aspired to the ranks of the episcopate must have married. How else could he understand the physical and emotional needs of the wedded believers for whose spiritual well-being he was responsible? Dennis himself had, of course, met that requirement, although he very seldom saw his wife. Adorai Dennis was neither surprised nor particularly unhappy about that. She'd been only twelve when the Dennis and Lenore families arranged the marriage, and she'd been raised to understand as well as Dennis did how such matters were handled among the church's dynasties. Besides, she hated Zion's world of social activity almost as much as she disliked the complex maneuvering of the temple's internal factions. She lived quite happily on one of Dennis' estates, raising horses, chickens, draft dragons, and the two sons she had dutifully borne for him in the early years of their marriage. That left Dennis, like many of his peers, at loose ends for feminine companionship. Fortunately for him, Madame Angélique and her unfailingly lovely and exquisitely trained young ladies were available to fill the void, always, of course, with the utmost discretion. Ah, well, Angélique, he sighed now, as she escorted him the last few feet to the door, and the dignified porter opened it at their approach. I'm afraid I truly do have to go. Not, he added with a shudder, which wasn't entirely feigned as he gazed out the open door at a fall night's cold, drizzling rain, without more regrets than you can possibly imagine. Flatterer, Madame Angélique patted him on the shoulder with a peal of laughter. Of course, if the weather is too bad, you could always stay the evening, Your Eminence. Get you behind me, Shanway. Dennis quoted with an answering chuckle, then shook his head. Seriously, he continued, watching the steamy plumes of his coachman's and horse's breath rise into the rainy night under his coach's lamps as they awaited him at the curb. I'd be most tempted to take up your gracious offer. Unfortunately, there are a great many matters which require attention before I can depart for Cheris, and I have several meetings scheduled early in the morning, but for that I feel sure... You could easily convince me. In that case, Your Eminence, I accept my defeat. Madame Angélique gave his hand another squeeze, then released it and watched him step out the front door. No one, least of all Dennis, was entirely certain later exactly what happened next. The porter bowed the archbishop through the door, accepting the heavy golden weight of a coin with a murmur of thanks. From his perch high on the carriage's box, Dennis, senior coachman, watched his employer's approach with undisguised gratitude. However pleasant the archbishop's visit might have been for him, the long wait had been cold, wet misery for the driver, his assistant, and the blanketed horses. The assistant coachman holding the horse's heads felt much the same thing, plus a twinge of envy for the way his seated senior partner's voluminous cloak formed a well-draped tent about him. Madame Angélique's footman and lantern boy went scurrying ahead of the archbishop, lighting his way and ready to open the coach door for him, and Dennis himself settled his thick fur-lined cloak and started down the broad, smooth steps with his eyes half-squinted against the blowing rain. That was when his feet went out from under him, literally. 
Dennis had never experienced anything quite like the sudden tugging, almost snatching sensation. It was as if a hand had reached out, grasped his right ankle, and pulled on it powerfully. It staggered him, and he was not, unfortunately, a particularly athletic man. The archbishop flailed his arms with a most un-archbishop-like squawk of astonishment as he fought for balance. But that tugging sensation didn't let go, and he squawked again, louder, as his feet went out from under him and he tobogganed down the steps. Had he considered it, he might have found it odd that he went down feet first instead of head first, which in turn might have caused him to think rather harder about that peculiar pulling sensation. At the moment, however, he was too busy falling to ponder such matters as they perhaps deserved, and he cried out as he hit the cobbled walkway at the bottom of the tall steps. He slammed across it until the avenue's raised granite slab curb abruptly stopped him and sent a bolt of anguish ripping through his right leg and shoulder. Madame Angelique's horrified servants raced after him, and the assistant coachman abandoned his place at the horse's heads to dash towards him. The archbishop shook his head groggily, scraped and bleeding, and more than half stunned by the ugly, slithering tumble. Then he tried to stand up and cried out again, more loudly, as the injudicious attempt sent waves of pain washing through him. Don't move, your eminence, the assistant coachman said urgently, going to his knees beside the prelate. You've broken at least one leg, sir. The young man had already ripped off his own cloak. Now he spread it over his fallen patron and looked at Madame Angelique's footman. Fetch a healer, he snapped. His eminence is going to need a bone setter at least. The white-faced servant gave a single jerky nod and went dashing off into the night, even as Madame Angelique came scurrying down the steps. Her face was twisted with genuine concern and dismay as she held a filmy evening cloak over her elaborately coiffured hair and knelt beside the coachman in her flowingly draped silk gown. Don't move, Eric, she said, not realizing his servant had already given him the same command. She let one hand rest lightly on his chest. I can't believe this happened. I'll never forgive myself for it. Never. Not, not your fault, Dennis told her through gritted teeth, touched by her manifestly sincere worry despite his own pain. It slipped. Must have been the rain. Oh, your poor leg, she said, staring at the obviously badly broken limb. I sent for a bone setter, my lady the assistant coachman told her, and she nodded jerkily. Good. That's good. She looked up over her shoulder at her porter, who had followed her down the steps, and now stood at her shoulder, wringing his hands. Stephen, she said sharply, don't stand there like a ninny. Get back in the house. I want blankets out here at once, and a pillow for the archbishop's head. Now go. Yes, ma'am, the porter said and turned to flee back into her establishment in obedience to her commands. Merlin Athrawis stood atop the roof of an elegant townhouse across the street from Madame Angelique's. He'd been waiting there for the better part of three hours, and he'd come to the firm opinion that he spent entirely too much time loitering on rooftops in the rain. Since he seemed to have acquired the habit, however, he was just as glad that at least a pika didn't have to feel the cold and wet if it didn't want to. He was also glad no one, and nothing, appeared to have noticed him so far. He'd hoped it would work that way, yet he'd had significant reservations about this entire operation. Unfortunately, he'd also come to the conclusion it was necessary. His recon skimmer hovered discreetly out of sight well to the north of the city of Zion hiding under every stealth system it possessed, while its passive sensors watched over the emission signatures Nimue, Alban, and Owl had detected in their first sweep of the temple and its environs. The fact that those emission signatures existed still made Merlin extremely uneasy, but he'd come to the conclusion that Nimue's initial hypothesis, that most of the signatures his skimmer was reading, were those of the temple's still-functioning environmental systems, had been correct. Certainly the temple was 
mystically warm and inviting, despite the increasingly unpleasant weather outside it. Given the local winter climate, that particular miracle had to be one of the archangel's more welcome dispensations, he reflected. There were still a few other more powerful signatures Merlin couldn't account for, though, and a part of him wanted to get even closer, take a better look. But prudence suggested otherwise. Whatever they were, they were buried beneath the temple itself, and while he devoutly hoped they were merely more of the temple's heating and cooling systems, there was simply no way to tell that. And until he had at least some clue about exactly what those emissions represented, or until he had absolutely no other choice, he wasn't prepared to push for additional information. There were always those orbiting kinetic bombardment platforms to think about, poking his nose even by electronic proxy, where any computer controlling the platforms might decide it didn't belong, could have unfortunate consequences. It was frustrating, to say the very least. If there was one organization he needed to keep close tabs on, it was the Council of Vickers. But unless he'd been prepared to deploy snarks, or at least their parasites, dangerously close to those unidentified emissions signatures, there was no way to snoop upon the Council's meetings. What made that especially worrisome was that even from his less risky coverage of the more junior archbishops and bishops living in Zion, it was clear the council was growing increasingly restive about Cheris. So far it seemed that restiveness had yet to attain critical dimensions, but Merlin was coming to the conclusion that he'd rather badly underestimated its underlying strength in the first place. He'd gradually become aware that discussion of Cheris cropped up much too often in his snark's coverage for his peace of mind. In private conversation between the church's senior prelates, as well as in more official settings, and there was a hard edge to many of the discussions he'd overheard. In point of fact, the church hierarchy's apparent level of concern was out of all proportion to the size and population of the kingdom. He was beginning to suspect the church was better aware than he'd originally believed of the potentialities he himself had sensed in Cheris, and Cheris' many enemies led by Prince Hector and Prince Narmon, were fanning the fire as energetically as they dared. The fact that the Church's suspicions of Cheris seemed to be at least as much emotional as reasoned played into Hector's and Narmon's hands. They had to exercise some caution. Their own distance from the temple left their own orthodoxy open to a certain degree of automatic suspicion of its own, especially in the eyes of the Office of the Inquisition but neither Hector's Corisand nor Narmon's Emerald had produced anything like Cheris innovativeness. Their agents in the temple were carefully emphasizing that fact as they spread exaggerated tales of King Harald's willingness to skirt the fringes of the prescriptions of Zhuo Zheng, coupled with observations about Harald's willingness to overturn the existing social order all backed by sizable cash donations. Somewhat more sophisticated or at least discreet techniques might be required to sway the vicars themselves, but the more junior ranks of the episcopate, and perhaps even more importantly, the priests and underpriests who provided the council's staff functions and who were thus ideally positioned to shape the way those tales were presented to their superiors responded quite well to simple bribery. So did more than one of the council's own members, apparently, and Hector and Tomas' efforts were slowly but steadily gaining ground. Archbishop Eric was as aware of that as anyone. It had been apparent from his discussions with his fellows and the instructions he'd been issuing to Father Matteo that he'd recognized he would be expected to look very closely at the situation in Telesburg during his annual pastoral visit. The Council of Vicars obviously wanted to hear his personal assurance either that the rumors it was hearing were wildly overblown or that the Archbishop of Cheris had taken the necessary steps to correct any problems. That, unfortunately, couldn't be permitted, because just this once, Harald's enemies were underestimating exactly what one Merlin Athrawis had in mind 
for the kingdom of Cheris. He had no intention of actually violating the prescriptions, not yet, but that distinction might well be lost upon an archbishop intent on satisfying the demands of his ecclesiastical superiors, which was why Merlin came to be standing on this miserable, rain-swept roof on a bone-chilling autumn night. Fortunately, Zion was a very large city, and Madame Angelique's establishment was in an expensive and exclusive section of it, almost five miles from the temple proper. That gave him a certain comfort zone where unidentified energy signatures were concerned, as long as he was discreet, and he'd discovered he could be very, very discreet when the need arose. Now he listened via the remote riding in a fold of Dinis cloak and nodded with satisfaction. He had nothing personally against Dinis, yet at least, and he felt pleased satisfaction as he eavesdropped on Angelique and Dinis' assistant coachman. The archbishop's injuries were undoubtedly painful, he reflected, as he packed away the handheld tractor unit he'd used on Dinis' feet. But it didn't sound as if they were life-threatening. That was good. Merlin didn't want to get into the habit of casually killing people he didn't have to kill. And overall, he preferred Dennis to a potentially more doctrinaire and rigorous replacement. On the other hand, it was obvious the archbishop's right leg at least was badly broken. Probably his right shoulder as well, judging by what Merlin's light-gathering systems could see from here and what he could overhear. Dennis would be a long time recovering. By the time he did, Xing Wu's passage would certainly be frozen over for the winter, and Merlin rather doubted anyone in the temple would expect the archbishop to make the arduous winter overland journey to Cloner and cross the cauldron, especially so soon after such a nasty accident and injury, which ought to delay Dennis' pastoral visit for at least another five or six safeholdian months. Long enough for me to get things up and running and erase my own fingerprints anyway, I hope, he reflected. At any rate, it's the best I can do for right now and I need to be getting back home. He chuckled inside at the thought. It was broad daylight in Cheris at the moment. He'd told Harold and Caleb, truthfully enough, that he needed some time in privacy to deal with certain aspects of his visions. The king had agreed to allow him to seek solitude in the mountains near Telesburg while he did so, although it was obvious Harold was none too happy about the thought of allowing Merlin out on his own and unprotected. Caleb, on the other hand, had merely looked thoughtful, extremely thoughtful, when Merlin made his request, and Merlin wondered exactly what was going on in the crown prince's mind. Whatever it was, the sooner Merlin got home to deal with it, or to divert the prince's suspicions, as the case might be, the better. He climbed very quietly down from his rooftop perch, arranged his poncho about himself, pulled up its hood, and strode briskly away. Al would be waiting to collect him with the skimmer's tractors, but not until he'd put at least ten more miles between himself and the temple. At least, he reflected sardonically, he'd have the city streets pretty much to himself on a night like this. 2. Royal Palace, Telesburg Crown Prince Caleb raised his hand to knock courteously, then paused just outside the half-open chamber door. One eyebrow rose as he listened to the quiet, crisp clicking sound. It came again, then ceased, then began yet again. The prince frowned, wondering what fresh novelty he was about to encounter, then shrugged and continued his interrupted knock on the doorframe. Come in, your highness, an amused voice invited an instant before his knuckles actually contacted the wood, and Caleb shook his head with a crooked grin and pushed the door fully open. He stepped through it into Merlin Athrawis's comfortable, sunlit sitting room and paused just inside the threshold. In keeping with his official position as Caleb's personal bodyguard, the Sage Inn had been moved from Maritha's tower to quarters in the royal family's section of the palace. In fact, they were quite near Caleb's own, with a view of the harbor that was almost as good as the one from the prince's bedchamber, although they were considerably more modest. The sage Inn had risen respectfully from his chair behind a desk at Caleb's entry. Now he stood there, clad in the crocken-badged livery of the House of Armok, head cocked, 
with a quizzical smile of his own. His sword and the matching short sword were racked on the wall behind him, and Caleb smiled slightly as he glanced at them. The longer of the two swords was unlike anything anyone in Cheris had ever seen before. It was also, apparently, unlike anything anyone had ever seen in Har Chong, judging from Master Domnek's reaction, at least. The arms master was obviously being eaten alive with curiosity about the Seijin and his weapons, but his Harchongi's pride refused to let him ask the questions burning within him. The crown prince shook his head and looked away from the sword rack, and one of his eyebrows quirked. There was a peculiar device on Merlin's desk, a rectangular wooden frame, about two feet long and six inches tall. Twenty-one vertical rods connected the upper and lower sides of the frame, and there were six flattened beads on each rod, five below and one above a wooden dividing strip near the outer frame's upper side. The beads on the rods were arranged to slide up and down, and their present configuration formed an obviously deliberate, if incomprehensible, pattern. There were also several sheets of paper on the desk, covered with the Seijin's strong, clear handwriting, but also with columns of some sort of symbols or characters Caleb had never seen before. Oh, sit down, Merlin, the prince said, crossing the chamber to him. The Seijin only smiled more quizzically still, then waited until Caleb had seated himself in the chair in front of the desk before sitting once more behind it. Caleb shook his head and snorted. I thought we were supposed to be leaving for Helen this afternoon, he said. We are, your highness, Merlin agreed. Catamount's been delayed, though. The page taking you a copy of his note probably passed you on your way here. We won't be leaving for at least another hour or so, so I thought I'd spend the time jotting down a few notes. Is that what those are? Caleb nodded to the neatly inscribed sheets of paper, and Merlin nodded. What sort of notes? Most of them are for High Admiral Lock Island, today at least, Merlin replied. I've got some I've already worked up for Dr. Mocklin and Master Houseman. I was just completing some calculations on manpower and tonnages, Hector's and Narmon's, not your father's, for the High Admiral. Calculations? Caleb leaned back in his chair, then gestured at the rectangular frame on the desk. Since you knew it was me outside the door without even looking. You must know I was eavesdropping shamelessly. I imagine that clicking sound I heard came from this thing? Indeed it did, Your Highness, Merlin said gravely, his peculiar sapphire eyes glinting with amusement while the notes of distant birdsong floated through the open window. Yet another of your little surprises, I suppose. Just what does this one do, if I might ask? It's called an abacus, Your Highness, Merlin replied. It's a device for doing mathematical calculations. It's what? Caleb blinked. It's a device for doing mathematical calculations, Merlin repeated. How does it work? Caleb could hardly believe he'd asked that question, and he felt a momentary stab of panic as he realized he'd laid himself open to the sort of explanation Franklin Thomas, his tutor, had always delighted in administering. Actually... Merlin said with a wicked smile. It's quite simple. Caleb shuddered at the dreaded simple word, but the Seijin continued mercilessly. Each vertical rod represents one integer, Your Highness. Each bead in this group here, above the divider, represents the value of five when lowered. Each bead in this group here, below the divider, represents a value of one when it's raised. At the moment... He waved a finger at the device's first four rods. The setting of the beads represents the number 7,413. Caleb had opened his mouth to disavow any interest in further explanation, but he paused, disavowal unspoken. He had no idea what an integer was, but he'd spent more than enough time working his laborious way through the endless numbers contained in the sort of report Merlin had been preparing for Admiral Lock Island. Surely it wasn't possible to represent a number that high with only four rods and twenty-four beads. You can keep track of numbers that high on something that size? He asked almost incredulously. Or much higher, 
Merlin assured him. It takes practice, but after you've learned to do it, it's quick and simple. Caleb only looked at him for several seconds, then reached out and drew one of the sheets of notes across in front of him. He glanced down the page and made a soft sound in the back of his throat as he reached one of the columns of peculiar symbols. From the context, it was obvious that they represented the results of some of the calculations Merlin had been making, but they made absolutely no sense to Caleb. Admittedly, I've never been the most enthusiastic scholar my family ever produced, he said, with masterful understatement, looking up at Merlin. Still, it occurs to me that I've never seen anything like this. He tapped the column with a fingertip. It's simply another way of writing numbers, Your Highness. Merlin's tone was almost casual, yet Caleb had the definite impression that there was something watchful and focused behind those odd sapphire eyes, almost as if the Seijin had deliberately arranged this moment of explanation. It was a feeling the prince had had before. Another way of writing numbers, he repeated and chuckled. All right, I'll grant you that. Somehow, though, I don't think simply really enters into it he observed, and in that moment, although he didn't realize it himself, he looked remarkably like his father. Well, Merlin said, sliding a blank sheet of paper across to Caleb and handing him the pen with which he'd been writing. Why don't you write down the number set here on the abacus? 7,413, he reminded helpfully. Caleb looked at him for a moment, then took the pen, dipped it in the desk's inkwell, and began scribbling down the number. When he'd finished, he turned the sheet around and showed it to Merlin. There, he said just a bit suspiciously, tapping the number with the end of the wooden pen holder. Merlin glanced at it, then took the pen back and jotted four of his incomprehensible symbols under it. Then he turned the sheet back around to Caleb. The prince looked down at it. There was the number he'd written, M.M., M M M M M C D X I I I, and under it were Merlin's odd symbols. Seven thousand four hundred thirteen. It's the same number, Merlin told him. You're joking, Caleb said slowly. No, I'm not. Merlin leaned back in his chair. That's ridiculous, Caleb protested. Not ridiculous, Your Highness, Merlin disagreed. Only different and simpler. You see, each of these symbols represents a specific value from one to ten, and each column. He tapped the symbol three with the end of the pen holder, then tapped the first of the rods on his abacus as well. Represents what you might think of as a holding space for the symbol. The wise woman who taught them to me many years ago called them Arabic numerals, which I suppose is as good a name as any for them. There are only ten symbols, including one which represents nothing at all called zero. He drew another symbol, which looked for all the world like the letter O on the sheet of paper. But I can write any number you can think of using them. Caleb stared at him. The prince often joked about his own aversion to book learning, but he was far from stupid. And he was also the crown prince of his world's leading maritime power. Record-keeping and accounting were critical to Cheris traders and shippers, and they were also functions which ate up the efforts of huge numbers of clerks with a voracious appetite. It didn't require a genius to recognize the huge advantages of the system Merlin was describing, assuming it actually worked. All right, the prince challenged, taking back the pen briefly. If you can write any number, using these numbers of yours, write this one. The steel nib of the pen scratched across the paper as he wrote, M M M M M M M M M M M M M M M M M M M D C C I I. Then he passed both of them back across to the sage inn. Merlin looked it over for a moment, then shrugged. The pen scratched again, and Caleb's eyes narrowed as Merlin wrote simply, nineteen thousand seven hundred two. There you are, Your Highness he said. Caleb stared down at the sheet of paper for several long, silent seconds, then looked back up at Merlin. Who are you, really? he asked softly. What are you?
Your Highness? Merlin's eyebrows rose, and Caleb shook his head. Don't play with me, Merlin, he said, his voice still soft, his eyes level. I believe you mean me, my father, and my kingdom well. But even though I may still be young, I'm not a child any longer either. I'll believe you're a Sejin. But you're more than that too, aren't you? Why do you say that, Your Highness? Merlin countered, but his own voice was level taking Caleb's question seriously. The legends and ballads say Seijin may be teachers as well as warriors, the prince replied, but none of the tales about them mention anything like this. He tapped the sheet of paper between them, then gestured at the abacus lying to one side. And, he looked very steadily at the other man, I've never heard any tale about even a Seijin who could cross an entire unfamiliar city through the middle of the winter's worst thunderstorm as quickly as you did. As I told your father, your highness, I was alerted by my vision. You were there at the time I experienced it yourself. Yes, I was, Caleb agreed, and you seemed distracted enough by it that I followed you to your rooms to be certain you'd reached them safely. I got there only seconds behind you, and I thought I heard something from inside your chamber. So I knocked. There was no answer, so I knocked again, then opened the door, but you'd already disappeared. The only way you could have done that was to go out the window, Merlin. I noticed that you never actually specifically answered Father's question when he asked you how you'd done it. But I saw no rope ladder you might have climbed down, and the sheets were all still on your bed. I see. Merlin leaned back in his chair gazing steadily at the prince, then shrugged. I told you, and your father, I possess some of the powers the tales say say Jin possess, and I do. I also possess some the tales don't mention, some which must be kept secret. I think, hope, I've demonstrated that I do indeed mean you and Cheris well, that I'll serve you and Cheris in any way I can, and some day, perhaps, I'll be able to tell you more about those powers and abilities I must keep secret for now. I promised your father the truth, and I've never lied, although as you've obviously noticed, that isn't necessarily the same thing as telling all the truth. I'm not free to tell all the truth, however. I regret that, but I can't change it. So I suppose the question is whether or not you can accept my service with that limitation. Caleb looked back at him for several seconds, then inhaled deeply. You've been expecting this conversation, haven't you? He asked. Or one like it, Merlin agreed. Although, to be honest, I had expected to have it with your father, or possibly Bishop Michael first. Father is more confident of his ability to judge men's hearts and intentions than I am, Caleb shrugged slightly. He's been doing it a lot longer than I have. I think some of the same questions have occurred to him, and he's simply chosen not to ask. And why should he have made that choice? I'm not sure, Caleb admitted. But I think perhaps it's because he truly believes, as I do, that you mean Cheris well, and because he's already guessed there are questions you can't or won't answer. He knows how desperately we need any advantage we can find, and not just against Hector and Narmon and he's unwilling to risk losing your services by pressing the point. And Bishop Michael? Much the same, I think. Caleb shook his head. I'm never really certain what Michael thinks in a lot of ways. He's a Cheresian, and he loves this kingdom. He also loves my father and our family, and even though he's never expressly said it to me, I think he actually fears the temple. He... Caleb paused a moment then shook his head. Let's simply say he's well aware of the way our enemies could use the temple and the church against us, and why. Like father, he knows the trap we're in, and if he says he senses no evil in you, then he doesn't, which isn't exactly the same thing as saying he has no reservations at all. And do you agree with your father? Yes, to a point. Caleb looked Merlin in the eye. But I will require one answer from you, Sajin Merlin. This, he gestured at the sheet of paper and the abacus once again, goes beyond visions and attempted assassinations. The services you're offering now will change Cheris forever, and eventually 
they're going to spread beyond Cheris and change the entire world. I suspect there are going to be even more changes than I can imagine at this moment. Changes some will fear and hate. Changes some may even argue violate the prescriptions of Zhuo Zheng, with all the dangers that would entail. I think the thunderstorm you disappeared into was no more than a spring shower beside the typhoon following on your heels. So the one question I have, the one answer I require, is why? You once said many of your enemies serve darkness, whether they realize it or not. But which do you serve, Merlin? Darkness or light? Light, your highness, Merlin said promptly, unflinchingly, looking straight into Caleb's eyes. There's enough darkness in the world already, the sage -in continued, and more is gathering. Cheris stands in its way, and so I stand with Cheris. And I tell you this, Caleb Armach, Crown Prince of Cheris, I will die before I permit darkness to triumph, whatever its source. Caleb looked deep into those level sapphire eyes for at least thirty measured seconds, and then slowly he nodded. That's enough for me, he said simply, and tapped the piece of paper once more. Now, he invited, try explaining these numerals of yours to me again, if you would. 3. Kings Harbor, Helen Island Helen Island lay 114 miles northeast of Tellisburg in South Howell Bay. It was shaped roughly like a triangle with a bite taken out of its eastern side and measured about 75 miles in its longest dimension. That wasn't particularly huge for a planet like Safehold, where islands were an everyday fact of life, but this island's craggy mountains rose to a spectacular height above sea level. More to the point, perhaps, Helen Island was a vital part of the ancestral Armagh lands, and it had been heavily fortified for centuries. Howell Bay had been the key to the evolution of the Kingdom of Cheris. Waterborne transportation was faster, easier, and far cheaper than trying to haul the same goods and materials overland, and Howell Bay had provided Cheris the equivalent of a broad, straight highway at its heart. Swift galleys and sailing vessels had tied the growing power of the kingdom together and provided the impetus and seagoing mindset for the oceanic expansion of trade which had followed. And Howell Bay had been dominated by three islands, San Shoal, Helen, and Big Tyrion. The fact that the House of Armagh had managed to secure control of all three of them had a great deal to do with the fact that it had also eventually secured the Cheresian throne. That had been centuries ago, but the kingdom of Cheris had maintained the fortifications on all three islands, and King's Harbor, Helen's major port, was the site of one of the Royal Navy's main shipyards. King's Harbor was also an ancient fortress whose walls had been steadily expanded for centuries, which made the shipyard what might be considered a secure location and the fact that most of the island's usable supply of ship timbers had been logged off long ago wasn't much of a drawback. Timber could always be shipped in, and Helen did offer substantial deposits of copper and iron plus, despite its relatively small size, enough mountain-borne rivers and streams to drive a great many of Cheris overshot water wheels. The King's Harbor shipyard had installed its first water-powered sawmill over a century before and a very respectable complex of supporting installations had grown up since. Over the years, more than one project about which the kings of Cheris wanted the rest of the world kept in ignorance had been carried out at King's Harbor. The shipyards at Hyratha on Big Tyrion were bigger and more capable in some ways, but Big Tyrion's population was also far higher, which meant security was commensurately more difficult to maintain there and the Royal Navy's Talisburg shipyard, the biggest and most capable of all, was also the most public. All of which helped to explain why Merlin Athrawis stood on the foredeck of the Royal Cheresian Navy galley HMS Catamount as she rode steadily into King's Harbor, past the towers guarding either side of the opening in the seawall. It was the first time Merlin had seen the harbor with his own eyes, as it were, and he was forced to admit the looming fortifications, standing stark and tall against the dark green and brown of their mountainous backdrop, were impressive, to say the least, when viewed from sea level. On the other hand, they were also about to become 
hopelessly obsolete, although no one else had any way to know that. He gazed at the sheer stone curtain walls, crenellated and tall, with regularly spaced towers and platforms for catapults and ballistae. Cannon crouched on some of those platforms now, he noted, crudely designed yet well made, then turned his attention to the shipyard itself. Half a dozen galleys like Canamount were under construction, their partially completed hulls already showing the rakish gracefulness of their breed. They too were about to become obsolete, and Merlin felt a brief, very brief, stab of regret at the thought of the passing of such lithe, beautiful craft. The fact that he felt unhappily certain he was going to have no end of difficulty convincing some Navy officers that their passage would be a good thing helped to account for some of that regret's brevity. He snorted in amusement at the thought and turned to glance at the young men standing beside him. Impressive, he said, and Caleb chuckled and looked over his shoulder. Merlin says it looks impressive, Arnold, he observed. Do you think we should feel flattered? At this point, Your Highness, I sometimes doubt anything truly impresses Sajin Merlin, Lieutenant Falcon said dryly. The Marine had returned to duty less than a five-day after the assassination attempt, and he'd adjusted remarkably well to Merlin's constant presence at the Prince's side. Some men in his position might have resented the public appearance that such a special reinforcement had been required. Falcon, however, knew the real reason for the arrangement, and he seemed remarkably impervious to public appearances. Now he only grinned. I've noticed, however, that the Seijin is always polite and careful not to hurt his host's feelings, he added. That's about what I thought, too, Caleb said with another chuckle, and turned back to Merlin. In this case, I meant exactly what I said, Your Highness, Merlin said. It is impressive, and I can see how it must have aided your ancestors' efforts to unite the kingdom. My, you are polite, Caleb smiled broadly. My ancestors began as the most successful pirates on the bay, as I'm sure you're quite well aware, Merlin, and I'm afraid their efforts to unite the kingdom had a great deal more to do with improving their opportunities to loot and plunder than with high and noble motivations. I'm not sure that's quite the way I'd put it, Your Highness, Falcon interjected with a slightly pained expression. Of course it isn't. You're a loyal servant of the House of Armok. I, on the other hand, am the House's heir. As such, I can afford to tell the truth. And I'm sure it amuses you no end, Merlin said dryly. Nonetheless, Your Highness, I do find the sight impressive, and I think it should suit our purposes quite well. You're probably right, Caleb said more seriously, and pointed off to the right where several columns of smoke rose from behind another stretch of curtain wall. You'll want to look it over for yourself, I expect, but there's a fairly respectable foundry back there. If I recall correctly, something like half the Navy's guns have been cast there over the years, I realize from what you were saying the other night, he smiled tightly, that we're going to need to expand it a lot. But it's still a start. I'm sure it will be, Merlin agreed, without mentioning that he undoubtedly had a far better notion of that foundry's capacity than Caleb himself did. The prince was right about how useful it was going to be, though. There's the Mari Jane, Your Highness, Falcon put in, pointing at another ship one of the heavier, clumsier, square-rigged merchant ships which constituted the kingdom's true wealth, and Caleb nodded in acknowledgment. Was it really necessary to haul everyone clear out here, Merlin? The prince asked, as their own galley altered course slightly to steer for the same anchorage. Probably not from a security perspective, Merlin acknowledged. On the other hand, I think your father was absolutely right about all the other reasons. It's not as if Helen were on the other side of the world, but it's far enough from Telesburg to make the point that he's dead serious about the need to keep this entire meeting secret and bringing all of them together at once, where they can see how all the bits and pieces fit together, is going to make them all realize how critical it is that they pull together. But it's also going to mean all of them do know how all the bits and pieces fit together. Caleb's voice and expression alike were both suddenly darker more somber. If it turns out we're wrong about any one of them, he's going to be able to hurt us much worse than if each of them only knew about his own particular piece of it. 
Merlin turned fully towards the prince, his own expression grave as he studied Caleb's. Caleb, like his father, had been very close to Calvin Armok. After all, the duke had been his godfather, not just his cousin. Given the difference in their ages, Caleb had always regarded Tyrion more as an uncle and, in many ways, a true second father than as a cousin. It had been Calvin who'd taught Caleb to ride when Harald's crippled leg prevented him from doing so, just as it was Calvin who'd overseen the beginning of Caleb's training with sword and bow. The prince had loved his cousin, and more than a little of the adoration of a very young boy for a magnificent uncle had stayed with him. Which meant the proof of Calvin's treason had hit Caleb even harder than it had hit Harald. In some ways, that was probably a good thing, for someone who would face the burden of kingship himself one day. But it had been a painful, painful lesson, the sort that left scars, and Merlin hoped it hadn't permanently damaged the boy's ability to trust those who truly deserved his trust. Your Highness, he said gently after a moment, these men are loyal. Baron Wave Thunders vouched for all of them, and so do I. No man's judgment is perfect, but I have no fear that any of the people your father's invitation has summoned to Helen today will ever betray you or Cheris. Caleb scowled for a second or two, then he snorted as he realized what Merlin had really said, and his expression eased slightly as he accepted the lesson. I know they won't, he said. I've known some of them all my life, for that matter, but it's still hard. He broke off with an uncomfortable little shrug, and Merlin nodded. Of course it is, he said, and it will be, for a while at least, but I think you can rely on the Baron to keep what's left of Narmon's spies on the hop for the next little bit, and I doubt Prince Hector is going to be particularly pleased about what's happened to his spies, for that matter. No, he isn't, is he? Caleb agreed with a nasty smile, and Lieutenant Falcon chuckled from behind him. I think that's a comfortable understatement, Your Highness, the Prince's chief bodyguard observed with a certain relish. He'd never been privy to all the details of the hostile espionage networks in and around Telesburg, but his position as Caleb's guardian meant that, despite his relatively junior rank, he'd been better informed than most, and he was delighted by what the Sajin's arrival had done to them. His only real regret was that the decision had been made to leave so much of Hector's spy rings effectively intact. It probably didn't feel that way to Jaspar Maison and Oscar Mulvane, of course. Mulvane, in particular, had gone into hiding when the warrant for his arrest was issued. He had no way of knowing Sir Richard Seafarmer had personally instructed the Crown's chief investigators that he was not to be successfully taken under any circumstances. Not that Seafarmer had had any objection to making Mulvane's life a living hell— until the Coruscandian managed to find transportation out of Telesburg. But apprehending the man and interrogating him had been no part of Wave Thunder's plans. They might have been forced to go after Mason as well, if they'd done that. As it was, they could pretend to have no suspicions at all where Mason was concerned, as long as Mulvane successfully slipped away from them. In the meantime, Hector's information-gathering capability in Cheris had sustained a major blow, with the elimination at one stroke, for a time at least, of all of Mulvane's contacts, and Mason was undoubtedly going to operate very cautiously for the next several months himself, at least until he once again felt certain that he wasn't under suspicion, which was going to prevent him from rebuilding quickly, too. Most of the groundwork for the plans King Harald and Merlin had hatched would be firmly in place by the time Narmon and Hector were able to build back to anything approaching their previous capabilities. Personally, Falcon would have greatly preferred to take both Mulvane and Mason into custody and execute them for the snakes they were. Since he couldn't, he was just as happy he was a simple marine responsible for protecting the heir to the throne from direct attack, and not a spymaster himself. He understood that there were perfectly valid reasons to leave a known spy in place. He simply didn't like doing it. 
At any rate, Caleb said after a moment, we'll have an opportunity to start explaining things to them soon enough now. Your Highness, welcome to King's Harbor, High Admiral Bryon Lock Island, Ninth Earl Lock Island, said, as Caleb walked into the large chamber high in the citadel. Wave Thunder Merlin and Falcon were at his heels, and the spartanly furnished room was like a cool, welcoming cave after the brilliant brightness and heat of the day outside. A single, deep-walled window looked out over the harbor, and Merlin saw a catamount far below gleaming in the sunlight like a child's toy as she lay to her moorings. There was more than a trace of family resemblance between the Earl and the Crown Prince, and Merlin watched Caleb closely but unobtrusively as the Prince crossed to the Admiral and extended his right hand. Lock Island clasped arms with him, and the older man's expression seemed to ease somehow. So he was worried about the kind of scars Tyrion might have left too, Merlin thought. It's always good to be here, just as it is to see you, Brian, Caleb said warmly. Not that Helen isn't just a bit inconveniently placed for quick visits. That's certainly true enough, Lock Island agreed, and grimaced humorously. Some of us, on the other hand, find ourselves required to make the trip just a bit more often than others of us. And others of us are just as glad we aren't part of the some of us any more, Caleb agreed with a chuckle looking past his kinsmen at the other men who'd risen from the chairs around the chamber's large table at his entrance. If you'll permit me, Sajin Merlin, the prince continued, I'll get the introductions out of the way, and then we can sit down and get started. Most of the waiting faces showed surprise at Caleb's obvious courtesy to his bodyguard, and Merlin was pleased to see it. If these men were buying Harald's cover story, it might hold against the rest of the world far better than he'd feared it might. Of course, Your Highness, he murmured. In that case, let's begin with Dr. Mucklin. Merlin nodded and followed the prince across to the five men at the table. He listened with half an ear, bowing, smiling, murmuring appropriate responses as Caleb made the introductions, but he didn't really need them. He'd already met every one of them through the interface of his snarks. Dr. Roger Mocklin was the dean of the Royal College of Cheris. He was a bit above average in height, gray-haired, with sharp brown eyes that were more than a little myopic. He was slightly stoop-shouldered, and he walked around with what the unwary might have thought was a perpetual air of mild bemusement. Edward Houseman was Mocklin's physical opposite. Short, stout, with twinkling eyes and a cheerful smile, he was barely forty years old, less than thirty-seven standard. He was also one of the wealthiest men in the entire kingdom of Cheris, the owner of two of the kingdom's three largest foundries and of one of Telesburg's larger shipyards, as well as a small fleet of merchant ships under his own house flag. Although he was a commoner by birth and hadn't bothered with acquiring any patents of nobility yet, Everyone knew it was going to happen as soon as he found the time to get around to it. For that matter, four years ago, he'd married the eldest daughter of an earl, and his noble father-in-law had been delighted by the match. Ryan McHale, bold as an egg and at least sixty-five or seventy standard years old, was a sharp-eyed man who'd partnered with Houseman in a dozen or so of the younger man's most successful ventures. McHale was a quiet man, whose apparently unassuming demeanor masked one of the sharpest business minds in Telesburg. He was almost certainly the kingdom's largest single producer of textiles, and he was definitely the Royal Navy's primary sailmaker, not to mention owning Telesburg's largest rope walk. Sir Dustin Oliver was about midway in age between Houseman and Mikhail. Although he was a wealthy man by anyone else's standards, his personal worth didn't even approach that of the other two. He was physically unremarkable in many ways, but he had powerful shoulders, and his hands, although well manicured these days, carried the scars of his youthful apprenticeship as a ship's carpenter. That apprenticeship was far behind him now, and although he'd never owned, and never wanted to own, a shipyard of his own, he was always busy. He was one of Telesburg's two or three top ship designers, and also the chief naval constructor of the Royal Cheresian Navy. 
The fifth man at the table wore the same sky-blue uniform tunic and loose black trousers as High Admiral Lock Island. But Sir Alfred Hendrick, Baron Seamount, was only a captain. And while Lock Island was long, lean, and heavily tanned, with the crow's feet and weathered complexion of a lifelong mariner, Seamount was a pudgy little fellow. He looked almost ludicrous standing beside the tall, broad-shouldered admiral, at least until one saw his eyes. Very sharp, those eyes, reflecting the brain behind them. He was also missing the first two fingers off his left hand, and there was a peculiar pattern of dark marks on his left cheek. A powder burn, Merlin knew, received from the same accidental explosion which had cost him those fingers. However unprepossessing Seamount might look, he was the closest thing to a true gunnery expert the Royal Cheresia Navy, or any other navy, possessed. Caleb completed the introductions and took his place at the head of the table. The others waited until he'd been seated, then settled back into their own chairs. They didn't waste time worrying about who took precedence over whom, Merlin noticed with satisfaction, although Seamount did wait for Lock Island to seat himself. Clearly, though, that was in deference to the High Admiral's superior naval rank, not to the precedence of this title. All of them obviously knew one another well, which might help explain their comfort level, but it was impossible to imagine grandees from, say, Harchong or Desnare accepting the social equality of any commoner. Caleb waited until everyone had settled, then looked around the table. Despite his relative youth, there was no question who was in command of this meeting, and Merlin rather suspected that there wouldn't have been even if Caleb hadn't been the heir to the throne. There's a reason why my father commanded all of us to meet here today, the prince began. As a matter of fact, there are several reasons. The fact that it's imperative that we prevent our enemies from discovering what we're up to, especially with you and Sir Alfred, Ryan, helps to explain why we're way out here at Helen. It's also the reason Father delegated this meeting to me. I'm still young enough that people may not expect me to be doing anything important without adult supervision. His smile was droll, and most of his listeners chuckled. Then his face sobered a bit. More importantly, I can disappear to meet with all of you here without anyone noticing much more readily than he could. But I want it clearly understood that at this moment I am speaking for him. He paused for a heartbeat or two, letting that sink in, then waved one hand at Merlin. I'm sure all of you have heard all sorts of fantastic tales about Sajin Merlin. Our problem is that most of those tales, despite their fantastic nature, actually fall short of the reality. One or two of his listeners stirred, as if they found that difficult to accept, and Caleb smiled thinly. Believe me, it's true. In fact, the reason Father's gone to considerable lengths to keep anyone with good sense from believing such ridiculous stories is because they happen to be true. Only two members of the Royal Council, Bishop Michael and a handful of our most trusted people, like Arnold here, know the truth about the Seijin and his abilities. To everyone else, he's simply my new personal guardsman and bodyguard, and one whose imposition I've rather publicly complained about on several occasions, a sign to keep me from sticking my foolish nose into any more ambushes. A trusted and valuable retainer, but only that. There are several reasons for that, and one of the reasons for the secrecy of this meeting is to keep certain other people, shall we say, from realizing just how important to us he is. As we all know, according to the old tales, Seijin are sometimes teachers as well as warriors, and that's exactly what Seijin Merlin is. He has things to teach us which may very well give us the advantages the kingdom needs to defeat our enemies. But Father believes it's vital that people like Narmon of Emerald and Hector of Khorasand, among others, don't realize he's the one teaching us, if for no other reason, because they would spare no effort or expense to assassinate him if they did. All eyes had swung to Merlin as Caleb spoke. Merlin looked back, his face carefully expressionless, and Caleb smiled again. The purpose of this meeting is to accomplish several things, he continued. First, Sajin Merlin's going to begin by sketching out how what he knows and what all of you already know can fit together to accomplish our objectives. But second, and just as important, we're going to discuss ways in which the six of you can take credit for what Merlin is teaching us. Lock Island straightened in his chair, glancing around the table, then looked at Caleb. 
Excuse me, Your Highness, but did you say we're to take credit for Sajin Merlin's knowledge? If I may, Your Highness, Merlin asked diffidently before Caleb could reply, and the prince nodded for him to take the Earl's question. Hi, Admiral, Merlin said, turning to face Lock Island squarely. Much of what I know, of what I can teach you, as Prince Caleb's put it, would be of limited value without the practical experience which you and these other men possess. In many, most cases, it's going to take what you already know to make what I can show you effective. Each of you is also an acknowledged master of your own trade, your own specialized area of knowledge, if you will. That means that when you speak, people will listen. And that will be important, because many of the things we're going to have to do will fly in the face of tradition. Change makes most people uncomfortable, even here in Cheris, and your people will take more kindly to change that comes from men they know and trust than they will to change that comes from a mysterious outlander, whatever his credentials. And on top of those factors, there's the need to introduce the changes we're going to have to make on the broadest possible basis. They can't all come from one man, for a lot of reasons. One personal reason of my own is that what I can tell you comes from the teachings of many others, some of whom I knew personally, some of whom I never met myself. It isn't my work, and I'd prefer not to be known as some sort of mysterious, possibly sinister, and definitely foreign genius, just because I happen to be the person in a position to pass it on to the rest of you. On a more pragmatic basis, if a single stranger suddenly appears and becomes a font of all knowledge, it's going to create both more resistance from those who cling to tradition and an unavoidable tension. It's always dangerous for a stranger to become too great, too powerful. It destabilizes things, creates jealousies and resentments. It can even lead to a fragmentation of authority, and Cheris simply cannot afford anything like that when so many external enemies are already gathering around you. Besides, I feel quite confident that even though something I teach you may be what starts you in a given direction, where you finally arrive will indeed be the result of your own energy and work. And, Mikhail said with a thin smile of his own, if you'll pardon me for pointing this out, it will also help keep you alive, Sejin Merlin. Well, there is that minor consideration, Master Mikhail, Merlin acknowledged with a chuckle. I trust, Houseman said, his tone carefully neutral, that none of this teaching of yours is going to infringe upon the prescriptions, say Jin Merlin. You have my solemn oath that it will not, Master Houseman, Merlin replied gravely. In fact, the king intends to involve Bishop Michael and Father Pater from the beginning to make certain of that. A few tense sets of shoulders seemed to relax ever so slightly, and Merlin hid an inner chuckle. He'd come to the conclusion that Caleb's estimate of Bishop Michael was correct. There was no question about the bishop's personal piety, but he was also a Cheresian patriot, and one Merlin was coming to believe, especially after that cathedral sermon, who had few illusions about the nature of the Council of Vicars and the rest of the church's senior hierarchy. Father Peter Wilson, on the other hand, was no Cheresian. In fact, he'd been born in the Temple Lands, and he was Archbishop Eric's chief intendant in Cheris. Like many intendants, he was also a priest of the Order of Schuler, which made him the local representative of the Inquisition as well. The prospect of coming to the Inquisition's attention was enough to make any safe holdian nervous, and none of the men seated around that table was unaware of how the Schulerites' wariness automatically focused on their own kingdom. Despite that, Father Pater was deeply respected in Cheris generally, and in Telesburg in particular. No one could doubt the strength of his personal faith or the fervor with which he served the responsibilities of his priestly office. At the same time, no one had ever accused him of abusing his office, which, unfortunately, could not be said about a great many other inquisitors and intendants. And he was scrupulous about ensuring that the prescriptions of Zhuo Zhang were applied fairly. Shulerites in general had a reputation for erring on the side of conservatism, but Father Pater seemed less inclined in that direction than many of his brethren. Sajin Merlin is correct, Caleb said. Bishop Michael has already been consulted and given his blessing to our efforts. Father Pater hasn't yet, and Bishop Michael has advised Father that it would be wisest to avoid 
embroiling Father Peter in all of the details of what we're doing. He didn't go into all of the reasons for that. There was no need to. Bishop Michael also strongly supports, the Crown Prince continued, Father's belief that the degree to which Sajin Merlin is involved in all of this should be minimized, not just for the reasons we've already discussed, although Bishop Michael agrees all of them are valid, but also because the involvement of a Sajin would automatically trigger a much more thorough and time-consuming preliminary inquisition if Father Peter were forced to take formal cognizance of it. Bishop Michael would prefer to avoid that, and he believes Father Peter would as well. After all, the critical point, as the writ itself makes clear, is the substance of that which is tested, not its origin. He paused until heads nodded solemnly, and Merlin resisted the temptation to smile cynically. All of those nodding men were perfectly well aware that Bishop Michael was effectively advising Harold on how best to game the system. But that was all right with them, because gaming the system, whether it was called that or not, had been an everyday fact of the Church's life for as long as anyone could remember. As long as Mother Church formally approved a new concept or technique, its originators were covered. And at least in Father Pater's case, approval wouldn't depend on the size of the bribe offered. And every one of the men in this chamber also understood that one major unstated reason for them to take credit for the things Merlin was about to begin teaching them was to spread out the responsibility for those innovations. To avoid having so many simultaneous new ideas come at Father Pater from a single possibly suspect source that he was driven to focus on where they came from rather than upon their content. There's one more initial point Father wanted me to stress, Caleb continued after a moment. Nothing that Sage and Merlin is about to share with us can be kept indefinitely as our exclusive property. Once others have seen the advantages, it won't take them long to start trying to duplicate those same advantages for themselves. Some of what we're going to be talking about today, like what Sajin Merlin calls Arabic numerals and an abacus, are going to have to spread widely to be of any use to us. As such, their advantages are bound to be recognized, and they're bound to be adopted by others very quickly. Others will have exclusively, or at least primarily, military implications, involving ways to make the Navy and Marines more effective. The results of those changes are going to be quickly apparent to our adversaries if and when they encounter them in battle. But Father would be much happier if people like Narman and Hector had no idea what we're doing until they encounter those changes in battle. Heads nodded again, much more emphatically, and Caleb nodded back soberly. In that case, Sajin Merlin, he said, why don't you go ahead and begin? <laughs>